The Russian Woman, written by Alex Lukman, audiobook produced by Book TV. Let's get to the story. Chapter 1 The call to prayer echoed through the ancient city of Istanbul as Michael Thorne stepped from his hotel. The air was sweet with the scent of jasmine, the light golden with the promise of a new day. Above, the sky was a blue so pure it hurt his eyes. Thorne was a dark star in the CIA's firmament of dark ops, a specialized skills officer, expendable, deniable. If this mission went bad, no one was going to show up and pull him out of a Turkish prison. Turkey was a powder keg about to explode, and Langley's overlords wanted to know when it was going to blow. Thorne was on his way to meet a man who was supposed to have the answer to that question. The last time there'd been a coup here, the bosses on the seventh floor had been caught with their pants down. A lot of powerful people had gotten upset. They were determined not to let it happen again, which explained why Thorne was walking down a narrow alley that stank of dead fish looking over his shoulder. He didn't think Turkish military intelligence was on to him, but he had to make sure he wasn't being followed. It was why he'd left the hotel early. A lengthy surveillance detection run before a meet in hostile territory was standard procedure. He didn't spot anyone following as he walked but he couldn't shake the feeling he was being watched. There was nothing new about feeling paranoid, but the jitters were worse than usual. The cafe where he was meeting the source was off Toxim Square, in the heart of the city. Thorne turned onto Istiklal Street, a pedestrian mall lined with shops that sold everything from hula hoops to hookahs. A constant drone of voices babbling in half a dozen languages surrounded him. He passed a stall where skewers of spiced meat sizzled over glowing charcoal. The smell started his stomach churning with acid. This meeting in a public place went against all his instincts. The source had insisted, saying he needed to feel safe. Why he thought a crowd was the safest place to be, he hadn't bothered to explain. Thorne would have chosen somewhere out of public view, somewhere private. Maybe in the shadows of one of the many Roman ruins in the city, or one of the museums. A place where he could see someone approaching, anywhere except this busy street. It hadn't been his call. He saw the cafe up ahead, a half dozen tables pushed out in front of a small restaurant. Ekrem Suvari, a wing commander in the Turkish Air Force, sat at one of the tables. There was a cup of coffee in front of him. A folded newspaper next to the coffee signaled the meat was on. Suvari wore a white shirt, dark sport jacket, dark slacks. He was clean-shaven except for the inevitable mustache, his hair cut in the neat fashion favored by officers in the Turkish military. He looked nervous. Thorne paused to look in the window of a shop, scanning the crowd. Psychic antennas stretched wide. Behind his sunglasses, he checked reflections in the glass. That man in the blue shirt with the mustache, had he seen him before? Almost every man in the crowd had a mustache. Many wore blue shirts. If a mustache and a blue shirt were signs of a hostile tale, he was surrounded by enemies. Thorne continued to look in the window. The man in the blue shirt passed by. Thorne studied Suvari. The colonel's fingers tapped a nervous drumbeat on the tabletop. Not far away, the man in the blue shirt lingered in front of a shop. Years spent in places where people wanted to kill him had tuned Thorne's senses to a fine pitch. A sudden feeling raised hairs on his neck. Alarm bells began going off in his head. Something was wrong. He felt it an electric presence in the air. If it had a color, it would be a sickly yellow-green. Something bad was going to happen. His adrenaline kicked in, a surge of energy. Not everyone had the sense of unseen danger. If you had it, you paid attention. If you had it and ignored it, you could end up dead or wishing you were. No one could say exactly what it was, but it was real enough. Thorne had learned to pay attention to it in the harsh wastes of Afghanistan. It was a voice in the back of his mind that had saved his life more times than he could remember. It was screaming at him now. He decided to abort. Suvari didn't know what he looked like. There were many foreigners in Istanbul. Thorne wasn't the only one on the popular street. He stepped away from the shop window and passed the cafe, keeping the crowd between himself and Suvari. Ahead lay the broad expanse of Toxim Square, a popular place for demonstrations and protests. As he got closer, he saw that the square was filled with angry people. A man with a neatly trimmed beard stood on a wooden box and railed at the crowd through a bullhorn. Rows of police dressed in riot gear stood nearby, formed up in neat lines. Their shields made a wall, 
a formation older than the Roman legions. If he'd known there was going to be a protest here today, he would never have agreed to the meeting place. Now it was too late. Thorne glanced back. The man in the blue shirt was talking on a cell phone and looking in his direction. Two large men in the crowd started moving toward him. Ahead, the demonstrators chanted slogans and pumped their arms in the air, a hard angry rhythm egged on by the man with the bullhorn. Someone shouted a command. Battens came out. Without warning, the lines of police moved forward into the crowd of protesters and began clubbing people to the ground. Black canisters arced through the air, releasing clouds of choking gas. The crowd surged, fighting back. For a moment, the police lines held. Then they broke. In an instant, Thorne was in the middle of a riot. He struggled to stay on his feet, hemmed in by people pushing and shoving and striking out in anger and fear. It was like being transported into a medieval painting of hell. He glanced behind. Blue Shirt and his thugs were caught in the crowd, trying to get through to him. Clouds of tear gas drifted over the square. Thorne coughed and pulled up his shirt to cover his nose and mouth. The flat crack of a gunshot echoed from the facades of the high-priced hotels lining the square. There were more shots, followed by screams. The crowd panicked and pressed in. He struggled to stay on his feet. Ahead, a metro sign rose high over the square. Thorne fought his way toward it and stumbled down the steps to the subway, carried along by the mob. Istanbul's metro system featured marble floors and colorful mosaics displaying scenes from Turkish history. But there was no time to admire them. The crowd carried him onto a wide platform just as a rush of air signaled the arrival of one of the sleek trains. The doors hissed open and Thorne got on. As the train pulled away, he caught a glimpse of Blue Shirt yelling into his phone. He was crushed up against a fat man in a rumpled brown suit. Sweat ran down the man's face, glistening in his thick mustache. The air was a humid funk of sweat and fear. Thorne pushed his way to the doors and got off at the next stop. He climbed out of the subway and found himself in a residential section of the city. A few blocks away, he boarded a half-empty bus. He settled into a seat and watched the cityscape go by through a dirty window. He'd been careful earlier, during the surveillance run. He'd seen no one and was certain he hadn't been followed. How had they known who he was? Maybe Savari was bait dangled to draw out enemies of the state, spies, people like him. Maybe they knew where I was going to be. That wasn't a comforting idea. He didn't have to go back to the hotel. He had his passport's money. There was nothing there he needed and they'd be waiting there just in case he returned. Thorn closed his eyes and pulled up a mental map of Istanbul. He was on the European side of the city. He had to assume they knew he was American. That meant the embassy was out. It would be the first place they'd expect him to go. By the time he got there, police would have sealed it off. The only friendly country within reach was Greece. There was still a window of time before the word to look for him got out. But it wouldn't be long it closed. He could get to Greece by water or he could go overland. Both options presented problems. Safety was three hours away by land. There were no trains. The bus terminal and the airport would be swarming with police. The border with Greece was a no-man's land of high fence and razor wire. The only way to cross was through a manned border post where they'd be watching for him. That left a boat or a ferry. Thorne didn't speak Turkish, and he didn't like the odds of trying to convince someone with a boat to take him to one of the Greek islands. If he were a Turk, he'd turn him in. The nearest ferry terminal to the Greek islands was Ivalik, 400 kilometers to the south. Turkish intelligence would expect him to head for the border as fast as possible. They might not expect him to stay in country and head south. It was a risk, but he couldn't see any alternative. Thorne spied a local mall through the bus window. He got off at the next stop and went inside. He found a store where he bought gauze pads and a pair of glasses with large black frames. He added suntan lotion, toothpaste, a razor, the kinds of things a tourist would have with him. The clerk put everything into a plastic sack. In another shop, he picked up a couple of shirts, a pair of khakis, shorts, some socks and underwear, and a blue ball cap. His last purchase was a cheap carry-all bag. Thorne placed everything inside the bag. On the way out of the mall, he grabbed a couple of tourist brochures from a rack by the entrance and added them to the contents. If he were stopped, he was just another tourist on vacation. His stomach rumbled reminding him breakfast had been a cup of coffee. He bought a beef sandwich from a street vendor and found a bench under a tree where he ate the food. When he was sure no one was paying attention, 
He stuffed two of the gauze pads in his cheeks and put on the glasses and the cap. He rumpled up the new clothes to make them look like they'd been worn. He took off his jacket, folded it, put it inside the carry-all with the clothes. His new appearance wouldn't fool anyone close up, but it was enough for the moment. It made him look more like the nondescript photo on his French passport. Turkey was part of the EU, which made things easier when it came to crossing borders. He put the Canadian passport he'd used to enter the country into the plastic sack from the store, along with what was left of the sandwich. He got up from the bench and dropped the bag into a nearby trash can. Then he hailed a cab and showed the driver a wad of money. It was a long drive south to the ferry terminal. There was plenty of time to think about why he was riding in a cab with garlic hanging around the mirror instead of sitting in a plane on his way back to the States or why people who wanted to hurt him might be waiting for him at the ferry. A gift for languages had brought Thorne to Langley's attention. His mother had died when he was two years old. At the time, his father had been a professor at the American University in Beirut. He'd hired a Syrian woman to take care of the boy, and married her a year later. Thorne had grown up in a household where English and Arabic were interchangeable. By the time he entered college, speaking Arabic was as natural to him as English. In college, he discovered that other languages came easily. French was a snap. He decided to study Russian, intrigued by the different alphabet and the difficulty of the language. He'd graduated from college with honors in Russian and Arabic. That was when Langley had first approached him, but they were too late. He'd already talked to a Marine recruiter. He breezed through OCS. Two weeks after his girlfriend pinned the gold bars of a second lieutenant on his shoulders, he was posted to Afghanistan. A year later, he'd transferred to recon and his girlfriend had found someone else to keep her company. He was 27 years old when he left the Corps, and Langley was waiting again. After Afghanistan, civilian life looked dull, boring. They offered him a chance to keep serving his country. Even though his idealism had taken a big hit in Afghanistan, he still believed in America. He took the job. That had been almost 10 years ago. Looking back, it definitely hadn't been boring. But ten years was a long time in his line of work. Like the song said, the thrill was gone. Days like this made him think about finding a different occupation. The only problem was he didn't know what else he would do. Five hours after leaving Istanbul, the taxi let him off in Ivalik. In the ferry terminal, Thorne searched the crowd for hostile faces. Twenty euros bought a ticket on a ferry leaving for the Greek island of Lesbos. He took a seat and waited for the call to board. When the call came, he got in line behind a large woman and her husband. They were arguing about something. They continued the argument all the way through the ticket checkpoint. The guard looked annoyed. Thorne handed over his passport, keeping a neutral expression. The guard glanced at the photo, looked at him, looked down again. The stamp came down and he waved Thorne through. Twenty stressful minutes later, the ferry churned out into the Aegean. He watched the Turkish coast recede into the distance. The trip to Lesbos took an hour and a half. Thorne changed some money and took a cab to the airport. It wasn't until his plane took off for Athens that he allowed himself to begin to relax. In Athens, he booked a Lufthansa flight to Dulles by way of Frankfurt. The only seat available to Washington was in business class. Accounting wasn't going to like that. That's too damn bad, he thought. Chapter 2 Thorne got into Washington at two in the morning, jet-lagged and dog-tired. He went home, notified Langley he was back and crashed. Sometime later, he struggled out of a dark dream to the sound of his cell phone vibrating across the end table next to the bed. The green numbers on his dresser clock told him it was a few minutes after six in the morning. He looked at the phone, saw a message to call in. The call was from Jenna Olmsted, Deputy Director of Operations at Langley. Jenna was his boss. She was also a friend. In the past, she'd been more than that. Thorne sat on the edge of the bed and called. Mike, where are you? Home. You need to get in here. We have a meeting with Carlson. He knew better than to ask what was up. On my way. She disconnected. Thorne used the toilet, took a shower to wake up. Standing naked in front of the sink, he wiped steam from the bathroom mirror and ran his hand over a light stubble. His eyes were a curious smoke-gray color. A woman had once told him they were intriguing. His face showed the strain of too many years spent in places where serious people hated him enough to want to kill him. A pair of puckered scars marked his chest and back from a hit he'd taken in Afghanistan. 
He'd been lucky if getting shot was luck. The enemy had used an M16. The small high-velocity round had drilled through and exited out the other side, missing everything critical. A round from an AK in the same spot might have killed him. A purplish waterfall of scar tissue across his hip and buttock was the legacy of a roadside IED that took out his Humvee. He'd survived. Two of his Marines hadn't. Sometimes the dead men visited him at night. When that happened, he woke up tangled in sheets soaked with sweat. He ran an electric razor over his face, pulled on khaki-colored dockers, a light blue shirt and a sport jacket. His pistol stayed locked in the end table by his bed, where he'd left it before he'd gone to Turkey. Jenna wouldn't call this early unless something big had happened. He went into the kitchen, inserted a pot into the Keurig he'd picked up a couple of months before, and punched the button. When the coffee was done, he poured it into a travel cup and went into the garage. Inside the garage was a four-year-old silver Jeep and a black motorcycle. He tapped the opener on the wall and watched the door rise on the day. Outside, the sun was climbing over the horizon. It was May, still cool. The heat and humidity of summer on the East Coast hadn't descended yet. Thorne lived in Virginia, a concession to the job. He would have preferred living somewhere out west, but it wasn't an option. He got into the Jeep. Early in the morning like this, it was an easy commute. Twenty minutes after leaving his house, he passed through the outer security ring at the CIA complex and pulled into one of the parking lots. At the main entrance, he went through another security check and into the building housing the heart of U.S. intelligence. There were a lot of intelligence agencies in the Washington area, more than 20 of them, the number changing all the time. CIA was still the big dog on the block, but the other dogs never stopped nipping at Langley's heels. It made for a pressurized work environment, as if the continuous stream of threats coming in every day wasn't enough. Thorne took an elevator to the seventh floor, where Carlson had his office. The seventh floor of the old headquarters building was the inner sanctum of the CIA, the lair of the senior administrators of the agency. Every time he came up here, he thought that whatever else you might say about Langley, they knew how to do power. The man who had designed the seventh floor of the building had taken his cue from the country club rich in the middle of the last century. If the style had a name, it was probably Wasp Traditional. The walls were paneled in glowing dark wood. The carpet was soft and thick underfoot. The lighting subdued. Museum-style lights shone on portraits of past agency directors lining the walls. They all had the self-satisfied look of men who knew they wielded a lot of power. Their eyes watched him as he walked down the corridor. He paused outside of Carlson's door and settled his features into a neutral expression. Then he went in. Lewis Carlson was director of operations, one of Langley's big chiefs. He sat behind a large desk that formed a barrier between him and anyone else in the room. It was one of the ways he let subordinates know who was in charge, what he thought of the peons who worked under him. Jenna sat in a chair in front of the desk. Hi, Jenna, Thorne said. He nodded at Carlson. Lewis. Carlson was smart, ambitious, and ruthless, a combination that had brought him almost to the top of Langley's food chain. He wore his tailored suit and silk tie like armor. As usual, he looked as though he'd eaten something that didn't agree with him. The corners of Carlson's mouth were permanently turned down. His lips were purplish and swollen, a sign of the bad digestion that mirrored his disposition. Thorne had never liked him and didn't trust him. The feeling was mutual. They had a long history between them, going back to Thorne's first posting in Bucharest. The two men tolerated each other because they had to. Jenna had on a black business suit and a blouse of cream-colored silk. Her hair was ash blonde, feathered and cut short. She was pushing forty but looked younger. A pair of sapphire earrings picked up the color of her dark blue eyes. In the closed culture of the agency, the word was that she was frigid or a dyke. Thorne knew neither was true. She often acted as a buffer between him and Carlson. Carlson gave Thorne a sour look. Where the hell were you? You should have been here an hour ago. I didn't get the call until an hour ago. Next time, get here faster. You want to tell me what's up? What's up is Turkey. What you were supposed to be finding out for us. A coup. Go to the head of the class, Thorn. If you hadn't decided to rabbit, it, we wouldn't be caught with our pants down again. If I hadn't left when I did, I'd be sitting in a Turkish jail waiting for our good friends from TMI to pull out my fingernails. So you say, you weren't there, Lewis. Lewis, Jenna said, her voice soft. This isn't productive. 
We need to talk about how to take advantage of the situation. Carlson gave an exasperated sigh. Thorn, what do you know about Mustafa Sevim? General Sevim, is he the one who led the coup? Sevim has declared himself the new interim leader of Turkey, Jenna said. He's promised elections in the fall after things have settled down. Good luck with that, Thorn said. Sevim is hardcore, a secular nationalist. Politically, he's somewhere to the right of Julius Caesar. I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for elections. The fundamentalists hate him, but he's popular on the street. Can he keep the mullahs in line? Carlson asked. He'll go after them if they make trouble, but he has to be careful about it. Strict Islam has gained a solid foothold over there. Kirdar gave the Islamists a lot of support. We're better off without him, even with Savim taking over. Gursek Kirdar had been president of Turkey for five years. The previous president had mismanaged three years of crop failures and been overthrown in a coup. Kirdar had been no friend of the West. He'd pushed for stricter Islamic law and strengthened ties with Russia. He'd built up his military with Russian weapons, in spite of the fact that Turkey was still a member of NATO. There were many in Washington who didn't think Ankara could be trusted in the event of war with the Russian bear. Kirdar had forgotten that not everyone in Turkey thought strict Islamic law was a good idea, or that Moscow had the country's best interests at heart. He'd been a problem, one the White House had wished would go away. Now he was gone, swept away in yet another coup. It remained to be seen how that would turn out. What happened to Kurdar? Thorne asked. He got out before they could arrest him. At the moment he's in Qatar, Carlson said. He took enough of the Turkish treasury with him to ensure his welcome. What's your reading, Mike? Jenna asked. Sevim has seized power, but does he have enough support to keep it? Probably if he doesn't get assassinated. Most of the country will support him. The average guy in the street doesn't care if things are run by a dictator he only wants to get by. All you have to do is take a walk through Istanbul to get a feeling for how people want to live. Turkey isn't Saudi Arabia. A lot of Turks didn't like Kurdar's attempts to enforce Sharia. Maybe in the cities, Carlson said. What about the rest of the country? The rural areas are always more religious. If there's a challenge to Sevim, it will come from there. But he has a big advantage. What's that? He has the military behind him. Tanks are an effective way to silence opposition. Kurdar had tanks too. It doesn't help to have tanks if the people driving them point them in the wrong direction, Thorne said. Director Kramer wants to know what she's going to tell the president, Carlson said. Is Sevim a friend or an enemy? The White House is worried about the nukes at Inserlik. Despite Kirdar's flirtations with fundamentalist Islam and the Russian Federation, the U.S. still maintained a heavily guarded stockpile of nuclear weapons on Turkish soil. From what I've heard, he's an intelligent man. He'll turn Turkey into a right-wing military dictatorship with the trappings of democracy. He's not like Kirdar. He doesn't trust the Russians and he needs us to act as a buffer against them. He'll be our friend as long as he gets what he wants from us. If it's handled right, he'll be a better ally than Kirdar ever was. That wouldn't take much, Carlson said. What about the nukes? I don't think there's any threat to the nukes. Sevim needs quick recognition by the White House. He won't do anything to jeopardize that. He'll be a dictator, but he can't be worse than Kurdar. If that's the case, we'll make him our dictator, Carlson said. It wouldn't be the first time. There's going to be a problem with the Kurds, Thorne said. As soon as Sevim is certain he's got full control, he's going to go after them. It's personal for him. His son was killed during a terrorist attack by the PPK. It would be a popular move on the street and it would help consolidate his power. If he gets serious about crushing them, there could be consequences. We might have to get involved. Fortunately for all of us, that's way above your pay grade, Carlson said. You can let the president worry about that. I want a full report from you in writing by the end of the day. Everything that happened in Turkey. I want to know why you didn't complete your assignment. I told you why. The contact was a plant and TMI was waiting. It was a judgment call. You didn't complete your mission. Full report by the end of the day. Are we clear? Good. The meeting was over. Jenna and Thorne left together. As DDO, Jenna had a lot of clout. She raided an office down the hall from Carlson's. She paused outside her door. What an asshole, she said. Thorne laughed. Some things never change, he said. Chapter 3 The bright sun of a May morning in Moscow streamed through the kitchen window. Anya Volkova waited for her breakfast to pop out of the toaster. 
Her mother's querulous voice called out from the other room. Anya, what did you do with my glasses? Where did you put them? Anya sighed. Her mother always thought everything was Anya's fault. As if she'd deliberately hidden the glasses to annoy her. I didn't put them anywhere. Look on the table by your bed. You were reading last night. You must have moved them. I don't see them. Look again. The toaster kicked a piece out onto the floor. Anya picked it up and spread a little jam on it. She leaned over the kitchen sink and took a bite, careful not to let any crumbs fall on her freshly pressed uniform. If she didn't leave soon, she'd be late for work at the ministry. There was no time for a proper breakfast. She'd get something at the canteen later. Her mother shuffled into the kitchen. She had been a beauty in her youth, but time and circumstance had taken it from her. The Soviet years had not been kind to Russia's women. Yulia Volkova's fondest memory was of being taken to a May Day celebration in Red Square when she was five. Leonid Brezhnev had been in the reviewing stand, surrounded by unsmiling men in uniforms and dark overcoats. She'd watched in awe as the missiles and tanks rolled by. Yulia never tired of telling Anya about the greatness of the Soviet era. Her husband would have agreed with her if he were still alive. Soviet greatness was one of the few things they had ever agreed on. Where's my breakfast? I don't have time to fix your breakfast, mother. There's bread and eggs. You'll have to make something for yourself. If your father were here, he would have made sure you had something ready. If my father were here, he would probably be too drunk to care. Anya, don't talk about him like that. I have to go. A wheedling tone entered her mother's voice. I need you to take me shopping. Mother, it's Friday. I have to work today. You know I can't take you shopping until tomorrow. You'll have to wait. Your tea is on the table. Yulia sat down heavily and picked up the cup in both hands. She sipped and made a face. Too hot. Anya finished her toast, brushed crumbs from her fingers. She looked at her mother, grown old and unhappy, and felt a sudden wave of sympathy. Life hadn't been easy for Yulia Volkova. I'll bring you a nice dessert from the canteen. If Mikhail was here, he would take me shopping. Her mother never missed a chance to remind Anya of her failings. Bringing up her younger brother was like a slap in the face. Mikhail was never going to take Yulia anywhere. At the sound of his name, Anya felt the old familiar sadness. Mikhail had joined the army to gain the admiration of his sister and older brother, Grigori. Eight months later, he was dead, killed in a meaningless training accident caused by the incompetence of his commander. The wound festered in Anya's soul. It would have helped if she could talk about her little brother with someone other than her mother and Grigori, but there wasn't anyone. No one close to hold her when the dark clouds gathered. No one to tell her things would be all right. Choosing a military career had made it difficult to find the right someone. Most of the men she had met were interested in sex, not relationship. The last man she'd allowed into her life had been incapable of seeing her as anything but an extension of himself. That had been a few years back. Since then, there'd been no one. Anya had almost become resigned to the idea that there might never be someone. That didn't keep her from hoping things would change. Goodbye, mother. I'll be back at six. There's soup in the refrigerator for your lunch. She paused in the hall to check her uniform and pushed a wisp of dark brown hair under the high-peaked officer's cap on her head. Dark marks under her eyes emphasized their brilliant green color. Long days at work had a way of taking their toll. Remember to... Anya stepped into the hall outside the apartment and pulled the door shut after her, cutting off her mother's words. Their relationship had never been easy. Sometimes it was all Anya could do to keep from shouting at her. After Mikhail died, it had gotten worse. Anya and Yulia lived inside the ring on Moskova Street, one of the better streets in Moscow's Basmani district. She'd lived there most of her life. The large apartment had belonged to her father, a perk of his high rank within the SVR, the successor to the old Committee for State Security, the KGB. His father had been a colonel in the KGB before him. She'd never known her grandfather, who had served in the NKVD under Stalin and Beria. If he was anything like her father, she hadn't missed out on anything. In the complicated relationships of power that affected everything in Russia, Anya's family history made her part of the privileged elite. She'd broken with the family tradition of serving in the security services, wanting nothing to do with spying on people who might turn out to be friends and neighbors, but she was patriotic. She'd wanted to serve her country. It was why she'd joined the military. Her background meant she was watched. 
After she'd graduated from officer training and her competence became obvious, she was fast-tracked for promotion. By the time she was 30, Anya had reached the rank of major. She was trusted. As she rose through the ranks, she demonstrated superior organizational skills. Two years before, she'd been promoted to lieutenant colonel and assigned to her current position in the Ministry of Defense. Anya worked in combat services support, supervising a unit of 500 people. CSS was responsible for maintaining the combat readiness of Federation forces. It was a grueling job, requiring high security clearance and periodic vetting by the GRU, military intelligence. The apartment wasn't far from the metro stop at Krasnia Vorota. Anya walked down the street enjoying the sunshine. She passed a bulbous egg-shaped house of red brick that was one of Moscow's tourist attractions. The house was on the market for an outrageous sum, millions of rubles. As she walked by, she wondered why anyone would pay that kind of money for an old building that was sure to have all sorts of problems. Who'd want to live in a place like that? Every time you looked out the window, you'd see strangers peering at you taking pictures. She took the steps down into the metro, through the turnstile, and down a long escalator. A train pulled in as she stepped onto the platform. Metro service in Moscow was fast and efficient. Nineteen minutes later, she got off and changed trains. The next stop was Arbatskaya Square, where the Ministry of Defense was located. MOD headquarters was built from blocks of light-colored stone. A black iron fence decorated with stars and topped with gold-painted points ran around the perimeter. Tiny areas of grass inside the fence did nothing to soften the hard bureaucratic look of the massive building. She went in through the main entrance, showed her ID to the guards at the security station, and took an elevator to the fourth floor. The doors opened onto an enclosed area. A man in uniform with a holstered pistol on his belt sat at a desk facing the elevator. Behind him was a closed door. He started to get to his feet. Anya waved him down. At ease, Senior Sergeant. Good morning. Good morning, Colonel. Senior Sergeant Yevgeny Popov was there to make sure no one without proper authorization got through the door in the wall behind him. He'd been wounded in Chechnya and ended up behind this desk. The army was a difficult place for women. A charged environment of sexual harassment and frequent sabotage by their male counterparts. At first, Popov hadn't liked the idea of having a woman for a commander. Then the bureaucracy had threatened to cut his pension benefits and Anya had intervened on his behalf. As far as Senior Sergeant Popov was concerned, she could do no wrong. It's a beautiful day out there, Colonel. I think spring is finally here, Anya said. No one who wasn't Russian could understand what those words meant to someone who lived in Moscow. The mind-numbing cold of the Russian winter had gone, and the oppressive heat of summer had not yet arrived. Popov pressed a button under his desk and the door behind him clicked open. Anya went through. Rows of painted columns marched down the length of the room, supporting the floors above. The huge space was filled with a sea of cubicles and computers. Her office was at one end of the room, raised above floor level, with a large glass window that allowed her to look out over the mix of civilian and military workers. Anya's domain. From time to time she wondered what life would be like if she'd chosen another occupation. But those were only passing fancies. She was working for her country. The pay wasn't good, but her rank brought privileges unavailable to most of the civilian population. Even so, sometimes she wished she'd landed in a different job, something less boring. Later she would remember that thought. Chapter 4 The official office of the President of the Russian Federation was located under the green dome of the Senate building, within the ancient brick walls of the Kremlin. Flowers had started to bloom in the Kremlin garden outside the President's office windows but it was doubtful if Ivan Tarasov had noticed. Tarasov sat behind a desk that had been used by Joseph Stalin. It was no accident that he had chosen that particular piece of furniture. There were only three men Tarasov admired. The first was his namesake, Ivan the Terrible, the man responsible for uniting warring feudal territories into what eventually became Russia. The second was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin. Joseph Stalin was the third. Tarasov was 69 years old, a product of the Soviet educational system and a true believer in Russia's destiny to rule the world. It had been instilled in him that America was Russia's enemy. By itself, that might have been enough to fuel the hatred that smoldered inside him. 
What had set it in stone was an American missile that scattered bits of his father over a hundred square meters of Afghanistan. His climb to power had started many years before. Promotion in the USSR depended on establishing a relationship with a patron, someone who could protect you within the ruthless world of Soviet bureaucracy. Tarasov's patron had been Yevgeny Kutsov, a member of the Politburo, the ruling committee of the Soviet Union. Kutsov had appointed him to the Central Control Commission, the feared arbiter of communist orthodoxy. The CCC had the power to expel anyone from the Communist Party, a kiss of death in the rigidly controlled society. A place on the commission opened the door to power on a national level. Tarasov had been a rising star, his future assured. Then came the collapse and the Soviet Empire was no more. Russia was reduced to a second-rate nation, and Tarasov was out of a job. That was when he'd met Boris Kerensky, the man now sitting across from him. Kerensky had been a mere captain then, in a military gutted by corruption and mismanagement from above. Like Tarasov, Kerensky was angry about what he saw as the betrayal of the motherland. He knew other young officers who felt as he did. A group of men formed around Kerensky and Tarasov. They had called themselves True October, in honor of the 1917 revolution. It had taken many years, but True October was now in control. Kerensky and Tarasov were bound together by the common goal of restoring Russia's place as a world power to be feared. As far as it went, they were friends, but that didn't mean they trusted one another. Trust was never easily given in Russia. Once given, it could be withdrawn without warning. Within the ruling circles of power, the new Russia was not much different from the old. Kerensky was now chief of the general staff, the most powerful position in the military. His broad shoulders and barrel chest strained the earth-green tunic of his uniform. His troops called him the Bear. It was said he'd once crushed a man to death with his bare arms during hand-to-hand -hand combat. No one ruled in Russia without the backing of the military. Tarasov sat behind the presidential desk because Kerensky had helped put him there. Kerensky had just finished briefing him on events in Turkey. Tarasov pursed his lips in frustration. That idiot Kirdar. I warned him about the subversive elements in his military. It took us years to undermine Turkey's relationship with NATO. There are billions of dollars of weapons sitting on the docks at Sevastopol ready to be shipped, with nowhere to send them. Seven will lick the boots of the Americans you watch. I agree, Mr. President. Sevim is a problem. Give me your ideas, Boris. The general staff met this morning to discuss the Turkish situation. We are of one mind that Sevim must do something to win the full support of his people. It's well known that he hates the Kurds. He views them as a subversive element. Most of the Turkish public agrees with him. Our opinion is that he will attack the Kurdish autonomous region in Syria to buy himself time and favor. Again. The Turks never learn, do they? How many times have we seen this scenario play out? It always ends the same way. A few noses get bloodied, national honor is upheld, and then they scurry back over their border. Nothing much changes. Of course you are right, Ivan Ivanovich. However, we think this time it is different. We believe Savim will go all out to destroy them. It's a logical move. Go on. If he can destroy their forces, he eliminates hope for a Kurdish homeland and extends Turkey's influence in the region. The Syrians can't do anything about it. They're not equipped to take on the Turkish army and they hate the Kurds as much as he does. An invasion will destabilize the region. We believe it provides an opportunity. How, General? The area of Syria controlled by the Kurds has significant oil fields and critical distribution pipelines. Sevim will create chaos. He wants to punish the Kurds, but he has no interest in remaining in Syria. He needs his military at home if he wants to stay in power. He couldn't take and keep the oil even if he wanted to. And the opportunity you mentioned. The Syrian regime knows it cannot survive without us. Once Savim invades the fields, I propose that we offer to assist President Al-Khali in recovering his territory. Of course, it would be necessary to build up our forces in the region to accomplish that. When Tarasov smiled, his lips curled upward at the corners. Foreign journalists sometimes compared his smile to that of a wolf, a comparison that pleased him. Russian journalists were more circumspect. Behind the smile were sharp teeth. I see, Tarasov said. Sevim would not be able to keep control, but we could. Yes, Mr. President, we could. Once the Kurdish defense forces are fully engaged with the Turks, we move in. To liberate the oil fields from Kurdish occupation. Exactly. And once we are in. Once in, we stay. 
protecting the oil for our gallant ally, President Kaleem Al-Khali. There are Americans there keeping an eye on the oil. The so-called advisors helping the Kurds. What about them? The American contingent is small. It poses no significant threat. You've met their new president. What do you think of him? How tough is he? I was not impressed. He's a creature of his political party. He has no experience in foreign affairs. Their election was divisive, and he's dealing with a lot of opposition at home. He doesn't like us, but I don't think he has the balls to stand up to us. In your opinion, what will he do if we increase our presence there? The Americans are sick of military adventures in the Middle East. I don't think he'll risk political capital for the Kurds. He'll bluster and threaten, but I believe he'll withdraw his troops rather than risk a confrontation. That is what I hoped you would say, Mr. President. Of course, we'll have to make sure Al-Khali is happy. He'll need a bone or two. That won't be a problem. He's enamored of our military technology. We could give him some of those missiles we had marked for Turkey, perhaps some frontline planes and training for his pilots. I believe that would satisfy him. He likes expensive toys. Assuming you're correct in your analysis, when do you think Seven will invade? Soon. He needs to get the public behind him. The Kurds have been causing trouble in Turkey for a long time. Nobody likes them. Using them as a scapegoat is a perfect way to stoke nationalism and divert attention while he goes after internal enemies. There's a bonus for you as well. Yes? The election is coming up. Taking control of the oil fields will boost your popularity. Tarasov's re-election was guaranteed, but genuine enthusiasm for him at the polls would make the process seem more legitimate in the eyes of the world. Optics and perception were everything. Russian politics was not much different from politics in the West. In the Western press, Russia was portrayed as a second-rate country, hiding behind the glitter of Moscow and an aging nuclear deterrent. President Tarasov as an unruly child. The reality was far different. Tarasov was highly intelligent and a dangerous enemy, deft at manipulating world opinion. He still allowed the obsolete aircraft carrier Kuznetsov to steam around the world, showing the flag and belching smoke, a rusting relic of former Russian power. The world laughed whenever Kuznetsov appeared. Like a master magician, Tarasov used the ship to distract attention from what was really happening. The era of the big aircraft carriers was over even if the Americans hadn't yet admitted it. In a world of hypersonic cruise missiles and space lasers, the aircraft carrier was an easy target. While the world was busy making jokes and watching the Kuznetsov, Tarasov had quietly built up a large fleet of first-class nuclear submarines. He'd modernized the Navy, the missile and ground forces, and the Air Force. The Federation's military was well-equipped and highly capable, with a professional officer cadre as good as anyone's. In the event of war, the West would discover that Russia could not be defeated by anything short of a full nuclear exchange. Seizing control of the Syrian oil fields and pushing the Americans out would be wildly popular. It would be seen as thumbing a collective nose at the West, a broad step toward reclaiming Russia's influence and power. I like your thinking, Boris. When do you want to proceed? Right away with an initial insertion of troops. It's going to take time to build up sufficient strength. What units do you want to deploy? I want to begin with the 22nd Special Purpose Brigade, Spetsnaz. It's best not to underestimate Kurdish resistance, Mr. President. The 22nd is the best choice if we run into problems later on, when we advance into the fields. I know their commander well. Colonel Novikov is a loyal and efficient officer. Also, the logistics are good. The brigade is based out of Rostov, close to Syria. There shouldn't be any problem with clearance from our Iranian friends for overflights. One brigade? The Kurds don't have much in the way of armor, but they claim a hundred thousand men in their Syrian defense force. Even the 22nd might have trouble with that many. I want to back them up with the 12th Motorized Rifle Brigade. Plus, they will have a full complement of logistical and engineering personnel. One of the first tasks will be to construct a base and airfield close to Kurdish-controlled territory. That will allow us to supply our forces and provide air cover when the time comes. The Kurds are no match for that much armor and personnel. General Chernov will be in overall command. Have you thought of a name for this operation? How does Operation Eagle sound to you? The wolfish smile reappeared. The double-headed eagle was an ancient symbol of Russian power. Good. Issue the orders. I'll speak with Alkali and let him know we're sending more supplies and troops to support him. He's not going to like it once he realizes what we intend to do. 
It doesn't matter whether he likes it or not. By the time he finds out, it will be too late for him to do anything. We'll make sure to sweeten the pot if he balks. Besides, he doesn't have a choice. The Americans will, as they say, shit a brick. Let them. They had their opportunity in Syria and failed to take advantage of it. Their political animosities work to our advantage. While they're busy tearing themselves apart, we'll continue to expand our influence. They need to learn once and for all that we can't be pushed aside. We're not the beggars they want us to be. They'll never understand us, General Kerensky said. No, Tarasov said, they won't, and that will be their undoing. Chapter 5 Lunch in the ministry canteen was forgettable. Anya bought a chocolate pudding to take home to her mother. She'd been back at her desk for an hour, studying recent production figures for the Sukhoi Su-57, still the Federation's premier frontline fighter. There were issues that needed to be addressed at the komsomolsk Amor plant, where the aircraft was manufactured. Her phone signaled a call on one of the internal lines. Lieutenant Colonel Volkova speaking. Colonel, this is Major Petrov. General Stepanov wants to see you in his office. Stepanov was the first deputy minister of defense, in charge of combat support services. Petrov was his aide. Now? Yes, Colonel, immediately. I'm on my way. What does he want? I'd better watch my step. Anya could count on one hand the number of times she had been in Stepanov's presence. She'd never been summoned to his office. There were eleven deputy ministers in the Ministry of Defense each responsible for some specific facet of Federation forces. The role of the military in Russia was fundamentally different from the way it was in the West, where military commanders were subordinate to civilian leadership. In Russia, the lines were blurred. Military and civilian authority were inextricably mixed. Nothing was done without consideration of the military. As the man responsible for combat readiness, First Deputy Minister General Yuri Stepanov was one of the most powerful men in Russia. He was part of a core group of senior officers led by the Chief of Staff, General Kerensky. Anya had plenty of experience dealing with powerful men, starting with her father. She'd learned early on to keep her mouth shut, pay attention, and follow orders. She joined the army to get away from her father, not realizing she'd still have to keep her mouth shut and follow orders. That had been years ago. At least now she was in a position where she gave some of those orders. Stepanov's office was on the top floor. Major Petrov was waiting to escort her to Stepanov's office when she stepped from the elevator. Petrov had fair hair, blue eyes, high cheekbones, and an arrogant expression. His round face reminded Anya of a sour apple. Anya felt his eyes crawl over her body. She met his stare. Yes, Major. You wish to say something? The look in Petrov's eyes faded. Cold bitch. This way, Colonel. She followed him to a tall set of wooden doors. A desk to the side was unoccupied. She assumed it was Petrov's. He knocked. A deep voice boomed from within. Come. Petrov opened the door. Lieutenant Colonel Volkova is here, sir. Send her in. Petrov stood to the side and indicated she should enter. She went in. The door closed behind her. Stepanov sat behind a polished wooden desk. He was a heavyset man with a broad face. Dark hair receded on either side of his forehead, leaving a widow's peak. The shoulder boards on his crisp uniform bore the large gold star of a full general in the army. Rows of ribbons decorated his chest. He was studying a document. She came to attention in front of the desk. A thick manila folder lay in front of him. She saw her name on it. There were files on every Russian. For someone like her, there were extensive background checks, countless invasions of her privacy. It was one of the things she resented about life in Russia. The fat file on his desk probably contained every detail of her life. Lieutenant Colonel Volkova reporting, sir. Stepanov looked up. At ease, Volkova, take a seat. I'll be with you in a moment. Sir. A chair with carved arms and a brown leather seat was placed to one side of the desk. Anya sat down at attention, her back straight. Stepanov scribbled something on the paper he was reading, capped his pen and set it down. He turned toward Anya and studied her for a long moment. His eyes were dark, flat, unreadable, as if he'd pulled an inner shield over them. Her father had used the same technique. She was damned if she was going to let herself be intimidated, but it wasn't easy. Stepanov radiated a powerful presence. He tapped the folder on his desk with her name on it. I've been reviewing your record, Colonel. It's exemplary. Your unit has consistently met or exceeded the goals required of you. 
That is a reflection of your organizational skills and leadership. Thank you, sir. You come from a family with a history of service to the Rodina. Tell me, Colonel, why didn't you enter the security services like your father and the men in your family before him? The question caught her off guard. What was he getting at? She decided to tell the truth, at least part of it. Stepanov didn't need to know how much she'd hated her drunken father and the thugs he called friends. To be frank, sir, I did not feel comfortable with that kind of work. I felt I could be more useful serving in the army. You have a judgment on the work of the security services. Careful. It is necessary work for our country, Anya said. The security services are a bulwark against our enemies. You would agree that we have many enemies? Yes, sir. If I didn't think so, I wouldn't be wearing this uniform. He nodded to himself. Her answer seemed to satisfy him. I have an important assignment for you. You are to maintain the strictest security for this. Understood? Yes, sir. Stepanov opened a drawer and took out a blue folder. It was marked State Secret in bold letters. Few documents earned the Federation's highest security rating. He slid it over to her. She took it and held it in her lap. As of today, your security clearance is increased. Your orders are to make certain everything is prepared for the success of the operation outlined in this folder. You are to give this your full attention. The requirements of this mission supersede all others. If anyone argues with you about priorities, refer them to me. You may only tell the people working for you what they need to know to complete their assigned tasks. Is that clear? Very clear, sir. Begin immediately. I want regular updates from you. Give them to Major Petrov. Sir. That's all, Colonel. Dismissed. Sir. She stood, saluted, pivoted on her heel and left the room. Stepanov watched her walk away. A beautiful woman. She's unattached. I think I will do something about that. Outside the office, Petrov was at his desk. His face closed down as she passed. Back in her office, Anya shut the door and drew the blinds over her window, a signal she was not to be disturbed. She sat down and placed the blue folder on her desk. State secret. She had never been given a document marked with that classification. Whatever it was, it meant trouble. And what was that all about? That conversation with Stepanov. If you could call it a conversation. She'd been careful not to tell Stepanov what she really thought about the SVR, the successor to the KGB. What she'd said about the security services being necessary was true, in the sense that someone had to do the dirty work of counterintelligence and rooting out spies and enemies. She loved her country, in spite of the fact that it had come to resemble the USSR her mother so fondly remembered. A country of increasing surveillance, where you had to be careful about what you said in public. Stepanov had been probing her, assessing her loyalty, her commitment, bringing up her family history, reminding her of her father. The breakup of the Soviet Union had turned Colonel Arkady Volkov into a bitter and angry man. In the end, his anger had killed him. Anya had it been ten years old when he died. The memory came unbidden. It was August. The apartment was stifling hot even with all the windows open. Her brother Grigori sat next to her at the dinner table pushing his food around on his plate. Mikhail was in his high chair next to Yulia. She was feeding a mashed vegetable to him, something with a sickly orange color. That color had always stuck in her mind. Her father sat at the head of the table in his chair. Anya wasn't allowed to sit in his chair. Nobody was except her father. She was careful not to look at him. She could tell he was angry about something. When father was angry, he might hurt her or her mother or Grigori. She kept her eyes on her plate. Those traitors, he said. Do you know what they have done? Do you? Anya watched the spoon with the orange food paws in her mother's hand. No, Arkady, who are you talking about? Those bastard priests, that's who. Traitors, all of them. Anya glanced at her father. His face was red. The water glass by his plate was filled with vodka. He picked it up and drank half of it. What have they done? Her mother said, her voice submissive. I'll tell you what they've done. He slammed the table. The dishes rattled. Mikhail began to cry. Her father's voice was loud. They've made saints out of the fucking czar and his family. Exploiters, murderers made into saints. Those bastard priests should be pulled out of their fucking churches and shot. If we still had a real government. He looked over at Mikhail. Stop his screaming or I will. He's only a baby. Her father stood, his features ugly with anger. Yulia got up, shielding Mikhail with her body. Mikhail screamed louder. If you won't do it, I will. You leave him alone, Anya said. He turned toward her, dark and terrible. 
Ah, the mouse squeaks. Anya wanted to run, but her feet were frozen to the ground. Her father pulled the heavy belt from his pants and took a step toward her. Arkady, no, Yulia said. I'll teach you not to squeak, little mouse. You. Suddenly he stumbled. His face turned a deep purple. He began wheezing horrible choking sounds trying to draw breath. He dropped the belt and grasped at the back of his chair. Then he toppled to the floor. Anya felt like she was standing outside of herself, looking at the man on the floor as if he were a stranger. Arkady Volkov's eyes rolled back and he died. For years, Anya had thought it was her fault that her father died. She pushed the memory back into the dark place where it lived and opened the blue folder. Operation Eagle, Phase 1. She began reading and caught her breath. The 22nd Special Forces Brigade and the 12th Motorized Rifle Brigade were being deployed to Syria, along with the 14th Engineers Battalion. The 22nd was her brother's unit, Grigori. Stepanov had put her in charge of the complicated logistics of the operation, including the construction of a base and airstrip inside Syria. She was ordered to monitor and ensure ongoing supplies for 9,000 combat forces and all their equipment, plus the engineers. A large amount of ammunition and fuel was required. The brigades were to be equipped with the latest advances in anti-aircraft missile technology. A timetable of three months was given to accomplish completion of designated Phase 1. It was a massive task. If anything went wrong, she would be blamed. As she read through the material in the folder, she realized Stepanov had given her an assignment usually reserved for someone of flag rank. She was being tested. How she handled it would make or break her career. Success would bring promotion. Anya had no doubt that if something went wrong, her career was finished. A headache began probing the space behind her left eye. The information in the folder said nothing about objectives. The goal of Phase 1 was to get the designated units to Syria, establish a base of operations, and stockpile supplies. Whatever Phase 2 might be, Anya had no need to know. But she could speculate. There wasn't any regulation against that. Everyone knew about Grigori's unit, the 22nd Brigade. The 22nd was one of the Federation's premier special forces units. It was famous for its counterterrorism skills, but Eagle didn't look like a new counterterrorism operation. Support by the motorized rifles, the excessive ammunition requirements, and the addition of sophisticated missile technology meant someone on the general staff anticipated serious combat. Moscow had been backing Syrian President Kalim al-Khali for years. The regime in Damascus was a corrupt, cruel dictatorship. Al-Khali remained in power because Moscow supported him. Without Russian help, he would have been defeated long ago by the rebel and Sunni forces arrayed against him. Even with Russian aid and decades of intermittent warfare, he still only ruled part of the country. The Kurds controlled everything to the east of the Euphrates, a region rich in oil. The proposed base was located near Deir Ezzor, on the edge of Kurdish-controlled territory. They must be going after the oil. That means they'll have to fight the Kurds. That explains the ammunition requirements. Grigori is going into combat. A shot of adrenaline pumped through her body. Anya had no problem with the idea that Grigori might be called to defend the motherland. It was the duty of any soldier, but the Kurds hadn't attacked Russia. Part of Anya's job was to know how much oil was produced inside the Federation, and how much was in reserve. Russia didn't need Syria's oil. The Federation could sell as much as it wanted, and still have more than enough for domestic and military needs. Stepanov had made her responsible for ensuring the success of an operation designed to start a war against people who were not Russia's enemy. This isn't right. Lately, she had found herself wondering why her government acted the way it did. Anya had chosen the military as a career because she'd been idealistic and young. Her youth was gone and her idealism had been sorely tested over the years, but she still believed Russia could be a force for good in the world the kind of Russia that had defeated fascist Germany in the Great Patriotic War. It wasn't Stalin who had defeated Germany. It was the Russian people who had sacrificed themselves by the millions to crush the Nazi aberration and protect the motherland. Her people. Anya wasn't naive. She knew Operation Eagle wasn't only about oil. It was a move to assert Russian power in the Middle East. The Kurds were in the way. They weren't an enemy but that didn't mean they wouldn't do their best to kill anyone who came against them, including her brother. Chapter 6 Colonel Konstantin Novikov watched elements of the 22nd Special Purpose Brigade, 
and the 14th engineers board the Antonov N-124 that would take them to Khmeimim Air Base in Syria. This flight consisted mostly of engineering, signals, and logistics units. So far, everything was going well. From Khmeimim, the units would head overland to Deir ez-Zor and establish a base for the operation. The first order of business was building an airstrip. The gigantic hold of the Antonov had plenty of room for the bulldozers and other construction equipment needed. After the strip was ready, supplies and men would be flown in directly. Novikov had more than 4,000 troops under his command. It was only a question of time before the presence of the 22nd was discovered by Western intelligence. American satellites and spies on the ground made that inevitable. To delay discovery as long as possible, the brigade would be transferred in increments over the next few weeks. The area had been an extensive war zone for more than a decade. The Federation already had a contingent of regular army and country. The additional troops would be justified as part of an ongoing counterterrorism mission. As he watched his men board the plane, a proverb came to mind. Russians had a proverb for almost every situation. The wolf can be hired as a shepherd very cheap. Novikov was an accomplished, experienced officer, the epitome of a professional warrior. After 30 years in uniform, he was nearing the end of his career. He'd been fighting Russia's enemies for a long time. He'd seen hard combat in hard places, and it showed. He never smiled. His eyes were dark and brooding, under slanting lids that spoke of a time when his ancestors rode with Genghis Khan, like special forces units all over the world. Spetsnaz brigades were a breed apart from regular units. The boundary between officer and enlisted was sometimes blurred. There were no conscripts in his brigade, no one who wasn't a committed and combat-proven professional. No officer could command such men unless he'd proven himself worthy of the job. It took more than competence in the field, although that was fundamental. For the best units, a bond was established that had nothing to do with rank. It was an alpha male world, and a rough one. Novikov believed in leading from the front. He could drink any man in his unit under the table. He could outmarch them and outfight most of them. He respected his men and they returned that respect. The brigade was his life. The 22nd Brigade was one of the most decorated units in the Federation. Novikov had shaped it, and he was proud of it. Eagle would likely be his last assignment, a final engagement against a determined enemy. The order to deploy into Syria and prepare for action against the Kurds was a welcome relief from the training routines and peacetime boredom of Rostov. He was looking forward to it. The Kurds were skilled fighters, experienced after years battling a variety of enemies set on destroying them. They were reasonably well armed, courtesy of the Americans, and had additional heavy weaponry they'd captured in battle. Novikov expected fierce resistance. There was no question who would win, of course. Novikov's troops were superb and far better equipped. As good as they were, the Kurds could not hope to defeat the Russians. Still, they would provide needed combat experience for his men. Novikov's executive officer, Major Nikolai Gorky, walked up and saluted. Ready for departure, sir. Novikov returned his salute. Very well, Major. I'll be following in three weeks with two of the special detachments. You have your orders. Yes, sir. We'll be ready for you. There's been an increase in terrorist activity in the area, Novikov said. Watch your ass, Nikolai. Keep your eyes open. Always, sir. Carry on. Sir. Gorky clicked his heels, saluted and jogged over to the plane. A moment later, the loading ramp lifted and closed. The four big engines on the huge plane spooled up and it began to move. Five minutes later, it rose into the air, headed for Syria. Operation Eagle had begun. Chapter 7 President Richard Campbell had arrived at the White House by way of the governor's mansion in South Dakota. He'd been in office for a little less than four months. His great-great-grandfather had helped settle the state back when it was still a territory. Campbell was South Dakota born and bred, growing up near the Black Hills on the sprawling family ranch. He was tall and lean, lanky and loose-jointed. Old people made folksy jokes about him being a tall drink of water, and said he looked a lot like the actor Jimmy Stewart. He'd used his height to advantage, playing Division I basketball for the South Dakota State Jackrabbits well enough to draw the attention of the pro scouts. Campbell loved playing ball, but he'd turned the scouts down. He knew enough about his ability to realize he wasn't quite fast enough for professional play. He'd married a local girl a week after graduation. 
It was one of those Hollywood stories that played well with the public later on. The guy who married his childhood sweetheart. By the time he'd gotten a master's degree in business administration, Amy had given him two children, a boy and a girl, and a... Campbell had left the family ranch in the hands of his older brother and started a service firm catering to the needs of the regional medical centers bracketing the state. Along the way, he'd become friends with a surgeon who had an idea for a new device useful in open-heart surgery. Campbell backed him. They'd patented, built, and tested the device. It was now used in every operating theater in the country. All that money had come in useful later on, when he got into politics. The honeymoon period of his presidency was over. The sharks had begun to circle, looking for vulnerabilities. At this point, he was still an unknown quantity. The Washington establishment saw him as an outsider, ripe for manipulation. Outside the bulletproof windows of the Oval Office, it was the kind of day that made you want to lay back and take it easy. No one in the room was in a mood to relax. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Bradford Bull Kroger, sat on one of two couches placed in front of the resolute desk and wondered what the man in the big chair was going to do with his first international crisis. Kroger still didn't have the measure of Campbell. How he dealt with what was happening in Turkey would fill in some of the gaps. Rebecca Kramer, director of the Central Intelligence Agency, sat next to Kroger on the couch. She was a blade of a woman, the contours of her face hard and sharp. Everything about her said serious. She wore a severe gray business suit and steel-rimmed glasses. Her only jewelry was a pair of discreet golden pearl earrings. There was no wedding ring on her finger. Harold Kaplan sat across from General Kroger and Kramer the point of one polished wingtip moving nervously in the air. Kaplan was Campbell's senior advisor for strategic planning and policy. He was a small man with an unfortunate face that looked crunched in on itself. Behind his back, the White House staff called him the Terrier, a comment both on his looks and on his relentless dedication to advising and protecting the president. Like an ill-behaved dog, he had a tendency to bite if things didn't go his way. Kramer had just finished briefing the president. Langley had confirmed that General Sevim was positioning troops and equipment along the Turkish border with Syria in preparation for a full-scale invasion into Kurdish-controlled territory. In addition, the Russian Federation was building up forces in the region. The analysts at Langley were concerned. When the analysts were concerned, so was Rebecca Kramer. So far, the Russians hadn't made any hostile moves. They'd stayed away from the American base in Kurdish-controlled territory, but everyone in the room knew that could change at any moment. Director Kramer, you're certain about the identification of the Russian units? Rebecca Kramer had an IQ of 158. 56 years old, she had spent almost all of her adult life within the agency. Campbell's appointment of an agency insider and a woman as director of the CIA had come as a shock to the intelligence community breaking a long string of male civilian and military appointees from outside Langley's incestuous circle. It had been a shrewd move by Campbell, though many had criticized his choice. Promoting from within was a gamble to gain some measure of loyalty to a new president. In the cutthroat world of Washington politics, getting the CIA in your camp was a significant coup. It was debatable whether or not Langley's fidelity would last, or even if it had been given. I'm certain, Mr. President, Kramer said. The 22nd Special Purposes Brigade and the 12th Motorized Infantry, along with an engineering battalion, the 14th. Our satellites can easily pick out the identifying insignia. We also have human confirmation. She saw the question in Campbell's eyes. Human intelligence, Mr. President. Information from observers on the ground. Moscow is calling it a counter-terrorist operation. They're lying. It is certainly more than that. The 22nd is one of their best Spetsnaz outfits, hardcore. The satellites show the Russians are in the process of transferring the whole brigade, more than 4,000 men. The addition of the 12th will add another 5,000 men when it's up to strength. Plus, there's that battalion of engineers. They've established a base, they're building an airstrip, and they're bringing more supplies in every day. You don't do something like that unless you're going to war. Spetsnaz, what's that? Campbell asked. Spetsnaz is what they call their special forces, sir. They are some of the best soldiers in the world, like our Delta Force. General Kroger, you heard what Director Kramer said. What do you think Tarasov is doing? I don't like it, Mr. President. Putting the 22nd down in Syria is disturbing, but it's deploying the motorized brigade that really worries me. The brigade is heavily armed. 
It adds significant assault strength and firepower. You only bring in that kind of support when you want serious offensive capability. It's much more than you'd need to go after a few terrorists. Not to mention the fact that they've built a full operations base in a matter of weeks complete with airstrip. When that is complete, it can handle those big Antonovs. I strongly recommend beefing up our presence there. At the moment, the Russians have us at a severe disadvantage. Campbell looked at Kaplan. Harold, sending American troops to Syria will not go down well with the public, Kaplan said. Our current polling data shows 76% of the public is in favor of bringing back all of our people in the Middle East. Sending more would be politically unwise. Letting the Russians take over Syria would be politically unwise, Kroger said. Mr. President, our analysis is in line with what General Kroger recommends, Kramer said. I don't think it's an accident that Tarasov has increased his capabilities in the region at the same time Sevim is planning to attack the Kurds. What's his objective? We think Tarasov has his eye on the oil fields in the Kurdish Autonomous Region. You think he's after the oil? They've already got plenty. Naive, Kroger thought. He's got a lot to learn. Sir, it's not about how much they have, Kroger said. It's about denying control of the fields to us. Right now, we and the Kurds determine what happens to that oil. Those fields are a large part of Syria's total reserves. The Kurds have prevented Damascus from taking control of them, with our help. I believe Director Kramer is right. Tarasov is getting ready to make a move on the fields. All the more reason for us to upgrade our capabilities. Congress will resist sending in more troops and equipment, Kaplan said. Congress resists anything that might cause them problems when it's time to be re-elected, Kroger said. Letting Tarasov take control of that oil would be a huge strategic mistake. We'd lose Syria for good. Mr. President, it's possible Tarasov is testing your resolve, Kramer said. You're unknown at this point, new in the job. He has elections coming up and he needs a public success. The Russians suffer from a collective inferiority complex. If he makes you look bad, it will help his re-election. General Kroger's opinion of Kramer went up a notch. She just made it personal. She's good at this. I met Tarasov briefly in Paris, Campbell said. He strikes me as an arrogant man. I don't trust him and I don't like him. Kaplan spoke up. Mr. President, perhaps it would be best to wait and see if the Russians really are going after the oil before you consider sending in more forces. An increase in our military presence at this time could be seen as a provocation. If we wait until they go into the fields, it will be too late to do anything about it, Kroger said. You'd risk a confrontation with Moscow over this? Kaplan asked. There won't be a confrontation if we're wrong about their intentions. But if they're planning to grab that oil, we have to be ready to stop them. Campbell watched the exchange, held up his hand. All right, I've heard enough. Harold, I agree we need more hard evidence the Russians are going to make trouble before we do anything that could be viewed as provocative. At the same time, General Kroger has a point. We can't let them do whatever they want. General, prepare a military option in response if Tarasov makes a move on those fields. I want something ready to go on a moment's notice. Yes, sir. May I make a suggestion? Of course. The Russians will roll over the SDF with their tanks. The Kurds are tough fighters, but they need weapons to fight with. I'd like to give them what they need, with your authorization. I'm talking about small arms, anti-tank weapons, vehicles, anti-aircraft missiles. Not major offensive weapons like planes. You don't need congressional permission to do that. That seems sensible. Go ahead, General. Make sure the press doesn't get wind of it. Director Kramer, increase your surveillance of the area. I want more information. Yes, Mr. President. Harold, talk to Margaret. Sooner or later, word will get out about the Russian buildup. We have to control the narrative on this. Margaret Whitcomb was Campbell's press secretary. Yes, Mr. President. Campbell stood. The others rose automatically. The meeting was over. Kramer and General Kroger walked together toward the entrance where their cars waited outside the entrance to the West Wing. He's making a mistake, Kroger said. Typical damn politician. Prepare something, but don't do anything until something happens. If something happens, it will be too late to do anything. At least he gave you authorization to send weapons. You and I both know those weapons won't be enough. When Savim goes into Syria, the Kurds will have their hands full, Kramer said. If we're right about Tarasov, he'll wait until they're busy beating off the Turks to make his move. I'm calling a meeting of the chiefs for later today. We'll discuss options. General, we both know this could escalate. 
I want you to know you can count on Langley for whatever you need. I appreciate that, Director. It would help if I had eyes on intel from the ground. I'll see what I can do. Kroger nodded. Nice work with Campbell in there. He'll be all right. He just needs time to learn his job. Fortunately, he has us to advise him. Kaplan is a problem, Kroger said. Yes. His main concern is the president's popularity. National security isn't his strong point. He shouldn't be in his position, but Campbell feels comfortable with him. If it comes down to it, he can be persuaded to take a more realistic position. You seem certain of that. I am. Let's hope he doesn't have to find that out the hard way. Chapter 8 Major Nikolai Gorky stood smoking under the relentless Syrian sun, scratching an insect bite on his thigh. Gorky didn't like the desert. The dry air sucked the moisture out of him. It felt like the inside of his nose was caked with cement. It was hotter than hell during the day and you froze your balls off at night. The best thing you could say about the desert was that it was ideal terrain for motorized assault. As far as he was concerned, that was the only good thing about it. He watched a scorpion scuttle toward him across the hard-packed earth. When it came close, he stepped on it. It made a satisfying crunch under his boot. The base was up and running. For now, the troops were sheltered in tents. Construction of permanent barracks would come later. By the time everyone arrived, there would be a combined total of almost 10,000 combat troops. Overall command of Eagle had been given to General Chernov. Gorky thought it was a good choice. Colonel Novikov had served under Chernov in Chechnya, and the two men got along well. A harmonious command boded well for success of the operation. So far, everything was going smoothly. Supplies had been arriving daily in a steady stream, a minor miracle. The base was in the interior of the country, not far from Deir Ezzor. The sprawling complex of oil fields and pipelines controlled by the Kurds mostly lay to the east and south of where Gorky stood. There were more wells near the Turkish border where Savim's army was getting ready to invade. Every objective was within easy striking distance, including the American advisor base 50 kilometers to the northeast. Gorky wondered if the Americans would be foolish enough to resist once the operation began. If the rules of engagement permitted, it wouldn't go well for them. Kurdish control of the fields was a thorn in the side of Moscow's ambitions. Russia's intervention on the side of Syria's president had saved him from the rebels, but he still ruled only part of the country. Eagle would change that. Gorky had no doubt the Kremlin would make sure Al-Khali was suitably grateful. By now, the American analysts would be scrambling to discover what purpose the base was intended to serve. They'll find out soon enough, Gorky thought. He'd feel better when his heavy weapons and more soldiers got here. They were due to arrive with Colonel Novikov in a few days, when the airstrip was finished. With Novikov would come the 108th and 173rd Special Purpose Detachments. That would almost bring the brigade up to strength and provide plenty of personnel and firepower. The rest would follow a week later. Sir, Gorky turned to see Master Sergeant Vanya Kozlov approaching. Kozlov had been a soldier for more than 20 years. Major Gorky was in command until Colonel Novikov arrived. But Kozlov was the one who was really in charge. He was built like a brick wall, broad and low to the ground. He was bald, strong, and more than competent. His face was scarred from shrapnel taken in Grozny. The wound had not helped his temperament. No one wanted to get on Kozlov's bad side. Kozlov stopped and saluted. Sir, your presence is required in the radio room. Gorky returned the salute. Thank you, Master Sergeant. Carry on. Kozlov saluted again and headed off toward the airstrip. Gorky walked toward the building that served as a combined mess hall, headquarters, officers' barracks, and communication center. Inside, it smelled of new construction and desert dust. It was a relief to get out of the sun. The duty sergeant rose from behind his desk as Gorky entered. He, at ease, Gorky said. He strode past the desk and entered the radio room. A man wearing the two stripes of a junior sergeant on his uniform epaulette sat in front of a table loaded with an array of radios and computers, tapping his fingers in rhythm on the table. He had a set of earphones on and didn't hear Gorky enter. When he felt Gorky's touch on his shoulder, he turned, ripped the phones off his head and jumped to attention. Faint music sounded from the phones. Sir, Gorky looked at the man's name tag. Junior Sergeant Pavlov, do you enjoy your job? Yes, sir. In the future, if I find out you have been listening to anything except official communications, you will be reduced to private and put on permanent latrine duty. 
Do you understand? Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. You have a communication for me. Yes, sir. Colonel Novikov is waiting to speak with you. He handed Gorky a headset. You can use this, sir. Gorky donned the headset and nodded. Pavlov flipped a switch. Sir, I have Major Gorky on the line, he said. There was a burst of static and Colonel Novikov's voice sounded in Gorky's ear. Good morning, Major. Good morning, sir. The Turks are getting ready to move, Novikov said. Our intelligence says the invasion will begin in two days. What is the status of the airstrip? We are ahead of schedule, sir. It's serviceable now, but I would prefer to wait one more day before we institute heavy traffic. Very well. I will arrive the day after tomorrow. I know what you're thinking, Nikolai. I'll be bringing the special weapons company with me. That's good to hear, sir. Now that the airstrip is ready, we'll bring everything up to full strength. About half the 12th Motorized Brigade is in country. They'll be joining you soon. The rest will come over next week. Colonel Brezhnev is their commander. Make sure we are ready for them. We'll be ready, sir. You're going to be busy this week, Nikolai. A word of warning. General Chernov might make a surprise inspection. Thanks for the heads up, sir. When will air support arrive? Are the revetments ready? Yes, sir. All set to go. Excellent. The squadron will arrive in a few days. Colonel, it will take at least another week to finish important infrastructure. Fueling facilities for the planes, fuel storage, the barracks. Don't worry, we're not moving yet. You've done well. Keep the pace up. Are you getting everything you need? Amazingly, I am. Supplies have been steady and well organized. CSS is doing a good job for once. Careful what you say, Nikolai. You never know who's listening. Criticism is not well received these days. Nothing new about that, sir. Novikov laughed. All right, I'm going. I'll see you in two days. We're going to kick their ass, sir. Yes, Major, we are. Gorky broke the connection and left the radio room. Back outside in the heat and dust, he stopped. Everywhere he looked, his men were busy. His men. His family. Chapter 9 Thorne had been back from Turkey for a month. He was out for an early morning run, 5K through the Virginia countryside. Sometimes it seemed to him that he'd been running for a good part of his life. When he played ball in high school and college, running was basic physical conditioning. When he went into the Marines, running was a daily occurrence. He'd thought there wasn't anything more to know about running. Then he'd started recon training. The Marine Corps was a tough service, and the men who made up recon were the toughest in the Corps. There was no room for anyone who couldn't handle the fierce physical and mental challenges of the training. Looking back, it was the hardest thing he'd ever done. Afghanistan was almost easy after that, except for the Taliban who kept trying to murder him. He came up behind two other joggers, a couple decked out in the latest high-tech running gear. He glanced over at them as he passed, looking for any sign they were more than they appeared to be. It wasn't that he expected trouble, it was habit. It was why he was still alive. The woman reminded him of his ex, Ashley. She'd had the same sharp features and liked to wear her blonde hair the same way, tucked up in a ponytail and sticking out the back of a ball cap. He'd met Ashley on Oahu. He'd passed all of Langley's background checks and was killing time until he had to report for training in Virginia. Ashley had been competing in a surfing competition on the North Shore. Mesmerized, he'd watched her dance with the crushing power of the Pacific riding the face of a monster wave through an ominous green tunnel of curling water. You didn't see many women take on that kind of wave. Not many men, either. Curious, he decided to seek her out. He found her standing with her board next to a food concession, still in her wetsuit, long blonde hair hanging loose across her shoulders. She was arguing with a broad-shouldered surfer type in a Hawaiian shirt and baggy red shorts. The guy was giving her a hard time. Suddenly, he knocked the board out of her hands and pushed her up against the wall of the concession hard. Thorne stepped up and tapped him on the shoulder. Hey. Surfer boy turned to look at him. He was muscular, overdeveloped, the kind of man who spent a lot of time in the gym looking at himself in the mirror. Big, dumb, and steroid strong. What do you think you're doing? Thorne said. Leave her alone. Fuck off, asshole. You know what? I don't think I will. Leave her alone. Dude, you just bought yourself a shitload of trouble. Surfer boy threw a punch. Thorn blocked the punch, moved a hip into him, and tossed him five feet away. He landed on his ass in the sand. I were you, I'd stay down, Thorn said. Dude. A group of surfers were hanging around the concession. A few called out. Hey, Eddie, looks like you got a problem. Better listen to the man. Yeah, Eddie, stay down. Laughter followed. Damn, now he has to get up. 
Eddie got to his feet, his face red, filled with rage. He charged. Thorn kicked him in the groin as hard as he could. Eddie went down and curled up in fetal position, groaning and clutching his genitals. Oohs and ahs came from the crowd. The fight was over. He turned to the woman. You okay? I'm fine. She looked at the man on the ground and then at Thorn. You always jump in like that. Only for beautiful women who ride big waves. She laughed. What's your name? Ashley, what yours? Mike, buy you a drink, he said. She brushed a strand of hair from her face, assessing him. Sure, I know a good place. Three mojitos later, he was hooked. Then it got complicated. Thorne was already bound by Langley's rules about relationships. One of them was not telling your significant other anything about your real job. Violation of that rule meant instant dismissal. The only exception was when the relationship was with another CIA officer. Even then, there were compartments that were closed to the other. From the beginning, his relationship with Ashley was based on a lie. He told her he worked for an IT company based in Virginia. She decided to join him there. A month after that, they were married in a civil ceremony. In hindsight, it was easy to see there'd never been a chance it would last. He was beginning a year of training with long hours. She was addicted to the adrenaline high of surfing, and there weren't any big waves in Virginia. She began taking trips to Hawaii, staying longer than she had to. He didn't know for sure, but he figured she might be cheating on him. By the time his training had finished, the marriage was hanging by a thread. His first assignment was Romania. The agency wasn't the diplomatic service. Spouses didn't follow their partners on postings overseas. The day before he was set to leave, he came home to an empty house and a note. The note said she was sorry. It ended with the name of her lawyer. Ashley had been Thorne's first real love. After her, he'd closed down, until he'd gotten involved with Jenna. It was an unlikely combination, the two of them. She was part of senior administration. He was a tool to be used and discarded if necessary. It wasn't the kind of pairing looked on with favor in the closed culture of Langley. One of the things Thorne liked about Jenna was that she didn't give a shit about any of that. She'd called it off over a year ago. Back at the house, he drank some water, stretched, cooled down. Five kilometers was enough to get the burn going. Not long enough to wear him out, but he could feel his legs complaining. Like it or not, he was getting older. Five years ago, a run like that would have barely broken a sweat. It was time to shower, put on his work face, and head in. Thorne drove to Langley, parked his jeep in the outer lot, and went into the old headquarters building. His office was big enough for a desk and a couple of chairs. There was no window. Windows were for people higher up on the totem pole. When he wasn't in the field, he was supposed to report in daily. There wasn't much for him to do except paperwork. There was always paperwork. He'd wait for the next assignment and stay current with the daily threat assessments. Sometimes he attended presentations by the analysts. Waiting for an assignment was part of the job he didn't like much. He wanted the freedom of the field, away from the rules of headquarters. He logged onto his computer and checked his messages. There was a reminder to make an appointment for his annual polygraph. A notice that the Saturday volleyball game was canceled. He'd never figured out who had put his name on that list. The next message was from Jenna telling him to contact her when he got in. He called her on one of the internal lines, hoping she wasn't already in a meeting. Olmsted, it's me, I got your message. Michael, something's happening in Syria. Come up to my office and I'll show you what we've got. I want your take on it. Now? Yes. On my way. Thorne rose, logged off his computer and left the room. The door closed and locked behind him. Jenna's PA looked up from her desk as Thorne came in. Her name was Shelley. Thorne was never quite sure what she thought about him. It would not have surprised him if she knew all about his affair with her boss. Shelley gave him a calculated look. She's waiting for you. Go on in. Thanks. She has a meeting in 15 minutes. I'll bear it in mind. Jenna was behind her desk watching a monitor mounted on the wall. She swiveled toward him as he came in and indicated a chair. Take a seat. I want you to see something. Her voice was all business. Thorne sat down. Jenna nodded at the monitor. I'm going to show you some satellite shots from Syria. The first section is from a recent pass over Latakia and the Russian air base there. Kumaimim. Yep. She clicked on a remote. The footage began to run. Satellite photography had come a long way in the last few years. It was possible to make out tiny details on a uniform from 180 miles up. It was no problem at all to determine if someone needed a shave or a haircut. 
or capture a face for the database. A newspaper or letter could be read with ease. Markings on military equipment were a snap. Michael watched as two enormous Antonov An-22 cargo transports came in to land. The An-22 had first appeared in the 60s, during the heyday of the Soviet Union. It was powered by four gigantic turbofan engines and was still one of the largest transport planes in the world. Puffs of smoke came from the wheels as the planes touched down. They slowed, taxiing past rows of fighter aircraft marked with the Red Star of the Federation, lined up neatly in their revetments. Shiny new planes, looks like a squadron of Su-35, Thorne said. Those are S-types, Jenna said. They've begun reinforcing what was already a large contingent of frontline aircraft. The Sukhoi Su-35S was a single-seat, dual-purpose fighter-bomber. It was a formidable weapon, one of the best planes of its type in the world. What's in the transports? Keep watching. The Antonovs lumbered to a stop near a cluster of buildings set off from the main terminals. The tailgates dropped. For a few minutes, not much happened. Then vehicles began rolling out of the planes. Armored personnel carriers, Thorne said. BTR-82A carriers, to be exact. About two-thirds of them are carrying 30 mm cannons. The rest are making do with heavy machine guns. I don't see any unit markings. The markings have been obscured, but not well enough. Those are elements of the 12th Motorized Brigade. Keep watching. A tank rolled down a ramp, followed by another. Hell, those are T-14 Armadas. That's their main battle tank. That's right, Jenna said. What are those big boxes coming out of the plane on the end? We're not sure. They could be construction materials. Construction materials, what are they building? An airbase. For that, we need to watch a different pass. Jenna clicked her remote. The scene shifted from the airbase on the coast of Syria to somewhere inland. This is near Deir Zor. The Russians began about three weeks ago. They're almost finished with the runway. You can see where they've laid it out. It's big enough to handle those Antonovs. Once it's complete, they can bring supplies directly there instead of overland from Kamaimim. They've built fighter revetments. They haven't even bothered to camouflage them. Probably figured it wasn't worth the trouble, Thorne said. They know we can see everything they're doing. He studied the photographs. There were long, orderly rows of large tents. Open latrines had been dug, a roof erected to shield them from the sun. More buildings were going up. Men were everywhere on the site, engaged in multiple tasks. They all wore desert camouflage uniforms. One good-sized building had been erected. That building must be Base HQ, Thorne said. You can see radio masts and a satellite dish. That's what we think. Reminds me of Afghanistan, Thorne said. Twelve-man tents. Do we know what unit that is? Analysis says they're from the 22nd Special Purposes Brigade. Spetsnaz, what are they doing there? That's the question, isn't it? Jenna said. The 22nd is a counterterrorism unit, Thorne said. They're serious players. Those are the guys that went into that theater in Moscow and gassed the whole place to take down the Chechens holding everyone hostage. There's nothing in Syria that should interest them. That may be, but there they are. It looks like they've moved almost half the brigade. That's around 2,000 men. And now the Russians are adding a motorized brigade. If they bring everyone up to full strength, that's around nine or 10,000 combat troops. We've also spotted an engineer's battalion. Moscow wouldn't put frontline troops out there unless they planned to use them. Adding a motorized brigade means they expect serious action. The only people with forces in the region are the Kurds. Don't forget our people. We have about 500 rangers there. What do you think they're up to? We think Tarasov is getting ready to go after the oil fields. There's nothing else of any value in the region. The Kurds are sitting right on top of big reserves. We aren't going to sit on our ass while Russia grabs Syria's oil. You think he'll risk a war with us? Tarasov is a nationalist and a fanatic. Campbell is untested. He may assume we'll back off if he starts something. He could even be right. Are you serious? As far as the president is concerned, confidence is not high. Shit, Jenna, we can't let Moscow get control of that oil. No. Jenna looked at her watch. Which is why you and I are now going to meet with Carlson. Chapter 10 Carlson's office looked out over the Virginia countryside and a parking lot filled with cars. The windows were made of a composite that could turn away a 50 caliber round. If someone tried to listen in by focusing an electronic beam on one of the windows, they would be disappointed. Not that anyone would be stupid enough to sit out in the parking lot with a laser spying on Langley's leaders. 
two chairs were placed in front of Carlson's enormous desk. Carlson nodded at them. Mike, Jenna, take a seat. Thorne's inner alarms went off. Whenever Carlson called him by his first name, he wanted something. Whatever he wanted usually meant trouble. Carlson looked at Jenna. Have you briefed him? We went over the satellite footage together. What did you think, Mike? The Russians are going to make trouble. That base is close to the oil fields, Thorne said. Carlson nodded. Too close. The DCI thinks that's why they're there, to go after the oil. That would explain the troop buildup. But why now? Savim is about to invade Syria and chew up the Kurds. Once that starts, they'll be fully occupied with fighting the Turks. The fields will be lightly defended, making them easy pickings for the Russians, Jenna said. Are we going to do anything about it? Thorne asked. Military options are being discussed, Carlson said. The problem is that we need more information. That's where you come in. Someone has to take a look at what we can't see on the satellites. Thorne looked at him. You want me to go to Syria? That's right. What am I supposed to do there? Jenna looked uncomfortable. The president and the Joint Chiefs want more intelligence about Russian intentions. Your job is to get it. You have to be kidding me, Thorne said. It doesn't take a military genius to see what their intentions are. You don't drop first-line combat troops into the middle of the Syrian desert if you're not going to start an offensive. The only logical objective is the oil. What else could it be? That's what we want you to find out, Carlson said. When Director Kramer meets with the president, she needs to know we have solid intelligence on what the Russians plan to do. That means eyes and ears on the ground. That's you. You speak fluent Arabic and Russian. There's no one better to do this. We have a low-level asset in Latakia who works at Kamamim. He'll find a way to get you onto that base. He won't be expecting you. You'll have to look him up and talk to him. You don't have a way to contact him. Tell him I'm coming. He's not James Bond, Thorne. He doesn't have a secret radio. He's not a trained agent, only a patriotic local who hates the regime. There's no way to get in touch with him except a direct meeting. You expect me to find out exactly what the Russians are going to do. That's right. Once you're on the base, keep your ears open. I suppose you wouldn't mind if I could grab a copy of their battle plan. That would be a good result. I was joking, Lewis. It would still be a good result. I'll leave it up to you and Jenna to take care of the details. I want you there within the next couple of days. Don't turn this into another turkey. Is that it? Do you have any questions? You have any answers? Carlson sighed. Jenna, get him out of here. As they were walking down the hall, Jenna turned to him. You can't resist, can you? You have to poke the bear. He pisses me off. It's his nature. I don't think he can help it. You heard that crack about turkey. He still thinks I chickened out. If he really thought that, he wouldn't send you to Syria. Whatever else he is, he's dedicated to getting results. He knows you're the best person for this. You are, you know. Maybe. No maybe about it, Mike. Let's go back to my office. Like Lewis said, we need to work out the details. Chapter 11 It was the end of the working day in Moscow. Anya Volkova was putting the finishing touches on her latest report to General Stepanov. She'd made sure Stepanov had been kept current on Eagle as he'd requested. For the moment, she'd put aside her doubts about the operation and what it might mean for the future. It hadn't been easy. But she'd managed to ensure an unimpeded stream of supplies moving through the pipeline to Syria. It had been a major challenge to ship the enormous quantity of things needed in the field, getting them stockpiled and ready to load as space became available in the transports. Her first priority had been getting all the materials needed to construct the base delivered in the right amounts at the right time. She'd had to solve the problem of how much fuel would be needed for all the various needs and where it would come from. There were requirements for the combat brigades, the engineers, and supporting aircraft. Then she'd had to estimate what would be needed once Eagle got underway. Anya researched historical operations, factored in an increase, then added 20%. The surest way to demotion and disgrace was for the tanks and armored carriers to run out of fuel when the troops were engaged in the field. The drain on national resources was going to create civilian shortages, but there was nothing she could do about that. She figured out how the fuel would be transported and stored. At that point, she ran into a major problem. The bureaucrats who oversaw the daily production and distribution of aviation fuel, gasoline, and diesel in the Federation had resisted diverting the large amounts required from domestic and foreign consumption. That had been the only time she'd been forced to go to Stepanov and ask him to assert his authority. That had solved the problem. 
She signed the report. A tap on her computer keyboard sent it upstairs. It was almost time to quit for the day. Her phone rang. Lieutenant Colonel Volkova. Colonel, General Stepanov requires your presence. Major Petrov's voice was an unwelcome intrusion. Very well, I'm on my way. She disconnected. Now what? As she rode the elevator up to the top floor, she went over everything in her mind. Had she forgotten some critical element? Had there been a complaint from Syria? Had something happened? Had someone interfered with her carefully orchestrated plans? Why else would Stepanov want to see her this late in the day? As usual, Major Petrov was waiting when she stepped out of the elevator. Follow me, please, Colonel. They came to the double doors of Stepanov's office. Petrov knocked and opened the door. Lieutenant Colonel Volkova, sir. Petrov stood aside and watched her enter. Anya felt his eyes on her. She'd be damned if she'd give him the satisfaction of turning around to give him one of her withering looks. Pointing to a chair to the side of his desk, Stepanov said, Take a seat, Colonel. Yes, sir. She sat on the edge of the chair, back straight at attention. At ease, Colonel. Relax, you're not here to be reprimanded. Yes, sir, thank you, sir. Anya softened her stiff posture a little. I have been paying close attention to reports on the status of Eagle, Stepanov said. I am pleased with your work. Anya didn't know what she'd expected, but it wasn't this. General Stepanov was not known for handing out compliments. Thank you, sir. Stepanov looked at his watch. It's after working hours. He opened a drawer on the side of his desk and took out a bottle of vodka with a green label and two glasses. Please join me in a drink. Anya's father had been a heavy drinker. It hadn't made her a fan of vodka, Russia's unofficial national beverage. But you didn't turn down the offer of a drink from one of the men who stood behind the presidential throne. Of course, sir, thank you. She took the proffered glass and raised it with his. To the success of our operation, Stepanov said. Our operation. Success, Anya said. They drank. The liquid was smooth and fiery at the same time. He refilled his glass and held the bottle out toward her. Another colonel. It wasn't a question. The ability to drink vodka in Russia was a national strength and a national curse. Anya had learned long ago how to hold her liquor. It was part of the game a woman had to play to show she belonged in the masculine culture of the army. She watched him fill the glass, wondering if he was testing her, wondering if she was expected to match him drink for drink. She would never be able to do it. She could already feel the effects of the first one. Thankfully, Stepanov settled back in his chair and sipped from his glass instead of throwing it back all at once. Tell me, Colonel, do you enjoy your work? Yes, sir, I do. It provides satisfaction when things go as they should. And when they don't. Then I try to improve my understanding of the problem so that it won't happen again. Stepanov nodded. That is a sensible approach, the approach of a leader. No one leads without making mistakes. Are you comfortable with the added responsibility this assignment has brought to you? I wouldn't say I was comfortable, sir. It's much too complex for comfort. I would say that I feel challenged in a good way. An honest answer. Had you said you were comfortable, I would have wondered if I had made a mistake by giving it to you. You haven't made a mistake, sir. I can handle this. Stepanov changed the subject. I've been invited to a gathering of a few friends tomorrow evening. I would like you to attend with me as my guest. Dress is civilian casual, but elegant, not formal. My car will pick you up at eight. Stepanov hadn't asked whether or not she wanted to go. Anya knew she had no choice. Yes, sir, I'd be honored. Good, good. He rose and held up his glass one more time. Anya rose with him. To the Rodina. The Rodina. The intercom on Stepanov's desk had been left open. Outside the closed doors of the office, Major Petrov listened to the conversation. The dirty old bastard. He's making a move on her. He's at least 20 years older than she is. This will look good in my report. As the door to the office opened, Petrov turned off the intercom. Anya walked past without looking at him. You will wish you had been nice to me, Volkova. Petrov worked for Russian military intelligence. The Glavnoye Razvedivatel Noye Upravlenie. The GRU had been around since the days of World War II. Many things had changed since Stalin was in charge but not the paranoia of the government regarding security and its military. The GRU was as powerful and pervasive in its own right as the better-known security organs of the SVR and FSB. Petrov's position meant there was little he didn't know about Stepanov. If he started sleeping with Volkova, it might provide an opportunity to get even with the snotty bitch. In any event, his superiors would be pleased. Sexual affairs always provided opportunities for asserting pressure, if pressure was needed. 
Smiling to himself, he began composing the report in his mind. Going down in the elevator, Anya felt the vodka working, wondering what she was getting into. It could be innocent enough. Stepanov was married, but his wife was ill and never seen in public. Certainly there were times when social occasions would be easier if he had an attractive woman with him. Anya knew she was attractive. She had a good body she kept in shape. There was something about her face, her intense eyes, her high cheekbones that drew men like bees to honey. The army wasn't an easy place for women. It was still a masculine society. There was a lot of lip service paid to the equal role of the women and men who served in the military. But the reality was far different. During her training to become an officer, she'd been subject to harassment, crude sexual advances, efforts to sabotage her performance, even physical threats. It hadn't tapered off until she'd finished her final year of training. Even now, she still had to deal with people like Petrov. She understood why men were attracted to her, but she'd never really understood why some men felt threatened by her presence. It was easy to dismiss them as insecure or angry at rejection, or to explain their behavior by saying it was because she was a woman who stood up for herself. But that reasoning seemed too simplistic to her. It felt like something more fundamental, something atavistic, primal, something that went back to the caves, a need to dominate and control that had nothing to do with who she was, but had everything to do with her sex. She thought about Stepanov's invitation. It was possible he had no ulterior motives, but she doubted it. She'd picked up on the desire hiding behind the invitation. If he wanted to bet her and she turned him down, there would be consequences. Stepanov was a man used to getting his own way. He wouldn't take rejection gracefully. She decided to push her concerns away. She was doing that a lot lately. Time enough to deal with the devil when he offered something for her soul. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. It was past the end of the workday. Petrov waited for Stepanov to leave. He couldn't go home until Stepanov dismissed him. Somehow it never occurred to the general that his aide might have things to do. Finally, the office doors opened and Stepanov emerged, carrying his leather briefcase. Petrov knew it was full of files, most of them classified. It was against regulations to take files home from the ministry. Even Stepanov was not exempt. Not that he gives a shit, Petrov thought. No one's going to stop him from doing whatever he wants. Petrov stood and came to attention. That will be all, Major, Stepanov said. You can go home now. Yes, sir. I need to get an early start tomorrow. Be here at 0600. Yes, sir, 0600. Bastard. Good night, Petrov. Good night, sir. The outer door closed behind him. Taking classified files home was only one of Stepanov's breaches of security. Sometimes Petrov wondered how the man had ever reached his high position. Petrov got up and went into the office. One of his tasks was to make sure everything was secure at the end of the day. More than once he'd found papers left out on Stepanov's desk that needed to be locked up in the safe. He always reported these errors to his real boss, Colonel Ivanov. So far, Stepanov hadn't done anything serious enough to bring leverage against him, but the GRU was patient. One day there would be something. Petrov was sure of it. Neb Almer, 10 kilometers. He began looking for a place to get off the highway. The sky was cloudless. The night black except for the yellow beams of his headlights and the pale light cast by the stars. The moon had not yet risen. Farmer's fields bordered the road. Tree-covered hills formed dark shapes to the east. A wooded area appeared ahead off to the right. Thorn slowed and turned off the highway, jolting across a plowed field toward the trees. He went as far as he could, cut the lights, and stopped the engine. Thorn took a deep breath, listening to the sounds of hot metal cooling. His fingers were stiff from clenching the steering wheel. By now the guards manning the border station would be alerted, watching for him. It wasn't hard to predict his movements. They knew he'd try to get out of the country, and Turkey was the only real possibility. It was the logical choice for a fleeing spy. Daylight would bring helicopters. In hours, the whole area would be crawling with cops. He took the browning from his pocket, ejected the magazine, counted seven rounds. There was one in the chamber. He pushed the magazine back into the butt and felt it click into place. Eight rounds. If he ran into trouble, it would have to do. The sign had said ten kilometers to the border. Ten kilometers on foot was nothing. The darkness would slow him down, but there was time to reach the border before sunrise. With a little luck, he'd walk into Turkey without any trouble. 
Once in friendly territory, he'd call for extraction. Thorn closed his eyes and let his photographic memory bring up a map of the area. The nearest town in Turkey was Yeladagi, a couple of kilometers over the border. He'd get to the town and call from there. His shirt was stuck to the wound on his side. At least the bleeding had stopped. He set off toward the faint outline of the hills. Twenty minutes later, he reached the first one. Out on the road, a convoy of cop cars screamed by, lights flashing. The hunt was on. He began walking north, keeping in the trees. Three hours later, he figured he had to be getting close to the border. The ground was uneven. He'd stumbled and opened up the wound. It was still bleeding, a slow, steady leak that soaked the shirt in the side of his pants. He wanted to sit down and rest. Not yet. A sudden breeze brought a strong smell of cigarette smoke. Unprepared, he sneezed. Halt, who's there? Show yourself. The voice came from somewhere to his left. Thorn crouched down and drew the browning. A second voice called out. Ahmed, what do you see? I heard something. Someone sneezed. You come out. Thorn waited. Ahmed, be careful. The second voice called. Thorn saw a dark shape coming through the trees. He waited until the sentry was close, then fired. The muzzle flashes lit the night. The man grunted and fell forward. The second guard opened up. Bullets showered Thorn with fragments of branches and bits of bark. Thorn fired at the muzzle flash, three quick shots. He heard the man scream, then the dull sound of a body hitting the ground. He began walking toward the sound when something came out of the dark and slammed into his chest. He went down hard on his back. A huge black dog snarled and scrabbled at him, trying to tear out his throat. Hot, stinking breath washed over him. He got an arm up and forced the snapping fangs away, pressed the browning against its chest and pulled the trigger. The gun was empty before it stopped trying to kill him. He pushed the heavy body away and got slowly to his feet. Thorn looked down at the dog. He didn't feel bad about killing the guards they'd been shooting at him. They knew what they'd signed up for. But the dog never had a choice. The dog bothered him. I didn't want to do that. It wasn't your fault. They made you that way. It occurred to him that he and the dog had a lot in common. They'd both been trained to kill, both of them shaped by people who needed someone to do their killing for them. It wasn't the best thought he'd ever had. An hour later, he stumbled into Yeladagi. Chapter 12 Thorn boarded a ferry from Cyprus to Latakia, wearing a neatly trimmed beard, sunglasses, and a cheap suit. He pulled a small carry-on behind him containing a change of clothes and personal toiletries. His papers identified him as Farid Amari, a mid-level official working for the Syrian Ministry of Agriculture as an inspector of marine fisheries. The clothes he wore had been manufactured in Damascus. Dye colored his skin and darkened his hair. Contact lenses changed his eyes from gray to brown. Invisible adhesive pulled his ears close to his head. No one was likely to suspect a minor bureaucrat of being a spy. He went through passport control with no problems. It didn't hurt that he spoke Arabic with an accent that placed him somewhere near Damascus, a gift from his Syrian stepmother. He had grown up speaking two languages immersed in two cultures. His stepmother had given him the knowledge he needed now to pass as Syrian. She'd passed on to him something more precious than the language of her native land, an understanding of her culture. The culture of Syria had been born out of thousands of years of treachery and war. Life here had always been based on survival. No one could understand Syria or any other Middle Eastern country without understanding that. Survival meant learning to see through the appearance of things to whatever truth lay behind it. He thought about his stepmother and smiled. Darifa had taught him how to see past the surface, a skill that served him well at Langley, where his independence and intelligence offended those who valued obedience over performance. A cab dropped him off near an apartment building in the southern part of the city. He climbed to the fourth floor, found the number he was looking for, and opened the door with a key. The apartment was a safe house a temporary refuge in a hostile environment. It was hot and stuffy inside, the air stale. The room smelled of dust and ancient cooking. Closed blinds covered the windows, dead flies lined the sill. He considered opening a window and letting in fresh air. Better leave it, no need to attract attention. His false identity would only hold up for a while. All entries into the country were scrutinized by the military intelligence directorate, Syria's secret police. Al-Khali's police were good, but the inevitable delay of bureaucracy would give him some time before they discovered no one named Farid Amari worked at the Ministry of Agriculture. By the time MID started looking for him, 
he would have left the country. Cameras had recorded his entry at passport control. It had been impossible to avoid them, which meant he was now in MID's facial recognition database. Getting into the country had been easy. If anything went wrong, getting out would be more difficult. It was obvious to Thorne that the Russians were going to try and take the oil fields. It was obvious to anyone who was paying attention. The only reason he was here in this crummy apartment was because the president wanted to cover his ass. If anything went wrong, it wasn't the president's ass that would end up in a Syrian prison. There hadn't been a CIA station in Syria for a long time. Al-Khali's thugs had killed or imprisoned everyone identified as an opponent of the regime. There was no one to back him up while he was here. The asset he was supposed to talk to was Jamal Ali, a mechanic who worked on the Russian airbase. The only way to contact him was face to face. He didn't know Thorne was coming. That might be a problem. Ali lived alone on the fifth floor of an apartment building on Beirut Street, not far from where Thorne was now. It was late afternoon. Ali wouldn't be home from his job on the airbase for another couple of hours. Thorne had memorized Ali's file. He was 44 years old, widowed, and lived alone. The man was a creature of habit. On work days, he arrived home every evening around six. Sometimes he took an evening walk when the heat of the day had softened. Sometimes he stayed in. Thorne planned to show up at his apartment around seven. Until then, he could stay where he was. But there was nothing to eat in the apartment. He needed food and caffeine. Latakia was a prime holiday destination for Syrians. There were many restaurants scattered throughout the city. He decided to find one and wait there. Thorne chose a cafe two blocks away from Ali's building. He sat down at a table on the sidewalk under an umbrella advertising a popular soft drink. The smells drifting from the kitchen reminded him of his childhood, when Darifa would prepare traditional Syrian dishes. He missed Darifa. She'd been brought down by cancer two years before. She'd fought it for five years, but in the end there'd been nothing more to do. Thorne had never thought of her as anything but his mother. His father was still alive, retired in Florida. He hadn't been the same since Darifa had died. He talked to his father a couple of times since then, but he hadn't seen him since the funeral. Thorne felt a brief flash of guilt. He decided to call him when he got back to the States. Syrian restaurants didn't have menus, but Thorne knew what they'd have. He hadn't eaten since he'd left Cyprus, and he was hungry. He ordered coffee and a bottle of water, a lamb kebab for the main course, hummus, stuffed grape leaves, and bread. Given the Syrian predilection for many appetizers and multiple courses, it was a light dinner. The food came. He watched the street as he ate. He dawdled over a second cup of thick black coffee until it was time to leave, paid his bill, and walked to Ali's building. As he walked, he looked for signs the building was being watched. He looked for people sitting in cars or loitering, anyone who seemed out of place. The street was empty of people. He saw no one. Even so, his scalp prickled. It was the same feeling he'd had in Turkey. It made him uneasy. It made him wish he had a gun. The entrance to Ali's building was unlocked. Thorne entered the lobby and took the stairs. He didn't like elevators. It was too easy to be trapped in one. With stairs, you had choice. You could move of up or down at will. In an elevator, you were locked inside a cage, at the mercy of someone's finger on a button. It was a little past seven when he knocked on Ali's door. A voice came from within. Who's there? Thorne recognized the accent as from somewhere inland. Maybe Raqqa. Karam. I'm a friend of Hassan's. The phrase identified Thorne as from the agency. The door opened part way. Ali looked out through the narrow opening, suspicious. Thorne said, Peace be upon you. And upon you, why are you here? I need to speak with you, Thorne said. Please let me in. With obvious reluctance, Ali opened the door. Once Thorne was inside, he closed it quickly. What do you want? I need to talk with you. My friends want to know what the Russians are doing at Khmeimim. Ali was a small man, dark-haired and nervous. He had a mechanic's hands, stained with years of working with grease and oil. You should not have come here, he said. I may be under suspicion. Someone has been asking questions about me at work. I won't stay long. Is there any chance you can get me onto the base? Ali laughed. There was no humor in it. Since the Russians began bringing in more people and equipment, they have become obsessed with security. No one is getting onto the base that hasn't been there for years. Everyone is vetted and everyone is checked two or three times a day. Have you noticed anything odd? Something with unusual security precautions? Anything like that? 
Allie walked over to a worn armchair and sat down. He didn't offer Thorne a seat. There is an old airplane hangar on the southern part of the base that is off limits to anyone except the Russians. You can't get near it. You know what's in there, only that it's not planes. You have no idea. All I know is that two weeks ago, one of the big transports arrived. As soon as the plane landed, they sent us away. They unloaded some long wooden crates and took them into the hangar. We were told we had better stay clear. How big were the crates? Ali spread his hands wide. Big. Perhaps 18 or 19 meters in length. Two meters high. Missiles. They have to be missiles. Can you remember how many? Many. It took most of the day to move them all. Sudden hard pounding sounded on the door. Police, open the door now. Ali's face drained of color. He jumped out of the chair. Allah, protect me. You have led them here. Someone began kicking the door. Thorne made it to the side as it burst open. The first man into the room held a gun in his outstretched hand. Thorne grabbed his arm as he came through the doorway, twisted and lifted. The elbow broke with a wet, dull sound. The man screamed and went to his knees. Thorne ripped the weapon from his hand, shot him in the head, then fired two shots at the next man coming through the door. He fell forward. Someone in the hall fired, multiple shots that echoed through the building. A bullet smashed the phone in Thorne's jacket pocket. A second burned across his side. He fired again. The third man went down, a puppet with cut strings. The silence after the shots was deafening. The room stank of burned powder and the metallic smell of blood. Thorne turned to speak to Allie and saw him lying on his back. He wasn't breathing. Blood spread out onto the carpet beneath him. There'd been a lot of noise. In a few minutes, the place would be swarming with police. Someone would have called them by now. He looked down the hall. All of the doors on the floor were closed. Thorne was wired. Who'd sent them? He bent over the body in the hallway and pulled an ID case from his jacket. The dead man's face looked back at him. The ID bore the seal of the political security directorate, Alcali's Gestapo. Thorne moved to the stairs and started down. His side hurt where the bullet had creased him, but he'd been lucky. A few inches to the right and he'd be lying next to Ali. Blood seeped through his shirt. For the moment, the wound was covered by his jacket. He reached the ground floor, the gun in his hand. How many rounds had he fired? Five? Six? Thorne was familiar with this model of pistol, a Browning high power. Good pistol, nine millimeter, 13 round magazine. So seven or eight rounds left. Better than nothing. Instead of heading for the lobby, he went the other way, looking for a service entrance in the rear. The cops would come through the front. With luck, they wouldn't be covering the rear yet. He pushed open a door at the back of the building and stepped into an alley with two overflowing dumpsters. The smell of rotting garbage mixed with the sweet scent of jasmine vines growing along the walls. The sky was red from the setting sun. The alley shrouded in shadows. There was no one in sight. Thorne turned right, walked to the end of the alley and turned left on the cross street. He tucked the pistol under his jacket in the small of his back. The next street was narrow, cobbled. He turned onto it. Cars were parked along one side, leaving only enough room for vehicles to pass. He eyed the cars as he walked until he came to an older Toyota sedan. He paused, looked. There was no one in sight. He drew the Browning, smashed the driver's window of the car with the butt of the gun, opened the door and slipped in. He took a folding knife from his pocket, jammed the blade into the ignition switch and forced it forward. Nothing happened. He cursed and leaned down under the steering column. The wiring harness was hidden inside. He sat up and worked with the knife on the ignition switch. The point broke off. He kept working until he got the switch out of the column. He pulled the wires out and started touching them together. The car started. He took his phone out and looked at it. The bullet had struck it full on. It was useless. He tossed it out the window. If they found it, it would do them no good. The night echoed with sirens as he drove away. He glanced down at the fuel gauge, almost full. Going south wasn't an option. It only led deeper into Syria. Safety meant going north to Turkey. Two roads went north from Latakia. One led to Aleppo, the other to the Turkish border an hour away. One hour to safety if he kept to the highway, but he couldn't stay on it all the way to the border. That would be asking for trouble. As he drove, he thought about what had happened at Ali's apartment. It couldn't be coincidence that Alkali's thugs had arrived when they did. Thorne didn't believe in coincidences. Someone had told them he was going to meet Ali. 
There wasn't any other possible explanation. They'd staked out the building and waited for him to show up, which meant they had known what he looked like, which meant there was a traitor at Langley. He had to hand it to the opposition. They'd done a good job of keeping out of sight. With his cover blown, he wasn't going to breeze through border control at Niv Almer using one of his passports. His only option was to ditch the car and cross on foot. Half an hour later, Thorne passed a road sign. Chapter 13 Anya stood in front of the hall mirror looking for flaws in her outfit. Stepanov had said civilian and elegant, not formal. The dress she wore was made of dark blue silk, reaching to ankles. She'd bought it a few years before, splurging for a friend's wedding. It had hung unused in the closet ever since. She'd been afraid it might not fit. It did barely. The dress was low cut across her breasts and open in the back, accentuating the smooth curves of her body. A simple gold chain hung around her neck. Emerald earrings matched the deep green of her eyes. Accustomed to the restrictive and ordered lines of her uniform, Anya was almost shocked to see what she could look like if she tried. It was a few minutes before eight. General Stepanov's driver would arrive any moment. Well, mother, how do I look? Yulia Volkova was thrilled her daughter was going out with such an important man. The first deputy minister of defense. Who knew? Perhaps it would lead to something. Romance. Marriage, even. General Stepanov was close to the president. Visions of meeting Tarasov danced in Yulia's head. Oh, Anya, if only your father could see you now, you are so beautiful. If my father could see me now, he'd probably call me a whore. You approve? Silly girl, of course I do. Now you must be very nice to the general. He can do wonderful things for you if he likes you enough. Don't worry, mother, he's my boss, I'll be nice to him. You're getting older, Anya. This could be an opportunity for you. Mother, please. He's 22 years older than I am. Besides, he's married. His wife is bedridden. He only wants someone to come with him to this party. It makes him look good to have a younger woman on his arm. You never know, Anya, who will be at the party. I don't know, probably people from the military. She was saved from more of Yulia's questions by a knock at the door. Anya draped a silk scarf about her shoulders and took a final look in the mirror. She brushed a stray hair from her forehead and opened the door. Stepanov's driver stood there. Colonel Volkova, the general is downstairs. Goodbye, mother. Don't wait up, I'm sure I'll be late. Anya. Anya closed the door behind her. General Stepanov raided an Oris Senate limo, similar to the presidential limousine, heavily armored. The car was gleaming black, massive, with a large chrome grille that shouted power. People on the street stopped and stared as the driver held the rear door open for her. You didn't see cars like that waiting for someone in this neighborhood. Anya settled herself on a wide expanse of soft black leather. General Stepanov sat on the left-hand side, dressed in a dark blue Italian suit. It was strange to see him in anything but his uniform. The driver closed her door and got behind the wheel. Good evening, Colonel. Good evening, sir. Stepanov gave her an approving look. Go ahead, Genity. Yes, sir, the driver said. The limo pulled away from the curb. Stepanov opened a compartment on the side of the door and took out a bottle and two small glasses. He poured and handed one to her without asking if she wanted one. She took the offered glass. To your health. Your health, sir. They drank. Your dress is very becoming, Colonel. An excellent choice. I am pleased to have such a charming companion for this evening. You flatter me, sir. Only as you deserve. Stepanov touched a button on his armrest and a thick partition rose between the rear compartment and the driver. Tonight's gathering is an opportunity for you to meet some of my colleagues and their wives. The president will be there. He may ask you about Eagle. Of course, you may discuss it with him if he asks. You may not discuss it with anyone else unless they are with the president. Follow his lead. She concealed her surprise. This was much more than she'd expected. Of course, sir. Stepanov poured himself another glass. Russia is about to reclaim her proper place on the world stage. For a long time, we have been dismissed by the West. They think we are weak, a pale version of what we once were. In the past, that was true. But it's no longer the case. They just don't know it yet. Stepanov paused. Pay attention this evening, Colonel. As with everything, perception is important. There is a plan for changing the international image of our society, especially as it concerns women. It is possible you may be asked to play an important part. Anya wasn't sure what to say. What can you say to something like that coming from a man who had the ear of the president? 
She chose to play it safe. I took an oath to our nation, sir. I am always ready to do what is required. Stepanov nodded. A correct answer, Colonel. A word of warning. Not everyone is ready for such a change. Why is he telling me this? She didn't know how the rest of the evening was going to go, but it was off to a hell of a start. Chapter 14 The limo headed out of Moscow on the Minsk Highway toward the exclusive residential section of Rublevka. Anya had never been inside one of the homes in this area. This was where the president, the prime minister, high-ranking military officials, and many of the oligarchs lived. They began to pass high walls along the sides of the road. Elaborate gates allowed brief glimpses of the extravagant homes of Russia's elite. Anya thought calling these buildings homes was ridiculous. They weren't homes. They were mansions, sprawling castles with high-peaked roofs and sparkling fountains, built in a dizzying variety of architectural styles. Status was measured not so much in how big your house was, since every house in this area was huge. The size of the lot told the story. If you had enough room for your own private lake, it gave you bragging rights over your billionaire neighbor. The limo turned off the highway and stopped at a massive iron gate set into a high stone wall. A uniformed security guard armed with a machine pistol held up his hand as the limo coasted to a stop. After a brief exchange with the driver, the heavy gate swung open. Their destination loomed ahead, a stone mansion with towers and battlements ablaze with light from dozens of windows. Anya looked at the building momentarily speechless. The drive circled around a large fountain featuring horses and chariots sculpted from marble. Sprays of water shot into the air. Concealed lights cast rainbows of color through the mists. The night was clear, warm. A dozen limousines were parked in front of a long garage that extended from one wing of the house. The drivers had gathered in small groups by the cars, talking and smoking. The car stopped underneath a wide stone portico in front of the main entrance. Who lives here? Anya asked. This is the home of Ivan Korosov, the oligarch, the man who runs Ruskaz. Ruskaz controlled the supply of natural gas to Europe and Turkey. Korosov was one of the richest men in the world. The same. Although it would be wise not to refer to him as an oligarch. He prefers to think of himself as a successful businessman. Watch yourself around him, Colonel. Yes, sir. When she stepped past the threshold, it was as though she'd slipped back to a time before the Bolsheviks came to power. The foyer was beyond spacious, wide and round, with a floor of white marble inlaid with circular patterns in gold and blue. The walls were curved to mirror the circular designs. A double staircase flanked by carved and gilded banisters swept up in elegant curves to a balcony on the second floor. A magnificent chandelier of glittering crystal hung from a tiled oculus above the foyer. Stepanov saw her staring at the chandelier. Kurosov is quite proud of that, he said. It used to hang in the Palace of Versailles during the reign of Louis IX. He held out his arm. Without thinking, she took it. Come, Colonel. It's time to enjoy ourselves. Straight ahead was a brightly lit drawing room filled with people talking and drinking. The entrance was flanked by two large oil portraits of battlefield scenes from the War of 1812. The paintings looked old, expensive, the kind of paintings that belonged in a museum. Everything about the house screamed money, a lot of it. Anya took in the details in a kind of visual overwhelm. They entered the room. A sea of voices surrounded her. A half-dozen servants dressed in white and gold livery circulated through the crowd with trays of drinks and hors d'oeuvres. The foyer had been impressive. The drawing room made it seem simple. Anya couldn't help thinking Catherine the Great would have felt at home here. As in the foyer, the floor was made of polished marble inlaid with blue and gold. Swooping patterns of gold circled a large table loaded with food set in the center of the room. The only other furniture consisted of wide armchairs carved and gilded in French Empire style, placed at intervals around the sides of the room. The walls were made of polished wooden panels carved in relief with gilded floral patterns. The ceiling was twenty feet high and dripped with gold. Another chandelier hung over the table. Sconces of gold were set at measured intervals along the walls, casting flattering light over the gathering. In one corner of the room, a chamber quartet played a piece by Mozart. She had never seen anything like it. She knew there were people in Russia with great wealth, but she'd never experienced what such wealth could buy. She thought about the waste of money this ostentatious room in this house represented. 
how so many of Russia's people lived on the edge of poverty. It's not right, not when there's so much need. She looked around at the crowd. The men looked well-fed, prosperous, satisfied, confident in their power. Their suits were cut of the finest imported materials. The women's jewelry glittered like the chandelier. Across the room, the chief of the general staff, General Kerensky, was talking with the Minister of Defense, General Igor Fedorov. What am I doing here? One of the waiters came by with a golden tray filled with drinks. Vodka, sir. Champagne? I'll have a vodka, Stepanov said. Champagne, please, Anya said. They took their glasses. A bearded block of a man who reminded Anya of a circus bear in an expensive suit came up to them. A champagne glass was engulfed in his hand. Tiny flakes of dandruff spotted his shoulders. General, I am so happy you could come. And who is this lovely lady with you? Ivan, may I present Lieutenant Colonel Anya Volkova. She kindly consented to come with me this evening. Colonel, this is our host, Ivan Korosov. Korosov's eyes twinkled. Anya would not have believed anyone's eyes could actually do that. The effect was like looking at a malevolent St. Nicholas who was thinking of making you a gift for someone's Christmas. Perhaps his own. Ah, you must be the one who has been requisitioning my fuel. My dear, you have caused me no end of complications. I'm sure I have no idea what you're talking about, Anya said. You have a gorgeous home, Mr. Korosov. Oh, it serves, please, you must call me Ivan. A man came over to the oligarch and whispered in his ear. Anya saw the bulge of a pistol under his jacket a bodyguard. You must excuse me, General, Korosov said. The president is arriving. He turned to Anya. It was a pleasure meeting you, Colonel. Perhaps we'll have a chance to get to know each other better later on. I look forward to it. She watched Korosov make his way out of the room. I don't like him, Anya said. Stepanov laughed. Not many people do. You deflected him nicely. A voice cut through the noise of the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, the president. Heads turned as Tarasov came in with his wife, Oksana. Everyone began clapping. Oksana looked fatter than in her pictures, almost frumpy. Tarasov smiled and held up his hand. Please continue. Conversation resumed. The president's wife left his side and made her way to a group of women standing near the food table. Tarasov began making the rounds of the room, shaking hands and talking briefly with the guests. It was the first time Anya had ever been in the same room with Tarasov. Watching him, she began to understand why he was president. There was a tangible aura of power surrounding him. Whether that was natural or some collective mantle resulting from his high position, she didn't know. But it was real enough. He's headed this way, Stepanov said. I'll introduce you. Tarasov came up to them. Stepanov and Anya straightened to attention. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, General. May I present Lieutenant Colonel Anya Volkova? Good evening, Mr. President. Anya said. Up close like this, Anya could smell Tarasov's cologne, something vaguely earthy. Looking into his eyes, she got no sense of who he was. It was as if something inside him was peering out at her and evaluating what it saw. It was an unsettling sensation. Colonel Volkova, Tarasov said. General Stepanov has kept me informed of your work. It is good to know I can rely on dedicated officers like yourself. Thank you, Mr. President. Tarasov took her hand. His palm was sweaty. Anya resisted a sudden urge to pull away. Anya, may I call you Anya? No. Of course, Mr. President. You and I will talk in the future, Anya, soon. He turned to Stepanov. General, about what we discussed earlier. Now that I have seen her, you may proceed. Make the necessary arrangements. Yes, Mr. President. Tarasov let go of Anya's hand and turned away to continue working the room. She resisted the impulse to wipe her hand on her dress. She saw the president's wife looking at her. It wasn't a friendly look. You've impressed him, Stepanov said. Congratulations, it isn't easy to do. I wasn't trying to impress him, Anya said. Stepanov smiled. I know you weren't, Colonel. That is why you succeeded. It wasn't every day the president of the Russian Federation complimented you. She should be grateful and pleased. So why did she have this feeling she was being used? Years of living with her father's mercurial brutality had forced Anya to develop a strong sense of intuition. Intuition had warned her when one of his violent explosions was brewing. More than once, it had saved her from being beaten. She'd learned to trust it. Now her intuition told her to be on guard. Sir, what did he mean? When he said that now he'd seen me to proceed with what you'd talked about. Stepanov sipped his vodka. 
Since the President has given his approval, I can tell you. You have been chosen to become the public image of women in our military. She was shocked. Me? Why? Come now, Colonel. There's no need for false modesty. You are an attractive and competent officer. Your recent work has only strengthened our decision that you are the right person for this. The last thing Anya wanted was to become the face of women in the Federation military. It was already difficult enough. The public exposure would provoke jealousy and strip her of what little privacy she had at work. Something in her expression must have given away her displeasure. Stepanov gave her a hard look. That's an order, Colonel. This is not open for discussion. Yes, sir. For a brief moment, Stepanov had shown her the stick. Now he brought forward the carrot. You've been moved up on the list. You are promoted to full colonel, effective immediately. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That will really piss everybody off. What do my new duties entail? It won't be too difficult. Pictures of you inspecting installations, interviews about your family's history of loyalty to the motherland, your career. You will continue in your present assignment with CSS. You have someone able to assume your duties if needed? Yes, sir. Major Kirov is an efficient officer. He's fully capable of running the unit. Good, good. Now, Colonel, let's get something to eat and enjoy the party, shall we? Stepanov held out his arm. They moved toward the food table. Across the room, President Tarasov was talking with the Minister of Defense. Was she imagining it, or were they looking at her? She'd been thrust into the highest circles of power without warning. It felt like someone had turned a glaring spotlight upon her. It wasn't a good feeling. Chapter 15 Two days after the raid on Ali's apartment, Thorne was back in Washington. He briefed Jenna and Carlson in Carlson's office. When he told them what Ali had said about the big crates, Carlson looked skeptical. Missiles, the satellite would have picked that up. Not necessarily, Jenna said. They could have timed the transfer between passes when the bird wasn't overhead. They could be SS-400, Thorne said. Ali's description of the crates matches their size. How reliable do you think his information is? Carlson asked. He could have been making it up, looking for a bonus. I don't think so. The men who kicked in the door were from the political security directorate. They only get involved with matters of state security. Ali was nervous. He told me someone had been asking questions about him. That doesn't prove he didn't make it up. He's dead, Lewis. I'd say that lends authenticity to his story. SS-400S are the best anti-aircraft missiles the Federation has. Installing those would be a major escalation over what they've deployed so far. It backs up the idea that the Russians are getting ready to move on the oil fields, Thorne said. Why would they need them? The Kurds don't have any aircraft. No, but we do. You think the Russians brought them in to keep us from getting involved? I think it's a signal they mean business. Right now, we get to say what happens to the oil under Kurdish control. If they drive the Kurds out, all that changes. Once those missiles are in position, it sends a clear message to stay away. Can you see Campbell risking all-out war with Russia? Because that's what could happen if we try to stop them. You're a real bundle of joy, Carlson said. I'm a realist. If the Russians want to take those fields, there's not much we can do about it. Not without things getting out of hand. He's right, Lewis, Jenna said. Kramer needs to know about this. All right, all right. I'll take it to her. She can have the pleasure of telling the president what he doesn't want to hear. There's something else, Thorne said. There usually is with you. What is it now? Why did al Khali's Gestapo happen to show up when I was at Ali's? The same thing happened in Turkey. Turkish intelligence was waiting for me at the meet with that colonel in Istanbul. Both times the opposition knew I was coming. Which brings up a question. How did they know? Carlson frowned. I don't like where you're going with this. You don't like it? How do you think I feel? You're saying somebody tipped them off about you, Jenna said. That's exactly what I'm saying. The only people who knew you would be in Turkey and Syria are in this building. That's right. You think we have a mole. It's the only logical explanation. Something happens once, it might be the breaks of the game. Twice means it isn't. It's too big a coincidence. You know I don't believe in coincidences. First missiles and now a mole. You really know how to make someone's day, don't you? Carlson said. I don't like it any more than you do. Carlson sighed. It was something he did a lot when Thorne was around. Jenna, who else knew about these missions? I'll find out. There are always people here who know things they aren't supposed to. Let me ask you something, Thorne said. Have other ops been going wrong lately? 
Carlson and Jenna exchanged a look. Thorne nodded. You just answered my question. How many? You don't need to know, Carlson said. That bad, huh? Better call out the mole catchers, Thorne said. Chapter 16 Later that afternoon, Thorne was getting ready to go home. A light knock came on his office door. He opened it to see Jenna standing there. Hey, she said. Hey, yourself. You done for the day? Yep. Good. Then you can buy me a drink. Best thing I've heard today, Thorne said. Any preferences on where? Some place where they have bottles with alcohol in them. Oh, it's like that. I spent the last hour listening to Carlson complain about you. I know the perfect place, Thorne said. Soon they were sitting in a booth in a McLean watering hole. Across the room, the bar was noisy. The booth was private. A waitress brought their drinks. Grey Goose Martini for Jenna. Jameson up with a soda back for Thorne. Jenna looked at him over her martini with something smoldering in her eyes. Sudden heat flooded his groin. Carlson wants your scalp, Jenna said. What else is new? You never told me why he dislikes you so much. That's a long story. I've got time. It goes back to my first posting in Bucharest. Carlson was chief of station. He was starting his climb up the ladder. Jenna fished the olive out of her martini and ate it. So what happened? I was the new kid on the block. Carlson used me as a glorified errand boy. It wasn't what I'd expected life would be like as a hotshot CIA officer, but I figured it was all part of the learning curve. Anyway, I was approached by a man who'd been a captain in Sosescu's secret police. The Securitate. Right. His name was Bogdan. Alexandru Bogdan. Those guys were the worst of the worst. They made the KGB look like kindergarten teachers. By the time I met him, he was old and sick. Somewhere along the way, his conscience had started to bother him. He still had a lot of connections. He knew I was CIA. He also knew about the rendition site we have outside the city. What he wanted me to do was blow the whistle. He wanted you to find a way to reveal the existence of the site. Publicly? Right. Bogdan knew I was only a peon. He said he wanted to talk to someone who had authority. Someone who had the details needed to convince the press it wasn't a phony story. Why did he want it exposed? He claimed that if he could get the site shut down, it would help make up for all those years he'd spent torturing people. At least that was his story. He was very convincing. What did he offer in return? He couldn't have expected you to just do what he wanted. He offered gold. Not money, intelligence. Details on current Russian operations against the West. Active communication protocols and codes. The location of a nuclear weapons stash left behind by the Soviet Union. A list of Russian agents working in Eastern Europe. Like I said, gold. Did you believe him? No. What he was offering was too good to be true. Plus he was asking me to become a traitor. What did you do? I did what I was supposed to do. I went to my boss and told him about the approach. Carlson. Thorne nodded. And? And Lewis got all excited. He figured we could pretend to agree to what Bogdan wanted and get the information. As if that would work. Wasn't he suspicious of this sudden bonanza? When I told him I thought it was a play by the opposition, he blew it off. I was too inexperienced, he said. Asshole, Jenna said. He saw it as a step toward a better posting. If he could bring home what Bogdan was offering, he'd be the golden boy. Then what happened? He told me to set up a meet with Bogdan. Then he would pretend to make the deal. Of course, since he was so much more experienced than I was, nothing could possibly go wrong. But it did? What do you think? I set up the meet. Carlson isn't dumb, whatever else he is. Bucharest isn't Moscow, but chief of station, there is an important post. If you're in Carlson's position, you don't agree to go alone to a cafe in the bad part of the city because that's what the asset wants. He had me come with him as backup. How come you never told me this story until now? Thorne shrugged. No particular reason. You never asked. Jenna smiled. I suppose we had other things in mind when we got together. So he went to the meet and you covered him. The meet was at a cafe in Ferentari. Have you ever been to Bucharest? No. Back then, Ferentari was one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world. It probably still is. Drugs, gangs, murder, you name it. There was no law in Ferentari. You were on your own. A foreigner would have to be crazy to go there. The fact that Bogdan would only meet there should have clued Lewis in. Thorne sipped his whiskey. So we go the cafe. It's after dark. There's one streetlight still working about a half block away. 
The street is empty except for a bunch of punks hanging out on a stoop down the block, smoking a joint. The cafe is a hole in the wall next to an alley. The alley is pitch black. I'm paranoid as hell, as you were armed. Oh yeah, Carlson too. We park across the street. I can see Bogdan sitting at the rear of the cafe under the fluorescent lights. I told Carlson what he looked like, but it wasn't hard to identify him. He was the only one in there except the guy behind the counter. Then what? We get out of the car. Carlson tells me to wait. I take out my gun and hold it down at my side in case it's a setup. I can't shake the feeling something's wrong. Lewis starts to cross the street when a car comes out of the alley and screeches to a stop. Two guys pile out and make a grab for him. Oh, 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 oh is right. Lewis takes down one of them with a fancy judo move. I'm trying to get a clear shot without hitting him. Bogdan comes out of the cafe with a gun in his hand. I shoot him. He goes down. By this time, Lewis has his gun out and he shoots the guy he threw onto the ground. The second guy gets one off, hits Lewis in the leg and knocks him down sprawling on the street. So that's why he limps sometimes. I always wondered about that. It's about to be lights out for Lewis. And I shoot the guy that put one in his leg, twice for good measure. The driver gets out of the car and fires at me. I shoot him. He falls down behind the car. All the time the punks on the stoop are watching the whole show, like it's for their entertainment. I run over to Lewis. Bogdan is up on his knees in the doorway of the cafe and he brings up his gun. I shoot him again and he's done. I hoist Lewis up, get him back in our car and get the hell out of there. Jesus, Mike, that's a hell of a story. All the way back to the station, Lewis is yelling about how he's bleeding to death. When we get back, I throw a field dressing on the wound. It took a chunk out of his calf, but the bullet missed the bone and arteries. He was lucky. So how come he doesn't like you? He ought to be grateful. He covered the whole thing up. He'd been suckered into a scam to get him someplace where they could grab him. If word of it got out, it would be his career in the toilet. He said if I told anyone, he'd destroy my career. After all, who were they going to believe? Me or someone who'd been in the agency for years? Knowing Carlson, he offered you a deal, Jenna said. I got a glowing fitness report from him. It included a recommendation for specialized training based on my exemplary skills demonstrated in the field, I think it said. The SSO program. Yep. Ever since then, I've had to watch my back with him. He's unhappy with you right now because of what happened in Syria, Jenna said. Kramer doesn't like messy ops where people get killed. You need to watch your step. He's going to find some way to screw you if he can. He's tried it before. Yes, but this is different. Kramer ripped him a new one. You know what she's like. He blames you. Figures. Like it's my fault a mole is screwing up his career track. He drank the rest of his whiskey. Kramer is bad news when she's pissed off. That might qualify for the understatement of the year. Jenna lifted her glass and drained it. Want another? Thorne asked. You have anything to drink at home? I still have most of a bottle of vodka in the freezer from the last time you were there. Vodka keeps. How about food? There's a steak in the fridge. I could throw it on the grill. Perfect. Let's get out of here. Jen. She stood and looked at him. What? Nothing. He dropped a 20 on the table. I'll follow you, she said. They left the bar. Thorne got into his jeep and pulled out of the lot. It was getting dark by the time they got to the house. Jenna pulled up in the driveway as he parked in the garage. He got the vodka out of the freezer and took glasses from one of the cabinets. I haven't got any vermouth. None needed, Jenna said. Straight up will be fine. He poured two glasses and handed one to her. Here's to it. They clinked and drank. The chilled vodka went down like fire and ice. Jenna let out a long breath. That's exactly what I needed. She poured another and sat down at the kitchen table. Thorne pulled the steak out of the refrigerator and set it on a plate. Jenna watched as he poured Worcestershire sauce over both sides of the cut, letting it pool. From a rack on the counter, he took garlic powder, black pepper, Himalayan salt, and Italian seasoning. He sprinkled each of the ingredients on one side of the steak, rubbed it in with his fingers, flipped the steak over and repeated what he'd done. Then he covered it with plastic wrap and set it on the counter. He washed his hands in the sink. Jenna said, can I do something? Nah, relax, I've got everything under control. Are you sure about that? She smiled at him. Would Madame like a salad with her steak? Jenna stood and came over to him. She reached up and draped her arms around his neck. Madame would like an appetizer before dinner. She kissed him, reached down, cupped him. My, she said. 
That was fast. I've missed you, Jen. Us. Come on. She took his hand and led him into the bedroom. It had been a long time since Thorne could have casual sex and not think anything more about it. Jenna had never been in the casual category. Part of him wanted to deny it. But what he felt for her at the moment was more than simple lust. He wasn't sure he was ready for it. As they undressed, she touched the bandage on his side. Does it hurt? Nothing to worry about. She looked at a row of deep scratches on his leg. What happened to your leg? That's from a guard dog who tried to eat me. It wasn't his fault. Kiss me, she said. Some things the body never forgets. There was none of the awkwardness between them common to new lovers. She was ready for him when he entered her. They moved together for what seemed like a long time, eyes locked. When they came together, it shook him to the core. After a minute, he kissed her, brushed damp hair away from her face. Whoa, he said. Whoa, yourself. This was probably a bad idea. Probably. It's going to complicate everything. Maybe. It doesn't have to. I want this, she said. So do I. If Carlson finds out, he'll use it against us. Then we'll make sure he doesn't, Thorne said. Now I'm hungry, she said. That steak should be ready for the grill by now. He got out of bed, pulled on his shorts, and walked barefoot into the kitchen. He went out onto the patio and lit the grill. When he came back in, Jenna was pulling salad ingredients out of the refrigerator. This lettuce is looking a little sad, she said. I haven't been to the store since before Syria. That explains it. She peeled away leaves until she found some that felt almost crisp. Later, after they'd eaten, they sat outside with fresh drinks. Jenna sighed. That was a serious sigh, Thorne said. What are you thinking about? I was wondering what it would be like to have a normal life, she said. Normal. You know what I mean. Less stress, more time to relax, take a vacation, stuff like that. You think it's possible? That kind of life? Not for me. Not for you either. Even if I was lying on a beach somewhere, I'd be worried about the things going on that most people don't know about. Like advanced Russian missiles in Syria. Like that. Somebody's got to do what we do. You think it makes any difference? I don't know. I try not to think about it. I used to think it does, Jenna said. Now I'm not so sure. Thorne looked over at her. You want to stay over? Don't ask dumb questions, she said. Psst. If you're enjoying this book and want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 17. President Campbell's morning hadn't started well. Being president wasn't all it was cracked up to be, and Washington was a long way from the grasslands of South Dakota. He'd woken up with a headache, unrested after a few hours of sleep. He'd forgotten what it was like to get a good night's sleep. A low-grade headache throbbed at the base of his skull. He'd washed down a couple of aspirin, gotten ready for the day, and headed for the breakfast room and a cup of coffee. Amy Campbell was sitting at the table, sipping a glass of orange juice and reading the morning paper. This was the one time of the day when they kept everyone away. Private time. There wasn't much of that. Morning, babe. You're up early. He kissed her on top of her head. I couldn't sleep. I didn't want to wake you, so I got up. Campbell sat down, poured himself a cup of coffee from a silver pot, and brushed jam on a piece of toast. His wife folded the paper and set it down on the table. She looked at her husband. He seemed to have aged a year, only a few months into the job. He looks so tired he needs a break. We haven't been to Camp David yet. Do you think you could get away for a weekend? Campbell took a bite of his toast. I'd like that. Maybe in a few weeks. My predecessor left things a mess. There are too many of his people still holding office. I'm meeting a lot of resistance. It's never anything overt, but things get shuffled aside or delayed. I knew Washington was going to be a tough nut to crack. I didn't know how tough. I'm beginning to find out. It's why you were elected, she said. People have faith in you. You'll find a way to do it. Campbell looked at his watch and started to rise. I have to start the day. Take your pills, Richard, she said. He looked at a small dish containing a dozen vitamin and supplement capsules. I hate taking all these damn pills. Stop grumbling and take them. She smiled at him. They keep you healthy. The little green ones will help keep your energy level up. Yes, doctor, he said. He began swallowing the pills. A half an hour later, Campbell was sitting behind his desk in the Oval Office. DCI Kramer had finished briefing him about the Russian missiles. The analysts at Langley had confirmed upgraded SS-400 were being installed at Latakia and the new Russian base near Dir Azor. 
General Kroger was in the room, along with Kaplan and Walter Covington, the National Security Advisor. You're certain of this, Director? Campbell said. Yes, sir. Mr. President, those are damn good missiles, Kroger said. I hate to say it, but they're better than ours. They can knock out almost anything we can throw at them. By bringing them in, they've upped the ante. You have any more bad news for me today, Director? Yes, sir, I'm afraid I have. They've also moved two squadrons of Su-35 from Latakia to the new base. How many planes is that? Twenty-four, Mr. President. The Su-35 is a fighter bomber. It's an offensive weapon. Two squadrons is a significant commitment. They wouldn't do that unless they intend to use them. General Kroger, what is your analysis of the situation? Sir, all indications are that Sevim is about to invade Syria and eliminate what he paints as the Kurdish threat to his regime. He's on a mission to avenge his son's death. When he goes after them, the Kurds will be forced to pull troops from everywhere else to reinforce their front. At that point, I believe the Russians will launch their offensive and go after the fields. Everything they're doing confirms our earlier suspicions. Director Kramer, I agree with General Kroger, sir. Everything points to a combined ground and air offensive against the Kurds. The only possible objective is the oil. Campbell turned to the National Security Advisor. Walter, what's your opinion? Walter Covington was 42 years old, Ivy League educated, and ambitious. He still had the fair-haired look and athletic build of his days at Yale, where he'd played quarterback. That had been the year they'd won the Ivy League championship. Losing was not a common word in Covington's vocabulary. President Campbell had run on the promise of a balanced and bipartisan approach to government. Covington was a hawk, picked to help balance those within his administration who tended to confuse appeasement with diplomacy. Harold Kaplan was the acknowledged spokesman for that group. Sir, you need to let Tarasov know we are not going to stand by and let him grab that oil. Kaplan spoke up. How do you propose to stop him? He's got the best part of 10,000 combat troops on the ground and plenty of air power to back them up. If we do anything, we risk war. You'd let him get away with it. I don't think Syria's oil is worth World War III, Kaplan said. It doesn't have to lead to that, Covington said. Tarasov knows he can't win a war with us. Tarasov isn't in control. His generals are. Mr. President, Covington said. If we don't do something, they'll think we're weak. That never works out well. Look at what happened when nobody stopped Hitler in 1936. This isn't 1936, Kaplan said. History doesn't repeat itself. Covington looked at Kaplan in disbelief. I can't believe you said that. If history teaches us anything, it's that it always repeats itself, unless somebody pays attention. Maybe it's time we figured that out. All right, Campbell said. General, what do you suggest? Sir, you asked me to prepare an option for this situation. Go on. At present, we have 500 advisors on the ground in Syria. They're about 50 kilometers from the new Russian base. I propose we reinforce them with a regiment from the 75th Rangers, out of Fort Benning. That's 2,000 men. They can be in place within 24 hours. That will show Tarasov we will not be intimidated. You want to send 2,000 Rangers in there? That's asking for trouble, Kaplan said. It will let the Russians know we mean business. What are the chances of the Russians engaging our troops? Campbell said. I don't think they're dumb enough to do that, Kroger said. What if you're wrong? Kaplan said. Mr. President, how are you going to explain it to the American people if any of our boys are killed over there? Campbell's headache came back with a vengeance. It sent a stab of pain shivering through his skull. He clasped his hands and rested his arms on his desk. General Kroger, we have to avoid an armed confrontation with the Russians at all costs. I agree that we can't allow Tarasov to do whatever he wants, but I'm not willing to authorize a troop deployment. It's too big a gamble. Tarasov already has the advantage of an established base with superior air power and defenses. We will wait and see how it plays out. I'm not going to have American soldiers dying for Syrian oil. Prepare a plan to get our people out of there if it becomes necessary. Mr. President, I've made my decision, General. Yes, sir. On the way out to their vehicles, General Kroger and Rebecca Kramer once again found themselves walking together. Campbell is making another mistake, Kroger said. He's worried about starting a world war, Kramer said. I don't believe it would come to that. He has to consider what Congress would do. Except for a few hardcore cases, nobody over there gives a damn what happens to the Kurds. Public opinion as well. The hell with the public. They don't know anything. No, 
but it would be helpful if they demanded a strong American response to Russia's actions, something that would force Campbell to act. The public will never support that. Perhaps we can help change their mind, Kramer said. What do you mean? The media is easily manipulated. It's a simple enough matter to stir up outrage once the Russians start rolling over the Kurds. You know how it works. Pictures of crying children, bombed out buildings, mothers wailing, burning oil fields polluting the skies. The media loves things like that. And then, and then once the outcry to do something is loud and clear, you present the president with a military option to punish the Russians that doesn't involve sending in more troops. Something that will force Tarasov to back off. What would that be? I'm sure you'll think of something, she said. Chapter 18 The Russian equivalent of the Pentagon was situated on the Moscow River, not far from the Kremlin. Tarasov and his senior officers were seated in the war room, watching a live satellite feed of Turkish tanks and infantry streaming across the border into Syria. Buried 300 feet below the surface, the war room was three stories high, the heart of the National Control Defense Center. The lowest level was filled with six long rows of computer consoles that allowed instant communication with any and all of the Federation's diverse military forces. The consoles were segregated by service, as could be seen by the different markings on the uniforms of the men and women sitting at them. Images of the Turkish invasion from a satellite orbiting over Syria were displayed on a gigantic screen. Two long tiers of U-shaped balconies faced the screen and overlooked the floor below. The balconies were lined with rows of red leather chairs. Tarasov sat in the exact middle of the front row on the first tier, looking at the images on the screen. He was flanked to either side by General Kerensky and Defense Minister Fedorov. First Deputy Defense Minister Stepanov sat next to Fedorov. The rest of the chairs were filled with the Russian general staff and ranking officers of the Federation's Army and Air Force. The second tier was currently empty. It begins, Tarasov said. Yes, Mr. President, Kerensky said. Sevim's tanks and planes will make short work of initial resistance, but they haven't come up against the main defensive positions of the SDF yet. The Kurds always knew this day would come. They've prepared for it. They know what they're doing, and they know what they're up against. They've placed their heavy weapons using features in the terrain to slow the Turks down. It will give them time to bring up reinforcements. Can they win? No, Mr. President. Not if Sevim is serious about crushing them. Their air force is limited to some aging F-16s and a few helicopters. They don't have enough weaponry to beat him. But it will be a costly victory for the Turks. The Kurds are dug in and determined. It's bound to drag on for quite a while. Have they begun moving reinforcements from the oil fields? Yes, sir. As we anticipated, some detachments of their forces protecting the fields are moving to meet the Turkish advance. What are the American advisors doing? Nothing. I've received reliable intelligence that they are not going to do anything, Kerensky said. The security services have a highly placed source in Washington who reports their president will evacuate them if necessary. As I thought, Tarasov said. The man is weak. It will be necessary at some stage to remove them, Kerensky said. All in good time, General. Perhaps their president will take care of that for us. Make sure there are no incidents that force the Americans to react. Yes, Mr. President. Operation Eagle, ready to begin on your command, Mr. President. Open the link to General Chernov. Kerensky spoke into his headset. Seconds later, General Chernov's voice sounded in Tarasov's ear. Yes, Mr. President. General Chernov, are you ready to execute? There was only one possible answer. Yes, sir. Our forces stand ready awaiting your command. The motherland is depending on you, General. I have every confidence you will carry out your mission with full success. Thank you, Mr. President. I will relay your words to our troops. Very well. You may begin operations immediately. Yes, sir. Tarasov broke the connection. In Syria, General Chernov turned to his commanders. Eagle is to begin immediately. Pass the word. He looked at his watch. Final briefing in 30 minutes at 0830. Dismissed. Outside the headquarters building, Colonel Novikov turned to Major Gorky. All right, Nikolai. Form up the brigade and get them ready to roll. The Twelfth will take the lead with their tanks. The men won't like that, sir. They expect to be in the front of the action. They'll be happy enough when they see what the tanks do to the Kurdish positions. There will be plenty of action, you can be sure of that. Sir, Gorky saluted and went off to carry out his orders. Chapter 19 
Captain Grigory Volkov stood in the open hatch of his armored personnel carrier, waiting for the command to advance. He was already sweating under the weight of his body armor. The sun was a blazing ball of yellow fire in a cloudless blue sky, a promise of searing temperatures to come later in the day. Grigory's vehicle was a testament to the skills of Russian military designers. It had eight large wheels and a 260-horsepower diesel engine that could do better than 50 miles an hour over level ground. It was armed with a 30 mm cannon and a 7.62 mm machine gun. The carrier was manned by a crew of three and carried seven Special Forces soldiers loaded down with a variety of weapons. Kevlar plating and a reinforced floor protected the occupants against bullets, mines, and IEDs. If needed, an overpressure system was designed to counteract nuclear or chemical attack. It was even air conditioned, though Grigori had little confidence that feature would continue to function in the Syrian heat. Electronic support for the vehicle commander was a technological marvel. Grigori had the use of advanced GPS and topographical maps, satellite navigation, and night vision functions. Using his headset, he could communicate with his crew, the brigade command vehicle, each of his platoon commanders, and every other vehicle in his company. Major Gorky's command vehicle idled at the head of the column. He had chosen Grigori's Alpha Company to be first in formation behind him. It was a source of personal satisfaction, an acknowledgement of his leadership. Grigori looked out at the featureless sands of the Syrian desert. Kurdish territory was less than an hour's drive away. His excitement was beginning to build the first hint of adrenaline making its way through his veins. All his senses were heightened. There was a hard metallic taste in his mouth. He took a deep breath. The air smelled of diesel fumes and hot metal and desert dust, the smell of war. Grigori couldn't think of any place he'd rather be than here, feeling the vibration of the idling engine under his feet. Ever since he could remember, he'd wanted to be a soldier. His father had reached the rank of full colonel in the SVR and had expected his sons to follow in his footsteps. Grigori had never wanted to be anything like his father. He'd never forgiven him for his cruelty, for the way Arkady Volkov had bullied all of them. He still bore the marks of his father's belt buckle on his back. The evening before, he'd meant to call Anya. It had slipped his mind. Now it was too late. I wonder what she's doing. You've gone far, big sister. Thinking of Anya made him think of Mikhail. Mikhail had doted on his big brother and sister. It had been natural that he'd follow them into the army. That would have been all right. Except for the incompetence of the idiot lieutenant responsible for Mikhail's useless death. The man should have been court-martialed, but he was well-connected. He had received only a mild reprimand. Grigori had learned the man had been promoted and was working a desk job in Rostov. He decided that when he got back after this operation, he'd look him up, catch him off base, teach him a lesson. A head and shoulders emerged from the open hatch on his left. Sergeant Pavel Vasilyev had been Grigory's driver for the better part of two years. Going to be another hot one, sir, Vasilyev said. The air conditioning is broken again. Too bad we can't open the vents for that desert breeze. You've been spoiled by all that nice cold air, Sergeant. That's right, sir. If they didn't want to spoil us, why add it in the first place? They put it there for you, Pavel. So you'd have something to bitch about when it stopped working. Vasilyev grinned at him. Got that right, sir. Everybody loaded up in back. Like caviar in a tin, Captain. A cloud of dust rose ahead. As tanks of the 12th motorized infantry began rolling. Grigori would have liked it better if the 22nd was out in front. But it made sense to let the tanks take the first brunt of whatever the Kurds might have ready for them. He heard a short burst of static in his earpiece, then Major Gorky's voice. All units prepare to move out. Here we go, sir. Vasilyev ducked into his compartment, pulling the hatch shut with a metallic clang. Grigori did a final comm check with his platoon commanders and dropped down next to him, closing the hatch. It was forbidden to drive the vehicles with the hatches open. At least the broken AC kept air circulating. Minutes later, the formation began moving toward the highway leading to Deir Ez-Zor. From there, they would cross the Euphrates into Kurdish territory. Deir Ez-Zor had been heavily damaged during the civil war of the decade before. The regime had rebuilt the city with Russian help, but had never been able to oust the Kurds from the oil fields on the other side of the river. Once across the Euphrates, the heaviest concentration of the wells under Kurdish control were to the east and south. Phase one of the battle plan called for the columns to cross the river and split into two elements. 
one element would head east under the command of Colonel Brezhnev from the 12th, eliminating opposition along the way before turning south. The second element, led by Colonel Novikov, would turn south as soon as they crossed the river. Eventually, the Russian forces would meet up near the town of Abu Kamal, close to the southern border with Iraq. That would secure the bulk of the fields under Kurdish control. At that point, attention could be turned to the remainder of the fields in the northeast. As they neared Deir Ezzor, the desert sands gave way to fields of crops irrigated by the life-giving waters of the Euphrates. Motorcycle outriders had gone ahead and cleared the way. People watched in silence as the Russian columns rumbled through, wondering if the city was about to be destroyed again. Grigori's company crossed the Euphrates into Kurdish territory and headed east onto a harsh yellow plain dotted with oil pumps rising and falling in monotonous rhythm. They looked like huge metal birds dipping their beaks. There was no cover. If an air attack came, the columns would be sitting ducks, but Grigori wasn't worried. The SDF didn't have many planes. If they showed up, Russian fighters would take care of them. The Americans wouldn't dare interfere. A flight of Su-35S screamed by overhead, headed somewhere to the east. He almost felt sorry for the Kurds. Those planes would turn their positions into rubble. The first objective was a large refinery and distribution junction ten kilometers east of the highway. So far they'd encountered no resistance, but Grigori knew it couldn't last. The refinery could be seen in the distance, a sprawling complex of buildings and towers. The planes had bombed it. Thick columns of black smoke rose into the morning sky, lit with an orange glow from the raging fires below. The air conditioning began working again. It made the interior almost comfortable. Grigori scanned the objective through his optics. He couldn't spot any of the enemy, only smoke and flames. Had they abandoned the refinery and fled? The column had almost reached the outer buildings when someone in the complex opened up with a heavy machine gun. Suddenly the air filled with the crackle of small arms fire. Bullets glanced off the carrier with a ringing metallic sound. They followed the waving red pennant on Colonel Brezhnev's command vehicle toward the muzzle flashes of the guns. Major Gorky's vehicle was off to the left. Static crackled in Grigori's comm set. Eagle 6 to all units. Enemy ahead in force. Engage at will. Eagle 6 was Brezhnev. Adrenaline pumped through Grigori's veins. You heard him, Vasilyev, Grigori said. Sasha, keep an eye on those buildings. Sasha Turgenev was Grigori's gunner. The 30 millimeter cannon was a powerful weapon, with enough force to penetrate the steel plate used in most armored personnel carriers. Against a building, it could blow holes through walls with ease. It was getting noisy inside the carrier. The autoloader clacked in word as it fed ammunition to the gun. A steady hail of bullets rang loud against the armor as they roared into the refinery complex. The turret made a whining sound as Sasha traversed back and forth searching for targets. Suddenly Brezhnev's command vehicle vanished, engulfed in a ball of smoke and flame. There was no time to think about it. A trail of white smoke erupted from one of the buildings. A rocket-propelled grenade streaked toward them. Left, left, RPG, Grigori shouted. Vasilyev swerved, too late. The grenade hit the troop compartment in the back of the carrier. The sound was like nothing Grigori had ever heard. It felt like a giant hammer had swung down out of the sky and slammed against the side of the vehicle. He was thrown off his seat. He hit the hard metal side of the carrier, driving his helmet down over his eyes. It hurt. He felt blood trickling down his cheek. The turn left had exposed one of the few vulnerable spots on the carrier. The explosion had blasted through the armor. In the troop compartment behind Grigori, men were on fire. Their terrible screams froze him in place. A second rocket exploded against the front, and the carrier stopped moving. Grigori looked to his left. Vasilyev was slumped over the big steering wheel. Blood ran down his face. Smoke filled the compartment. Coughing, Grigori leaned to the side and unlocked the hatch above his unconscious driver, then threw open the hatch over his head. Dizzy, he hauled himself out until he lay on the top of the vehicle. Tracers streaked through the air. For every round he saw, nine more were invisible. Rifle flashes blinked and stuttered in the dark window openings of the refinery buildings. The air was dense with the sound of automatic fire. Explosions echoed all around. Bullets passed over him, ricocheted off the turret, whined away. A discordant symphony of death. He crawled over to the driver's hatch and lifted it up, then bent down and pulled Vasilyev through the opening. A bullet punched into his thigh, almost knocking him off the vehicle. 
It was like being hit by a truck. His leg went numb. He kept hold of Vasiliev and dragged him to the side, lowering him down to the ground. Then he crawled back to his hatch and dropped down into the compartment below. Sasha's legs dangled from the turret. Coughing and choking in thick black smoke, he got Sasha down. Grigori couldn't feel his left leg. Somehow he struggled up through the command hatch, then reached down and hauled his gunner out of the burning BTR. Another bullet struck him as he pushed Sasha over the side. He rolled off the carrier and landed on his back on the hard ground. Grigori lay there looking up at the sky. Something blocked the light. Captain, Vasiliev, why is he there? Vasiliev was saying something, but he couldn't hear what it was. He couldn't feel anything. There was no pain. Only a sickening feeling of falling, faster and faster. He wanted to tell Vasiliev to help Sasha, but he couldn't speak. Anya, then the world dropped away. Chapter 20 Two days after the Russians crossed the Euphrates, Anya and her mother were watching television. All three major channels were reporting on the operations in Syria. All the channels carried the same commentary, glowing accounts of an unstoppable Russian advance. Anya was worried. She knew the truth behind the propaganda spewing from the TV. The Kurds were putting up stiff resistance, more than had been anticipated. It was only the end of the second day and the advance was already slowing down. Russian casualties were heavy, far surpassing estimates. Even though Kurdish forces had been siphoned off to fight the Turks, a determined contingent had remained behind to protect the oil. What was supposed to be a quick and painless victory had turned into a savage, bloody battle with no holds barred. The tanks had proved vulnerable to suicidal Kurds armed with courage and the latest American anti-tank weapons. Every building, even the smallest shack, was heavily defended. The Kurds had sophisticated anti-aircraft weapons, a gift from the Americans. They hadn't stopped attacks from the air, but they had made them costly. One Su-35 cost the equivalent of 85 million American dollars. Six had already been shot down. The outcome of the operation was not in doubt. In the end, control of the oil fields would pass to Moscow. But President Tarasov wasn't getting the quick and popular victory he had counted on. Russian forces had steered clear of the American troops in the area. But Anya worried that someone might make a mistake and trigger a much larger war. As far as she was concerned, nothing short of a direct attack on the motherland could justify that. There had been times during her career when Anya had wondered why she had been ordered to do something. Even so, she'd never questioned the necessity for what she was asked to do. She had always assumed there were good reasons for those orders, even if she didn't know what they were. But this adventure in Syria was different. It bothered her. Russia had plenty of oil. What was happening in Syria was political, a chess move on the world stage. It wasn't about defending the motherland, no matter what the television announcers said. The Kurds were no threat to the Federation. Her countrymen were dying because of politics. It felt wrong more than wrong. She wished she could do something about it, but that wasn't possible. On screen, a well-known Moscow TV anchor stood by the side of a highway somewhere east of the Euphrates, facing the camera. He wore a helmet that was too small for him, and a vest that made him look like someone playing soldier. Smoke rose in the distance, over ancient land that might once have been the biblical Garden of Eden. A stream of Russian vehicles rolled by behind him, throwing up clouds of dust. His prideful commentary made it clear the Russians were there at the request of their staunch ally, President Kalim al-Khali, to help drive out the Kurdish occupiers who were plundering Syria's vast oil reserves. Elements of the 22nd Special Purpose Brigade and the 12th Motorized Rifle Brigade have been engaged since the beginning of operations to ensure the security of our nation. Our troops are advancing at a steady pace. Some resistance has been reported, but the enemy had better watch out. Our brave soldiers will soon make short work of them. Yulia put her hand to her mouth. Grigori is in the 22nd. Did you know about this, Anya? Eagle was no longer a secret. There was no reason to hide her knowledge. Yes, mother, I knew about it. Why didn't you tell me? What if something happens to Grigori? I didn't want to worry you. Besides, I wasn't allowed to tell you. That's no excuse. You should have told me. I wasn't allowed to, Anya said again. The operation was secret. Your father was always keeping secrets, Yulia said, her voice unhappy. A knock came at the door. Anya rose from the couch. I'll get it. It's late. Why is anyone coming here now? She went to the door and opened it. 
Two officers in dress uniform stood there, one of them a woman. Anya had a sudden sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach. There was only one reason why these people would be here this late at night. Colonel Volkova. Her mouth was dry. Yes, I am Colonel Volkova. I am Captain Brzezinski. It is my sad duty to inform you that your brother, Captain Grigory Volkov, has fallen in battle. The words paralyzed her. Anya stood rooted to the floor, unable to move. Yulia's voice came from the other room. Anya, what is it? He can't be dead, it must be a mistake. I talked to him a week ago. Colonel Volkova, are you all right? He can't be, they've made a mistake. Her heart began pounding. A wave of dizziness swept over her. Anya put her hand on her chest, feeling as though she might faint. Then it passed. She looked at Captain Brzezinski. You are certain? There's no possibility of a mistake? I am very sorry, Colonel. How? What happened? Captain Volkov's vehicle was disabled by a rocket attack. Your brother is a hero, Colonel. He was under continuous fire and severely wounded. He disregarded his wounds and managed to get his crew to safety before he succumbed. You can be proud of him. Please accept the condolences of the nation for his death. He died for the motherland. Died for the motherland. The words echoed in her mind. Grigori was dead. Dead. Anya, her mother, had come into the hall. She saw the two officers. Anya, what do they want? Anya took a deep breath. It's Grigori, mother. Grigori, is he all right? Mother. Yulia looked at the two officers standing in the hallway. The blood drained from her face. No, she said. She clasped her chest and fell to the floor. Shit, the captain said. He pushed his way past Anya and knelt down. Yulia's face was an odd color, her breathing harsh and labored. Lieutenant Peshkov, call an ambulance. Anya felt like she was standing outside of herself, as if she were in a bad dream and couldn't wake up. Sound faded. She saw the lieutenant call for help without understanding the words. She saw Captain Brzezinski pushing on her mother's chest. All she could think about was what he'd said. Died for the motherland. She realized Lieutenant Peshkov was saying something. What did you say? I said an ambulance is on the way, Colonel. Thank you, Lieutenant. I'm sorry, ma'am. Yes, Grigori is gone. My sweet brother is gone. For what? For nothing. Then I helped make it happen. She wanted to strike out to scream at Brzezinski. Of course she couldn't do that. It wasn't his fault. Someone was to blame, but it wasn't him. It was too soon to feel grief, but she knew it would come. She was aware of something else building inside her, demanding to get out, demanding to be heard. Anger. No, something more intense than that, something more primal. Rage. Chapter 21 Anya sat unmoving at the kitchen table, watching a wisp of steam rise from her cup of tea, getting ready to visit her mother in the hospital. She was thinking of Grigori and why he'd been sent to Syria in the first place. She'd spent a lot of time the last few days thinking about that. The more she thought about it, the angrier she became. She didn't like where her thoughts were taking her. The official explanation for the war was that Federation troops had gone into Syria at the request of the regime in Damascus. The public believed it, but Anya knew it was a lie. Operation Eagle was only the opening move in a larger game. The generals were playing with fire. The risk of igniting a larger war was real. The Russian operation had destabilized the region. The world was nervous. All of the Middle East had gone to high alert. She didn't believe the Americans would stand by and let Tarasov do whatever he wanted. They'd have to respond. Whatever the response was, it wouldn't be good. She couldn't sleep at night thinking about what war with the West would look like. The images were too horrible to contemplate. Nothing was worth starting World War III, certainly not Syria's oil. A major confrontation with America could go nuclear. If that happened, her homeland would be destroyed. The Federation didn't need more oil. Russia had enough proven reserves to cover her needs for the next 30 years. The oil was an excuse. Why were troops in Syria? Why had her brother been there? It sure as hell wasn't to assist the corrupt regime of Kalim al-Khali. Tarasov was allied with a core group of senior generals who wanted to bring back the power Russia had wielded in the days of the Soviet Union. The election was coming soon. His popularity had taken a big jump because of the Syrian offensive. People saw it as a resurgence of Russian strength, something to make them feel proud of their country again. Grigori died because Tarasov wanted to look good in the polls. The realization triggered a sudden rush of adrenaline. Her heart began pounding. It felt like someone had grabbed her head and squeezed. 
She took deep breaths, calming herself. Of course it wasn't that simple. Or was it? It didn't really matter. What mattered was that Grigori was dead for no good reason. Dead because of powerful men who wanted even more power. They had killed both her brothers, one through incompetence and one through an unnecessary war. Stupid men putting her country and the world at risk. It's wrong, wrong. They have to be stopped. I have to do something. She drank some of her tea, then got up to go to the hospital. They had put her mother in a private room, an unexpected luxury. The room was painted in soothing shades of blue, pleasant and quiet. The nurses and doctors were polite and respectful. They all knew what had brought on Yulia's heart attack. Anya sat by her mother's bed holding her hand. You're going to be all right, mother, Anya said. I've talked with the doctors. You'll be going home tomorrow, but you'll have to take it easy for a while. I've arranged for someone to stay with you when I'm at work. Yulia squeezed Anya's hand. You have always been a good daughter, Anya. I'm sorry I've been difficult these last years. Since she stopped. I know, Anya said. Since Mikhail died. Oh, Anya, why Grigori too? She couldn't tell her mother what she knew, that Grigori's death was meaningless. Yulia would never believe his death was useless. It was the only way she could accept the pain. It would be cruel to tell her the truth. I don't know, mother. I don't know why. At least he died fighting to keep our country safe. Sometimes sacrifice is necessary for the good of the motherland. A hero, Anya. At least there's that. Your father would have been proud of him. In spite of her determination not to say anything, something slipped out. His death wasn't necessary, mother. Of course it was. Don't say that. Soldiers die in war and Grigori was a soldier. Our leaders would never have sent him into harm's way if it wasn't necessary. Anya said, I was thinking. She stopped as two men entered the room. Both were in uniform, one a major, the other a senior sergeant. The sergeant carried a camera. Colonel Volkova? He saluted. I'm Major Nikitin with Krasnya Zvezda. This is Senior Sergeant Lebedev. May I offer my condolences on the loss of your brother? Red Star was the official newspaper of the Ministry of Defense. It was widely read throughout the Russian military. Thank you, Major. Why are you here? We're running a feature article about your brother's heroic actions on the battlefield. It will be part of an ongoing series featuring you and your family. Senior Sergeant, you may begin. Get pictures. Sir, Lebedev began taking pictures of Anya and her mother. Anya remembered the conversation with Stepanov at the party, when he'd told her she'd been chosen to become the face of women in the military. They were using Grigori's death to kick off their campaign. She felt her face flush with anger. Ma'am, would you look at the camera, please? Lebedev said to Yulia. Bastards, Anya thought. Chapter 22 Major Gorky and his men proceeded against stiff resistance toward Syria's eastern border with Iraq. Gorky's orders were clear. He was to avoid the American advisors located in the area. Under no circumstances was he to engage them. The realities of combat didn't always match orders given in the calm before battle. Things happened that couldn't be predicted. Even in a world where technology and sophisticated communications eliminated some of the problems that had plagued commanders since the days of the pharaohs. The nature of war was confusion and uncertainty, a truth recognized by every competent commander. It was called the fog of war and was taught in every military academy in the world. By the time they encountered the American patrol, the 22nd had suffered heavy casualties. Colonel Brezhnev was dead. Gorky was now in command of the eastward advance. His best company commander had been killed while rescuing his wounded crew. The Kurds had stubbornly refused to surrender or run, and they were armed with the latest American weapons. The soldiers of the 22nd were pissed. They were hot and they were tired, and they'd been taking intermittent fire for several hours. They came over a rise and saw an armored personnel carrier and three Humvees headed straight for them. Gorky opened fire. It was one of those incidents that happens in war. The American vehicles looked a lot like the Kurdish ones. There was nothing unusual about that, since most of the Kurdish vehicles had been provided by the Pentagon. American and Kurdish units were painted in a similar desert camouflage pattern. The firefight was brief and brutal. When it was over, 14 Americans and 18 Russians were dead. One of Gorky's APCs was in flames, a second was disabled, and the American units had been destroyed. It wasn't until he came alongside the burning remains of the lead American vehicle and saw the markings that Major Gorky discovered his mistake. 
Asterisk, 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 asterisk. In Washington, D.C., it was evening. Rebecca Kramer had poured herself a glass of white wine and picked up a book when her secured line rang. The display showed it was from her deputy director, Scott Davidson. She picked up. Yes, Scott. There's been an incident in Syria. The Russians fired on an American patrol. Casualties. Fourteen of our people. Eighteen Russians. Confirmed. We were using Echo listening to the Russian commander. Confirmation is straight from the horse's mouth. Echo was one of America's most coveted secrets. A program that captured Russian military communications in real time. Langley had been listening to the Russians talk about what had happened. I'm on my way, Kramer said. She disconnected, dialed, and called back her bodyguards and driver. Evening traffic was snarled. It was an hour before she was back in her office on the seventh floor. There were many perks that went with her job as head of America's most powerful intelligence agency. One of them was a private kitchen and dining room. Someone was always there to provide food and whatever else might be needed. The first thing she did was call for coffee, lots of it. A written brief on the incident lay on her desk. There was a light knock on the door and her deputy director came in. Kramer didn't like many people, but she appreciated Davidson. It would have been going too far to call him a friend. Rebecca Kramer didn't have friends. She had colleagues and few of those. Davidson was on the list. Davidson was 61 years old, with thinning hair turning gray. More than 30 of those years had been spent in the agency. He wore a dark suit tailored to conceal a slight scoliosis that hiked one shoulder higher than the other. His face looked as if it hadn't been quite finished. One cheekbone was higher than the other. The corner of his mouth on that side turned slightly upward. His eyes were a hazel color, his eyebrows almost non-existent. He had on a light blue shirt open at the collar. Davidson usually wore a tie, but it went into his pocket after working hours. Ten o'clock at night qualified as after hours. Coffee! She gestured at the sideboard where a gleaming pot stood next to an array of cups and saucers. There's a fresh pot over there. I could use a caffeine hit. It's been a long day. He poured a cup and pulled up a chair near Kramer's desk. This is going to be a real shitstorm, he said. Run it by me. Our people were out on a routine patrol. Their orders were to observe Russian activity if possible. They had strict orders not to engage. Something went wrong. Who fired first? Davidson shrugged. The Russians, but it's a moot point. We can't prove it was them and they can't prove it was us. The Kurds have been giving the Russians hell. My guess is someone got a little trigger happy. I guarantee they'll say we fired first when it goes public. Of course they will, Kramer said. It may even be true. Like you said, it's a moot point. Does the president know? I figured that was your call, director. The Joint Chiefs will have gotten the word by now. Okay, call in analysis DI operations. Have them come in now. We'll meet in the bubble. DI was digital information. She had told Davidson to have the directors of three of Langley's five directorates come in. The bubble was a completely secure room in the heart of the building. Anything else? No, that's it for now. Thank you, Scott. No problem. I'll get on it. He left the room. Kramer called General Kroger. I was about to call you, Kroger said. You've been briefed. Those Russian bastards killed 14 of our men. They paid the price, though. You remember what we spoke about at the White House? Of course. Sad as it is, the deaths of those soldiers gives us the key to stirring up public opinion. The media will be all over this. It won't take much to get people demanding the president do something about the Russians. That's cold, Rebecca. You know I'm right, General. Unfortunately, you are. Have you thought about what might be done to discourage Tarasov's adventurism? Adventurism. I guess that's one way to put it. Yes, I have. Kroger told her what he had in mind. I knew I could count on you, Kramer said. Chapter 23. President Campbell was running on caffeine and irritation. The incident in Syria hadn't gone public yet, but it wouldn't be long before it did. Kramer had tipped the press, though Campbell didn't know that. By afternoon, everyone would know American soldiers had been killed in a firefight with the Russians. On the evening news, the anchors would put on grim faces and pontificate about Russian ambitions in the Middle East. The pundits would clamor for the president to do something. Retired generals would be trotted out and asked for their opinion. Their hawkish comments would be treated like pearls of wisdom. The report on American deaths would be spiced up with shots of mothers weeping over dead children. 
and heart-rending videos of terrified refugees fleeing the Russian advance. Public outrage would build. By the next day, protesters would gather outside the White House grounds holding up signs demanding Campbell do something about Russian aggression in Syria. It was another detail Kramer had taken care of. Kramer, General Kroger, Harold Kaplan, and Walter Covington were with the president in the Oval Office. Kramer had dressed in a black Prada business suit with flared shoulders that brought out the sharp angles of her face. She looks like a witch, Kaplan thought. Kroger, as always, wore his uniform. The four silver stars on his shoulders glittered whenever he moved. Covington had chosen a gray suit and silver tie. Kaplan and the president were the only people in the room whose clothes appeared a little rumpled. Well, General, what the hell happened? It appears to have been an accident of war, Mr. President. Our people were told to observe Russian movements. They were under orders not to engage. Intercepts of Russian communications indicate the confrontation was unexpected and unplanned. They had been taking a beating from the Kurds. Our vehicles are similar to what the Kurds are using. They probably thought our boys were the enemy. General, I can't tell the American people it was an accident and no one is to blame. No, sir, you can't. What is the situation in Syria? Russian troops have captured more than half of the territory that was under Kurdish control. That includes most of the southern oil fields. We always knew the Kurds couldn't withstand overwhelming military force. Units of the SDF still combat effective are reforming and retreating to the northeast. It's going to be tough for the Russians to get them out of there. What are the Turks doing? They've established a large exclusion zone along the border. Turkish troops have stopped advancing for the moment but Savim may have intentions of going farther into Syrian territory. He truly hates the Kurds, and he's determined to kill as many of them as he can. The war has created a refugee crisis. Tens of thousands of people have been displaced by the Turkish and Russian advances. Savim needs to stop. Harold, I want to talk to him. Today, set it up. Yes, Mr. President. I want options. Walter, what's our best course of action now that there's blood on the ground? Sir... Tarasov cannot be allowed to get away with murdering Americans. We need to send him a message. Kaplan spoke up. It wasn't Tarasov that killed our people. Not personally. But he's the one who sent troops to Syria in the first place. If they hadn't been there, our men would still be alive. That makes him responsible. What kind of message would you send? Campbell said. One he understands, Mr. President. Americans are dead because of his actions. He's crossed the line. Are you suggesting a military response? I'm not going to countenance putting troops on the ground. In fact, I intend to pull out our advisors before anyone else gets killed. Kroger forced himself to remain silent. Walter is right, Mr. President, Kramer said. A strong response of some kind is required. People are angry. They expect you to do something. Sir, General Kroger said. There might be a way to do it without inserting troops. A way to pressure Tarasov to withdraw. I'm all ears, General. So far, he's had a free hand in Syria. He thinks you're weak, that you have no will to confront him in a meaningful way. He doesn't believe you are capable of ordering a firm response. Rebecca Kramer smiled to herself. Kroger had just told Campbell that Tarasov didn't respect him. Kroger continued, We have to put pressure on him. Enough pressure so he realizes it's in his best interest to pull back. How do you intend to do that without inserting troops? Campbell asked. We could use the Navy, sir, and we can do it without firing a shot, Kroger said. You've lost me, General. The Russians have only one warm water outlet that's open all year, from the Black Sea through the Bosporus Straits and the Dardanelles. I propose that we blockade the waterway on the Mediterranean side with the Sixth Fleet. It would bottle up most of the Russian Navy and put a stranglehold on commercial traffic. We let Tarasov know that unless he apologizes for the deaths of our people and pulls out of Syria, the blockade will continue. Are you out of your mind, General? Kaplan said. Do you want to start a war? Tarasov will never accept that. He doesn't want a war any more than we do. Tarasov knows it would be a mistake to try and break a blockade by our navy. You'll paint him into a corner. He has an election coming up. What makes you think he's going to let us humiliate him like that? I think Harold is right, Kramer said. We would be backing Tarasov into a corner. Kaplan looked surprised. It was unusual for her to back him up. Kramer went on. Perhaps we could give him an out. Go on, director. Campbell said. The blockade is an excellent idea, but asking Tarasov to apologize publicly is too much. He's not the kind of man who will apologize for anything. We would be wise not to make that a condition of ending the blockade. What about the oil? 
We can't let him sit on that. I agree, Mr. President, that's not negotiable. He has to withdraw from the fields. However, demanding that he leave Syria will not be acceptable to him or his generals. We could offer withdrawal to the way things were before he crossed the Euphrates. Status quo ante. Kramer nodded. He keeps Syria as a client state. He keeps his bases and installations. Everything goes back as it was before. What about our dead? Covington asked. The Russian military takes responsibility for a regrettable mistake and offers reparations. Something symbolic that doesn't involve Tarasov personally. Remember, 18 Russian soldiers died as well. We all agree it was an accident of war. Regrettable, but not intentional. I like it, Covington said. Kaplan shook his head. You're talking as if this is a done deal. Mr. President, this is a very dangerous plan. Establishing a blockade will be interpreted as an act of war. The Russians won't allow their fleet to be bottled up. We wouldn't allow such a thing, why would they? Most of their imported goods come through that waterway. Things are not good in Russia at the moment. Consumer goods are an important part of keeping the populace compliant. Tarasov can't afford any more public discontent than he already has. All the more reason to proceed, Kroger said. I do not believe the Russians will respond militarily to a blockade. If he attacks our ships, it would mean war. We can turn Russia into a radioactive wasteland in 20 minutes, and Tarasov knows it. He wouldn't risk it. What if you're wrong? Kaplan said. We have done an extensive, in-depth analysis of Tarasov's thinking, Kroger said. I'm not wrong. Campbell stood to signal that the meeting was over. Everyone rose. General Kroger, I will consider your proposal. Thank you all for your input. Harold, please stay behind. Yes, sir. Covington walked partway down the hall with Kroger and Kramer. I like your plan, General. Kaplan is afraid of his own shadow. Tarasov knows better than to take a shot at us. Syria's oil isn't worth it. He can save face by claiming he drove the Kurds out to support his ally. If Damascus can't take advantage of it, well, that's their problem. I appreciate your support, Walt. Once this gets out, the president is going to be under a lot of pressure to respond. He'll do the right thing. Hopefully he'll have a day or two to think about it before it leaks. Don't count on it, Kramer thought. Chapter 24 For decades, America had been known in Russia as the main enemy. The phrase had gone out of style for a while, but memories in Russia were long. Old habits died hard. News of the firefight between Russian and American troops sent a shockwave through the country. No one considered the possibility Russian troops might have fired first. Within hours of the news going public, a large angry crowd had gathered in front of the American embassy in Moscow to protest the U.S. presence in Syria. President Tarasov and General Kerensky watched the crowd on a monitor in Tarasov's office. We could not have planned anything more effective than this, Tarasov said. I want pictures of the men who were killed on the front page of every newspaper. I agree, Mr. President. It's an excellent opportunity. Perhaps you could visit the families or bring them here to the Kremlin for a presentation of medals and the gratitude of the nation. I sometimes wonder which of us is the more cynical, General. I prefer to think of it as utilizing opportunity, Kerensky said. Was it really an accident? Yes, sir, it was. The commander in the field believed he was firing on Kurdish vehicles. We fired first? Yes, sir. Perhaps we should give him a medal as well. It's either that or a posting to Siberia. Major Gorky screwed up, but a medal would be better. After all, he did take out the American units even if his mistake got his men killed. A medal ceremony would be a popular move. Very well, set it up. Yes, sir. I understand that Colonel Volkova's brother was killed heroically. Yes, sir. Captain Volkov was part of Major Gorky's unit. He died from wounds sustained when he rescued two of his crewmen from their burning vehicle. Let's award Gorky the Medal of Suvarov for heroism in combat. At the same time, we'll give the gold star to Captain Volkov. Colonel Volkova can accept it for him. We'll televise the ceremony. The public will like it. The official name of the Gold Star Medal was Hero of the Russian Federation. It was Russia's highest military award. May I suggest that we also include Captain Volkov's mother at the ceremony? Perhaps even present the medal to her while Colonel Volkova stands at her side. Tarasov nodded. An excellent idea. Have you heard from the Americans yet? Kerensky said. Not yet. I'm sure I won't have long to wait. What do you think they'll do? I don't expect them to do anything. At least not anything important. They'll complain and threaten some sort of retaliation, but nothing will come of it. 
Their president doesn't have the balls, and even if he did, the American Congress would cut them off. What's the situation in Syria? Except for isolated pockets of resistance, we've established control of most major distribution points and about two-thirds of the oil fields. The Kurdish forces have consolidated and are retreating into the northeast quadrant. They're battered but hold good defensive positions. How long till it's done? Hard to say, Mr. President. A month, perhaps. They are very stubborn fighters. A knock sounded. One of the tall double doors opened and an aide stepped into the room. What is it? Tarasov said. Mr. President, the American president is calling. Send in the translator, then put him through. Yes, sir. The man withdrew. This should be interesting, Tarasov said. The translator came in, a captain in uniform. He came to attention and saluted. Mr. President, where do you want me? Right there, by the desk. Tarasov picked up the phone. He activated the speaker and recorder. Mr. President. President Tarasov. I'm calling about the event in Syria. Which event would that be, Mr. President? Are you talking about the unprovoked attack on our forces by your so-called advisors? Kerensky nodded his approval. In Washington, President Campbell covered the mouthpiece of the phone. He'd asked General Kroger to be present during the call. The son of a bitch wants to play hardball. He's trying to intimidate you, Kroger said. He needs to know you won't put up with it. Campbell uncovered the mouthpiece. I'm not going to play games, President Tarasov. Regardless of who fired first, the fact that American lives have been lost forces me to tell you that the United States will not tolerate further aggression. Is that a threat, Mr. President? Not at all, merely a bit of advice. You and I are not friends, President Tarasov. I regret that is the case. I hope we may have an opportunity to remedy that in the future. You do not know me well. Please do not underestimate my resolve in this matter. Things have gone far enough in Syria. I suggest that you withdraw your troops back across the Euphrates, in the interests of better relations between our two nations. Acknowledgement of responsibility and an expression of regret for the deaths of our soldiers would go a long way toward improving those relations. In Moscow, Kerensky raised his eyebrows. President Campbell, it is true we do not know each other. You tell me not to underestimate your resolve. I tell you, do not make that mistake with me. We are in Syria as the legitimate ally of the regime carrying out actions against bandits who have been stealing resources from the Syrian people. Stealing those resources, I might add, with your assistance. We will not change our decision to remove these bandits once and for all. You offer advice. Let me do the same for you. Do not interfere with our operations in the region. The results might not be to your liking. That is your final word on the matter, Mr. President. It is the United States which should apologize. Stay out of Syria, Mr. President. It is no longer in your interest to remain there. If you wish better relations between our countries, you will cease your provocations against us. Tarasov disconnected. You may leave, Tarasov said to the translator. Sir, Kerensky waited until the man had left the room. That was well done, Mr. President. There's nothing he can do, Tarasov said. The United States has become a paper tiger. If he leaves his advisors in place, they will be a small island surrounded by a sea of Russian strength. He has no option but to pull them out. We will graciously allow them to withdraw. Tarasov got up and went to a sideboard. He filled two glasses from a bottle of vodka and brought one over to Kerensky. A toast, General, to a new era, one where we have regained our rightful place in the world. It has been a long time coming, Tarasov said. The two men drank. On the other side of the world, President Campbell was angry. General Kroger, sir, that arrogant bastard hung up on me. He needs to understand that I will not be intimidated. I've considered your suggestion regarding blockading the Dardanelles. You've discussed this with the other chiefs? Admiral Stone? Yes, sir, at length. Their opinion? The chiefs are united. In our judgment, a blockade is the most effective way to pressure the Russians without putting our troops in harm's way. What do you think the Russians will do, General? They'll bluster, sir. They'll probably go to the UN and accuse us of warmongering. But they're not going to do anything foolish like trying to run the blockade with one of their warships. What will happen if they try? We'll warn them not to proceed. If necessary, fire warning shots to discourage them. If they continue, we will disable their vessel. This could escalate, Campbell said. There may be some limited incidents. Tarasov isn't going to risk a major war with us, Mr. President. He'll negotiate. What about our rangers? Should we leave them in place or bring them home? With all due respect, sir. 
If you pull them out now, Tarasov will see that as a sign of weakness. I recommend leaving them in place. Very well, but I want extraction ready if things heat up. Yes, sir. Prepare to institute the blockade if we can't resolve this in any other way. I'm going to request an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council. We'll try diplomacy first. If that fails, we'll put the blockade in place. In the meantime, go to DEFCON 3. That will show Tarasov we're taking this seriously. Yes, Mr. President. He's coming around, Kroger thought. Kramer will like this. Chapter 25 The push to make Anya the face of women in the military had moved into high gear. There had been a front-page article in Isvestia, as well as the article in Red Star. Anya was an instant celebrity. Everywhere she went, people looked at her and whispered to each other. Some of her co-workers offered condolences on the death of her brother. Some looked at her with eyes of envy and jealousy. Rumors at the ministry had her sleeping with everyone from General Stepanov to the president himself. How else to explain her sudden promotion, jumping ahead of others on the list? People more deserving of higher rank? She'd worked hard to get where she was, and the rumors and innuendo made her angry. She told herself she should be used to it by now, but that didn't help. Ever since Anya joined the army, she'd had to work twice as hard as her male counterparts. She couldn't choose assignments or superior officers, but she could do her best to accomplish whatever was required. Her family history hadn't hurt, but she'd gotten where she was on the strength of her abilities. It made her furious that people thought she'd earned promotion on her back, and now Stepanov was scheming to give them reasons to think they were right. Earlier today, he'd made his move. She'd been summoned to his office, not knowing what to expect. As usual, Major Petrov looked at her in a way that made her skin crawl. Stepanov had been behind his massive desk, reading a thick file when she entered. Have a seat, Colonel. I'll be with you in a moment. Sir. After a few moments, Stepanov finished and set the file aside. It is my pleasure to tell you that your brother has been awarded the gold star for his actions in Syria. President Tarasov wishes to present the medal himself. He wants to give it to your mother. Of course, you will be standing at her side. A fucking medal. Oh, Grigory, my beautiful brother. She wanted to tell Stepanov what he and Tarasov could do with their medal. But she couldn't say that. Yes, sir. The ceremony will take place in the president's office tomorrow afternoon at 1400 hours. Take the rest of today and tomorrow off. Make sure your mother is prepared. These events can be stressful when one is not used to meeting the president. Of course, sir. I'm sure she will be grateful and thrilled. It's not every day the gold star is handed out. Your brother is a true hero. His men would have died if he had not acted as he did. She couldn't tell Stepanov what she really thought. That Grigory was dead because of people like him. People who had started an unnecessary war because they could. I'm sure it is also good for morale to have a hero. Her voice contained a bitter undertone. Stepanov looked at her, not sure if she was being sarcastic. I don't quite take your meaning, Colonel. I only meant that our country needs heroes when we are at war. A war that is going well, thanks to your efficient organizational abilities. Thank you, sir. I would like to discuss some details of the operation with you, Stepanov said, his voice friendly. Perhaps in a more relaxed atmosphere. Why don't you join me for dinner this evening? In the outer office, Petrov listened to the conversation. Thank you for the invitation, sir. But perhaps another evening might be more appropriate. My mother is not well. She needs careful preparation for tomorrow's ceremony. Of course, of course, I wasn't thinking. Another evening will do as well. Let's say the day after tomorrow. I'll send my car to pick you up. Will that be all, sir? Yes, Colonel, go home and take care of your mother. Yes, sir. On her way out of the office, Petrov gave her a knowing leer. She went back down to her office, locked her files in the safe, and left the ministry building. It felt as though everything was spiraling out of control. Stepanov had more on his mind than dinner. That evening she told Yulia about the ceremony. Mother, the president is going to give Grigory the gold star. The gold star? It's our highest military honor. The president wants you to attend the ceremony. I'm going to meet the president. He wants to present the medal to you. There will be photographers there. Yulia put her hand to her mouth, horrified. What will I wear? He's the president. I don't have anything. Don't worry, mother. I'll take you shopping. We'll find something nice. Yulia began crying. Anya put her arm around her, holding her until she'd calmed down. It's all right, mother. No, it isn't. It's all too much. What is? Everything. First, Grigori is killed. Now you're an important person. I'm going to meet the president. 
I don't know why everything is changing so fast. You've always wished you could meet him. Yes, but not like this. We have to make the best of it, Anya said. Come on, I'll make some tea. I don't want any tea, I want to lie down. Anya helped into her bedroom and onto the bed. I'll be in the other room if you need me, Anya said. Yulia turned on her side and muttered something in reply. Anya closed the door to the room and went into the kitchen. She put a kettle on for tea and sat down at the kitchen table. While she waited for the water to boil, she thought about Stepanov. He was a bullish man, not particularly handsome, old enough to be her father. She imagined what it would be like to have sex with him. The images weren't pleasant. Everything she'd worked for was in jeopardy because this man was attracted to her. It wasn't fair, but she'd never bought into the idea that life was supposed to be fair. Her father had taught her that, not by words, but by his actions. Anya was under no illusions. Stepanov wasn't inviting her to dinner to talk about logistics. If she refused him, he'd flush her career down the toilet. Anya wasn't sure what she'd do when he propositioned her. She wasn't a prude, but she preferred to choose who she led into her bed. Would she have sex with him to protect her career? If she did, did that make her any better than a whore? She didn't know the answer to that question. It disturbed her, that she didn't know. The kettle whistled on the stove. Anya got up and spooned tea into a strainer. She took a cup from the shelf and made the tea. She went back to the table and sat down again. She'd been in the army for 17 years. She remembered what it had been like that first week of advanced training. The Vistral course for officers was a one-year program for candidates selected for future high command. It was held on a base outside the town of Solnechnogorsk, about 60 kilometers from Moscow. She thought she'd been prepared for what she was getting into. The reality turned out to be a lot different. The first day of training was an assault on personal privacy and boundaries. Vistral candidates were treated harshly. As soon as she stepped off the bus, she'd been forced to run everywhere with people shouting at her. The day was a blur in her memory, but some things stood out. They'd cut her hair. She'd been rushed from one place to another. All the time, people had yelled at her. At the end of the day, they'd stood her up in her shapeless green fatigues against a measured background and had a picture taken for her ID. When she was finally allowed to sleep, she fell exhausted onto the lumpy mattress of her bunk and passed out. It seemed as though she'd been asleep for only a few moments, when a sergeant began banging the lid of a large trash can to rouse them from bed. No particular exceptions were made for women candidates, except for segregation from the men. After they'd been rousted from their bunks, the women were given ten minutes to prepare for the day before being marched to the mess hall. The bathroom consisted of a long row of open toilets. The sounds of fifty women voiding their bowels at the same time was something she would never forget. After those first months of harassment, the ranks of the candidates were considerably thinner. At the end of the year, she'd finished fourth in the class. She'd paid her dues and learned her job. She was good at it. Now it was all threatened by this powerful man. She sipped at the tea and considered what to do. All that fine talk about becoming the image of women in the modern military boiled down to a reality no different than it had been in the time of the czars. Spread your legs or suffer the consequences. She thought about her little brother, Mikhail. The officer responsible for his death should have been court-martialed. Instead, he'd been shuffled to a different post and allowed to continue his career. He'd even been promoted. She thought about Grigori, dead in a war created to satisfy the lust for power of her country's leaders, a war that might trigger something worse. She knew how Stepanov thought. He was typical of the Russian high command. There would be no meaningful negotiation with the United States. Rulers came and went, but the motherland endured. It was Russia that was important, not the politicians and generals who ruled her. Anya truly loved her country. She dedicated her life to protecting it, but the Russia she loved was in the control of madmen. They'd killed her brothers. Now they were driving the country toward the abyss. If war came, millions would die. Someone had to do something. A small voice whispered in the back of her mind, something she didn't want to acknowledge. A thought she couldn't dismiss. A thought of treason. Chapter 26 In the morning, Anya took her mother to the gum department store on Red Square to find something for the medal ceremony. The shops would have seemed familiar to anyone from Europe or America. All of the big brand names in women's clothes could be found here. After an hour of wandering through the shops, Yulia still hadn't seen anything she liked. 
Anya looked at her watch. They needed to be back at the apartment by 11 at the latest. It was already after 10. I don't know, Anya, Yulia said. Nothing feels right. Anya stood looking at a mannequin wearing a brown dress. That would look great on you. I don't like it. Anya had long experience of her mother's moods. It would do no good to argue with her. She would get emotional and difficult if she thought she was being pushed to do something she didn't want to do. The fact that she was going to meet Tarasov in a few hours didn't make anything easier. Then Anya had an inspiration. Come on, mother, there's another place we can go. I'm sure we can find something there. Outside the store, she hailed a taxi and told the driver to take them to the Tsvetnoy market. For once, traffic was light. It wasn't long before they entered the enormous mall. Anya wished they could have lunch at one of the restaurants on the top floors, but there wasn't time. Where are we going? Yulia asked. My feet are getting tired. Right here, Anya said. They have nice clothes in this shop, mother. I'm sure we'll find something you like. Twenty minutes later, Yulia stepped out of the dressing room wearing an ankle-length creation in dark green. She was smiling. You look fabulous, mother. That dress is perfect for you. You think so? Perfect. And it's made right here in Russia, very patriotic. I'm sure the president will notice. Then I'll take it, Yulia said. Anya paid. A bit shocked at the price, but it was worth it to keep her mother calm. Besides, she really did look good in the dress. The medal ceremony was scheduled for two o'clock in the president's office. Anya and her mother had toured the public areas of the Kremlin in the past, admiring the treasures in the museums. They'd toured the great domed chamber of the Senate building, but they'd never been inside the president's office. General Stepanov met them outside the entrance. He was wearing his Class A uniform. An impressive array of ribbons covered the left side of his jacket. Good afternoon, sir, she said. Mother, this is First Deputy Defense Minister Stepanov. He is the man I work for. Stepanov reached out and took Yulia's hand in his. It is a great pleasure to meet you, Stepanov said. Your daughter is one of my most valued officers. Flustered, Yulia looked to Anya, then back at Stepanov. I have always tried to do my best with her, she said. Stepanov smiled. You have succeeded. Come, the president is expecting us. Two armed guards in full dress guards uniform stood at attention on either side of tall double doors leading to Tarasov's office. As the trio approached, they moved in synchronized motion to open the doors and returned to attention. Inside the room, Tarasov, General Kerensky, a major she didn't recognize and a crowd of photographers waited for them. Anya hadn't expected to see Kerensky there. Oh my, Yulia said. Tarasov had the politician's gift of charm. He used it now, coming forward and smiling. He took Yulia's hand in both of his. You are Grigori's mother, he said. I knew your husband years ago. I am only sorry I have to meet you under these circumstances. It is an honor to take the hand of the mother of a hero of the motherland. Comrade President, I... I don't know what to say. Yulia, may I call you Yulia? Without waiting for an answer, Tarasov turned to the two men standing near his desk. Yulia, may I present Chief of Staff General Kerensky and Major Gorky? General Kerensky insisted on being here today to honor your son. Major Gorky was your son's commander. He was with him in the field and witnessed his heroic actions. Gentlemen, this is Captain Volkov's mother and his sister, Colonel Anya Volkova. The next ten minutes were a blur of murmured platitudes and flashing camera lights. Major Gorky praised Grigory's actions. Tarasov presented the medal, a single gold star hanging from a ribbon bearing the white, blue, and red colors of the Russian Federation flag. A second medal for bravery in combat was presented to Major Gorky. More pictures were taken of the entire group standing together. Then it was over. A limousine drove them back to their apartment. Yulia held the medal in her lap, silently staring out the window at the city passing by. Anya would have liked more time to talk with Major Gorky, but there'd been no opportunity for that. He'd seemed sincere in his words praising Grigory's courage, unlike Kerensky and Tarasov. If there was a medal for acting, they both deserved it. The more she saw of Tarasov, the more she didn't like him. It made sense that he'd known her father. In some ways, Tarasov reminded her of him. It was no recommendation. Anya wasn't looking forward to tomorrow. Tomorrow she would be back at work. The photographs were sure to be displayed prominently in Izvestia. There would be more whispers and looks, more envious comments behind her back. It wasn't work she was worried about. It was what would come after. Tomorrow evening she was having dinner with Stepanov. Chapter 27 
The next evening, Stepanov sent his car to pick her up. Anya had been thinking all day about what she was going to do when Stepanov propositioned her. But when she got into the limousine, she still hadn't decided. She could give in to his demands and watch her career flourish. She could refuse him and find herself in a meaningless job somewhere far away where she couldn't embarrass him, her career over. It was the way things worked in Russia. Maybe it was the way things worked everywhere. She was a woman working in an organization run by men who were used to getting their way. Up until now, she'd been successful in fending off those who saw her as sexual prey, but Stepanov wasn't in the same category as the rest of them. He was far too powerful to ignore or evade. The knowledge that she wasn't the first woman forced to choose between virtue and safety brought no comfort. Stepanov had an apartment on the top floor of a building on Ostozhenka Street, near the Prechistinskaya Embankment. Ostozhenka Street was one of the most expensive streets in the world. Only the elite could afford to live here, the power brokers of the Federation. It wasn't Stepanov's primary residence. That was out in the same neighborhood as the oligarchs and the president, where his wife was under 24-hour care in their Rublevka mansion. The Moscow apartment was convenient to work and to the Kremlin. It was also convenient for conducting an affair. Stepanov's driver rode up with her in the elevator and escorted her to the door. He knocked twice. Anya heard the lock release. The driver opened the door. Please, Colonel, go right in. The general is expecting you. Really, I never would have guessed. Thank you, Anya said. Anya stepped inside and looked around. In spite of herself, she was impressed. The ceilings were 14 feet high. The floors made of polished stone. Everything was decorator-coordinated in white and black. A wide coffee table of black marble rested in front of a long sectional couch covered in soft white leather. A huge television screen dominated the wall across from the couch. Recessed overhead lights and a modern chandelier illuminated the room. Paintings of quality decorated the wall. That surprised her. She hadn't expected Stepanov to have a taste for art. A white piano stood near a row of windows facing out over the street below. They were covered with white damask drapes. Stepanov came into the room. He dressed in a gleaming white shirt open at the collar, loose black slacks and black loafers. Anya guessed the casual outfit had cost thousands of rubles. She thought of a proverb her mother was fond of repeating. The devil lives in a beautiful mansion. Welcome, Colonel. I am pleased you could join me this evening. Perhaps a drink to begin, a glass of wine, vodka? Wine, sir, thank you. We are not at work, Colonel. Let's dispense with the formalities. May I call you Anya, and please call me Yuri? Of course, sir, Yuri. Stepanov walked over to a bar at the side of the room and took a bottle of red wine from a rack. Anya couldn't help but think that most of her apartment would fit within this one room. This is a particularly fine vintage, Stepanov said. A Chateau Mouton Rothschild Bordeaux. Very smooth. I'm sure you'll like it. He opened the bottle and picked up two glasses. You have a beautiful apartment, Yuri. Thank you. Yes, I fell in love with it as soon as I saw it. The building is almost new. The developer was in financial difficulties and I was able to secure this top floor for a good price. The floor below me is still unoccupied, though I expect it will be gone soon. You have the entire top floor. Yes, it's extremely private and quiet. I find it quite relaxing after a day at the ministry. Come, let's go into the other room. She followed him into a sitting room. Comfortable chairs were placed around a low table burdened with artfully arranged dishes of food. Anya was worried about how the evening would turn out. She had tried to formulate a plan, but the only thing she could think of was to try and get him drunk. Drunk enough that sex was out of the question. She'd stroke his ego and hope that would be all she'd have to stroke. When he got around to propositioning her, she still didn't know what she was going to say or do. How did you manage such a feast? I have a good chef, Stepanov said. Flatter him. I think a man's servants reflect the quality of the man, she said. Stepanov laughed. Do you? Well, perhaps you're right. He poured the wine and handed her a glass. She swirled the wine in her glass and breathed in the aroma, then took a sip. There was no need to pretend what she thought about it. This is wonderful, she said. Drink up, there's more where that came from. Stepanov picked up a remote lying on the table and pressed a button. Soft music filled the room. A second touch on the remote dimmed the lights. Anya, I have something I'd like to discuss with you. I'll bet you do. She drank some wine, waiting. You know about my wife, yes? 
Yes, I do. I'm sorry she is ill. I enjoyed having you attend the party with me at Kurosov's home the other evening. I confess I have little love for events like that, but it is an obligation of my position. My proposal is simple. I would like you to accompany me in the future when I am required at social functions. I would be happy to go with you, General. Yuri, please. Yuri, from time to time I may require other duties. In return, I can guarantee your advancement to higher rank. Anya had no doubt what those other duties would entail. He wasn't guaranteeing promotion because he wanted her to escort him to public events. You're an experienced woman, Anya. I don't want to insult your intelligence by pretending that our relationship would be anything but one of convenience. There are obvious benefits to both of us. Such an arrangement would compromise my authority at work, Anya said. Stepanov smiled. I am pleased to see that you do not make a pretense of false modesty. We both know my patronage can take you far in your career. You would continue in your present job for now, but my intention is to move you into central planning. Central planning? What would I be doing? Supervising a larger picture of operations than your current position. Your organizational skills will be a good fit there. You will have more responsibility, and it will require promotion to higher rank. No one will question your authority. To do that would be to question mine. There are few who would dare. He smiled again, a smile of raw power that sent a quick shiver along her spine. And if I found such an arrangement uncomfortable? My dear Anya, I'm sure I don't need to point out that such a decision might have consequences for your career. I see. Let's have some food, he said. Try the caviar. Anya loved the classic movies of the Italian directors. Sitting here with him, she felt like a character in a film by Fellini. She was surrounded by the trappings of wealth. She was drinking Stepanov's wine, eating his food. It was all very civilized. Beneath the surface civility Stepanov displayed, she knew he'd crush her like a bug if she refused him. Grigori was dead because of this man and his cronies. The thought triggered anger, sending blood rushing to her face. She turned away before he could see it. They finished eating and went back into the living room to sit on the couch. Anya was on her third glass of wine. Stepanov had switched to vodka. Do we have an agreement, Anya? They are leading us into disaster. I have to find a way to stop them. But how? Stepanov drank and watched her, waiting to see what she would decide. If I give in to him, it will bring their secrets close. If I refuse, he will send me away. Then I can do nothing. God forgive me, but if sex is the price I must pay, I will do it. She took a breath. Yes, Yuri, we have an agreement. I knew you would understand, he said. He reached over and kissed her, probing her mouth with his tongue. She could smell his sweat under his cologne. He tasted a vodka and caviar. A phone rang. Damn it, Stepanov said. I told them no calls. He stood, walked over to a sideboard and picked up the phone. Da. He listened. Da, Kurosho. He set the phone down and turned to Anya. I'm sorry, my dear. We'll have to continue another time. My presence is required at the ministry. My driver will take you home. She was careful not to show her feelings of relief. Chapter 28 Rebecca Kramer and Scott Davidson were in Kramer's office, talking with Langley's chief operating officer, Ed Bradford. As the man in charge of the money, Bradford was the third ranking officer in Langley's pecking order, with a security clearance one step below Kramer's and Davidson's. He was a mousy-looking man, not very tall, with wispy brown hair combed over a growing bald spot. He wore a gray suit that failed to hide a tendency to hunch his shoulders forward, as if his chest was about to cave in on itself. His glasses had thin gold frames. Thick lenses magnified watery hazel eyes. The colors of his tie identified his alma mater as a large Midwestern university. His shoes were impeccably shined. Bradford was the kind of man people forgot a moment after they had met him. I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, Director, but we can't keep ignoring these figures. These covert ops are costing way more than they should. I mean, look at this. Bradford stabbed with his finger at an entry on a spreadsheet he was holding. This is a good example of what I'm talking about. This man, Thorne. Davidson rolled his eyes at the mention of Thorne's name. Bradford continued. He comes back on Lufthansa from wherever he was by way of Frankfurt and books a business class ticket. Do you know how much it costs to fly business class from Frankfurt to Dulles on Lufthansa? Kramer sighed. No, Ed, I don't, but I'm sure you're about to tell me. $3,581, that's how much. Why the hell didn't he fly economy? I imagine there wasn't a seat available, Kramer said. 
Then he should have waited until he could book one, Bradford said. That might not have been possible. Director, I understand your reluctance to rein in these people, but we don't have unlimited funds in our black accounts in spite of the fantasies of the media. So what you want us to do, Ed? Davidson said. For a start, an agency-wide campaign to reduce costs. That will look good the next time Congress tries to tell us we're spending too much money. But the real difference will have to come from this office. The two of you have to make it clear that these excessive expenses won't be tolerated. Whatever you have to do. Kramer sighed again. All right, Ed. Message received. We'll pass the word. Is there anything else? No, that's it, Director. I'm glad you understand. They watched the door close behind him. He's really an annoying man, Davidson said. He can't help it. It's in his nature. You have to admit he's good at keeping the money trails clean. Every time we have to go through the dog and pony show with Congress, he's got the right kinds of accounting records to show them. They never see what we're really doing or where some of the money comes from. If he wasn't with us, he'd probably be working for the mafia. I'll give him that, Davidson said. But he's still annoying. Speaking of Congress and money, what's your take on the new appropriations bill? Do you see any problems there? Campbell's election shook up the Senate Committee on Appropriations. The new chairman is Peterson. He doesn't like us. Fortunately, there are 30 senators on that committee. A majority of them are either friendly or can be convinced to see our point of view. I don't think there are going to be significant problems, but Peterson will try to cut our funding. Peterson is held up by the media as a paragon of virtue, Kramer said. What have we got on him? Can we exert pressure? I'll have to take a look. Davidson said, but I seem to recall there was something early on in his career we might be able to use. An incident with a young woman working as a volunteer on his campaign. Those are always good, Kramer said. Chapter 29 Anya woke with a gasp, heart pounding. She'd been dreaming, a dark dream of something evil and unseen coming for her. The illuminated dial on the clock next to her bed read 333. She got out of bed put on a robe and went into the kitchen. She'd never get back to sleep. Anya turned on the light, put a kettle on for tea and sat down at the kitchen table. She wasn't worried about waking her mother. Yulia always took a sleeping pill that knocked her out until morning. She pulled the kettle off the stove as it began to whistle. As she went through the familiar steps of making tea, her mind swirled with thoughts and images. Mikhail and Grigori, cameras flashing at the medal ceremony, the way she'd caught General Kerensky looking bored, Tarasov's platitudes about heroism and sacrifice, Stepanov his certainty he could have her because he wanted to, because she was powerless, powerless to resist the advances of a man who could destroy everything she'd worked for, powerless to prevent men like him from risking catastrophic war with America. It pissed her off. She'd sworn an oath of loyalty when she entered the military. But where did her loyalty really lie? Was it to her superior officers? Men like Stepanov, to her government. She'd joined the army to protect the people, the motherland. She hadn't joined it to blindly follow Russia's leaders over a cliff. Anya didn't believe for a moment that Russia could win a war with the United States. Tarasov and his generals had started down a road that could end in the destruction of everything. She wasn't confident sanity and common sense would prevail. She could do nothing or she could act, but there wasn't anything she could do on her own. She needed serious help. There was only one obvious choice. The Americans. If she went to them, they had the power to do something. But if she went to them, it would make her a traitor. Her position at CSS and high security clearance gave her access to a wide range of classified military information. If the Americans knew what Tarasov and the generals were planning, they might be able to stop things from escalating before it was too late. It was the only option she could think of. The idea made her feel sick to her stomach. If she took that step, there could be no turning back. Was it treason to betray your country in order to save it? It was Sunday. Unless she was ordered in, she didn't have to go into work today. She began thinking about how to make contact with the Americans. She couldn't go anywhere near the American embassy without being photographed and questioned. She couldn't call. Every call to and from the embassy was recorded and analyzed. She racked her brain. She needed a go-between, someone who had a reason to help her. Someone who was unhappy with the regime. Vlas, he hates Tarasov and his cronies. He might help. Anya knew Vlas Sokolov from an economics class she'd taken at the university. He'd been her professor. They'd formed a friendship that extended beyond the classroom, 
based on a mutual love of coffee and chess. Chess was a national obsession in Russia. Sokolov was ranked at the expert level, several hundred points above Anya. She would never match him, but she enjoyed the challenge of the game, the need to think several moves ahead and anticipate her opponent's strategy. She hadn't seen Vlas for several years. She wasn't sure what had happened to her old professor since then, but she knew he no longer taught at the university. Sokolov had made the mistake of publishing one article too many expressing dissatisfaction with the economic policies of the regime. Anya had no contact information for him, but that wasn't a problem. Unless he had greatly changed, she knew where he would be on a Sunday. It was going to be a warm spring day, ideal for playing outdoors. Unless something had happened to him, Professor Sokolov would be at the chess ground in Presnansky Park. The park was home to Presnya, one of Moscow's many chess clubs. There were always people there looking for a game. She looked at the clock on the wall. It was still many hours before she could go to the park. The adrenaline rush fueled by her anger had worn off. Suddenly she was tired. She decided to go back to bed and try to get a few hours of sleep before her mother woke, hoping she didn't dream. Chapter 30 Anya had always liked Presnensky Park. Moscow had many beautiful parks, but this one always felt special to her. It was crowded with people enjoying the fine weather. She passed a bench flanked by two large chess bishops carved in stone and entered the chess area that was a key attraction of the park. A giant chessboard in black and white stone was laid out on the ground. Sometimes games were played here with life-sized pieces. Nearby were rows of tables where people sat absorbed in the game. Nearly all of them were occupied. She looked for Professor Sokolov and spotted him sitting at a table, chess pieces arranged on a board, waiting for someone to sit down and challenge him to a game. He looked worn, older than the last time she'd seen him. He wore a shapeless brown jacket, dark pants and brown shoes that had seen better days. Long gray hair escaped under his brown cap and fluttered in the spring breeze. His glasses were slightly crooked on his nose. One of the earpieces was taped to the frame. She sat down across from him. Hello, Professor. I thought I would find you here. Sokolov's face lit with pleasure. Anya, wonderful. I have been reading all about you. You shouldn't believe everything you read in the newspapers, Professor. How long has it been? Three, four years? More like five, Anya said. Sokolov studied her. There was a picture in his vestia of Tarasov presenting a medal to you and your mother. I was sorry to hear of your brother's death. Thank you. Sokolov turned the board toward her. You can have white. Has your game improved? Anya reached out and moved her queen's pawn two spaces forward. The first step of the Rai Lopez opening. I doubt it, Professor. Sokolov countered with a similar move. I don't think you came here to play chess with me, he said. You always were good at reading me, Vlas. No, I didn't come here for that. I'm hoping you can help me with something difficult. She moved a knight near her pawn. Sokolov brought out a knight. Are you in trouble, Anya? Not yet. How can I help? She hesitated. Had he changed? Was he still the opponent of the regime he had once been? If she told him what she wanted... She was putting her career and her future in his hands. She brought her bishop out, gaining control of part of the board. She reached out and touched his hand. Her voice was quiet. Do you still oppose what is happening in our country? The park was noisy with people talking and the sound of children playing. Even so, Sokolov lowered his voice. I will always be opposed to these people. They are contemptible creatures, incompetent. They care about nothing except power. Certainly they don't care for us or all these people here. He gestured with his hand to take in the park. She moved a pawn one square forward, thinking about what she was going to ask him to do. Once the words were out of her mouth, there was no going back. Not only that, she would be involving him, putting him at risk. There was no other way. She took a deep breath. I need to get a message to the American embassy, she said. I thought perhaps with your contacts. Do not say any more, Sokolov said. Not here. There is a cafe not too far from here, on Rochdelskaya Street. It is called the Black Queen. Meet me there half an hour after we finish the game. First we must play it out for appearance's sake. Fifteen minutes later, Anya tipped over her king. Thank you for the game, she said loud enough to be heard at the next table. She got up and walked away. She didn't see Major Petrov standing some distance away under the trees. Petrov had waited outside Anya's apartment earlier thinking how she'd never made any effort to hide her contempt for him, how she thought she was too good for him. 
Petrov's job was to spy on Stepanov and report back to his superiors in the GRU. Stepanov had started making obvious moves on her. By now, he was probably fucking her. Petrov told himself she was too close to Stepanov and needed to be observed. If something turned up that reflected badly on her, well, that was too bad. He hoped she was up to something. It would look good in his reports. He'd followed her to the park, careful that she didn't see him. He'd watched her sit down at a chess table and begin a game. Petrov couldn't hear what Volkova was saying, but it was obvious she knew the man she was playing against. He took a small camera from his pocket and photographed them sitting at the table. The game progressed, ending with Volkova's defeat. She shook hands with her opponent, got up and walked away. The man put away his chess pieces, picked up his board, and walked off in the opposite direction. Petrov waited a moment before following her, keeping a good distance behind. She would never believe it was a coincidence if she saw him. He followed her through the park and out the other side. She kept walking, sometimes stopping to look in a shop window. Then she went into a cafe called the Black Queen. He knew the place. It was popular with the chess crowd. He couldn't follow her in there. She'd see him. He took up station across the street. A few minutes later, Petrov saw the man she'd been playing chess with in the park enter the cafe. A satisfying feeling of righteous judgment came over him. She was conspiring with this man. There couldn't be any other reason to meet him here after seeing him in the park. An innocent cup of coffee? If that was so, why not walk to the cafe together? Why pretend to separate? Whoever the man was, he'd be in the database. All citizens were. It wouldn't take long to identify him. Colonel Ivanov would be pleased. It ought to be enough to bring her in. They'd find out what she was up to. Petrov had no doubt about that. Chapter 31 Art Greenwald sat in his office on the top floor of the American Embassy in Moscow, trying to work out the answer to a crossword clue. What the hell were Armada leaders? Five letters across. It was making him crazy. Greenwald was CIA chief of station in Moscow, a plum assignment given only to career officers with field experience who had proved themselves in lesser administrative posts. At least that was the way it was supposed to be. In practice, the position was as much a reward for success in playing the political games permeating Langley as it was for competence. Greenwald was good at his job, but he wasn't a risk taker. He was biding his time, hoping for a promotion and reassignment to Virginia. Greenwald was in his late fifties. It had been years since he'd had to maintain himself in the peak physical condition necessary for survival on the street, and it showed. A small paunch pushed out against the buttons of his Brooks brother's shirt. He was starting to go bald and had begun trying to conceal it with only partial success. His eyes were light blue. At the moment they were sore from squinting at the damned crossword puzzle. A knock on his door was a welcome distraction. He looked up. Come in, Jeremy. Jeremy Coates was listed as a second cultural attaché on the embassy roster, a description that fooled no one in the Russian security services. It was a position Greenwald himself had once held in the early years of his career. Coates acted as Greenwald's eyes and ears on the street. He was useful for the kinds of assignments that required getting your hands dirty. Coates was a little under six feet tall. He had short brown hair, brown eyes, and broad shoulders. Sometimes when he'd had too much to drink or when he was stressed, he spoke with a Midwestern accent that revealed his Iowa roots. He spoke Russian fluently, which was one of the reasons he had been posted to Moscow. People had trouble remembering his face. It was one of his best assets as an officer. He handed a large envelope to his boss. It was addressed only to CIA. The envelope bore no stamp or return address. This came in this morning, Coates said. You need to look at it. No stamp, no address. It didn't come in the mail. How did it get here? Good question. It was left on the reception desk downstairs. Best guess is one of the locals the embassy hires for maintenance of the public areas. What's inside? If it's legit, it's a gift from heaven. Take a look, you'll see. Greenwald opened the envelope. It contained several sheets of paper. The top piece was a letter typewritten in Russian. He began reading. To the person in charge of American CIA operations. I am an officer working in the Ministry of Defense with access to the highest levels of military planning. I am a patriot who is concerned for my country. I see what our leaders are doing and fear for the future. I wish to provide information in the hope it can be used to prevent war. I do not want anything in return. I want to protect my country. To prove I am sincere, 
I provide a complete list of logistical and operational directives for the current offensive in Syria. If this is of interest, I will be in Presnensky Park on the bench with two bishops between 12.30 and 1 o'clock on Sunday. I will be reading War and Peace. Your contact must wear a red flower. Greenwald looked at the accompanying sheets of paper. Has anyone checked this out? Yes, as far as we can tell, it's accurate. It fills out some of the blanks about what's happening in Syria. This is very detailed. Whoever put this together must have serious access. So that's what he says, Coates said. It could be a setup. Disinformation. The FSB would love to get something they could use against us. It could be, but if they want to create an incident, there are easier ways to do it. This material exposes vulnerabilities in the Russian operation. They wouldn't give us something like this as bait. This is a Langley wet dream, if it's real. Greenwald thought about how bringing in a highly placed source in the Russian Ministry of Defense would enhance his career. It was a no-brainer. This is Friday, he said. I want you in that park on Sunday. FSB knows who I am, Coates said. I sit down next to the source, he's blown. They know who you are, but they aren't always following you. Change your looks, you're really good at that. Greenwald was right. Coates was good at it. He came from a family of professional actors. His father had always assumed his son would follow in the family tradition and had taught him the art of making himself look like someone he wasn't. He hadn't become an actor, but the skills Coates learned at his father's knee turned out to be useful anyway. You know how to spot surveillance, Greenwald said. If you think you're being followed, walk on by. Make sure whoever is on that bench sees the flower you're wearing. They'll figure it out. If you don't think it's safe to make contact, memorize the face. All right. Listen, Jeremy, this is a big deal if it's genuine. You have to make the asset feel safe. He has to trust you. Set up a way to make contact as needed. Find out what he wants. He said what he wants. To prevent a war. Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. There are lots of reasons why people betray their country. Find out if he's sincere. If we can get him to take money or get him to sign something, he's ours. So much for trust, Jeremy said. Trust is an overrated word, Greenwald said. Coates looked at the unfinished crossword. Is that from the Times? Yeah, 25 across is driving me crazy. Prowse, Coates said. What? 25 across. Armada leaders. The answer is Prowse. I'll be damned. I never would have thought of that. Chapter 32 Sunday in Moscow was the kind of day when it was easy to believe life was good, and one lived in the best of all possible worlds. The trees were green with renewed life. Birds sang in the branches. Bursts of color bloomed in flower beds placed beside the walkways. Anya entered Presnensky Park a little after noon. She wore a light-colored silk blouse and a dark skirt that reached below her knees. She made her way through the park to the bishop's bench and sat down. At the other end, an old man sat reading a paper. A wooden cane rested against his leg. She looked at her watch. It was almost 12.30. When she'd given the letter to Vlas, something had changed inside her. It felt like she'd entered an altered reality. All her senses were heightened. She remembered that not long ago she'd wished things were more interesting. Her wish had come true, but not in the way she'd imagined. Her future had once looked secure, if somewhat dull. Now it felt uncertain, threatening. She took out a paperback copy of War and Peace and began to read. Excuse me. It was the old man at the end of the bench. Anya looked up from her book. I'm sorry, what? I notice you are reading Tolstoy, an incredible picture of a world long gone, don't you think? She looked at him. There were thousands like him in Moscow, veterans of one of the many wars, Afghanistan or Chechnya. He was dressed in a mix of clothes that clearly came from charities or thrift shops. He wore large tortoiseshell-framed glasses and an old barracks cap. She couldn't quite place his accent. Then she noticed the flower in the lapel of his moth-eaten army jacket. Flustered, she looked at him. Talk normally, Coates said. Two strangers discussing Tolstoy. Yes, I agree, Anya said. Tolstoy creates a reality that no longer exists. May I see your copy? Anya handed the book to him. He flipped through the pages, held the book open and handed it back to her. This section where he describes Prince Andrei about to engage in battle is particularly fine. She took the book. A small piece of paper rested between the pages. Yes, she said. The way he contrasts a dark clear sky with an enormous sun. Only Tolstoy could pull off something like that. You are doing a great service for your nation. Someone will be in touch. Be careful. 
Coates got up from the bench with obvious difficulty. Anyone watching would see an old man in pain, perhaps from wartime injuries or the crippling arthritis that came from too many nights spent sleeping on cold, hard ground. Anya watched him walk slowly away, leaning on the cane. Amazing. His Russian was perfect. I'd swear he was a veteran. She looked at the piece of paper in her book. A phone number was written on it and an instruction. Memorize and destroy. By the time he returned to the embassy, Coates looked as he always did. American. Dressed in a sport coat and slacks, around 30 years old. Fit and reasonably good looking. He took the elevator to the top floor. How did it go? Greenwald asked. You're not going to believe this. The asset is Colonel Anya Volkova. Volkova. The one they're touting as the new woman in the army. It's the same. Holy shit. Yeah, that's what I said when I saw her sit down. She works under Stepanov, Greenwald said. We have a file on her. He picked up a phone and punched a button. Find the file on Colonel Anya Volkova and send it up to me. Volkova. V-O-L-K-O-V-A. Yes, thanks, Helen. He set the phone down. Tell me. Once I saw who she was, I didn't need to ask her for credentials. She was reading War and Peace. I used that as an excuse to talk to her. I passed a secure phone number to her. What's your impression? She was nervous as hell, but she recovered nicely. She seems determined, but she's an amateur. It wouldn't hurt if we could find a way to teach her a few things to keep her from getting picked up by the FSB. I'd be nervous too, I were her, Greenwald said. There was a knock at the door. A woman came in carrying a blue file folder. Blue meant the file was restricted but not secret. She set the file on Greenwald's desk and left. He opened it up. Seems the colonel has been moving in elite circles lately, he said. Stepanov took her to a party at Ivan Korosov's last week. The guy that runs Ruska's. Yep, all the big shots were there. Tarasov brought his wife. General Kerensky was there with Fedorov and half the general staff. He flipped the page. It's possible she's Stepanov's mistress, but that's speculation. If Stepanov makes a move on her, there's not much she can do about it. She won't have a choice, Coates said. No. She looked as though she was under a lot of stress. The big question is why she decided to come to us. You don't believe what she said in her letter? I don't know if I believe it or not. What are you going to do? I'm going to make someone's day at Langley, Greenwald said. Psst. If you want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 33 Thorne sat in his Langley office, contemplating the week's events. Turkish troops still occupied a large swath of northern Syria, but Campbell had persuaded General Sevim to halt the advance. The fighting was fierce in Syria, but Russian superiority had gained the upper hand. Kurdish forces were being driven into the northeast corner of the country. They were boxed in. Campbell had called an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council. There had been a lot of shouting. The American ambassador and his Russian counterpart had traded accusations. In the end, a compromise had been reached. It was decided to convene an international peace conference to try and resolve the Syrian issue. It was set to take place in Helsinki. Thorne was doing his best to ignore the frenzied speculation in the media about what would happen in Helsinki. He was reading the latest edition of Red Star. Reading helped maintain his fluency in Russian. Besides, he never knew what he might discover in the paper. Espionage had always been about information. Modern technology produced so much information that it took thousands of analysts and vast computer resources to try and make sense of it. The analysts looked at everything in Red Star and boiled it down to a handout. The problem was that they didn't focus on things the same way he did, which was why he preferred reading the actual paper. Thorne always looked for the human element, something the analysts tended to gloss over. Sometimes a simple article could provide unintended insights on what Russian leadership was thinking or planning. The front page featured a picture of a woman in uniform. She was looking straight at the camera, her expression neutral. The photographer had captured a sense of caged energy about her. The caption under the picture read, Colonel Anya Volkova, the new Russian woman. She's beautiful, he thought, but she looks like she's holding everything in. Next to her, an older woman lay in a hospital bed identified as Colonel Volkova's mother. Volkova's brother had been killed in Syria. Her mother had suffered a heart attack when she heard the news. After praising her brother's actions, the emphasis in the article shifted to Colonel Volkova and her family. How she was coping with her brother's heroic sacrifice. How important her work was in combat services support. 
Volkova was in charge of ensuring the uninterrupted supply of everything needed for the Syrian offensive. That's interesting. A major operation like that usually has someone of flag rank in that position. The article gave Volkova a lot of credit for Russia's success in Syria. When he finished the article, Thorne had learned a great deal about Colonel Volkova, her brother, and her family's history of service to the state. He laid the paper down on his desk, leaned back in his chair and put his hands behind his head. The article wasn't typical of Red Star, a monthly paper oriented toward military views and tactics. Thorne couldn't remember the last time he'd seen an article praising a woman in the Russian army, at least not the modern army. Many women were considered heroes of what the Russians called the Great Patriotic War, women who'd killed an impressive number of German soldiers or blown up more of Hitler's tanks than their male counterparts. History had proved Russian women were fierce enemies in war. But this wasn't wartime. Volkova was being held up as an example of the success and recognition women could achieve in the modern Federation military. Trained, competent, loyal, indispensable, and therefore rewarded with advancement. Successful because of opportunities provided by Russia's enlightened military leadership. Bullshit, he thought. You could call Russia's military leadership many things, but enlightened wasn't one of them. He set the paper aside and picked up a day-old edition of his Vestia. The paper had survived the fall of the Soviet Union and was now the nearest thing Russia had to a national newspaper. The front page carried a large picture of Colonel Volkova and her mother standing next to General Kerensky, General Stepanov, and a man identified as Major Gorky. They were in President Tarasov's office. He was presenting Russia's highest military award to Volkova's mother. They're turning this woman into a household name. Why? Thorne's conclusion was that she'd been singled out for promotion and greater responsibility. If she didn't screw up, Colonel Anya Volkova was on her way to becoming a major player in the Byzantine world of Russian military bureaucracy. He filed the information away in his mind. The phone rang. Thorne. Mike, it's Jenna Carlson wants us. Where? In his office. On the way. Every time he walked down the paneled hallway on the seventh floor, Thorne felt as though the eyes in the portraits of past directors were following him with disapproval. He'd never gotten used to it. It gave him the creeps. He knocked at Carlson's door and went in. Jenna was already there. Carlson was behind his desk. Ah, there you are. Sit down, Mike. He glanced at Jenna as he sat. Her expression gave no clues. How's your Russian? Carlson asked. It hasn't changed, Lewis. You know I'm fluent. Good. You're going to Helsinki. Helsinki, to the conference, why? Because I need someone there who isn't on Tarasov's security radar. Probably half of his people at the conference will be FSB or SVR. They know everyone who's at the embassy. They don't know you. The Federal Naya Slujba Bezopasnosti, FSB, was responsible for Russia's internal security. The Slujba Veneshny Razvedki Rosiskoy Federatsi, or SVR, was the Federation's equivalent of the CIA. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, the two organizations had been created to replace the old Committee of State Security, the KGB. The FSB was headquartered in the same building on Lubyanka Square that had once housed the KGB. The names had changed, but not much else. The new organizations were better organized and better equipped, but still as ruthless as the old. Don't forget I was just in Syria. They'll have passed their intel onto the Russians. There's no reason why they would recognize you. You were disguised. They don't know what you really look like. Besides, Helsinki is neutral ground. Even if they find out who you are, they won't do anything about it. Lewis, it doesn't matter what I look like if someone here tells them I'm coming. I'm not convinced we have a mole. Neither is Director Kramer. Forgive me if your lack of conviction doesn't fill me with confidence. For what it's worth, the only people who will know you're in Finland are in this room. What about Kramer? That's Director Kramer, Thorne. Yes, she'll know. I'll think about it. I guess I didn't make myself clear, Carlson said. It's not an option. I want you to go to Helsinki. You still haven't told me why. We need to know if the Russians mean what they say at the table. You want me to go to Helsinki and try to find out what the Russians are really thinking? More or less. I'm glad to see you understand the concept. Come on, Lewis. Every Russian I've ever met is paranoid as hell. They're not going to open up to a stranger, even if he speaks the language. Then I guess you'll have to make friends. Don't worry, Thorne. All I want you to do is observe. You're good at that. Find out what you can. There's always loose talk in the hotel bar. 
You don't mind hanging out in the bar, do you? Someone has to create my legend. Passport, pictures, documents, all that. The things I need. That means you and Jenna won't be the only people who know about me. You think someone in documents is a traitor? I didn't say that. I'm glad to hear you say so because it's already done. Carlson reached into a drawer, took out a package, and pushed it over to Thorne. We made sure your identity was hidden, Jenna said. No one in documents knows who you are. I can guarantee that, Carlson said. Look, Mike, this has to be done. All of our people at the embassy are compromised. You'll come home when the conference ends. Since I don't have a choice, when do I leave? Tonight. Your flight leaves at 9.10 from Dulles. Then I'd better get moving. Unless there's something else. No, that's all, Carlson said. When Thorne had left, Carlson turned to Jenna. Let's go, she's waiting. DCI Kramer's office was down the hall from Carlson's. Scott Davidson was in the room with her. Lewis, Jenna, have a seat, Kramer said. She waited until they sat down. Scott, you go ahead. We've been looking into the possibility that we have a mole, he said. Thorne was right. It explains a lot. You'll be happy to hear that it's probably not him. I can't believe you ever thought it was, Jenna said. Don't be naive, Jenna. You know we have to look at everyone. It wouldn't be the first time a traitor pointed the finger at someone else. You said probably. Does that mean he's still under suspicion? Don't let your personal feelings get in the way here, Jenna, Kramer said. My personal feelings? Did you really think we wouldn't know you and Thorne were sleeping together? You haven't exactly been discreet. Did you forget that your phones are monitored for location? When they spend nights at the same place, it's not rocket science to figure out what's going on. There was no point in denying it. The last time I looked, there was no regulation against officers of the agency having a personal relationship, Jenna said. In fact, I thought it was preferred, since there's no risk of inadvertent exposure to an outsider. I never allow personal feelings to get in the way of my job. I resent the implication. Stand down, Jenna. No one's accusing you or Thorne of anything, Davidson said. It certainly sounded like it. Let's move on, Kramer said. As you both know, several of our operations have run into trouble in the last few months. We've lost seven assets, dead or missing. Two of our people narrowly avoided arrest by the opposition. That doesn't include Thorne's misadventures. Someone is leaking specific information to the other side. It has to stop. Lewis, you've been pursuing this. Carlson cleared his throat. I believe Thorne's recent problems present the best chance of pinning down the mole. In his last two assignments, the opposition knew who he was before he got there. That's only possible if someone here told them. I've been looking at everyone who could have known his cover identity and where he was going. It turns out to be a fairly long list, but I've narrowed it down. Jenna looked at him. I do the work and he takes the credit, asshole. This is your responsibility, Lewis, Kramer said. I made you director of operations. Don't make me regret my choice. The current situation with the Russians means finding the mole is our number one priority. I understand, director. I've set a trap that may help smoke him out. Oh, I sent Thorne to Helsinki to keep an eye on the Russian delegation. Aside from the people in this room, only three others know he's going. If someone tries to interfere with him, we'll have narrowed down our suspect list. You're using Thorne as bait, Jenna said. I wouldn't put it quite like that, Carlson said. How would you put it, Lewis? You told him no one knew except us and Director Kramer. He would have argued if I'd told him what I'd done. He can handle himself. What are you worried about? You painted a target on his back. If the mole knows about his mission, you've exposed him to the opposition. He's an SSO, Jenna. He knew what he was getting into when he signed up. You mean he's expendable, Jenna said. Carlson shrugged. If there is a traitor and this exposes him, it's worth it. You son of a bitch, Jenna said. Jenna, I understand your reaction, but Lewis is right, Kramer said. Thorne can take care of himself. He's proved that more than once. I don't have to remind you it would be inappropriate to tell him what Lewis has done, do I? No, director, you don't. As I said, I never let personal feelings get in the way of the job. That doesn't mean I have to like it. Good. Scott, do you have anything to add? Lewis, I want to see a list of the people you suspect. I'll have a copy on your desk after we're done with this meeting. Make sure there are no leaks on this, Kramer said. If word gets out, our mole will disappear. Besides, it's bad for morale. No problem, Carlson said. As they left Kramer's office, Jenna turned to Carlson. You really are a bastard, Lewis. Come on, Jenna, this is the CIA. Everybody lies. Suck it up and get over it. You didn't do this because you want to catch the mole. You did it because you want to screw Thorne. 
Think whatever you like, Jenna. By the way, I'd watch what you say. You didn't do yourself any good in there. She wanted to tell him to go fuck himself. She stifled the urge. Back in her office, Jenna considered what to do. They could all go to hell. She wasn't going to let Mike walk blind into Carlson's mole trap. She couldn't do anything about it here. Not within the cloud of surveillance that existed inside the building and her office. She finished the report she'd been working on, shut down her computer, and left the building. She walked to her car, exited the Langley compound, and drove a half mile down the road to a turnout. Then she took a prepaid burner phone from the glove compartment, powered it up, and called Thorne. Yes, Mike, it's Jenna. I didn't recognize the number. What's up? I'm getting ready to leave. Carlson is setting you up. They know there's a mole. He's using you as bait to smoke him out. The only reason you're going to Helsinki is to try and get the mole to tip off the opposition and provoke them to go after you. If they make a move, he'll have narrowed down the suspect list. Figures, Thorne said. You told me he'd find a way to screw me over. They know we're sleeping together. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. I was told in no uncertain terms not to warn you about Carlson's plan. Kramer and Davidson think it's a good idea. Nothing like knowing your bosses will back you up. Kind of gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Hey, I'm your boss and I'm backing you up. Exception noted. If the opposition comes after you, they'll play rough, Mike. They'll try to grab you. Pawns aren't worth a whole lot. Besides, I'm expendable, remember? Don't underestimate your value. You moved out of the pawn category a long time ago. Give yourself some credit. If the opposition can take you off the board, it will be a win for them. Thanks for sticking your neck out. Be careful in Finland. I'll bring back a bottle of good Finnish vodka. Just bring yourself back. Jenna broke the connection, opened the back of the phone and took out the battery and the card. She broke the card in half and tossed the pieces out the window. When she got home, she'd get rid of the rest of it. It wasn't likely the call would be flagged, but she'd learned long ago to be careful. Working for Langley was a pain in the ass when it came to privacy. Kramer's revelation about using their phones to discover her relationship with Mike was a case in point. Kramer had wanted to make sure Jenna knew her place. Davidson was as bad with his subordinates, maybe worse. The reason he was deputy director was because of his good old boy connections. That, and the fact that he was a champion at sucking up to people above him. Carlson was a manipulative prick who had his eye on Kramer's job and would do anything to advance his position. It was like working in a snake pit. The three of them had no compunction at all about setting Mike up as bait for the opposition. It wasn't so much that they were doing it, as that they were doing it behind his back. She knew Mike. If they'd told him the truth, it wouldn't have been a problem. She waited for a break in the traffic, pulled away from the turnout and headed home. Jenna lived in a renovated brownstone in the city, right at the edge of Georgetown. Once inside the house, she tossed her purse onto the hall table and went into the kitchen. She considered making a martini and thought better of it, opting instead for a glass of white wine from an open bottle in the refrigerator. She took the glass and the bottle into the living room and dropped into her favorite chair. She thought about Mike, wondering what the hell she was doing. She'd called a halt to things a year ago because she'd been frightened by the intensity between them. He wasn't the kind of man you could be with on a casual basis. She had just been promoted to her job as DDO and she hadn't wanted the complications that came with a relationship that was more than casual. She'd looked at him that day in the bar not long ago and wanted him. She told herself it wasn't anything more than simple lust. That was then. Now it was too late to pretend that her feelings were casual. She poured herself another glass of wine. Chapter 34 Thorne flew to London, then changed to a Finnair flight to Helsinki. The new push for economic austerity had forced him to travel in economy class. By the time he landed in Finland, he'd used up the better part of a day and was stiff from the lousy seats and hours in the air. A lot of that time had been spent thinking about Jenna's call. Finding out the trip to Helsinki was a setup didn't surprise him. Carlson was a master of underhanded manipulation. It was typical of him to do something like this. Thorne's passport said he was Canadian. Titanium-framed designer glasses and a good suit, combined with a trim mustache and goatee, gave him the look of a prosperous businessman. He cleared passport control and took a cab to the hotel where the conference was being held. A room had been reserved for him. If anyone asked, he was here to look into importing Finnish saunas to Canada. 
There was no reason anyone would think he was anything other than what he appeared to be, unless one of the people on Carlson's list had betrayed him to the opposition. If that were the case, they'd come after him soon. If they did, he'd be ready for them, thanks to Jenna. The conference was scheduled to begin in two days. Delegations from the United States, Syria, and the Russian Federation were arriving tomorrow, along with representatives of Turkey and the EU. There had been a lot of bickering about who would attend the meetings as interested observers or participants. An Egyptian Nobel Peace Prize winner had been chosen to moderate the discussions, someone who could reasonably be seen as neutral to both sides. Security was already heavy at the hotel. Thorne spotted half a dozen men and women in the lobby sporting discreet earpieces. Thorne's room was typical of European hotels, small but comfortable. Enough room for a bed, a corner desk and chair, a wall-mounted TV, an armchair and a bathroom. The view was of another wing of the hotel, but he wasn't there for the view. It was after seven in the evening Helsinki time. Long experience had taught him the best way to defeat jet lag was to adapt to local time and act accordingly. That meant it was almost time for dinner. He stripped and went into the bathroom. A cold shower brought him back to alertness. He dressed in slacks, a gray shirt open at the collar, and a sport jacket, casual business style. By now the bar would be filling up. It was time to go downstairs and mix. If the opposition knew he was here, they'd watch for an opportunity to engage. The wall behind the bar was filled with bottles from floor to ceiling, liquors of every kind and description. Like everything else in the hotel, the bar was clean and modern, open and light. The floor was made of granite tile. Red rugs placed under chairs and tables helped keep the noise down to a bearable level. Most of the tables were occupied. A man at the bar stood and left. Thorn slid onto the vacant stool. The bartender came over a woman with long blonde hair tied back in a ponytail. Mita Haluesit Huoda, she said. Sorry, I don't speak Finnish. Do you speak English? Thorne said. Yes, I do. I asked you what you would like to drink. He thought of Jenna and ordered a vodka martini. The drink came. He took a sip and looked about the room. A group of reporters had commandeered several tables and pushed them together. Judging from their loud voices, they'd been there a while. There were a number of people he pegged as locals. Others were probably staying at the hotel. The hotel and bar were right in the middle of town, making it a popular watering spot. If the Russians had agents here, they weren't easy to spot. The man sitting on his right got up and left. A woman sat down on the empty stool. She was attractive, with the look common to Scandinavia. Her eyes were blue, her cheekbones high and well-defined, her skin milk-white fair. Her blonde hair was cropped short feathered against her skull. She wore expensive clothes, dark gray slacks, a red silk blouse, black designer shoes with sturdy raised heels, gold and ruby earrings, gold bracelets, the faintest hint of high-end perfume, no wedding ring. Hey, she said. Her voice was pleasant. Hello, you are English, she said. No Canadian, I'm here on business. Finland is a very good place to do business. I hope so, Thorne said. You are long here? Only a few days. What kind of business do you do? Import-export. I import saunas for home use. I'm hoping to get a better deal here than in Sweden. Finnish saunas are much better, she said. Have you tried one yet? Thorne laughed. No, not yet. I only got here a few hours ago. I'm Sophie. Welcome to Finland. She held out her hand. They shook. Hello, Sophie. I'm Calvin. My friends call me Cal. Well, Cal, would you like to buy me a drink? It would be my pleasure. Thorne signaled the bartender. What were the odds a woman who looked like this would sit down next to him two minutes after he appeared in public? Going out of her way to be friendly? She was either a hooker or a spy. Right, game on. Chapter 35 Major Petrov stood at attention, suppressing the urge to scratch his nose. He waited for his superior to finish reading the report on Anya Volkova. Colonel Yurchik Ivanov worked in the 5th Directorate of the Main Directorate of the General Staff, the GRU. When foreigners thought of Russian spies, they usually thought of the old KGB, now transformed into the FSB and SVR. Those feared organizations were puny compared to the GRU. The tentacles of Russia's largest intelligence agency spread like poison throughout the world. The GRU was supposed to concentrate on foreign intelligence, leaving domestic spying to the FSB. It was a fine distinction that meant little. 
especially when military personnel were involved. There were 12 official directorates in the GRU, augmented by special units used for assassinations and foreign destabilization tactics. Ivanov's 5th directorate was responsible for military operations intelligence. Petrov had been assigned to watch General Stepanov as a matter of policy. In the new Russia, as in the old, everyone in positions of importance within the military was assigned a watcher. The GRU had been created by Stalin during World War II. Stalin was long gone, but GRU policies and tactics remained the same. Ivanov held a cigarette pinched upright between a nicotine-stained thumb and forefinger as he read. He was a large man, his shoulders pushed against the seams of his uniform jacket. His eyes were black, cold. His face was an unpleasant face, pockmarked with acne scars without humor, a face that told you to be careful. Ivanov took a deep drag, leaned back in his chair and blew smoke up at the ceiling. He looked at Petrov. You say in your report you suspect Stepanov intends to make Volkova his mistress. Yes, sir. You are to be commended for your observations. This is useful information. However, though it is a breach of conduct, it is not an unusual situation for a senior officer like Stepanov to take a subordinate for a lover. What made you decide to follow her? Stepanov has given her access to the most secret information. It is highly unusual for someone of her rank to be given such responsibility. I felt that closer observation was necessary. Because? A hunch, sir. She is arrogant. I don't trust her. She lacks respect. You mean she lacks respect for you, don't you, Major? Never mind, you needn't answer that. Petrov felt himself flush. I identified the man she met in the park and later in the cafe. His name is Vlas Sokolov. He is a known troublemaker, a dissident. He and Volkova pretended to go separate ways before meeting again in the cafe. That is highly suspicious. I agree, Petrov. Bring him in. I want to know what he and the colonel talked about. Yes, sir, shouldn't we bring her in as well? Do I need to remind you that she is now an important symbol of our military? We will wait until we find out why she met this man Sokolov. Yes, sir. That's all. Petrov saluted and left the room. Ivanov stubbed out his cigarette and lit another. He contemplated how he might use Petrov's report to his advantage. Sexual liaisons always provided opportunities for pressuring the individuals involved, as long as proof of impropriety was available. That wouldn't be hard. Stepanov was married. If Petrov was right and Stepanov was fucking her, film of them in bed would give him what he needed. Petrov was a plotter, but he'd shown good initiative in following Volkova. It would be interesting to see what the interrogation of Sokolov revealed. Ivanov's intuition told him there was something there. Why else would they have acted the way they did? As if they were worried someone might be watching them. Ivanov had to be careful pursuing this investigation. General Stepanov was a powerful man, close to the president. Colonel Volkova was now well known to the public. The sister of a fallen hero, the poster woman for recruitment into the services. She had the approval of the president and was clearly marked for future promotion. If Stepanov found out about the investigation, Ivanov might find himself stationed somewhere cold and harsh, a long way from the comfort of his Moscow apartment. He could always shift responsibility to Petrov if things became awkward, but it was much better if it never came to that. He picked up his phone to order surveillance installed in Stepanov's apartment. Chapter 36 Anya rode in the car Stepanov had sent, on the way to have dinner with him at his apartment. Tonight she would be forced to give herself to him, or suffer the consequences. She'd had time to get used to the idea, but she wasn't looking forward to it. It hadn't been easy to make the decision. As much as she hated the idea, if she had to sleep with him to save her career, she'd do it. Her only option was to use Stepanov's lust to manipulate him. The dance of power between men and women was the oldest battle in the world. Sex the oldest weapon. At least there'd be a reprieve after tonight. Stepanov was going to Helsinki as a delegate to the peace conference. She dressed carefully, a touch of perfume, preparations to make sure there was no risk of getting pregnant. She'd heard nothing from the Americans since the day in the park. The man on the bench had told her someone would contact her. He hadn't said how or when. Meanwhile, she went about her job and waited for whatever was going to happen. According to the daily accounts published in Izvestia, the offensive in Syria was going well, with only minor casualties. The paper was lying. It was true the Kurds were in retreat, but Russian casualties were much greater than reported. 
The public wouldn't be so enthusiastic about the war if they knew the cost. She knew what the cost was. Russian blood. Grigory's blood. She wondered if her letter to the Americans had reached anyone who could make a difference. She didn't think it would change the outcome of what happened in Syria. It was obvious what the Russian forces intended to do and what their objectives were. She hadn't revealed anything the Americans probably didn't know. She'd only wanted to show them she had access to military operations. That she was willing to give them information, if it helped prevent a larger war. The man on the bishop's bench meant she'd succeeded in piquing their interest. Anya had surprised herself by the way she'd felt after meeting the American. She had just betrayed her country. Part of her had expected something dramatic to happen. To walk out of the park and be arrested, or to come home and find the FSB waiting for her. Perhaps for the sky to open, to hear a booming voice call down wrath upon her. But nothing had happened. Instead, she'd felt relieved, as if a burden had been lifted from her. She'd gone home, spent the rest of the afternoon with her mother, made dinner, watched television for a while, and gone to bed. A perfectly normal and boring day, except for what had happened in the park. Tonight promised to be anything but boring. Stepanov met her at the door with a glass of wine in his hand. He wore a black shirt open at the collar, exposing thick chest hair. She caught a whiff of cologne. At least it's a pleasant scent. You look lovely, my dear. Thank you, Yuri. Come, have a glass of wine with me. It's from Italy, a rare vintage. It will go well with the food. I've had the chef prepare an Italian meal for us. I didn't know you were a gourmet. There are many things you don't know about me, Anya. I hope that soon we will get to know each other much better. He poured a large glass of wine for her. They went into the living room and sat on one of the white leather couches. The wine was a deep ruby color, almost purple. It clung to the sides of the glass like honey as she swirled it around. She inhaled the aroma, a rich scent that evoked images of distant hillsides, sunlight, and dark earth. She sipped. It bloomed in her mouth. Exquisite, she said. Stepanov looked pleased. I'm glad to see you appreciate it. Wine is a social drink. When I'm by myself, I usually drink vodka. But wine like this requires company for enjoyment. Tolstoy would not approve, Anya said. He thought drinking wine was a mistake that people drank only to push away the voice of their inner spiritual being, their conscience. Most likely Tolstoy didn't have much enjoyment in his life, Yuri said. Perhaps he would have changed his mind if he had drunk wine like this. Anya smiled at him. What a pleasure it is to have an intelligent conversation, Stepanov said. He raised his glass. To Tolstoy, they drank. Stepanov filled her glass again. You know I'm going to the conference in Helsinki, he said. Do you think it will produce any results? It's a waste of time. Nothing will come of it. They must know we will not leave Syria because they want us to, Anya said. Their president is new to his job. He hasn't learned that we cannot be intimidated by saber rattling. If they do anything rash, they will find that out. Stepanov sipped his wine and looked at her over the glass. I want you to accompany me to Finland. I've already added you to the list of delegates from the Federation. Your extensive knowledge of our operations in Syria makes you a reasonable choice. You will sit behind me at the conference table. I may have occasion to ask you about something. Shit. That's not why he wants me to come to Finland. Of course, Yuri, I would be happy to assist. Have you ever been to Helsinki? No, I've never been outside our borders. It will be quite an experience for you. Helsinki is very civilized. You will enjoy it. There should be opportunities for you to explore the city. Come, let's eat. The table was loaded with food, as it had been the first time she'd come to his apartment. An assortment of cheeses, breads, and vegetables was placed next to platters of chicken and fish. A large salad sat on the side. There was pasta and soup. It was more than any two people could eat. We could do it in the traditional Italian way and take things in order, Stepanov said. I prefer to simply choose whatever one likes. Please take as you wish. Anya ate little anticipating what was to come. She finished her wine while they talked and ate. Stepanov filled her class a third time. When they were done eating, Stepanov poured a small glass of golden liquor for her. It tasted of honey and autumn sunlight. Stepanov stood and took her hand. This way, he said. He picked up the bottle of liquor and led her to the bedroom. Like the rest of the apartment, the room was done in shades of black and white. The bed was wide, deep, the bed covers turned back. The sheets were of red satin. A large mirror was mounted on the ceiling above. 
another on the opposite wall facing the bed. Stepanov pointed at an open door. The bathroom is there. You will find a robe on the back of the door. I'll be back in a minute, she said. Anya went into the bathroom and closed the door. The fixtures were gold, perhaps plated, perhaps not. A pale blue silk robe hung on the bathroom door. She gripped the edge of the sink and stared at herself in the mirror. Get it over with. She took off her clothes and put on the robe. The silk caressed her skin. When she came out, Stepanov was lying naked on his back, his large penis pointing at the mirrored ceiling. His body was covered with hair. He watched her walk across the room. Take off your robe, he said. She shrugged off the robe and let it fall to the floor. You are very beautiful, Anya. In spite of herself, she looked at his erect organ. Come here, he said. Later, she couldn't remember much except the unpleasant feeling of his body against her and his animal grunts of passion. She was glad she'd had that third glass of wine. It wasn't enough to make the sex pleasurable, but it helped make it endurable. After a while, Stepanov fell asleep, sated. He began snoring. She got up, went into the bathroom, and turned on the shower. When she'd washed away as much of him as she could, she still felt unclean. She turned off the water, dried herself, and put on her clothes. Stepanov would not want her there in the morning. Of that she was sure. His snores were loud and deep as she came out of the bathroom. She dressed quickly and left the bedroom. She passed a door on her left, open to a library and study. Stepanov's briefcase sat on the floor next to a desk. She could hear his snores coming from the bedroom. Taking a deep breath to calm herself, she went into the room. The briefcase was unlocked. Inside was an unmarked folder. She opened it and began reading. It was an evaluation of combat unit readiness. Anya was used to seeing things like this, but there was something different about the file she held in her hands. Her job meant she knew almost everything there was to know about the Federation's military, but this folder contained references to units she'd never heard of. They all had one thing in common. They were specialized submarine units, secret units. They had another thing in common as well. They were all currently at sea. Under Tarasov, the submarine fleet had become a primary weapon in Russia's wartime arsenal. With a shock, she realized the list must mean the Federation was getting ready for war. She placed the folder back in the briefcase, closed it, and set it back down by the desk. Her worst fears were coming true. Chapter 37 Kramer, Davidson, and Carlson were meeting in Kramer's office. All right, Lewis, you have our attention. Tell us about this Moscow walk-in. She's not your typical walk-in, Carlson said. This woman works in the Ministry of Defense. She's in a position where she knows damn near everything that's going on with their military planning. She's also the focus of a major publicity campaign designed to encourage women to choose the military as a career. Her boss is the first deputy minister of defense, General Stepanov. Moscow Station thinks we need to jump on this. That's Greenwald, isn't it? Davidson said. That's right. He wouldn't push this up to us if he didn't think it was gold. It seems too good to be true. She could be a plant, meant to give us false information, mislead us. Why does Greenwald believe her? Why would she want to help us? Kramer asked. What's her motivation? He thinks it's a combination of revenge and patriotism. Patriotism? How does a traitor get to be a patriot? Davidson said. According to Greenwald, Colonel Volkova believes the current leadership is taking Russia down the path to war. She fears the destruction that would result from war. She's got that right, Davidson said. We'd wipe them off the face of the earth. Carlson continued. It's classic agent motivation, ideological. She believes her country is on the wrong course and fears the consequences if something isn't done. What's the revenge part? Kramer asked. Volkova had two younger brothers, both in the army, both dead. One brother was killed in a training accident because of incompetent supervision. The officer responsible was promoted. Her second brother was killed in Syria recently during the firefight with our forces there. Tarasov made him into a public hero and awarded him the gold star. It's the Russian equivalent of our Medal of Honor. So this Colonel Volkova and her family are a big deal, Davidson said. A very big deal, Carlson said. Her family has a long history of service to the state. Her father was SVR. Her grandfather was an aide to Andropov when he was running the KGB. And his father was in the NKVD under Beria. Her family background means she's considered part of the unofficial elite. She's been watched since she was a child and marked for advancement. She's trusted. Interesting, Kramer said. 
Volkova oversees all the logistics of the Russian offensive. She knows what's going on in real time. She knows what they're planning. She's already revealed weaknesses that helped us slow the Russian advance. Kramer looked thoughtful. You think she's the real thing? Yes. We haven't got anyone in Russia with that kind of access. Tarasov's security services are good at what they do. Until she came along, the only thing we've gotten out of Russia in recent months is chicken feed. Nothing as good as what she gave us to prove she was who she said she was. What kind of protocols have been set up with her? Who's her handler? She doesn't have one yet, Carlson said. She's only been told someone will contact her. Greenwald thought it best to let us make those decisions. Then we'll assign someone. We have an opportunity for a face-to-face -face meet coming up. She's been added to the Russian delegation that's going to Helsinki for the conference. She's listed as an advisor to General Stepanov. Greenwald thinks she may be Stepanov's mistress. Davidson snorted. Sure, advisor. Bed bunny, more likely. I have a suggestion, Carlson said. Thorne is already there. He's been through the drill. He knows how to get the most out of an asset. We can have him contact her. That might be counterproductive, Kramer said. You sent him there to see if you could draw out our mole. If he's been compromised and meets with Volkova, she'll be exposed. Not if he's careful not to be seen with her. The conference starts tomorrow. We could send someone else, but why do that when we have someone in place? I don't like Thorne, Davidson said. We should send someone else. Your personal dislike doesn't mean he can't handle this, Kramer said. Besides, it will save money. That will make Bradford happy. Lewis, tell Thorne to make contact. Warn him his cover may be blown. He's not going to like that. I told him there was no way a mole could know he was going. Then you'll have to come clean. We can't risk losing Colonel Volkova as a source. But you got yourself into this, Lewis. Get yourself out. Are we clear? Clear, Director. How will she know Thorne is genuine? Kramer asked. When she contacted the embassy, she told them to send someone wearing a red flower, Carlson said. I'll tell Thorne to do the same. What are we going to call her? She needs an operational designation. Kramer entered a few strokes on her keyboard. A list came up on the screen. Opera, she said. Let's hope she's a good singer, Davidson said. Chapter 38 The steady buzz of his cell phone woke Thorne in his hotel room. The woman in the bar had turned out to be a high-priced hooker, not an agent for the opposition. When she'd realized Thorne wasn't going to avail himself of her services, she'd moved on. After she left, he had two more drinks. A pounding headache told him that had been a mistake. He fumbled and picked up the phone. It looked like any other modern cell phone, but it was a product of the Defense Intelligence Agency's Skunk Works. It had satellite capability and was encrypted with unbreakable technology. No one was going to listen in on the conversation. Thorn, Michael, this is Lewis. I have an assignment for you. It's priority importance. Are you clear to talk? It's three in the morning and I'm alone in my hotel room. Yeah, I'm clear to talk. We want you to arrange a covert meeting with someone who's with the Russian delegation at the conference. You make that sound simple, Thorne said. You realize what kind of security they have? I'm sure you'll find a way. Her name is Anya Volkova. She's a colonel, traveling as an assistant to General Stepanov. He's the first deputy defense minister, which makes him a major player. Thorne remembered the articles in his Vestia and Red Star. Volkova, the woman whose brother was killed in Syria. That's her. It sounds like you already know who she is. Only what they've printed about her. She happens to be in a perfect position to know what the Russians are doing. She contacted the embassy in Moscow. She wants to help us. She's a walk-in? That's right. Why would she help us? She's on the fast track. They've turned her into a national figure. We ran it by psych to be sure. They say she checks the boxes and we should believe her. Far be it from me to argue with the head shrinkers, Thorne said. You really should stop making those derogatory comments, Carlson said. Are you going all PC on me now, Lewis? I'm going to ignore that. She'll be staying in your hotel with the other delegates. Contact this woman and gain her trust. Her designation is Opera. Set up communication protocols with her. Give her some basic tradecraft. She's an amateur. She'll make a mistake if she doesn't learn quickly. Has she given any indication she wants to defect? Negative. We don't want her to defect. Don't mention it if she doesn't. What if something happens and her cover is blown? If something happens, whatever we do will be time and situational dependent, Carlson said. You're willing to get her out if there's trouble. She'll need reassurance. Of course. You always were protective of your assets. 
Is there anything specific you want me to find out when I talk with her? Stepanov's wife has ALS. It's possible Volkova is his mistress. That would be good to know if true. You want me to ask her if she's sleeping with Stepanov? That's a great way to build rapport. From what I know of her, she doesn't strike me as the mistress type, Thorne said. Come on, Thorne, she's a woman. She wouldn't be the first to sleep her way to the top. You really should stop making those derogatory comments, Lewis. There you go again, Carlson said. You can't help being a smartass, can you? Something in you brings it out of me, is that all? There's something else. If we have a mole, it's possible he knows about your mission. You need to be careful when you meet with the source. You said there was no way that could happen. Yeah, well, I was wrong. Sorry about that. Sure you are. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. I expect timely updates. Don't screw this up, Thorn. Carlson hung up. Thorn got up and put on a robe. No way he was getting back to sleep now. He turned on the Keurig provided by the hotel, inserted a pod, and waited as it filled a cup. He sat down and sipped the bitter brew, thinking about how to make contact with Volkova. The top floor of the hotel had been set aside for the Russian delegation due to arrive later today. SVR agents were already stationed at all access points to prevent unauthorized personnel from entering the floor. There was zero chance he could meet her there. It would have to be while the conference was in session, when all the delegates were down on the ground floor and out of their rooms. Maybe it wouldn't be as difficult as he thought. In the days of the USSR, it would have been impossible to approach her. Someone like her would have had KGB minders with her when visiting the West. The Federation was more open, at least on the surface. Life was better in Russia now than it had been under the communists. The old paranoia about people defecting to the West was still there, but it wasn't as much of a concern as it once had been. There would be breaks in the conference sessions. The weather was good. People would go outside. That might provide an opportunity. The conference could last for several days, or end quickly. There was no way to tell. Thorne doubted Moscow had any intention of agreeing to anything, but they might drag things out to make the West look unreasonable in negotiations. It's what he would do if he were them. He would have to be patient and hope an opportunity presented itself to approach her. Jenna had confirmed that there was a mole, and now Lewis had told him to be careful. Thorne had to assume the worst, that his cover was blown. If the Russians knew who he was and saw him meet with Volkova, she was toast. They'd take him off the board if they considered him a threat, neutral ground or not, and Volkova with him. On a shit scale of 1 to 10, this mission had the potential to be a 12. It wouldn't be the first time. Chapter 39 Two large men held Sokolov by his elbows and marched him along a narrow alley hidden behind the Institute for Cosmic Biology. That was when he recognized where he was being taken. The alley led to GRU headquarters, a run-down ten-story offense to architectural design called the Aquarium. Because of the extensive use of glass in the building, Sokolov knew he was in trouble. Why had he been picked up? And why the GRU, not FSB? His dissident activities were well known. They had cost him his job at the university and forced him into a tiny one-room apartment in a crumbling building built when Brezhnev was still running things. But the GRU... That was a different kind of worry. What could they want? Inside the building, the guards marched him past the security desk with a nod to the man on duty. They passed the bank of elevators and started down concrete stairs toward the basement. It was never a good thing when they took you to the basement. Russian basements had been places to fear since the time of Ivan the Terrible. Sokolov began to sweat. The stairs ended in a long corridor painted a sickly green, lit by the flickering glow of fluorescent lights. The lights did nothing for the color. Rows of doors lined the hallway. The two guards stopped halfway down, opened a door, and shoved him into a square room. The door closed behind him. He heard the lock click. A scarred table was bolted to the floor in the center of the room. There were two chairs. A large mirror was mounted on one wall. High up in one of the corners, a camera watched him. Sokolov breathed a small sigh of relief. It wasn't a cell or a torture room. Interrogation room. They're watching me through that mirror. He sat down. The feeling of relief vanished as quickly as it had come. He tried to compose himself. After what seemed a long time, the lock clicked and the door opened. A man dressed in the uniform of a major came in carrying a folder. He was accompanied by one of the guards. The guard walked to a corner of the room and stood at ease, watching. The major sat down at the table across from Sokolov. 
He opened the file and began reading. After a few moments, he closed the folder with a snap and looked up. You are the dissident, Floss Sokolov. Excuse me, Major. I'm not a dissident. I have learned I was wrong to criticize our government. So you say, why am I here? I will ask the questions in this room, Petrov said. You are here because we want to talk to you about your relationship with Colonel Volkova. My relationship? I don't have a relationship with her. She was a student in one of my classes when I was still teaching at the university. Do you deny recently meeting Colonel Volkova in Presnensky Park? I was waiting for a game of chess. She appeared and sat down. I hadn't seen her in years. What did you talk about? Small talk. I told her I was sorry to hear about her brother. We discussed chess. I am ranked as expert. I remember we talked about the Sicilian defense. It's a classic in chess strategy. I know what the Sicilian defense is, Sokolov. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to imply that you didn't understand chess. What did you do after the game? I went to a cafe I know. I can always find a good game there, and the coffee is excellent. You met Colonel Volkova there, did you not? Not really. I mean, I was surprised to see her in the cafe. I didn't know she would be there. There are many cafes in Moscow. Do you really expect me to believe she accidentally chose the exact one you had gone to after your meeting in the park? Why didn't you walk there together? Why go to the trouble of separating and taking different routes? Sokolov felt sweat running down his back between his buttocks. I didn't know she would go to the cafe, he said. And in the cafe, what did you talk about then? I, I don't remember. We played another game. I won, of course. You don't recall what you talked about? Not really. Petrov stood and picked up his folder. I'm sure we can help you remember, he said. Why don't you think about it for a while? Perhaps something will come back to you. He gestured to the guard and the two men left the room. In the hall, Petrov told the guard to wait. He opened the door to the next room. Colonel Ivanov sat inside, smoking, watching Sokolov through the one-way mirror. He's hiding something, Ivanov said. Yes, Petrov said. Let him stew for a few hours, then see if his memory has come back. If not, more aggressive interrogation is necessary. Yes, sir. I'm sure he will tell us whatever it is he thinks he can keep to himself. They always do, Ivanov said. Chapter 40 As expected, the first day of the Helsinki conference was spent bickering about protocols and rules. Nothing was accomplished that offered hope for peace in Syria, but no one had expected the first day to produce anything worthwhile. For Anya, it was a day of sheer boredom. The Federation delegation was headed by the Russian foreign minister Arkady Lebedev. He was backed up by the Minister of Defense, General Fedorov. Stepanov and General Kerensky were the other ranking delegates from the Federation. The Americans had sent a delegation headed by their Secretary of State. Edward Demarest was an unknown quantity to the Russians. He'd been a major donor to Campbell's campaign. Before his appointment, he'd been CEO of a large corporation that manufactured agricultural machinery. Demarest was a short man given to plain, dark suits and a no-nonsense approach to his job. He had a deceptively mild appearance that reminded people of Harry Truman. The impression was strengthened by old-fashioned round glasses with steel frames. He seemed out of place in the tense atmosphere of the conference. Accompanying Demarest were General Kroger from the Joint Chiefs, several ranking American officers, some civilians associated with the White House and Congress, and a gaggle of aides. Both sides of the conference table glittered with medals, gold braid, impeccable uniforms, and tailored power suits. Syrian and Turkish observers lined opposite sides of the room, glaring at each other. A second row of chairs had been placed behind each of the major participants at the table. Anya's was directly behind Stepanov. She'd been relieved to learn Major Petrov wasn't part of the Russian delegation. It meant she didn't have to put up with his snide looks and bad breath. She still had to put up with Stepanov. She was careful to maintain the appearance of strict professionalism with him in public. Rumors were already swirling about them. It was essential to maintain appearances. For now, Stepanov was on his guard around her. But in time, he would begin to relax. One day, there would be an opportunity to bring him down. For the moment, she had no choice but to play the role he'd scripted for her. The night before, she'd left his hotel room a little before midnight. For an older man, Stepanov had a lot of stamina. He was an aggressive lover, with little consideration for his partner. His lovemaking bordered on rape. She'd slept badly, woken bruised and sore. Looking at herself in the bathroom mirror, 
she decided she would have to do something to curb his passion. She had a friend who was a pharmacist who might help. Maybe she could give her something to put in Stepanov's wine. Slow him down, put him to sleep. But she'd have to be careful. The only interesting thing to come out of the first day's discussions was a proposal that the opposing parties do away with their uniforms and meet wearing civilian clothes. The moderator had suggested the change as a way to tone down the hostile military atmosphere in the room. None of the generals and admirals were happy about giving up the prestige of their uniform, but they had all agreed. The idea was touted in the press as progress. The hotel phone rang. She picked up. Colonel Volkova. Colonel, this is General Stepanov. This morning's session has been canceled. Something the moderator ate last night didn't agree with him. We are not going to resume until one o'clock this afternoon. General Fedorov, General Kerensky, and myself have some things to discuss. I won't be needing you. You are free to explore Helsinki this morning if you wish. Thank you, sir. Be back here by noon. Yes, sir. Stepanov hung up. So, a morning of relative freedom. It was an unexpected gift. She decided to have breakfast in the hotel restaurant and take in the sights of the city. She put on a light jacket, did a final check in the mirror, and left her room. In another part of the hotel, Thorne was about to go downstairs for breakfast when his phone buzzed. Thorne, Michael, this is Scott Davidson. I want to talk with you about your assignment. Is this a good time? As good as any. I was about to get some breakfast. I won't keep you long. The individual in question has been designated opera. When do you think you'll make contact? That's impossible to say. At the first opportunity is the best I can tell you. Yes, I understand. I worked the street myself at one point. Yeah, I know all about your time in Rome. What a jerk. I want you to let me know as soon you make the connection. DCI Kramer has asked me to keep her informed. What about Carlson? Normally I report to him. By all means, report to Lewis. But I want you to give me a heads up first. Timely updates. Are we clear? Yes, sir, we're clear. Good. Then I'll expect to hear from you later today. Davidson disconnected. Thorne looked at the phone in his hand. There was no operational reason for Davidson to contact him. That meant there was a hidden agenda. Thorne's first thought was that it was a power play at Carlson's expense. He didn't like Lewis much, but if he did what Davidson asked, it would get back to him. He'd go ballistic. It would create trouble Thorne didn't need. Davidson was ambitious. Everyone knew he wanted Kramer's job, including Kramer. Thorne thought Kramer found it amusing. Carlson was after Davidson's job with his eye on the ultimate goal of the directorship. Kramer liked to play the two of them off against each other. The last thing Thorne wanted was to get caught up in the cesspool of seventh-floor politics. When the gods started scheming, it was best to stay out of their way. Rumbling in his stomach reminded him he was hungry. He put on a sport jacket and went downstairs to the crowded restaurant. He joined a line of people waiting to be seated. Colonel Volkova was seated alone, near one of the windows. The morning sunlight bathed her face and made a halo around her hair. It took his breath away. God, she's beautiful, like an angel. The line moved and he was next. The hostess looked around the restaurant. She said something in Finnish. I'm sorry, I don't speak Finnish, Thorne said. Do you speak English? Yes, I do. There are no tables free. Would you like to wait, or are you willing to share a table? Europe was different from America. Sharing tables in crowded restaurants was considered normal. No one thought anything of it. There was only one table that could be shared, the one where Volkova sat. There were other people from the Russian delegation in the restaurant. Thorne didn't know who was security, but someone was. He couldn't be seen talking to her. Thanks, I've changed my mind. Thorne turned and walked into the lobby. A sign announced cancellation of the morning session. A table with coffee, tea, and pastries had been set up near the reception desk. He poured himself a cup of coffee picked up a bun covered with sugar and raisins, and sat down where he could watch the restaurant entrance. With the morning session canceled, what would Volkova do? Was she free? Had she been given the morning off? Or would Stepanov want her for something? The image of how she'd looked sitting in the light stuck in his mind. He munched on the bun and drank his coffee thinking about her. Twenty minutes later, she emerged from the restaurant. She stopped at a rack full of tourist brochures near the desk took one, and left the hotel. Thorne waited to see if anyone came out of the restaurant after her, then got up and followed. As he passed the rack, he took a duplicate of the brochure she'd chosen. It showed a picture of Helsinki Cathedral.
Chapter 41 Anya was tall for a Russian woman, making it easy to keep her in sight. She didn't seem to be in a hurry. It was a beautiful day, pleasant and warm. A faint breeze carried a hint of the Black Sea not far away. Thorne kept a leisurely pace behind her. The streets seemed loose, clean. He could feel it. No one was watching. Sensing the street was a gift, a sixth sense. Not everyone had it. It was one of the reasons Thorne was still in the game, one of the reasons he was good at what he did. The same sense had kept him alive in Afghanistan. Daily confrontation with violent death either brought it out or it didn't. He'd known some who had developed the same ability to sense unseen danger. Others never had. Most of those men were dead. Sometimes Anya stopped to look in a shop window. He followed her to a broad square fronting the cathedral. The massive building had been built in the 19th century as a tribute to Tsar Nicholas I. The architect had combined neoclassical motifs with the style of a traditional Russian Orthodox church. The cathedral gleamed white in the bright sunlight. A high tower rose from the center of the cathedral, roofed by a green dome, a golden orb, and a cross. Four smaller towers mirrored it with similar domes, orbs, and crosses. Wide steps led to a colonnaded facade capped by a triangular pediment. Statues of the apostles stood guard around the edges of the building. He waited until Anya climbed the steps and went in. Thorne did another check for watchers, then followed her up the steps. Helsinki Cathedral was a major tourist attraction, but this early in the day there were few tourists inside the church. He saw Anya standing at a souvenir shop near the entrance, reading a pamphlet. He waited until she started down the central aisle toward the nave before entering. Helsinki Cathedral was Lutheran, different from the great Catholic cathedrals of Europe. It was built in the shape of a Greek cross. Long rows of plain wooden pews marched in regimented order toward the nave and altar at the far end of the cavernous space. Far overhead the ceiling was circular, undecorated, plain. High arches opened to the arms of the cross. Crystal chandeliers hung over the central aisle, glowing with light. Halfway to the nave, Thorn looked back. An organ decorated with ornate carvings in gold and red overlooked the space from a broad balcony. Anya reached the nave and stood admiring an enormous painting behind the altar that pictured Christ being taken down from the cross. The painting was surrounded by an elaborate, gilded frame, flanked by two golden pillars mounted on a marble platform. A pair of life-sized angels in gold knelt in reverent worship to either side. Thorn came up to Anya, holding his brochure. He looked up at the painting. Impressive, isn't it? He said in Russian. She looked at him. Yes, very beautiful. It was the first time he'd heard her voice. He didn't know what he'd expected, but he liked it. He liked the way she managed to make Russian sound almost soft. She was wearing a light touch of perfume, something that hinted at flowers. Up close, she was even more beautiful than he'd thought. I would have worn a red flower, except I haven't had a chance to buy one yet, he said. Please do not be alarmed. You were told you would be contacted. He watched her register the words. Her face blanched. I know you must be nervous. It's natural. What if someone is watching us? No one is. I've made sure of that. I'm good at what I do. I know it's a lot, but I'm asking you to trust me for now. Do I have a choice? Anya said. You always have a choice. Right now, trusting me is the right one. What's your name? Michael. Like the angel. So you are my guardian angel? Yes, that's a good way to think of it. I am frightened, Michael. I didn't realize I would feel like this. I would be surprised if you weren't frightened, Colonel. Please call me Anya. She reached out and touched his arm. An electric shock rippled through him as if her touch had fused them together. It startled him. Her green eyes opened wide. Oh, she said. Surprised, she took her hand away and stepped back. What was that? He forced himself to focus. When do you have to be back at the hotel? Noon. Thorne turned toward the entrance, observing each person who came in. We need to set up a way for you to get information to us, a way to communicate. How did you contact the embassy? I have a friend who arranged it. I'm not sure how he did it. Your embassy is watched all the time. It is risky to go anywhere near it. Can you use the same method in the future? I don't know. I would have to talk to my friend. See if it can be arranged. If that doesn't work, I'll think of something else. What if we need to meet? Anya asked. It's best to avoid meeting in person, but sometimes it may be necessary. I want you to memorize a number. Can you do that? Of course. He recited a phone number and asked her to repeat it. Call that number if you need to make contact. 
Don't use your regular phone to call it. Buy a burner. Use cash. A burner. A cheap prepaid phone. You can pick one up while you're here. Use it once, then throw it away. Make sure no one sees you. From now on, always assume you're being watched. That way you're less likely to make a mistake. It's the safest way. Then what? What do I do after I call? When you call that number, someone will answer in Russian with the name of an Italian restaurant. Tell them you're sorry. You dialed the wrong number and hang up. That's the signal you want a face-to-face -face meeting. Where should the meeting be? Somewhere outdoors. Is there a place you like to go? Somewhere you visit regularly? There's a park I like to walk in. Ismailovsky Park. It's green with lots of trails and trees. That's good. If you need to meet, call the number. Don't do it unless it's really important. You have Sundays off, don't you? Yes. Go to the park on the Sunday after you call. Be there at 9 in the morning and start walking. Someone will come. If you're there for two hours and no one shows up, go home. Then go to the park again the following Sunday. Okay? Okay, it is a big park. I will sit near the Ferris wheel and begin walking when I see you. Standing next to her, she felt like someone he'd known forever. Thorne wanted to reach out and hold her. It confused him. There's something you need to know, she said. Yes, something secret is being planned, something big. I think they are planning war. Maybe with America, I don't know. They have activated secret submarine units. Even I did not know about them, and I should. How do you know this? General Stepanov had a file in his apartment. I looked at it. His apartment? Stepanov has forced me to sleep with him. If I refuse him, he will destroy my career. He is one of the reasons I am doing this. He is a pig. Thorn felt sudden anger toward Stepanov. It added to his feelings of confusion. I'm sorry. She shrugged. It's the way of the world, no? You learn in Russia to do what is needed to survive. It takes courage to do what you're doing, Anya. I love my country. Our leaders have betrayed us. They must be held accountable. They are criminals. If they are not stopped, they will destroy everything. You haven't asked for anything. Do you want money? Do not be insulting, Anya said. I didn't mean to insult you. It's standard practice to ask. Also, you need to know we'll get you out if something goes wrong. That will not be possible, she said. I could not leave my mother. Besides, if something goes wrong, there will probably not be time to get out. There are always signs, Thorne said. You're smart. You'll see them. If you have even a hint someone's on to you, call the number. We'll pull you out. Not without my mother. He looked at his watch. We've been here long enough. I'll go first. If a meeting is necessary in Moscow, I want you to come, Anya said. She reached out to touch him again, resting her hand on his arm. This time there was no shock. He looked into her eyes. He'd never seen eyes like that, that color of deep green. Something unspoken flashed between them. His heart began pounding. He found himself holding his breath. That might not be possible, he finally said. You will think me stubborn, but I will not meet with someone else. I do not trust your government any more than I trust my own. But I think you can be trusted. Anya, it is what you say, a condition of the deal. I'll have to talk to my superiors. They'll see it as a problem. Tell them it is necessary or they will not hear from me again, she said. Now I will leave first. She turned and walked away. Halfway down the long aisle, she looked back at him. Thorne watched her go. It felt like an absence, as if part of himself had gone with her. He thought about the way she'd looked. Those green eyes. Vulnerable, but vulnerability with underlying steel. The way she'd taken charge at the end. He'd never met a woman like her. No one had ever affected him like that. Not Ashley, not Jenna. Thinking of Jenna brought up feelings of guilt, as if he'd betrayed her by what had just happened with Anya. But nothing had happened, had it? Chapter 42 Thorne went back to his hotel and called Jenna. Michael, where are you calling from? My hotel in Helsinki. Listen, I need your advice about something. That's a first. What's the problem? Actually, there are two problems. Davidson called me and wants me to brief him about opera before I talk to Lewis. Something doesn't feel right about that. What's going on? Have you talked to Davidson or Lewis? Not yet. Did Davidson give you a reason why he wanted you to call him first? He said Kramer wanted to be kept informed. Lewis would do that, Jenna said. That's why I called. It feels like a power play. I thought you might know something I don't. Davidson doesn't like Lewis. He may be trying to take over control of opera. She's a gold asset. Davidson is a bureaucrat, Michael said. He doesn't know a damn thing about running assets. 
I might not like Lewis, but he knows his job. He knows the street. Then there's that second problem I mentioned, which is, Opera insists on having me as her handler. She says she won't work with anyone else. Lewis won't like that, or Davidson. It wasn't my idea. She's in Moscow, Mike. Whoever runs her has to be nearby. Normally it would be someone out of the embassy. I know the people stationed there. There isn't anyone qualified to run a high-level asset like this. Don't let Lewis hear you say that. You know it's true. When did that make any difference? Jenna said. If they assign someone else, we'll lose her. She's frightened and I don't blame her. She doesn't trust us, but for some reason she trusts me. If you'd been there when I talked with her, you'd know I'm right. If Davidson is making a move to take her over, he's not going to listen to you. He'll assign someone else. Davidson doesn't have a clue about what's going on out here. He'll put someone on it who doesn't know what they're doing and get her killed. The Russians find out she's talking to us. She'll be arrested. Jenna, we can't let that happen. You should tell Carlson about Davidson. Give him a heads up. Davidson will know I warned him, Thorne said. It's not a smart career move. What career? You burned your promotion chances a long time ago. Thorne laughed. You don't pull any punches, do you? You knew that before you called me. Think about it. You warn Lewis he'll be so pissed off at Davidson that he'll make sure you handle opera just to spite him. He'll go to Kramer. She'll back him up. Why would she do that? You haven't noticed her management style. Julius Caesar had nothing on her. Divide and conquer is written deep on whatever passes for her heart. That's hard, Jenna. You asked for my advice. Yeah, I did. You could be right. I'll talk to Lewis. If Davidson is trying to take control, it makes sense he'd want to cut him out of the loop. What did Opera tell you? It's not good news. She says the Federation is planning something big. Maybe war with us. Something that involves their submarines. She said the units were secret. She hadn't heard of them before and she knows everything about their military. Why does she think they're planning war? How did she find that out? General Stepanov has bullied her into his bed. She's pissed off about it. She saw a file in his apartment. In a way that's good about Stepanov. What's good about it? It gives her real motivation. It helps me understand her. It authenticates her. I hadn't thought about it that way. Of course not, Jenna said. You're not a woman. Chapter 43 Right after he'd spoken with Jenna, Thorne called Carlson and told him about Anya's demand. What the hell do you mean she won't talk to anyone but you? Don't shoot the messenger, Lewis. I'm telling you what she said. It was her idea. She came up with it out of the blue. I told her that could be a problem, but she wouldn't hear it. Do you think she means it? I do. It's not possible. Before you say anything more, there's something you need to know. Davidson called me. What did he want? He wanted me to brief him about opera before I reported to you. He what? You heard me. He wanted me to report to him first. I think he wants to take over control of the asset. Did you? Did I what? Call him first. No, I didn't. Why not? You have street experience. I respect that. You know how to run agents. You know what it feels like to look over your shoulder all the time. Davidson doesn't know shit about any of that. He takes her over. She's toast. She's too important to lose because he wants to play spy. Brief me. Tell me how the meeting went. Thorne told him. When he was done, there was a long pause. All right, Carlson said. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go talk with Kramer after I finish talking with you. I'll recommend that we honor Opera's request and assign you as her handler. That means you have to be nearby, but posting you to Moscow isn't going to fly. I could cover her from here in Helsinki. It will keep me off their radar. It's a short flight to Moscow if she wants to meet. Let me think about it. You'll need a reason to stay in Finland. Something that will give you an excuse to go into Russia. Why not use my Canadian identity? I'm supposed to be in the import business. We could build on that, set up an office as a front. Like I said, I'll think about it. Listen, Michael, I want you to know I appreciate the heads up. Reminds me of that scene in Casablanca, Thorne said. What scene? At the end, when Bogart is talking to the French cop. He says, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I wouldn't go that far, Carlson said. Chapter 44 Vlas Sokolov was in hell. He sat naked on a wooden chair, his hands handcuffed behind him. Every time it fell over while they beat him, they picked it up and began again. He was in bad shape. Both his lips were split and bleeding. Two of his teeth had been knocked from his mouth. He could barely see out of one eye, the other was fully closed and swollen. 
It felt like something was wrong in his face. It hurt when he breathed. He thought they might have broken a rib. He no longer knew how long he'd been in the cell with Petrov and his muscular sergeant Sergei. Every part of his body screamed at him, begging him to tell them he'd helped Anya contact the Americans. He had sworn to himself he wouldn't betray her, but he wasn't sure he could continue to resist. Sokolov sat in his pain and waited for them to start again, hoping he could endure. Petrov stood looking at the battered man in the chair and swore. He was getting tired of this. Blood had splattered on his shirt and he was angry. Sergei, bring the generator. Yes, sir. Sergei left the room. Petrov went over to Sokolov and lifted his chin. This is your last opportunity to tell me what I want to know, he said. Please. Sokolov coughed blood. I have told you I don't know what you want. I want to know what you and Volkova talked about in the cafe. Chess. I have told you. We talked about chess. Old times at the university. Nothing else, I swear. Please do not hit me again. Sergei came back in the room, towing a small hand-powered generator and a length of chain. Haul him up, Petrov said. What? What are you doing? Sokolov mumbled. You'll find out soon enough. Petrov watched as Sergei looped the chain through a pulley fixed to the ceiling of the cell. He lifted Sokolov from the chair, uncuffed his hands, pulled his arms over his head and cuffed them together. He fastened one end of the chain between them. Then he hauled on the other end of the chain and hoisted Sokolov into the air. Sokolov screamed. His bare feet dangled a foot above the ground. Sergei tied the chain off to a fitting on the wall. Sokolov hung, his shoulders in agony. Blood dripped from his toes. This is a very effective technique, Petrov said. The Germans made good use of it in the Great Patriotic War. You see this handle attached to this wheel? No? Nothing to say? Allow me to explain how it works. Sergei turns the handle and spins the wheel, generating electricity. Petrov held up wires with large alligator clips on the end of them. You've seen these before. The kind you use to jump a car. The faster the handle turns, the more electricity is generated. Sergei showed the professor how it works. Sergei began turning the handle. The wheel made a metallic whirring sound as it spun. Petrov held up the two leads in front of Sokolov's face. Watch. He brought the leads close together. A brilliant blue spark arced between them. Stop for the moment, Sergeant. The whirring died away. Please don't do this. Only a taste, Petrov said. He fastened the clips to Sokolov's big toes. Sergeant, not too fast. Yes, sir. He began turning the handle. Sokolov screamed and jerked as electricity ran through his body. Chess, he screamed. We talked about chess. Faster, Sergeant. Sokolov screamed louder. His body shuddered and twisted. Petrov held up his hand. Sergei stopped turning the handle. He is very stubborn, don't you think, Sergeant? Very stubborn, sir. Let's try something a little more tender than his toes. Be careful not to crush them. Sergei removed the clips from Sokolov's toes and attached them to his testicles. Sokolov groaned. Last chance, Sokolov, you won't like it. Sokolov began sobbing. Tears ran down his face. You may begin, Sergeant. Sergei began turning the handle. As the charge built up, Sokolov convulsed and made a strange gurgling sound. <sighs> Suddenly his head dropped forward and he went limp. A thin stream of brown fluid ran down his leg. Shit, Petrov said, get him down quickly. Sergei undid the chain and lowered Sokolov to the floor. He bent over him. He's dead, sir. I think he had a heart attack. Stubborn old man. Perhaps he was telling the truth. They always talk. Perhaps, Petrov said. Perhaps not. Clean up this mess and dispose of the body. Yes, sir. Colonel Ivanov wasn't going to be happy when he told him Sokolov was dead. There was no use putting it off. He went upstairs to Ivanov's office. Well, Ivanov said, it's unfortunate, but the suspect is dead. It appears that he had a heart attack while being interrogated. At least tell me you got something from him, Ivanov said. Nothing. Nothing. Either he was telling the truth or stubborn. It happens sometimes. Then there is no evidence against Volkova. No, sir. But I'm convinced she is up to something. We need to know what it is. Why else pretend to separate and then meet at the cafe? They were plotting something, I'm sure of it. I agree, it is highly suspicious. But without something more, I'm not going to question her, Ivanov said. The surveillance in Stepanov's apartment may provide the evidence we need. I would love to find something on that arrogant bastard Stepanov. He thinks he's above our attention. May I make a suggestion, sir? Let me put people on her. If she's involved in a conspiracy, Sokolov may not have been the only person she was meeting. Ivanov considered the request. 
All right, but keep it simple. One man only. Yes, sir. Understood. We need to exercise caution. She's Stepanov's pet. If he gets wind of our interest, he'll piss all over us. Yes, sir. Give it a week after Stepanov gets back from Helsinki, then pull the recordings from his apartment. Then we'll see. Chapter 45 Since when do we let assets tell us who they'll work with? Davidson said angry. He was in Kramer's office. So were Jenna and Carlson. It's not without precedent, Kramer said, her voice mild. She's too important to let Thorne handle her. You know what he's like. He has no respect for the chain of command. What do you think, Lewis? Kramer said. She already knew what Carlson thought. He'd briefed her an hour earlier on Thorne's conversation with Colonel Volkova in Helsinki and told her Davidson had tried to go over his head with Thorne. He'd pointed out that Thorne had established rapport with Volkova. More important, he had established trust. You didn't throw that away because of an ego-driven pissing match. Carlson hadn't used those exact words with Kramer, but he'd made sure she got the idea. It was no secret Carlson wanted the deputy director's job. Kramer wanted Carlson to say what he thought in front of Davidson because she enjoyed playing her subordinates off against one another. It's obvious Opera trusts Thorne and doesn't trust us, Carlson said. I don't think it's obvious, Davidson said. Why would she trust him? Why decide she won't talk to anyone else? Maybe Thorne is making it up, trying to make himself seem important. Are you saying Thorne is lying? Jenna said. If the shoe fits. Jesus, Scott, you know better than that. I didn't know we were on a first-name basis, Olmstead. Keep it civil, Scott, Kramer said. Jenna, why do you think Opera would make that demand? First of all, if Mike says she'll rabbit if we give her a different handler, you can take it as gospel. He's good at what he does. If he couldn't convince her to change her mind, no one else is going to do it. I can understand why she wouldn't trust us, Kramer said. She's been told all her life that the CIA is her enemy. But why trust Thorne? Jenna couldn't tell them she'd talked to Thorne before he called Carlson. He must have connected with her. He's a real person, not some faceless enemy on the other side of the world. Women make these kind of decisions differently than men. She must have sensed something about him that made her decide to trust him. So Opera trusts Thorne because of women's intuition, Davidson said. Are you kidding? This is the CIA, not a feel-good therapy group. I'm not going to dignify that with an answer, Jenna said. Lewis, how do you see it working if Thorne is her handler? Kramer said. We can use his cover as a Canadian businessman and set him up in Helsinki. Rent an office, print up the materials he needs, build up a past history in Canada in case someone goes looking. We've done it all before for less potential. Why not post him to Moscow? Davidson said. If you're convinced he's the one who should run her, he should be where he's got quick access. If Thorne is posted to Moscow, they'll know who he is, Jenna said. The embassy is watched around the clock. He'd be followed every time he left the building. It would make it difficult or impossible to meet with opera. You should know that. Don't tell me what I should know, Olmstead. Why not when it's clear you don't know what you're talking about? Thorne is a loose cannon. We let him handle her, he'll screw it up. I can handle her from here. Carlson kept his face expressionless, but inside he was smiling. What if she wants a face-to-face -face meeting? Jenna said. Are you planning to go to Moscow? Don't be ridiculous, Davidson said. I've heard enough, Kramer said. Scott, Thorne already has the kind of rapport with Opera we need to get the best out of her. I'm not going to rock the boat. Jenna, you set up Thorne's legend in Canada. We're going into the sauna import business. Who knows? We might even make some money out of it. As they left Kramer's office, Davidson turned to Lewis. I'm not going to forget this. We both know Thorne is the right choice for this. She trusts him. She wouldn't give you the time of day. You want to hang your career on Thorne, you go right ahead. I'm going to enjoy watching when you crash and burn. You'll regret what you said in there, both of you. They had reached Davidson's office. He went in. The door closed softly behind him. Doors on the seventh floor were designed to close that way. You get the feeling he would have slammed it if he could? Jenna said. Carlson laughed. Chapter 46 Anya was glad to be back in Moscow, back at her job. When she was in her office, she could pretend she was in control of her life. It had been hard enough to keep up the pretense when she'd been forced into Stepanov's bed. Now that she'd taken the enormous step of betrayal, it was nearly impossible. Tarasov and his reactionary generals were chasing a dangerous illusion, a return to the days when the world trembled before Russian power. 
She was doing the right thing. She was sure of it. Then why did she feel so guilty? It didn't take a psychologist to figure it out. What she was doing was treason. The fact that it was treason in a good cause didn't change the reality. In her wildest thoughts, Anya had never dreamed she would betray her country, never dreamed she would meet an American spy. It didn't help that this particular American spy was understanding, good-looking, sympathetic. She kept thinking about the strange current she'd felt when she touched him. It wasn't like the kind of shock you got from static electricity. It was something more powerful. She couldn't get his face out of her mind. There was something in his eyes that had touched her. Something real. She pictured him wrapping his arms around her, holding her. Sudden heat flooded her groin. Damn it, how could she be attracted to him? Why couldn't he have been patronizing and dismissive, like most of the Russian men she knew? Then it would have been easy to back out of what she'd started. But she didn't want to break the connection with him. It was too late to back out. She was committed. She looked through her office window at the orderly chaos of her command. There was always movement on the floor, people in their cubicles, focused on their monitors, talking on the phone, moving about. They were like family to her. She felt responsible for them. She worried about them. It made her angry that the generals in the Kremlin would put them at risk because they wanted more power. She had never been a religious person, but it was like something out of the Book of Revelation. War, the Red Horseman. She thought of the day Grigori told her he'd been picked for special forces. He'd handed her a cloth patch that showed an eagle flying past mountains in the background. The number, 22 inches, was sewn in red at the bottom. What's this? My new unit patch, the 22nd Special Purpose Brigade. She remembered the look on his face, the pride. Think about it, Anya. Your little brother, Spetsnaz. The best of the best. It's a long way from when you used to change my diaper and wipe my butt. When do you start? I report the day after tomorrow. The only reason I got a pass was because my sergeant knows how to get around the bureaucracy. Anya had laughed. I could use someone like him. Come on, you're a colonel. You can do whatever you want. Not quite. Only generals get to do whatever they want. She looked at him, at the man he'd become. I'm proud of you, Grigori. Please promise me you'll be careful. Don't worry, we're not at war. Yes, but things happen. You're thinking of Mikhail. So I suppose I was. It will be okay, sis. But it hadn't been okay. A sudden wave of grief rolled over her. She took a deep breath. Another brought her emotions under control. Think of something else. Helsinki. The peace conference. A fiasco. It had ended after three days with the Russian delegation walking out. The conference had accomplished nothing. Then again, no one had expected it to. The war was not going well. The Kurds had retreated to fortified positions in the northeast corner of the country. They were well armed with American weapons, and every meter of worthless desert gained was at the cost of Russian blood. It was like the first Chechen war all over again. Then it had taken many months and many casualties to dislodge rebel forces from their strongholds, in spite of overwhelming Russian military superiority. The offensive was stalled, bogged down by the fierce opposition. Someone had to be blamed. General Chernov had been recalled and was on his way back to Moscow. The truth was being kept from the public, but sooner or later it would come out. The Americans would want to know about the change in command, the mounting cost in blood and treasure. She decided to ask Professor Sokolov to get another message through to the embassy. The day after tomorrow was Sunday. He'd be at the chess tables in the park. She'd look for him there. Chapter 47 The weather was good, the sun shining, and Presnensky Park was crowded. People strolled about or sat on the grass. Anya walked along the paths until she came to the chess tables. She didn't see Professor Sokolov at any of them. She sat on a bench and waited for him to show up. It felt normal to sit on a park bench on a warm day, listening to the sounds of people laughing and having a good time. There hadn't been a lot of normal in her life lately. She closed her eyes and turned her face to the sun, soaking in the light and warmth, letting her mind drift. Her head dropped forward and she snapped alert. She looked at her watch. She'd been zoning out for almost twenty minutes. She looked around at the chess tables. Sokolov still had not appeared. It was unusual for him. He never missed Sunday chess in the park if the weather permitted. For her old professor it was a ritual that might as well have been graven in stone. She hoped he wasn't ill. She waited another half an hour. 
then decided to go to the Black Queen Cafe and see if he was there. It was the only other place she could think of where she might find him. She realized she didn't know where he lived. It hadn't occurred to her to ask when she'd last seen him. Her mind had been too preoccupied with her need to get a message to the American Embassy. He wasn't in the cafe. She went to the counter and ordered a coffee. A heavyset man with a thick mustache was working the espresso machine, the same man she'd seen the last time she'd been there. He was probably the owner. Excuse me, she said. Do you know Professor Sokolov? He wiped his hands on a towel. He looked at her, then back at the machine. Why do you want to know? He's a friend. Usually he plays chess in the park on a Sunday, but he's not there. I remembered that he likes to come here. The man placed her coffee on the counter in front of her. You were here with him not long ago. That's right. A friend, you say? Yes. There was something odd in the way the man was looking at her. He looked around the room. No one was near enough to overhear their conversation. You will not find him here, the man said. He began wiping the counter with the towel. Do you know where he is? Anya asked. He's been arrested. Anya felt a sudden rush of adrenaline that left her weak in the knees. Her heart began pounding. What? No, that can't be. Why? The man shrugged. Who knows? He was here having a game. Two men came in. I saw them show him ID. Then they took him away. He hasn't been back since. What kind of ID? JRU. You should leave now. I don't want any trouble. You are sure it was GRU? I was in the army. I know what their IDs look like. Did they say anything? One of them said the major wanted to talk with him. She looked at her coffee, untouched. Please go now. I don't want any trouble. Don't come back. The man turned his back to her and began cleaning the gleaming espresso machine with his towel. She put money on the counter to pay for the coffee and left the cafe. She walked back toward the park. Perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps Sokolov would be sitting at one of the chess tables. But when she got there, he wasn't in sight. She sat down on the same bench as before. What had the cafe owner said? When Sokolov was arrested, he'd overheard them say the major wanted to talk to him. What major? Petrov. The thought sent another rush of adrenaline whispering through her veins. Her intuition told her she was right. It has to be him, that cold bastard. He's GRU. He doesn't like me. He probably knows about Stepanov and me. He could have followed me, hoping for something to tell his bosses. If he did, he saw me meet Vlas. She didn't like what she was thinking. If Sokolov had been arrested, it might have something to do with her. It might not. But Anya didn't believe in coincidences. She was sure he hadn't told them about the message to the embassy, or she would have been picked up by now. She would not be sitting here in the sun on a pleasant Sunday afternoon. If Petrov was behind Sokolov's arrest, everything was now much more complicated. She looked around the park, filled with people. Was she being followed? Anyone could be watching her. Anyone at all. She'd never see them. How could she hope to contact the Americans if she was being watched? Michael had said to always assume she was being watched. She'd forgotten that. Maybe she'd made a mistake by going to the cafe. But if she hadn't gone, she wouldn't know Vlas had been arrested. Anya had few friends, but she considered Sokolov one of them. He was a kind, brilliant man. She had to do something. There was no point in waiting in the park any longer. She got up from the bench and began walking. She paused at a fountain and glanced behind her as she drank. A man quickly turned his head to look in the other direction. He'd been lingering near the chess tables when she'd been waiting on the bench. Fear bloomed in her chest, then anger. She wanted to walk up to the man and confront him, but she smothered the impulse. That would only make them more suspicious of her. Why would she think she was being followed if she were innocent of any wrongdoing? She entered the metro and caught another glimpse of the man behind her. So, not simple paranoia. Without Sokolov, the link to the embassy was broken. She'd have to call the number Michael had given her. She'd use one of the cheap phones she'd purchased in Finland. She waited for the train to arrive, a plan beginning to form in her mind. Chapter 48 Thorne rented an office in Helsinki on the ground floor of a quiet street near the center of town. It came furnished in Finnish modern. The furniture was too sterile for his taste. The desk was made of light-colored wood, the chairs similar with cushions covered in a dark blue fabric. An abstract modern painting with bright colors hung on one wall. The desk chair was a creation of chrome and faux leather. It looked like it belonged on a spaceship. He was surprised to find out it was comfortable. His phone vibrated in his pocket. 
Thorn. Mike, it's Jenna. Opera called in. There's a problem. That didn't take long. The contact she used to get her message to us was arrested. That would be bad enough, but there's more. Why do I have a feeling I'm not going to like what you're going to say? We have an asset in GRU. He's reported that a dissident named Vla Sokolov was picked up and interrogated by a Colonel Ivanov. Sokolov was her contact. He had a heart attack while they were interrogating him. He's dead. As yesterday's news. That means she's compromised. She doesn't think so. She said she'd have been arrested if she was. She says she's being followed. There's a major named Petrov who is General Stepanov's aide. He's GRU. She thinks he's responsible for the arrest. She thinks he's responsible? What if he isn't? She's almost certain Petrov is behind it. Her contact was picked up by GRU thugs. She wants us to find out what happened to him. That shouldn't be too difficult. They're probably holding him at GRU headquarters. There's more. There always is. She wants us to get Petrov off her back. Thorn leaned back in the chair. That might not be easy. She have any ideas about how to do that? She wants us to compromise him. Petrov has access to General Stepanov's papers. She suggested we make it look like he's selling secrets, something like that. She's learning fast, Thorne said. I like the way she thinks, but compromising a GRU officer is risky. Why is this Major Petrov harassing her? She didn't say. As it is, the entire conversation was only about 30 seconds long. She wants a meet. She'll be in the park on Sunday, as you agreed. If she's being followed, someone has to pull them off. I'll need help. We'll think of something. Anything else? We want her to have a microburst transmitter, Jenna said. Something she can use to send information. It's too risky to have her meet with you every time she has something to pass along. You'll have it tomorrow. That's not a good idea. They find it, it's all over. It looks like an ordinary compact, the kind of thing she'd carry in her purse. You'll have to convince her to take it. I'll tell her. I don't think she'll agree. Davidson is still pissed about losing control of Opera. He's trying to make a case to take over. Now there's an indication she's under suspicion. On what grounds? That you made a mistake when you met her and tipped off the opposition. He's claiming that's why she's on their radar. Davidson is an ass. Opera won't talk to anyone else. If she's being followed, it's not because of anything I did. I know that. So does Lewis. Sure, but what about Kramer? It keeps her amused to watch Davidson try to undercut you. He never quits, does he? Makes me wonder what it would be like to have a normal job. Probably a lot like this, Jenna said. There are always people like him around. It doesn't much matter what kind of work you do. Do I detect a note of cynicism? Jenna laughed. More like a symphony, she said. Psst. If you're enjoying this story and want to support more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 49 The men of Russia's high command sat at a long polished table deep beneath the National Control Defense Center in Moscow. No surveillance network, no matter how sophisticated, could penetrate here. No one who wasn't in the room could hear what was being discussed. Between them, these men controlled enough weaponry to destroy all life on Earth several times over. President Tarasov was seated at the head of the table. Everyone in the room knew the pinched expression on his face meant he was angry. The generals and admirals waited for him to speak. General Kerensky, why are we still fighting in Syria? Why haven't we used our bombers against these people? It was thought the fighter-bomber squadrons would prove sufficient, Kerensky said. But the Kurds constructed underground tunnels and bunkers that protect them from our raids. This has gone on long enough. Drop the father on them. A ripple of uneasy movement went around the table. The father was the largest conventional weapon in Russia's arsenal, a thermobaric monster nicknamed the father of all bombs, Foab. The destructive effect of one was similar to a tactical nuclear weapon. The father mixed powdered aluminum with high explosive and ethylene oxide, a combustible gas. When the bomb detonated, it ignited the oxygen in the air. The result was a gigantic fireball that vaporized everything in the area. The explosion left a vacuum that ruptured the lungs of anyone unfortunate enough to survive the initial detonation. It didn't matter if you were in a bunker under the surface. You died anyway. It was a cruel, effective weapon of mass destruction. Kerensky looked uncomfortable. Sir, at the moment the world sees our offensive in Syria as little more than a continuation of the difficulties in Syria that began years ago. If we drop the father, we'll be accused of war crimes. World opinion will turn against us. Tarasov slammed his hand down on the table. I don't give a whore's ass for world opinion. 
World opinion has belittled us for decades. World opinion thinks we are irrelevant. We are tolerated because of our nuclear arsenal. Without our missiles, we would have been overrun by our enemies years ago. What world opinion needs is a demonstration of our power and our determination to pursue our own destiny without the interference of others. Do you understand, General? Yes, Mr. President, Kerensky said. You will order the mission. Yes, sir. Does anyone else have an objection? No one did. Chapter 50 At a little over 15,000 pounds, the father of all bombs was a heavy load. A suitable match for the enormous bomber assigned to carry it to Syria. The TU-95 MSM was the latest version of the venerable TU-95 long-range bomber. Like the American B-52, it had been in continuous service since the 1950s. Unlike its American counterpart, it was propeller-driven. Four turboprop Kuznetsov engines with counter-rotating propellers powered the huge plane through the air, half a football field long, lifted by distinctive swept-back wings. It was an impressive machine. No one seeing the plane could doubt its purpose of sowing death and destruction. Few aircraft had the deadly look of the Russian Tu-95. Two hours after taking off from Ukraine Air Base, the plane was over target. The bomb bay doors opened. The father of all bombs dropped away toward the doomed Kurds below. Captain Alexei Yegorov opened the throttles and banked hard to starboard. The roar of the turboprops was deafening inside the cabin. In the co-pilot's seat next to him, Lieutenant Yevgeny Kozlov watched the Syrian desert pass below. I wouldn't want to be down there about now, he said into his headset. Kurdish barbecue, Alexei said. A brilliant orange glare filled the sky behind them. An instant later, the plane bucked and shuddered as the shockwave hit. Alexei set course back to Ukraine Air Base in eastern Russia. About time we did something besides training runs and harassing the Americans, he said. Pissing off Americans is fun. It would not be so much fun if it was for real, Yevgeny. You've seen how quickly their fighters respond. The American pilots know what they're doing. We make big target. Our countermeasures would take care of them. You are optimist, Yevgeny. But today we don't worry about Americans. We will get a medal for this. Irina will be proud of me. Irina is leading you around by your dick. You should get that woman out of your head. I enjoy being led around. She's unbelievable in bed. Suddenly, the cockpit filled with the harsh sound of the missile alarm. Shit, where did that come from? Release countermeasures. Yevgeny flipped a switch on the console. Clouds of metal chaff and powered decoys dropped out behind them. They've got a lock, Yevgeny said. The roar of the straining engines almost drowned out the screaming alarm as Alexei put the plane into a steep bank. Still locked on, Yevgeny said. Alexei, the missile struck behind the left wing. The wing folded up and ripped away. The bomber plummeted toward the earth in a death spiral that ended in a burst of orange flame and roiling black smoke. The explosion when it hit was a small thing, compared to the devastation it had left behind. The world was one step closer to war. Chapter 51 President Campbell leaned back in his chair and steepled his fingers. When he'd entered politics, he'd been filled with youthful energy and well-intentioned illusions about creating meaningful change. Forty years later, the illusions were gone. In their place was the uncomfortable knowledge that his decisions had consequences he could not predict, with far-reaching effects on the lives of millions of people. It was not a part of the job he enjoyed. Sometimes he wished he'd chosen a different occupation. Today was one of those times. Sitting in the Oval Office were the people he relied on for advice, by choice or necessity. Seated on one of the couches flanking a rug with the presidential seal in the center of the room were General Kroger and DCI Kramer. National Security Advisor Covington and Harold Kaplan sat on the other. General, what the hell happened? What was that weapon? Was it a nuke? No, sir. It was a thermobaric bomb. It's conventional. It produces an effect similar to a small nuclear weapon but without the radiation. It decimated the Kurdish command structure and destroyed significant stockpiles of their weapons. An unknown number of Kurdish fighters are dead or missing. Resistance in the region is finished. The Russians have started mopping up. Were any of our people there? Twenty-four of our advisors were killed. I'm being crucified in the press, Campbell said. The media is having a field day. Half of them want me to resign. The other half wants me to teach Moscow a lesson, whatever that means. This morning I received a call from President Tarasov. He was upset with me for giving the Kurds the missiles they used to shoot down his bomber. 
That's too damn bad, Kroger said. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. The use of that bomb is a war crime. I'd be careful about pointing fingers, General, Kaplan said. We used a thermobaric bomb in Afghanistan some years ago. Don't give me that sanctimonious bullshit, Kaplan. It's not the same thing at all. The Taliban were cutting off the heads of our soldiers with a dull knife. I'm not interested in revisiting the past, Harold, Campbell said. I want ideas on how to respond to this atrocity. Who wants to start? We have to make it clear to Tarasov that he's crossed the line in a big way, Covington said. He cannot be allowed to get away with this. I agree, Kramer said. You tried diplomacy, sir. It didn't work. It's time for something stronger. The only thing a thug like Tarasov understands is determination to stand up to him. Determination backed up by sufficient force, Kroger said. We've had this conversation before, Kaplan said. If we provoke Tarasov, it could lead to a larger conflict. Why don't you grow a set of balls, Kaplan? Kroger said. Every time Tarasov says boo, you start looking over your shoulder for a place to hide. I've got news for you. You can't hide from someone like him. Stop thinking about the Poles and start thinking about your country. I resent that, Kaplan said. How dare you accuse me of not caring about my country? It's people like you that always get us in trouble. People like me? You mean military people? You don't like us much, do you, Kaplan? Frankly, General, no, I don't. If it weren't for people like me and the men and women who serve in our military, you would not have the freedom to say something like that. Enough, Campbell said. Personal animosities will not resolve this problem. He looked at his national security advisor. What do you think, Walt? Do you think a show of force will help Tarasov see reason? It's going to take more than a show, Mr. President. Whatever we do, it has to have teeth in it. Otherwise, Moscow will ignore us. DCI Kramer. I agree with Walter and General Kroger. A show of force is needed. As Walter said, something with teeth. Harold? I've already said what I think. I want to go on record that I believe a military response would be a mistake. However, I will support whatever you decide, Mr. President. You'd better, Kramer thought. General Kroger, Campbell said. Tarasov needs to understand we are not going to let this go. He can't use weapons of mass destruction with impunity. I will not be intimidated. I've considered your suggestion regarding blockading the Dardanelles. You've discussed this at length with the other chiefs, Admiral Stone. Yes, sir, at length. Their opinion. In our judgment, a blockade is the most effective way to send a message to the Russians without putting our troops in harm's way. What do you think they'll do if we institute a blockade, General? They'll bluster, sir. They will probably go to the UN and accuse us of warmongering. But they're not going to do anything stupid. They might try to run the blockade with one of their warships. We've already discussed that possibility, sir. Campbell sighed. He had to do something. There weren't any risk-free options. He hated war and desired peace. But history had proved that bad things happened when leaders failed to back up the desire for peace with a sword. The man who sat in the Oval Office was the public face of the United States. If he allowed Tarasov to get away with dropping that damn bomb, it would convince him he could do whatever he wanted without fear of American retaliation. The Oval Office brought with it enormous responsibility, with many competing priorities. The biggest priority of all was the security of the United States. Tarasov had made it clear he was a threat to that security. Syria was a long way from America's borders, but what was happening there showed that the Russian bear was waking after a long slumber. Today, it was Syria. Tomorrow, it would be somewhere else. Tarasov had to be stopped. Campbell made his decision. Very well. Issue the orders to institute the blockade. I will talk with General Sevim. Those are Turkish waters. We'll need his cooperation. It shouldn't be too difficult to get it, sir. He needs us. How long will it take to move the fleet into position? Not long, sir. They are currently holding exercises west of Gibraltar. I want tight security on this, General. Once word gets out, Congress will be making the usual noises about who has the authority to do what. The longer I can put that off, the better. I'll deal with the fallout when it becomes necessary. Kroger looked at the president with new respect. I wasn't certain he had it in him. About time we stood up to Moscow. The fleet is a common sight in the Mediterranean. Their movements won't cause undue concern until it becomes evident we're setting up a blockade. He paused. Mr. President? Yes, General. I want to say, sir, that I'm glad it's you sitting in that chair. Campbell felt a flush of pleasure at Kroger's words. I'll be damned I never expected that from him. Thank you, General. 
Let's hope you can still say that a few months from now. Chapter 52 Tarasov proclaimed a national holiday to celebrate the victory of Russian forces in Syria. The pages of his vestia were filled with stories about the bravery and determination of Russian soldiers. The loss of the bomber and its crew was mourned as part of the cost to secure peace in the region. The paper said it had been shot down during a reconnaissance flight by an American missile. Anya knew the real story. Those poor men. What a horrible way to die. She hadn't known the bomb was going to be dropped or she would have tried to get word to Michael. She wished there was a way to sit down and talk with him. She wanted to. Sudden movement on the floor outside her office interrupted her thoughts. Anya looked out through her window at the workspace. People were leaving their cubicles, gathering in small groups, talking. Something's happened. What now? She was about to get up and find out what it was when she saw Major Kirov hurrying across the floor. She waited for his knock on the door. Come in, Major. Kirov saluted. Colonel, spit it out, Pavel. What's happened? I tried calling, but something seems to be wrong with your phone. Anya realized the phone had not rung for a while. She'd been too busy to notice. Kirov continued. The Americans have established a naval blockade in the Mediterranean, across the Dardanelles. What? That's impossible. Why would they do that? I don't know why, Colonel, but I can assure you they have done it. They are preventing our ships from going through the passage in either direction. They are stopping our ships, our navy. Only civilian vessels are permitted to pass, and only those coming from or headed to Turkish ports. Anya knew the men in charge of Russia's military might. She knew how they thought. They would never let the United States dictate to them. The American president was making a serious mistake. It would mean war. As if reading her mind, Major Kirov said, The Americans are making a mistake. Yes, they are, Anya said. Major, give everyone a few more minutes, then get them back to work. Tell Senior Sergeant Popov to have someone fix the phone. Colonel, Kirov saluted and left the room. She watched him move across the floor, talking with people as he went. Soon everyone was back at work. A blockade. The Kremlin would respond. What would they do? What could they do without starting a war? War would mean the end of everything. What was the matter with these people? Unless the Americans withdrew their ships things would escalate. Then it wouldn't be long until the missiles began to fly. Stepanov would know what was being planned. She was having dinner with him tonight at Turandot, the most expensive restaurant in Moscow. He wanted to show her off, and Turandot was the place to do it. She'd never eaten there and was looking forward to it, even if it was with Stepanov. Later, they would go to his apartment. If she could get him to tell her what Tarasov was going to do about the blockade, she could pass it along to Michael. She was supposed to meet him in the park on Sunday. She wanted to find out something useful before then. Something to tell him. She thought about his eyes. He had beautiful eyes. How he'd looked at her when they were standing in front of the painting in the cathedral. No one had ever looked at her like that. She'd felt it like a gentle touch. A tangible sensation that rippled through her. He'd felt something too, she knew it. She'd seen him react. Ever since Helsinki, he'd intruded on her thoughts. She'd be sitting at her desk doing some mundane task, when she'd realize she'd been thinking about him, daydreaming, imagining being with him, imagining what it would be like to go somewhere with him, someplace where they could be alone, imagining what it would be like to make love with him. But he was American, the enemy. Even if he was a temporary ally, it was impossible she couldn't allow herself to love him. This couldn't be happening to her. Michael knew about Stepanov. Would he want her knowing that? Was he the kind of man who would think of her as spoiled goods? Part of her mind told her she was a fool for thinking he could love her. She wished that part of her mind would shut up. Anya looked out her office window and forced herself to focus. What was she going to tell Michael when she met him? She wished she knew more about Tarasov. Maybe she could get Stepanov to talk about him. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. At that moment... Tarasov was in the secure room under the National Control Defense Center. The ranking officers of the armed services were arrayed around the long table, all of the men who controlled the military forces of the Federation. General Kerensky sat to Tarasov's right, Defense Minister Fedorov and General Stepanov to his left. Tarasov rapped sharply on the table to get their attention. Let's begin, he said. We must consider our response to the American provocation. Admiral Maxim Mikhailov, commander of the Northern Fleet, put up his hand. 
Mr. President, it is much more than a provocation. This blockade is an act of war. So was shooting down our aircraft. There were murmurs of agreement around the table. Mikhailov continued. One of our frigates attempted to pass through their blockade. They told her captain that if he tried to force his way through, he would be fired upon. He requested instructions and was ordered to proceed and test their resolve. They fired a warning shot that narrowly missed his vessel. He was ordered to withdraw and wait for further instructions. Mr. President, this is completely unacceptable. I'm sure we all agree with you, Admiral, Tarasov said. The question before us today is what are we going to do about it? What are they trying to achieve by this madness, Mr. President? Stepanov said. Have you talked with their president? I have. This is about our operation in Syria. They want us to retreat back across the Euphrates and abandon our gains. They also want a public apology for the deaths of their soldiers. The room erupted with shouts. Never. Fuck the Americans. They are the ones who must apologize. Tarasov let it continue for a moment, then held up his hand. The room went silent. We must discuss options. General Fedorov, what is your opinion? It seems to me our options are limited, Fedorov said. Number one, we can comply with their demands, but that is not a viable choice. Nods of agreement. Number two, we can negotiate with them. There is nothing to negotiate. The voice belonged to General Pyotr Andropov, commander of the Russian Aerospace Forces. Andropov was in charge of Russia's nuclear missiles and airborne forces. Negotiation is a sign of weakness, he said. If we negotiate, we admit we were wrong. I will not support it. Andropov was one of President Tarasov's most influential backers. His opinion carried a lot of weight. How many think we should negotiate? Tarasov asked. Not a single hand was raised. Comrades, we are united. We will not negotiate. Admiral Mikhailov raised his hand again. Admiral, this is an issue of respect, he said. The Americans have never given us the respect we deserve, not even for our sacrifices during the Great Patriotic War. I do not believe their only purpose in setting up this blockade is to pressure us about Syria. They wish to humiliate us before the world, weaken us, interfere in our economy. They are keeping critical goods from reaching us. They are preventing our rightful use of an international waterway. I say again, this blockade is an act of war. We must treat it as such. The men sitting at the table stomped their feet on the floor in approval. Tarasov waited until the noise had died down. I agree with your sentiments, Admiral. However, war is our last resort. We must try to avoid it if we can. At the same time, it would be prudent to prepare for the possibility. General Fedorov, raise our defense posture to the next level of readiness. That will let the Americans know they can expect consequences if they continue to dictate to us. Yes, Mr. President, I will enlist the support of our allies. We'll take this to the Security Council at the UN. I will have our ambassador call an emergency session. The world must see that we cannot be bullied. We have many friends at the UN. They will support us if we make a diplomatic effort. Admiral Ivanov has stated the situation perfectly. Let us hope the Americans come to their senses before things get out of control. In the meantime, make preparations in case they do not. I want to see options by this time tomorrow. He looked around the table. Are there any other comments before we adjourn? There were none. Chapter 53 Anya was tired after a stressful day at work. When she opened the door to the apartment, she smelled something burning. Yulia was asleep in one of the chairs in the living room, her mouth open, snoring. A thin wisp of smoke drifted from the kitchen. Anya hurried into the room and saw a pot smoking on the stove. She turned off the burner and grabbed a towel, picked up the pot and put it under water. A cloud of steam hissed into the air. The bottom of the pot was charred black. Yulia called from the next room. Anya, is that you? Anya went back into the living room. Mother, you left the burner on under some soup. The pot is ruined. I did. I don't remember doing that. You have to be more careful. It could have started a fire. I'm hungry, Yulia said. I'll fix you something, then I have to go out. Where are you going? General Stepanov has invited me to dinner. Anya, that's wonderful. He can do so much for your career. I don't remember. Is he married? Yes, mother, he is. His wife is an invalid. He's only interested in me as a dinner companion. That's too bad, Yulia said. It would be nice if he were single. I know what you're thinking, mother. He's not going to ask me to marry him, so get the idea out of your head. You never know, though. His wife might die. Anya sighed in frustration. I'm going to make your dinner. 
then I have to change. While Yulia was eating, Anya dressed. She chose the same blue dress she'd worn to Ivan Korosov's party. It was the only decent outfit she owned for elegant occasions, and dinner at Turandog qualified as one of those. Underneath the dress, she wore black lace underwear. She dabbed a drop of perfume behind her earlobes. A thin gold necklace and gold earrings completed her outfit. At eight sharp, Stepanov's driver knocked on the door. Good evening, Genity. Good evening, Colonel. Stepanov was reading a document when she got in the car. He placed it in his briefcase, then set the case down on the floor. Anya, you are looking beautiful tonight. Thank you, Yuri. You will enjoy the food at this restaurant, he said. Have you eaten there before? No, I have never been able to afford it. Then you are in for a treat. The limousine pulled away from the curb. This thing with the Americans, Anya said. Why are they doing this? Don't they know we must respond? The Americans suffer from illusions of superiority, Stepanov said. They don't like the fact that we have won in Syria. They think they can make us go back to the way things were before Operation Eagle was launched. That's foolish, Anya said. Yes. What are we going to do about it? Stepanov gave her an appraising look. You don't need to know that, Colonel. All you need to know is that something will be done. There was rebuke in his tone. I was just curious, she said. There's no harm in telling you we are going to the UN about this blockade. It's possible that international pressure will cause the American president to reconsider his actions. I hope so. Stepanov reached into the compartment next to his seat and took out a bottle of vodka and two glasses. He poured and handed Anya a glass. I know you must feel somewhat constrained by the nature of our relationship. That's one way of putting it. I want you to know I truly value your companionship. I enjoy being with you and admire you. I hope that in time you will come to feel the same way about me. He gestured with his glass. To us. She wanted to spit at him. Be patient. She touched her glass to his and they drank. She wished she was having a drink with Michael. The restaurant was on Tverskoy Boulevard, not far from the Kremlin. Genity guided the limousine into a parking area filled with high-end vehicles. Parked with the Mercedes limos and BMWs were several armored Hummers and a sleek red Ferrari. The Hummers were popular among the oligarchs. Being a billionaire in Russia had many advantages. Being a target for every bold and enterprising thief was not one of them. Large men with guns stood smoking in groups near the cars. Stepanov and Anya were escorted into a recreation of a 16th century Florentine courtyard. Sculpted nude statues stood in niches on the left of the entrance. On each end of the courtyard, the windows of a high-end jewelry store gleamed with displays of gold and diamonds. It was the kind of store where a pair of simple gold earrings cost thousands of dollars. The maitre d' greeted Stepanov by name as they stepped into the restaurant. The main dining hall made the courtyard look shabby. Anya felt like she'd been transported to a palace from the time of the Tsars. An enormous chandelier of crystal and amethyst hung from a high domed ceiling painted with clouds and lavished with raised designs of gold. Musicians wearing powdered wigs and dressed in 18th century costumes played chamber music on a rotating stage in one corner of the room. Waiters dressed in brocaded waistcoats with gold buttons glided soundlessly about the floor. There were golden statues and Renaissance style paintings everywhere she looked, always something to marvel at and catch the eye. It was impossible to take in all the details. Impressive, no, Stepanov said. It's overwhelming. The food is good. The wine list is superb. This way to your table, General, their escort said. He guided them through the crowded restaurant to a table in the back, underneath a gilded balcony that circled the room. People watched and whispered as they crossed the room. Their escort held a brocaded chair out for Anya and seated her. Bring the wine list, Stepanov said. At once, General. He scurried away. The food is somewhat eclectic, Stepanov said. A kind of fusion between Asian, French, and traditional. I'm not sure what you would call it. Have whatever you like. I always have trouble in a good restaurant choosing between dishes. Perhaps you would allow me to choose for you. Please do, Yuri. Stepanov nodded as if he'd expected nothing else. As he had said, the food was good. The wine was excellent. By the time they left the restaurant, Anya was pleasantly high. Stepanov had drunk at least one full bottle and was in an expansive mood. Gennady drove them back to Ostojenka Street. Anya set her mind for what was to come. Once they were inside the apartment, Stepanov went to the liquor cabinet. A nightcap, he said. In one of the light fixtures overhead, a camera recorded everything Stepanov and Anya said and did. 
It was one of several devices strategically placed around the apartment. When they moved to the bedroom, the feed automatically recorded their movements. Stepanov liked to leave the lights on when they were having sex, but it wouldn't have mattered. The cameras had night vision capability. An hour later, Stepanov's snores filled the room. Anya slipped out of bed, her mind already on tomorrow's meeting with Michael. She walked naked to the shower. The cameras watched every move. Anya emerged from the shower and dressed. She looked over at Stepanov. He was deep in sleep, unconscious to the world. She walked down the hall to his study and entered the room. Unlike the last time, his briefcase was missing. Stepanov had left it locked in a compartment inside his car when they'd gone into the restaurant. There was nothing on the desk. She opened a drawer. There was nothing important inside. A second drawer failed to produce anything of interest. She left the apartment and descended to the street, hoping for a passing taxi. Chapter 54 Even at nine in the morning, there were plenty of people in Ismailovsky Park. At one time, it had been a private estate and hunting preserve belonging to the Tsars. Now it was one of the largest parks in Moscow, with trails that meandered through hundreds of acres of forest. Part of the park was given over to amusement rides. Anya bought an ice cream cone from a stand near the big Ferris wheel. She sat on a bench nearby eating her ice cream, watching a group of children playing nearby, thinking about how life had brought her to this point. Her career had always been her priority, and now it was too late for children. None of her relationships had been the kind that turned into marriage and family. She didn't regret the choices she'd made, but sometimes she wished there was someone she could turn to in the middle of the night when she needed comfort. Someone she could share her life with. Someone like Michael. But he was an American spy. If it wasn't so impossible, it would almost be funny. The problem was that she wasn't laughing. Anya finished the ice cream, took out a book and began reading. If anyone was watching, it looked like a normal thing to do. Her mind filled with random thoughts. Would Michael come? Was she being followed? Would she be arrested? After a long half hour turning pages, she couldn't remember anything she'd read. She felt his presence before she saw him. Michael walked by. She waited until he was some distance away, then got up and followed him. He led her past a large pond visible through the trees, then turned off the paved path onto a trail that led into the forest. The trees were exploding with green after the harsh winter. Sounds faded as they went farther into the forest. Streamers of light filtered down through the branches. They had only the sounds of the birds for company. Her steps felt soft on the dirt path. Usually when she walked in the forest, it calmed her. Not today. Today her heart was pounding. She couldn't help looking over her shoulder to see if anyone was behind. Michael left the path and disappeared into the trees. She looked for him. Over here, Thorne said, his voice quiet. I might have been followed, she said as she came up to him. Don't worry, you weren't. We made sure of that. Are you all right? Now that you're here, I'm fine. She stepped close to him. He could smell her scent, a subtle musk that set his heart beating. The world disappeared. All he could see was her face. You have beautiful eyes, he said. So do you. I haven't been able to stop thinking about you. I thought today would never get here. He touched her face. She leaned close. The first kiss was gentle, soft. Michael, she said. This is crazy. I know. I don't care. I don't either. The second kiss was deeper, longer. They broke away and Anya stepped back, flushed. I wish we were somewhere else, somewhere private, she said. So do I, but we're not. We can't stay here long. I know. He forced himself to concentrate. Why did you want to meet? She took a breath and made herself think of what she wanted to tell him. Two days ago, the high command met with Tarasov to discuss the blockade. I know this because General Stepanov had to leave word where he would be. I know these people. They will never accept or agree to American demands. In my work, I see everything. All of our serviceable submarines are now at sea. That is very unusual. I think war is coming. Can you find out what they are doing? I will try, but I cannot guarantee it. I asked Stepanov, but he doesn't like it when I ask him for details. Be careful, Anya. You mustn't make him suspicious. Don't worry. I told him I was just curious. Anya shifted gears. What have you done about Petrov? We're working on it. I want to know where Professor Sokolov is being held. Can you help him? Anya. She looked at him and read what he was going to say. He's dead, isn't he, those bastards? I'm sorry. For what it's worth, they probably didn't mean to kill him. 
He had a heart attack while he was being interrogated. Who was it? GRU, a colonel named Ivanov. I know who he is. Petrov works for him. I am sure he suspects me of something. We're working on it, Thorne said again. What good am I doing, Michael? If I hadn't asked Vlas to help me, he'd still be alive. All I've accomplished is to get him killed. It's not your fault, Anya. She snapped at him. No. What do you know about it? Do you have any idea what it's like to know someone is always watching, waiting for you to make a mistake? Actually, I do, Thorne said. It's the kind of world we live in now. There are always people who want to control everything, who care about nothing except power. We have them in America like you do here, only it's usually not as obvious. It is not the same. Anya, what you're doing is important. You said you think war is coming. If you're right, you're the best chance to prevent it from happening. If we know what they're doing, we can try to stop them before it starts. She took a deep breath, calming herself. Perhaps. No perhaps about it. You're next to Stepanov. He's a key player. He is a pig. Yes, but a very important pig. Maybe we can turn him into bacon. She smiled. You make a joke. I'm only half joking. I need to go back, Anya said. I don't like to leave my mother alone for too long. My bosses want me to give you a transmitter. No, I won't take it. I told them you would say that. You can use the number I gave you before to reach us. I do not want to call and talk to someone I don't know. Okay, I'll give you my number. It's secure. If I don't answer, call again in a little while. If it's an emergency and I don't answer, call the number you used before. He gave her his number and had her repeat it. I'm nearby, over the border in Finland, he said. If you need me, I can be here within hours, but it's better to keep our meetings at a minimum. I understand. I won't ask for a meeting again unless it's really important. There's an old Roman tomb with an inscription carved on it, Thorne said. I think of it when things get difficult. She looked at him, curious. What does it say, this inscription? It says, don't let the bastards wear you down. She laughed. It made him smile to see her happy. Maybe this Roman was really a Russian. Maybe. I should go now, she said. I don't want you to go. I don't want to. She looked at him. How can this be, these feelings? He stepped close and kissed her. I don't know, but they're real. I know that. I should go, she said again. Tell me the number, he said. She repeated it to him. Please, Anya, be careful. I will. They kissed. It vibrated through his body, a kiss he didn't want to end. After what seemed like a long time, she pulled back. Goodbye, Michael. He watched her walk away through the trees, thinking about the kiss and the sound of her laugh. The kiss had shaken him. It told him it was too late to back away. As far back as he could remember, he'd been told Russia was an enemy. You didn't fall in love with the enemy. It went against everything he'd ever been taught. How could this be happening? He thought about that first electric touch in the cathedral in Helsinki. The sensation that he'd known her forever. He decided it must have started then. It wasn't quite love at first sight, but it was damn close. He began walking back to the main path through the park, thinking about her. Anya was beautiful, but that wasn't why he felt this way. Physical attraction was a lousy basis for relationship. It might get your attention, but it would never be enough on its own. Ashley had taught him that. About the only thing he and Anya had in common was love of country. He wasn't ashamed to say he loved America in spite of its flaws. It was what drove him, gave him meaning. It was why he'd made a choice to stand against her enemies. It kept him working at Langley in spite of people like Carlson. He supposed that made him a patriot. Some would say that was corny, but he didn't give a shit what they thought. Governments and politicians came and went, but the country survived them. It was the land that mattered, the people. Anya felt the same way about Russia. Her people would call her a traitor, but if her beloved motherland could speak, he figured it would thank her. In a way, they were mirror images of each other, ideal partners. It didn't explain why he wanted to be with her, but it gave him the excuse he needed to forget she was supposed to be the enemy. Once he was out of the park, Thorne caught a taxi to the airport. Chapter 55 Back in Finland, Thorne called Carlson. Damn it, Thorne, you were supposed to give her that transmitter. I told you she wouldn't take it. You know what surveillance is like now. Sooner or later they'd find her if she used it. It's microburst technology. That doesn't matter. It's not worth the risk. I gave her my number. If something comes up, she'll contact me. You gave her your direct number. Are you nuts? She's using burners, Lewis. One-time use. Throw it away. She's not going to lead them to me. 
You just gave me a mini lecture on surveillance. Then you tell me they can't track her calls to you. Do you even listen to yourself? Would you like to know what she said? Don't waste my time, Thorn. She thinks they're getting ready to go to war. They're planning something big. Whatever it is, it has something to do with their submarines. She says all of them are already at sea. They aren't stupid enough to attack the blockade with their subs, Carlson said. It would mean war. They don't want a war with us. You could be right. I don't know, Thorn said. I'm simply repeating what she told me. She seemed to think it was important. She's not experienced, Thorn. She doesn't know what's important. You're not giving her much credit. There's a reason she's running that unit, and it's not because she's stupid. You sure you're not letting your dick get in the way of your judgment? Get your mind out of the gutter, Lewis. Yeah, I'm sure. Everything about her says she's the real deal. You know what they'll do to her if they catch her. You have any trouble getting into the country? No. They run a background check on everyone who enters the Federation. So by now they've discovered that I'm running an export business in Helsinki. It's not unusual for a businessman in Finland to take a trip to Moscow. Moscow is where the action is, if you're ambitious. Everybody wants in. Why did she ask for a meeting? Why won't she call in? She doesn't trust us, Lewis. She's hanging out there in the wind all by herself. For some reason, she's decided she can talk to me. If it makes her comfortable, if that's the way she wants to do it, that's how we have to play it. Davidson is still lobbying Kramer to take her away from you. You think she's going to? She hasn't done it yet. Opera won't go for it no matter what Kramer decides. What about her mental state? How do you read her? She's determined. She's also pissed. The GRU murdered her contact. He was a personal friend. Damn it, Thorn. You weren't supposed to tell her that. She asked, I'm not going to lie to her. How did she take it? She's angry. And she wants us to do something. She's probably scared shitless, but she's handling it well. She talked again about the GRU major that's making trouble for her. If we could do something about him, it would go a long way toward building trust. We're working on it. That's what I told her. It's not good enough. Major Petrov is going to have some big problems soon. These things take time. You know that. You can't hurry it up. Don't push it, Thorn. Like I said, these things take time. I've been thinking. We need to create an escape plan for her in case something goes wrong. There's not a lot we can do. You know that. But go ahead and talk to Jenna about it. I don't want to see her get burned any more than you do. Okay, something else. From what I saw, Russians are really upset about the blockade. We're not making any friends over there. What's Campbell trying to do? He's trying to put the genie back in the bottle and get the Russians to give up their gains in Syria. He's dreaming. They're not going to do that. He's backing Tarasov into a corner. It's not a good idea. Would you like me to set up a meeting with the president and the joint chiefs? I'm sure they'd love to hear your opinion. You know I'm right, Lewis. It doesn't matter if you're right. I know, that's what scares me. Chapter 56 Deep below the Moscow streets, faces at the table in the National Defense Control Center were grim. Tarasov waited until everyone had settled in their seats. He'd already decided what he was going to do, but he needed to let these men think it was their decision. He'd been waiting a long time for this moment, ever since the day he'd learned of his father's death. Admiral Ivanov, sir, what is the status of the American blockade? Nothing has changed, Mr. President. They seem determined to stay there as long as they want, or at least until we meet their terms. I can't break it without starting a war. How about the rest of you? Tarasov said. Do you agree with Admiral Ivanov? Are war or submission to the American demands our only options? General Fedorov raised his hand. May I be blunt, Mr. President? Speak your mind, General. The General Staff is of one mind on this issue. The American blockade is intolerable. It is an act of war. There were murmurs of assent around the table. Fedorov continued. We can't break the blockade by fighting a localized action with the American Navy. Even if we could win such a battle, it would rapidly escalate to a full-scale exchange. What are you getting at, General? We have two possible courses of action. The first is to accede to the American demands and pull back across the Euphrates. I speak for everyone in this room when I say we cannot agree to that. The American president does not believe we will resort to war. He thinks we have no choice but to retreat. Once we do that, American threats and demands for concessions will not stop. Fedorov paused. We must activate Medusa, he said. The word fell like a stone on the tabletop. Tarasov smiled to himself. This was going to be easier than he thought. 
Medusa was the name of a mythical sea monster in Russian folklore, half woman, half snake. She was always pictured with poisonous serpents growing from her feet. Medusa was also the code name for a first strike attack against the United States. Like all first strike options, it was designed to neutralize critical military targets and defeat the enemy's ability to respond. The fatal flaw with first strike scenarios lay in the reality of modern defense systems. Satellites watched everything. A missile launch could not be hidden. There would be enough time for the enemy to launch his own missiles in retaliation. Those kinds of scenarios always ended in mutual destruction. The reason nuclear war had been avoided in the past. No one had pulled the trigger because no one believed they could win. Medusa changed that. Medusa utilized undersea missiles launched like torpedoes from modified submarines. The subs were protected by stealth technology that made them virtually undetectable. The missiles were equipped with thermonuclear warheads, each warhead the equivalent of a 50 megaton hydrogen bomb. A radical propulsion system drove them at high speed through the water. Speed and proximity to the target made the weapons difficult to detect. For all practical purposes, they were unstoppable. The warheads were dirty, intentionally designed to spread lethal radioactivity over wide areas. Critical stress points in the tectonic plates off the coasts of America were programmed into the computers guiding the missiles to their targets. Each detonation would trigger earthquakes and tsunamis, sending radioactive waves hundreds of feet high roaring inland across the American countryside. All military installations on both coasts would be destroyed. At the same time, ballistic missile submarines stationed off the American coasts would launch a coordinated attack, taking out targets farther inland. ICBMs from Russia's mainland would finish the job. The only way to win a nuclear war was to take the enemy by complete surprise. Medusa made that possible. By the time the Americans knew they were under attack, it would be too late. Fedorov continued. General Stepanov and I have been working with Admiral Mikhailov to refine the plan in light of the current situation. Go on, Tarasov said. The key elements are already at sea. We only need to order our submarines into final position for the attack. All that is required is your permission. You sent the submarines out without notifying me. We did not think it was necessary, Mr. President, Fedorov said smoothly. It was simply to test our operational capability and iron out any potential problems. Tarasov looked at him. They've been planning this all along. The realization that these men had tried to manipulate him made him angry. His face gave nothing away. Inwardly, Tarasov seethed. They were doing what he wanted, but they'd done it without consulting him. They thought they'd boxed him in. They thought they still controlled him, but the reality was different. Things had changed since the days when he'd needed them to stay in power, but they didn't know it yet. He was going to have to teach these arrogant bastards a lesson, but they were still useful. For now, he was forced to wait. You are proposing a first strike with nuclear weapons against America. Yes, Mr. President. What is your estimate of our casualties in this scenario? Most of their land-based missile silos will be rendered useless. Effective enemy response will be limited almost exclusively to their submarines. We know where most of those are, and they will be destroyed. We can stop almost everything they throw at us. Almost everything. We assume some missiles will get through our defenses. There's no way to avoid casualties. However, we will have eliminated their main ability to retaliate. How many casualties, General? We estimate 15 to 20 million, possibly less. Only 20 million, that seems low. Fedorov didn't pick up on the sarcasm in Tarasov's voice. Our defense systems are excellent, Mr. President. The Americans are unaware of how good they are. Our efforts to make them believe our military is hampered by old technology and crumbling infrastructure have succeeded. Their belief has helped us conceal our true capabilities from them. What about their fleet? It's right off our coast, equipped with nuclear missiles. We have taken that into consideration. Our missiles, planes, and submarines will destroy their fleet at the same time the undersea missiles make landfall, Fedorov said. Everything will be coordinated as one massive strike. We are confident most of their missiles will be intercepted. Tarasov looked at the hard-faced men at the table. They were all watching him, waiting for his decision. How many of you think we should proceed with Medusa? Give me a show of hands. One by one, everyone raised a hand. Very well. General Fedorov, make the necessary preparations. If the Americans do not come to their senses, we will do it for them. Yes, Mr. President. Are there any other comments? Mr. President. Yes, General Andropov. Morale has been affected by the loss of our brave airmen in Syria. 
I want to do something about it. What do you have in mind? Sometimes their pilots penetrate Syrian airspace. So far, we have ignored them. Our bomber was shot down with an American missile. Let's return the favor. I propose that the next time they send a plane to piss on us, we shoot it down. Tarasov looked at the men sitting around the table. What he saw was desire for revenge. We have agreed to initiate Medusa. Isn't that enough? There is a risk things will escalate before we are ready, if we shoot down one of their planes. They won't start a war over one plane, Andropov said. We can call another emergency meeting at the UN to confuse them. We could blame the Syrians, say they made a mistake. I do not believe things will get out of hand. General Andropov's idea has merit, Fedorov said. It will boost morale. Our troops will be in the proper mood when Medusa starts. I agree, Stepanov said. There were murmurs of assent around the table. Give the orders, Tarasov said. Is there anything else? No, then this meeting is adjourned. Chapter 57 Colonel Ivanov had listened to Petrov's report on the surveillance of Colonel Volkova. She had gone again to the Black Queen, where she had asked about the dissident, Sokolov. On Sunday she'd gone to Ismailovsky Park, where her watcher had found himself following someone at a distance who looked like her. Volkova had been out of sight for almost thirty minutes. Now Ivanov and Petrov sat in a darkened viewing room, watching the surveillance recordings from General Stepanov's apartment. Petrov provided a running commentary. They had dinner at Turbinot, then came back to his apartment. This is footage from the bedroom, about a half hour later. Turbinot. I wish I could afford to eat there, Ivanov said. They watched as Stepanov undressed and lay back naked on the bed. Hairy bastard, isn't he? Well equipped. The man's an ape. Here she comes, Petrov said. Anya walked into the picture, dressed in a silk robe. They watched her drop it to the floor, then climb onto the bed. She is a beautiful woman, Ivanov said. Hmm, not much on foreplay, is he? No, sir, he gets right to it. Doesn't look like she's enjoying it much. She's no better than a whore. Don't be so judgmental, Major. I doubt she has much choice in the matter. Move the recording forward. I want to see what she does after they finished. I'll watch it again later, Petrov said to himself. Yes, sir. Petrov fast-forwarded the recording until after Anya had showered and dressed. They watched her leave the bedroom. A camera in the hall recorded her going into Stepanov's study. The camera in that room showed her searching the drawers in his desk. That's enough, Ivanov said. I want to know what she was looking for. Bring her in. She'll be in the ministry at work. Shall I have her brought in now? Yes, Petrov stood. At once, sir. Got you, you arrogant bitch, he thought. Chapter 58. Anya was working at her desk when the phone rang. Colonel Volkova. Colonel, this is Senior Sergeant Popov. Yes, Senior Sergeant, what is it? I just let two men from GRU through. They're here for you. I see. I wanted to give you a heads up. I appreciate it, Yevgeny, thank you. She looked out her window and saw the men coming across the floor. She fought down her fear, taking deep breaths to slow the rush of adrenaline. They came into her office without knocking. Volkova, you will come with us. You will address me as my rank demands. Who are you? One of the men held out his ID. We will address you as we wish. Come with us. You will regret your rudeness, Anya said. She stood. They left her office, the men flanking her, pressing in on her. Silence followed behind as they passed through the workroom. As usual, Moscow traffic was heavy. The 40-minute drive from the ministry to GRU headquarters took more than an hour. Anya was taken to a room with a table, two chairs, and a large mirror on the wall. Her escort left and closed the door. She heard it lock. She looked around the room. A vague, unpleasant odor of sour sweat lingered in the air. The walls were painted a dirty institutional green that reminded her of old pea soup. The camera watched from the ceiling. The table was scarred and chipped. She sat down in one of the chairs, wondering who was watching from behind the mirror. She sat quietly, wondering why she'd been brought here. She didn't know if she was under arrest or if this was an attempt to intimidate her. She couldn't think of anything Petrov might have heard or seen that would cause problems, unless they'd seen her meet with Michael. But he'd told her that had been taken care of. If they had seen her, how would she explain it? She guessed she'd been in the room for about an hour, when the door opened and Colonel Ivanov came in, carrying a laptop computer. He sat down at the table across from her. Why am I here? She said. You are interrupting important work. You are here because of suspicious activity. 
Do you know who I am? I know who you are, Colonel. Am I under arrest? Not at this time. It depends on how you answer my questions. I protest this treatment. You may protest all you like, but you will still answer my questions. I advise you to cooperate. I am always ready to cooperate with the proper authorities, Anya said. On the Sunday three weeks ago, you met with a known dissident in Przensky Park, a Professor Sokolov. What is your relationship with this man? Don't let him see that you know Vlas is dead. Professor Sokolov was one of my teachers at the university. I had not seen him for many years. Our meeting was an accident. We played a game of chess and talked. I don't know anything about his political views. What did you talk about? Chess, mostly. Our time at the university. Vlas is ranked as expert. I'm only an amateur, but I enjoy the game. He beat you. Easily. What did you do after that, after you finished the game? I went for a walk. Then I went into a cafe for a coffee. The Black Queen. Yes. Where you again met with Sokolov. That was a surprise. I had no idea he would be there. You expect me to believe it was a coincidence? Of course I do. Would it surprise you to know that Sokolov is a dissident opposed to the president? Yes, it would. I am a loyal officer. I do not hold dissident views. I already told you I was unaware of Professor Sokolov's political beliefs. You understand it looks suspicious. To you, perhaps. I suppose that is your job to be suspicious. What did you talk about in the cafe? Chess, mostly about defensive strategy. The Sicilian defense. We played another game. I drank my coffee and left. The welfare of the state requires constant vigilance, Colonel. You would agree? Of course. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Across town on the top floor of the Ministry of Defense, General Stepanov called Anya's work number on the fourth floor. Major Kirov speaking. Major, this is General Stepanov. I wish to speak to Colonel Volkova. Sir, she's not here. Where is she? Why is she not at work? Sir, she was escorted from her office by agents from GRU. What? When did this happen? A little over two hours ago, General. Thank you, Major. Stepanov disconnected. Then he dialed another number. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. In the interrogation room at GRU headquarters, Ivanov made a mistake. He opened his laptop computer, entered a few keystrokes, then turned the screen so Anya could see what was on it. He touched a key and the images began to move. It hit her like a fist to the gut. She was looking at a video of herself having sex with Stepanov, with him on top of her. You bastard, she said. How dare you? Vigilance, Colonel. No one is exempt. Let's move it forward. He touched another key. The recording sped forward until she saw herself dressed, coming down the hall that led past the study. The camera angle shifted to inside the room. She watched as she opened a drawer in Stepanov's desk. Ivanov stopped the recording. What were you looking for, Colonel? Think. A file. You admit you were looking for a file. Something classified, perhaps? It's not that kind of file. A nail file. Oh, come on. You really expect me to believe that? Before she could respond, the door flew open. General Stepanov strode into the room, his presence filling the space. Behind him were two soldiers with assault rifles. What's going on here? Stepanov said. Ivanov slammed the laptop closed, jumped to his feet and saluted. Sir, I am conducting an interrogation. I can see that. Why is Colonel Volkova here? She is suspected of treason. She had to do something. Sir, Anya said. Yes, Colonel. This man has placed cameras in your apartment. Tell him to show you what he has on his computer. Stepanov's voice was dangerously calm. Is that true, Ivanov? I can explain, sir. I'm sure you can, Colonel. However, nothing you can say justifies placing surveillance in my private quarters. Sir, she was looking through the drawers in your desk. That's true, sir, Anya said. I broke a nail. I was looking for something to fix it. What else does he have on his computer? She spoke to fuel Stepanov's anger. He has everything, Yuri. The bedroom, the bath, he put cameras everywhere. I see. Colonel Ivanov, give me your computer. Sir, I must protest. Stepanov always wore his pistol. Now he took it from the holster and pointed it at Ivanov. Give me the computer. White-faced, Ivanov handed the laptop over. Listen to me very carefully, Colonel, Stepanov said. You will have every recording and video made in my apartment on my desk within one hour. You will remove all surveillance equipment immediately, today. Now, if you try to fuck with me on this, you will wish you had never been born. Do you understand? Sir, I... Stepanov leaned close and placed the barrel of the pistol against Ivanov's forehead. His voice was very quiet. Do you understand, yes or no? Yes, General. 
On my desk, all of it in one hour. Yes, General. Then we're done here. He holstered the pistol. Colonel Volkova, you may ride with me back to the ministry. Yes, sir. Stepanov was silent as they left the building. The soldiers climbed into their vehicle and drove off. Stepanov's driver held the rear door open while Anya and Stepanov got into the car. Once they were moving, Stepanov raised the window between the rear compartment and the driver. He poured himself a vodka. He did not offer one to Anya. What were you really looking for? He said. I told the truth, Yuri. I wanted to fix my nail. I thought I might find something in your desk. I want to believe that. What else would I be looking for? This is Major Petrov's fault. He desires me, but I loathe him. He knows it. I think he convinced Ivanov to follow me and put cameras in your apartment. I ran into an old professor of mine in the chess park. I hadn't seen him for years. Ivanov says he's a dissident, but I didn't know that. They have built that up into treason. Stepanov looked at her. Hmm, well, these things happen. Forgive me, my dear, I should have offered you a drink. That was most stressful for you. Stepanov poured a vodka and handed it to her. She threw it back in one gulp. Yuri, he was going to arrest me. I have enemies, Anya. They would like to create a scandal around me. It's possible that is what is behind this. I am only sorry you have been caught up in it. I don't think Ivanov will let it go, Anya said. Don't worry about Colonel Ivanov, Stepanov said. His voice sent a chill down her back. She took his hand. Thank you, Yuri. He watched her lean back against the leather seat. What were you doing, Anya? As first deputy minister of defense, Stepanov received daily briefings from the intelligence services. Two days before, the briefing had contained an assessment that someone was passing sensitive military intelligence to the CIA. The assessment was deemed reliable based on information obtained from a highly placed American source. He found it difficult to believe Colonel Volkova could be the traitor. What possible reason could she have to betray the motherland? She had become a national figure. People were naming babies after her. She came from a family with a long and distinguished record of loyal service. Very few achieved her level of success, and the future promised more. Stepanov was planning to move her into a position of more responsibility, where she would wear a general's star. He had guaranteed her career. Why would she do anything to jeopardize that? She was a pleasant companion. He didn't think she was pretending to enjoy his company. She seemed natural in his presence. No, he couldn't believe she was a traitor. Looking in his desk must be nothing more than an innocent mistake. All the same, he decided to keep an eye on her. If it did turn out to be her, he would shoot her himself. With regret. Back at the ministry, Anya ignored the covert looks as she walked across the work area to her office. Once inside, she closed the door and drew down the blind. She sat at her desk and began shaking. She took slow, deep breaths until her body stilled and she regained her calm. She remembered the odd way Stepanov had looked at her in the car. Had he believed her story? She supposed he must have or she'd be sitting in a cell waiting to be interrogated. Damn Ivanov anyway. Damn him and his toady Petrov. She imagined the two of them watching while Stepanov grunted over her and felt a quick flush of anger. At least they weren't likely to be a problem from now on. Yuri would see to that. There were advantages to being associated with such a powerful man. As long as he was convinced of her loyalty, she was safe. At least for now. Chapter 59 Thorne was on his secure phone with Jenna. An escape plan, she said. Carlson wants us to figure something out. We can't do that without knowing the specifics of her situation. There are too many factors involved. Where is she starting from? What's the urgency? Is she in immediate danger? You know what I mean. We can make some assumptions, Thorne said. We can assume she'll be starting from Moscow and that we wouldn't need to pull her out unless the situation was urgent. It's not too early to start thinking about this. A lot would depend on whether or not the FSB is after her. Assume the worst. She's blown on the run and they're looking for her. That would close down all the easy routes, Jenna said. She'd have to travel overland. The Russians don't mess around. They'd shut down everything all at once. No planes or trains. No convenient flights to Helsinki or Vienna or Rome. No crossing the border in a car or bus. They'd set up checkpoints on the major highways. There's something else, Thorne said. I mentioned getting her out if things got bad. She said she wouldn't leave without her mother. That's a non-starter. It's already hard enough to get her out. How old is her mother? Pushing 70. 
Opera is worried about her, so her health is probably bad. This keeps getting better and better. You'd have to convince her to leave her mother behind. You haven't met Opera. Take my word for it, she won't do it. Then she's not getting out. Let's pretend I can change her mind. Where would she go? The Ukraine? From there she could get to Poland. The border is militarized. She'd need an ironclad reason for them to let her through. It's not a good choice. Besides, how would you have her get to Poland? Ukraine is bigger than France. It would take time to get to the Polish border and they'd be looking for her. Finland is better. She could cross from St. Petersburg. Finland is the obvious choice, Jenna said. They'd expect that. St. Petersburg would be tied up like a circus escape artist. How about Estonia? She could take the ferry from Tallinn. The only other option would be a private boat across the Gulf of Finland. Estonia is still under Russian influence, even if they're not ruled by Moscow anymore. Just because they joined NATO doesn't mean everyone there is our friend. FSB has agents there. Finland, too, even though they're neutral. You're a real optimist, Jenna. I'm being realistic. This conversation tells me what I already know. I'd have to go get her, see her through. I don't think Carlson will sign off on that. I don't care what Carlson thinks. I'll do whatever it takes to get her out. She heard something in his voice. Shit. He's attracted to her. That's all I need, a damn Russian for competition. The first time she'd ended up in bed with Mike. It had been an impulse born of too many martinis and frustration caused by the stringent security demanded by her job. Getting involved with him wasn't something you could do halfway. It scared her. When she felt herself falling for him, she'd broken it off. Now it was a year later and she'd allowed herself to let him get close again. She was in deeper than she'd ever been. It had been great these last few weeks. She'd begun to think there might be a future to the relationship. And now he was mixed up with this Russian woman. Jenna had seen her picture. Anya Volkova had a kind of exotic beauty that stood out from the crowd. He was getting involved with her. She could feel it. Damn him. I'm beginning to worry about you, Mike. It sounds like you're getting emotionally involved. Of course I'm emotionally involved. We owe it to our assets to protect them. It's a moral contract. Sure it is. I don't think Carlson sees it that way. Or Kramer either, for that matter. They're not going to sign off on you taking risks for opera. She's put her life on the line because she wants to do the right thing. She trusts me. I have an obligation to her. Good intelligence still boils down to people. We have to back them up. If we don't, we might as well hand everything over to the computers. I've never heard you say anything like that before, Jenna said. It hasn't been necessary to say it before. Mike, wait a second. Something's going on. He heard someone talking in the background. Jenna came back on the line. I have to go. The Russians shot down one of our planes. Shit. We'll talk later. She hung up. Thorne set his phone down on the desk. What was Tarasov thinking? Didn't he realize his actions were pushing the world toward war? Maybe he didn't care. Maybe he'd already decided war was inevitable. If there was a war, what would happen to Anya? He couldn't do anything about Tarasov, but if it became necessary, he'd do whatever it took to keep Anya safe. He didn't ask himself why he felt that way. He only knew he did. Chapter 60 Admiral Stone sat on one of the couches in the Oval Office, making a conscious effort to sit still. When he was stressed and angry, he had a tendency to make erratic movements with his feet. He was stressed today. The Russians had shot down one of his boys. Lieutenant J.G. Terrell Williams had taken off from the USS Ronald Reagan on a routine surveillance mission off the Syrian coast. Yes, he'd strayed a couple of miles into Syrian airspace. Damn it, that was no reason to blow him out of the sky. Kaplan sat in his usual place on one of the couches, looking preoccupied. Secretary of Defense Arnold Dixon sat next to Kramer across from Admiral Stone. Secretary of State Demarest sat next to him, polishing his glasses. Rebecca Kramer cast an occasional glance at Kaplan, waiting to see if he'd gotten the message to cooperate. When she'd learned an American plane had been shot down, she'd known Kaplan would try to convince the president that the best response was diplomacy and patience. Rebecca Kramer was done with diplomacy and patience. She was sick of appeasement. The Russians needed to know the time for games was passed. The mandate of the CIA didn't include setting national policy. But that had never kept Langley's directors from doing whatever was necessary to make things go in the right direction. It was an article of faith at Langley that politicians couldn't be trusted to make the kinds of hard decisions needed to ensure America's safety. 
She regarded President Campbell as naive when it came to Russia. He didn't understand Tarasov's hatred of America, but Kramer did. She'd studied the Russian president and his history. She didn't have the power to decide what the response would be to Russia's actions. But she was damned if she was going to let someone like Kaplan steer the president away from what had to be done. She'd had a plan ready for a moment like this. That morning, Kaplan had found a sealed manila envelope on his desk, addressed to him and marked eyes only. There was no postage on the envelope or return address. When Kaplan looked at the contents, adrenaline shot through his body and froze him to his chair. An 8x10 photograph showed him naked in circumstances that would bring instant disgrace if it became public. A single sentence was typed under the picture. Don't advocate compromise or everyone sees this. If that picture got out, he was ruined. A minute later, an aide had knocked on the door of his office. What is it? Sir, the president wants you. There's been an incident in Syria. On my way, Kaplan had said. He'd put the picture and envelope through the shredder before he left. Now he sat with the others in the Oval Office, wondering if he would still have his job tomorrow. Kaplan loved his job. He loved the trappings of power. As a senior advisor to the president, he had a lot of status in Washington. He got the best tables, the best invitations, the inside tips that had already made him a millionaire. He wasn't about to give all that up. Not for anything. It was probably Kramer who had sent the picture, but he couldn't be certain. It didn't matter who'd sent it. He had no doubt the sender would follow through on the threat if he didn't do as he was told. General Kroger and Walter Covington came into the room. I'm sorry we're late, Mr. President. There was an accident. Traffic was backed up. You're here now, that's what matters, Campbell said. Let's get started. Kroger and Covington sat down on either side of Admiral Stone. As usual, Covington was perfectly dressed. The creases in his pants and brilliant shine on his shoes a civilian match to the military uniforms. As you are all aware, this morning the Russians shot down one of our planes while it was conducting routine reconnaissance off the Syrian coast, Campbell said. I need to decide on a response. Mr. President, Tarasov has gone too far, General Kroger said. I agree, Mr. President, Admiral Stone said. Frankly, I'm beginning to wonder about Tarasov's mental state. His actions seem irrational to me. He's escalated the potential for conflict without any obvious advantage. I don't see what he hopes to gain by this. He's challenging us and the world is watching. We must take firm action and quickly. The Russians deny responsibility, Campbell said. They claim the Syrians shot the plane down after it violated Syrian airspace. Excuse me, Mr. President, but that's like saying the dog ate my homework, Kroger said. It was an SS-400 that took out our plane. The Russians maintain rigid control of those missiles. Everyone knows the Syrians aren't in charge. Admiral, you said you don't see what Tarasov hopes to gain, Kramer said. It may be a distraction. What do you mean, Director? We have reliable intelligence indicating Tarasov and his generals are planning something big. We don't know the details, but our analysis is that they're planning a major response to the blockade. This incident with the plane could be an attempt to draw our attention away from something else they're doing. While we're watching their right hand, the left is doing something else. You may be giving Tarasov too much credit. Demarest said. It would be unwise to underestimate him, the defense secretary said. Arnold Dixon was almost the exact opposite of Demarest in looks and political philosophy. He was a big man who had played football at Auburn until an injury knocked him off the team during his junior year. It wasn't serious enough to cause permanent damage or to keep him out of the army after graduation. He'd volunteered for the Rangers and served with distinction. The Russian bomb in Syria had killed American soldiers. Dixon took it personally. The generals backed him in winning the presidency, but he's not a puppet. He's where he is because he agrees with the philosophy of the ultra-nationalists who currently make up the Russian general staff. He paused and sneezed into his elbow. Sorry, he sniffed. My allergies are acting up. Tarasov has spent the last few years modernizing the Russian military. His generals want to play with their new toys. We're seeing that in Syria. I'm worried about them, and I'm worried about this latest incident. General Kerensky sees us as the fascist enemy. So do Minister Fedorov and the rest. All of them have made public comments favoring confrontation with the West. What are you saying, Arnie? Demarest said. It's possible they're getting ready to go to war. Our blockade may have pushed them to the brink. That would be consistent with our intelligence, Kramer said. Our Russian source told us exactly that. 
You think they're planning a first strike? Kroger said. I certainly hope not, but it's possible. That would also be consistent with what our sources are telling us. I wouldn't put anything past that madman, Stone said. Harold, President Campbell said. You've been unusually quiet. What do you think? I agree with General Kroger, Mr. President. Tarasov has gone too far. We have to send a strong message to the Russians. Good boy, Kramer thought. You don't think we should take this to the UN, Campbell said. I would prefer a diplomatic solution. That hasn't done any good in the past, Mr. President. Something stronger is needed this time. Campbell looked at Kaplan as if he'd grown three heads. You think a military response is required? All I'm saying is that the UN has not helped us before when it comes to dealing with the Russians. For once I agree with Harold, Kroger said. Mr. President, I think we need to make a measured military response to this outrageous provocation. I concur, Admiral Stone said. We could take out the missile site that brought down our plane. That would be a limited and appropriate response. There will be Russians at that site, Demarest said. Tough, Dixon said. They can't have it both ways. Either the Syrians are responsible or the Russians are. If they maintain the fiction that it was the Syrians, then they can't make a public stink if some of their personnel are killed when we retaliate. Walter, what do you think? Campbell asked. Covington cleared his throat before answering. I don't like it, but I don't think we have a choice. Harold makes a good point. We could go to the UN and try the diplomatic route, but we all know it's a waste of time. In the end, nothing will come of it. I'm concerned about Director Kramer's comment that this incident may be a strategic distraction orchestrated by Tarasov's generals. Perhaps if we show resolve now, we can avert war later. Well put, Admiral Stone said. I agree, Kramer said. A limited response would be an effective message, Kaplan said. I can prepare a diplomatic statement justifying our actions, Demarest said. We have to draw a line, Dixon said. Campbell looked around the room and sighed. They were all agreed. He'd asked for their advice. He hoped he wasn't about to make things worse. Admiral Stone. Yes, Mr. President. Order your people to take out that missile site. I don't want to hear about civilian collateral damage. Is that clear? Yes, sir, very clear. It will be a surgical strike. A presidential aide came into the room. Sir, the British ambassador is about to arrive. I'll be right there, Campbell said. Campbell stood. The others got to their feet. Admiral Stone, keep me informed, and God help us if this goes wrong. Chapter 61 Two days had passed since Stepanov had pulled Anya out of the interrogation with Ivanov. He hadn't sent for her since then. She was beginning to worry. It was true Stepanov had enemies who might try to use her as a way to bring him down. She worried that he might have decided she was too much of a risk. Without his patronage, she was vulnerable. Even if Ivanov was out of the picture, his superiors would never let it go. She was trapped. She had to convince Stepanov he needed her. There had been moments with him when he'd seemed to genuinely like her. He'd begun to trust her, but Ivanov's cameras had destroyed that. She had to find a way to restore that trust and regain his confidence. She could call Michael and tell him what had happened. But what difference would it make? He couldn't do anything about it. She couldn't run to him for comfort every time she got nervous. She wished there was a way to reach him without calling. A place to leave and receive messages. What did they call it in the spy stories, a drop spot? Something like that. Anya was home, in the apartment. She'd fixed dinner for her mother not long before. She cleaned up the kitchen, went into the living room, and sat down on the couch. Yulia was watching reruns of Streets of Broken Lights, a long-running crime show. It's terrible, these criminals, how they act, Yulia said. It's only a television show, mother. No, it's real, Anya. Thank goodness we have such brave policemen to protect us. There was no point in trying to point out the flaws in Yulia's thinking. Suddenly the program was interrupted. The picture on the screen changed to the main newsroom of Channel 3. A moving banner on the bottom of the screen announced breaking news in flashing white letters against a red background. Cameras zoomed in on the anchor. His face was stern. Anyone watching instantly knew something serious had happened. American missiles have struck a defensive installation near Damascus built to protect our Syrian allies from Western aggression. Several Russian citizens volunteering at a humanitarian relief shelter nearby were killed in the explosions. President Tarasov will discuss this reckless crime in an address to the nation tomorrow morning. Stay tuned to Channel 3 for developments as they come in. 
We now return to our regular programming. The police drama resumed. The Americans would never dare do something like that if the party was still in charge, Yulia said. Times are different now, mother. Her mother began breathing heavily. They may be different, but they're not better. When the party was in power, we had order. The world respected us. Not like now. Don't get upset. It's not worth it. Yulia's voice became loud. Don't tell me not to get upset. Don't tell me it's not worth it. You never knew the pride we felt in the strength of the party. Yulia's face was becoming red. Anya looked at her with alarm. Please, mother, calm yourself. Remember your blood pressure. Quack, doctors. My blood pressure is fine. It's... Oh. Yulia grasped her left arm. Oh, it hurts. Mother. Yulia's face contorted with pain. She tried to speak, but all that came out was a choking sound. She pitched forward onto the floor. No. Anya jumped to her feet. Mother. Yulia gave a long, shuddering gasp and stopped breathing. Her eyes stayed open. Anya was stunned. She'd been annoyed with her mother earlier, when she'd criticized the dinner Anya had made. Yulia was always complaining. She'd wish then that her mother would stop. Now there would be no more complaints. Feelings of guilt filled her. Anya knelt down on the floor and brushed hair from Yulia's forehead, then gently closed the eyes. She remembered what it was like when her mother was young, still full of vitality. Before she became bitter. Before she became lost in memories of a glorious Soviet world that had never existed. Everything Yulia had been or wanted to be was gone. Reduced to this lifeless shell lying on the floor in front of her. First Mikhail had been taken from her, then Grigori. Now her mother was gone. There was no one left. Anya held her hands to her face and began to weep. Chapter 62 Scott Davidson was a man of little humor who took life seriously. It was ingrained in his genes, part of his New England heritage, as was his Ivy League education. He came from old money. His father was chairman of a prestigious alliance of major banks. His family background, his trust fund, and his gift for flattering those who could help him meant he was noticed. In college, he'd been initiated into a secret society that had long provided a significant share of America's leaders. Shortly after graduation, Davidson had been invited to a private dinner on an exclusive estate outside of the city for members of the society. Among the guests were a Supreme Court judge, a senator beginning his fourth term, and a man who took him aside and introduced himself as the director of the CIA. By the time dessert was served, Davidson's career had been chosen for him. All these years later, it was only a question of time before Kramer's office became his. Scott Davidson looked at the file on opera and tossed it down on his desk in disgust. Damn it, he was the deputy director of the CIA. If he wanted to designate himself as primary handler of an asset, he damn well ought to be able to do so. Letting Thorne handle her was adding insult to injury. Thorne should have been fired years ago. Thorne was a problem. Everyone knew that. He didn't show the proper respect to his superiors. Kramer knew that. So why the hell didn't she get with the program and hand opera over to him? He knew why. She enjoyed playing power games. As long as she was the boss, he had to do what she wanted whether he liked it or not. Davidson didn't like playing second fiddle to Kramer. Opera was bringing the underlying friction between them to the surface. He swiveled in his comfortable chair to look out the office windows. The view from the seventh floor was much more than the sprawling Langley complex in the pleasant Virginia countryside. It was a view of power. It reminded him that he was literally next door to the kind of power most people could only dream of. If Kramer was forced out, the president would appoint him in her place. Why wouldn't he? No one was better positioned, and Davidson had powerful friends who would make sure he got the job. Perhaps he could use opera to engineer Kramer's downfall. Find a way to make sure Thorne screwed up. If something went wrong, the axe would fall on Kramer's neck, not his. He might be able to get rid of Kramer and Thorne at the same time, two birds with one stone. That happy thought made him smile. Davidson looked at his watch. It was almost time for the morning briefing with her, a half hour or so spent reviewing the latest threats and intelligence that had come in during the night. He got up, put the file in the wall safe, and locked it. He spun the dial. Then he went to the door adjoining Kramer's suite, knocked and went in. A few moments later, there was a knock on Davidson's door. When there was no response, it opened and Ed Bradford entered the room. He was carrying a file, an excuse for being there. Bradford knew all about the daily morning meetings between Davidson and Kramer. 
Keeping an eye on the door leading into Kramer's suite, he went to the wall safe and noted the number where the dial rested. Then he dialed in the combination and opened the safe. The combination was on a need-to-know basis. Bradford didn't need to know, but he'd been in this office when Davidson had opened the safe. He'd stood nearby and watched the dial turn. His eidetic memory took care of the rest, the same way he'd learned the combination to the outer office door. The opera file lay in front. When Bradford saw what was inside, he knew he'd struck gold. He took out his phone and began taking pictures. Sometimes the Russians were reluctant to part with their cash, but they'd pay well for this. Finding out that a highly placed Russian colonel was passing information to Langley would be worth a large payment to his Cayman Island account. In a community of people who spent their days seeking out hidden information, it was difficult to keep some things from becoming known. Rumors were spreading that there was a mole. Bradford had decided it was almost time to disappear, and this file would give him enough to do it. Langley's mole catchers were good. Bradford had no desire to spend the rest of his life locked up in a supermax prison. He'd been careful, but sooner or later they would discover his identity. It was time to head for someplace warm, someplace where they would never find him, someplace where they put little umbrellas in the drinks and the women were easy, where he could let the good times roll, away from his nagging, domineering, boring wife, where he could live the life he wanted and deserved. When he was done copying the file, he put it back in the safe, closed the door and reset the dial to where it had been. He looked around to make sure everything was as it had been and left the room, humming to himself. Chapter 63 Thorn watched Tarasov's address to the Federation on Finnish TV. When it was over, he turned off the television, thinking about what it might mean. There was nothing surprising in the speech. Tarasov had made the usual kinds of indignant protestations and excuses. According to Tarasov, the Russians killed in the American attack had been providing humanitarian relief to the Syrian people. The Americans were militaristic, imperialistic, warmongers. The Russians wanted only peace and prosperity for all peoples of the world. Blah, blah, blah. It would be easy to dismiss the words as typical Russian bullshit. But something in Tarasov's expression and body language made Thorne's scalp tingle. The Russian president was lying. That wasn't unusual, but he was hiding something. What was it? He hadn't talked about retaliation. Instead, he'd cast himself as acting more in sorrow than in anger. He had assured the Russian people he would present his case to the United Nations, in the hope diplomacy would soften America's warlike heart. Tarasov, resulting to genuine diplomacy, was about as believable as recent tabloid articles claiming Bigfoot had appeared in Washington with a message for the president from extraterrestrials. Compared to Tarasov's speech, the Bigfoot story was higher on Thorne's scale of credibility. Thorne had lost count of the times he'd seen public opinion shaped by people who wanted everyone to believe a big lie. It was child's play to manipulate public opinion, if you had control of the media. The Nazi master of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, had spelled it out so anyone could understand. If you wanted someone to believe a lie, you mixed it with a tiny bit of truth and repeated it over and over and over again until people believed it. At the same time, you made sure the larger truth was censored and concealed. That way no one was bothered by inconvenient facts that didn't fit the narrative. The lie became the truth. Soon everyone was convinced it had always been that way. Sometimes he wondered why such a simple method was so effective. Then again, human psychology being what it was, it wasn't hard to understand. People wanted to believe what their leaders told them. They wanted to live in a world where they felt safe, or at least a world where someone in control made them feel that way. That wasn't Thorne's world. If there was a truth he lived by, it was that safety was an illusion. He hadn't heard anything from Anya since the last time they talked. That didn't have to mean anything. It could be days or weeks before she discovered something he needed to know about. All the same, he had a bad feeling time was running out. If she was right in thinking the Russian high command was planning war, then there might not be weeks left to head it off. He was worried about her. It was more than that. He missed her. He wanted to hear her voice, to touch her. It was frustrating, waiting for her to contact him. Feeling frustrated went with the territory. He was stuck here in Helsinki, pretending to be someone interested in importing saunas. His cover was wearing thin in more ways than one. His phone buzzed. Carlson. Thorn. Did you watch Tarasov's speech? Hello to you too, Lewis. Yes, I saw it. 
What did you think? He's planning something. All that talk about the UN and the innocent victims of our aggression is so much bullshit, a smokescreen. Have you heard from Opera? Carlson said. Nothing. Not even a high C. Ha ha, very funny. It happens that Director Kramer agrees with your assessment of Tarasov. I want you to contact Opera and find out what that Russian prick is planning. Wait a second, Lewis. She would have made contact if she'd come across anything new. She may be in trouble. We have another source, a low-level asset in the GRU. Opera was picked up for interrogation a few days ago. They were about to arrest her, but Stepanov intervened. Thorne tensed as he heard the words. They felt like blows. What, you didn't think I needed to know that right away? What difference would it have made? I only learned about it this morning, I'm telling you now. Damn it, Lewis, why did they pick her up? She was seen talking with the man who helped her contact our embassy. The one who died while they were interrogating him, Sokolov. We need to think about pulling her out of there. She's not going anywhere, Thorne. You are not authorized to extract her. You called me to say you think she could be in trouble, but you don't think being picked up by the GRU is reason enough for extraction? They let her go, didn't they? That doesn't mean anything. It could be a ploy. They could be waiting for her to make a mistake. Which is another reason you need to contact her. She's not a professional. You can give her the benefit of your experience. Go to Moscow. Meet with her. Give her a secure phone she can use. It's already on the way to you. You'll have it within a half hour. She didn't want a transmitter. What makes you think she'll take a phone? She doesn't have a choice about it. We can't indulge her. She's playing in the big game and she needs to step up to the plate. Please, Lewis, spare me the corny sports analogies. Whatever. Talk to her. She said they were planning something big. What is it? By now she must have some idea. The White House is pushing Kramer and she's pushing me. Shit rolls downhill, Thorn. I need answers and I want you to get them from her. What if she doesn't have any? For her sake and yours, you'd better hope she does. If you can't come up with something, Kramer will probably turn her over to Davidson. Davidson is an idiot. He'll do something stupid and get her blown. The only reason he wants to run opera is because he thinks it will give him points when it comes time to appoint the next director. Yeah, well, go talk to her and bring back some useful intelligence. Then everyone will be happy. It's not a good idea to meet without setting it up ahead of time. I have every confidence in you, Thorn. You'll figure something out. Now you're really making me nervous. Get it done. I'll expect to hear from you within the next couple of days. Lewis. He was talking to dead air. Chapter 64 Major Petrov was no longer sitting at the desk outside the tall double doors leading into Stepanov's office. He'd been replaced by another man, a captain, whose name badge identified him as Chernyshevsky. Anya sat on an uncomfortable chair in the outer office, waiting for Stepanov's summons to enter. The doors opened and General Kerensky emerged. Anya jumped up and came to attention. At ease, Colonel. Sir. Kerensky exited. You can go in now, Colonel, Chernyshevsky said. Thank you, Captain. Stepanov's office smelled of strong Russian tobacco. Kerensky was a heavy smoker. A cut glass ashtray on Stepanov's desk was filled with butts and ashes. Captain Chernyshevsky closed the doors behind her. Sit down, Anya, Stepanov said. Sir. I asked you to come up here because I wanted to offer my condolences. I was sorry to hear about your mother. Thank you, sir. I'm told it was quick. Yes, sir. She collapsed in front of me. That's terrible, my dear. It must have been very upsetting. Take some compassionate leave, if you wish. That won't be necessary, sir. I prefer to keep working. It keeps my mind occupied. Besides, my unit is very busy at the moment. Good. I was hoping you'd say that. You are about to get busier. The American aggression in Syria forces us to increase our state of readiness. It's more important than ever that things go smoothly with our logistical needs. Once this immediate unpleasantness has passed, I intend to move you into a position of more responsibility. Do you think you're ready for that? You're the best judge of that, sir. I am happy to serve in any capacity. Good, good. Stepanov looked down at his nails, then back up at her. Perhaps we might have dinner tonight at my apartment. I'd like that, Yuri. I'll have Janady pick you up at eight. Yes, sir, I'll be ready. Then I'll see you this evening. Yes, sir. Anya rose and left the room. So another evening of extravagant food, good wine, and bad sex lay in store for her. Stepanov was acting as if everything was normal. It seemed to prove he had decided Ivanov's suspicions were without merit, but she doubted his sincerity. How could he be sincere? 
He might think Ivanov had been overzealous by dragging her in for interrogation, but he had to wonder if there was any basis to the accusations. The only thing that had saved her was his anger about those awful recordings. Stepanov had been enraged by the invasion of his privacy. She didn't know where Colonel Ivanov was now, but she hoped it was somewhere unpleasant. If he hadn't stepped so far over the line, she'd probably be locked in a cell somewhere in GRU headquarters. Riding down on the elevator, Anya thought about what Stepanov had said, about raising the state of readiness, the importance of things going smoothly. It could only mean they expected the Americans to attack, or that they were going to start it themselves. The naval blockade was having an effect. Shortages of consumer goods were beginning to appear. People were starting to get angry. For the moment, their anger was directed at the West, but it wouldn't take much to change that. Tarasov could not allow the populace to turn their anger toward him and his government. He needed to do something to break the blockade, and he needed to do it soon. Back in her office, Anya tried to focus on her work. By afternoon, she was becoming alarmed. Requests for logistical support and increased supplies were coming from all over. There was only one possible explanation. War was imminent. It was the excuse she needed to call Michael. Psst. Give this author some love by clicking subscribe. Chapter 65. Thorn booked a flight from Helsinki to Moscow. Anya's call came as he was about to leave for the airport. We have to meet, she said. Where and when? Thorn said. I'm coming to Moscow today. The same place as last time. Tomorrow morning, nine o'clock. She broke the connection. A horn sounded outside. His taxi was here. Riding to the airport, he thought about the call. It had lasted no more than ten seconds. Good tradecraft. He smiled to himself. Anya was a fast learner. She'd sounded stressed. It figured. She'd survived being picked up by the GRU. That would stress anyone, but she hadn't called about that. This was something else. It had to be important. Carlson might get his answers after all. In Moscow, the guard in the booth took a long time looking at his passport. Standing off to the side were two big men in plain clothes watching him. Why are you here? Business. What kind of business? Import and export. I buy goods here and in Finland for Europe and Canada. Not America. I don't like Americans, Thorne said. The agent stamped the passport. Enjoy your stay, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. As he walked toward the taxi rank, Thorne felt the eyes of the FSB men on the back of his neck. His scalp tingled. He resisted the urge to turn around and look. It wasn't paranoia. Something had changed since the last time he'd been here. The taxi reeked of garlic and stale cigarette smoke. The driver's accent was thick. Thorne guessed he was from somewhere east of the Caucasus. Moscow traffic moved at a crawl. It took more than an hour and a half to get from the airport to the Metropole Hotel, where he'd booked a room. The Metropole was a piece of Moscow history, built before the 1917 revolution. The Bolsheviks had taken it over to house their growing bureaucracy. It had been turned back to being a hotel in the 30s and left to decay into a seedy shadow of its former grandeur. It had finally been restored in the 80s, in an effort to bring in tourists and their foreign currency. Thorne liked the hotel's bizarre mix of architectural styles. As long as he had to be in Moscow, he figured he might as well stay someplace interesting. There was no point in trying to find a place where he wouldn't be watched. All foreigners were watched in Russia. If he tried to disappear, it would only raise suspicion. His room overlooked the Bolshoi Theater across the street. Ballet wasn't his thing, but looking at the classical facade of the famous building, he wondered what it was like to be a tourist in Moscow. If you wanted to go to a ballet, this was the place to do it. He'd see if he could get a ticket just for the hell of it. They could probably arrange it at the desk downstairs. Carlson would blow a gasket when he saw a ballet ticket on the expense sheet. That alone made it a good idea. Besides, it was the kind of thing a Canadian businessman might do. It was good for his cover. He had dinner in the main dining room, an enormous hall with high ceilings and a domed glass roof. He picked up his ticket at the desk and crossed the street to the theater. The ballet was an incomprehensible three-act opera about Pearl Fisherman, a priestess who was also a forbidden lover or possibly a witch. Two men competing for her affection, a big fire, and the anger of the gods. Or was it the anger of a jealous lover? Thorne wasn't sure. As he filed out after the performance, he decided ballet still wasn't his thing. 
Summer was not far away, and the night was warm. He walked for a while, looking for anyone paying attention to him. He saw nothing unusual, but he couldn't shake the feeling something was off. He remembered the two hard-faced men at the airport. He'd have to be careful tomorrow when he went to meet Anya. An hour later, he was back in his room. He drew the drapes across the window, muffling the sound of late-night traffic outside. Thorne sat in a chair and closed his eyes. Sleep had always been elusive when he was in the field. Over the years, he'd learned to enter a resting state where he was neither asleep nor awake. In his mind's eye, he saw the park where he was going to meet Anya. He visualized the big Ferris wheel, the concessions, the benches, the paved walkways past the pond, the forest. He imagined himself meeting Anya. He imagined everything being calm and perfect. He was deep into the meditation when his phone vibrated in his pocket. Chapter 66 As usual, Stepanov was asleep within minutes after sex. Dinner had been uneventful. Stepanov had kept the conversation light. Nothing further had been said about Colonel Ivanov. He'd made no mention of the blockade or the preparations Anya was overseeing, except to compliment her on her work. She got up from the bed and went into the bathroom. It was becoming a routine. Have sex, wait till Stepanov was passed out, take a shower to wash the stink of him away, dress and go home. At least this time she knew there were no cameras watching, or were there. She'd looked for the signs. A small dot in the corner of the ceiling, a tiny hole in the wall, something hidden in an overhead light. She didn't see any. She probably wouldn't even if they were there. She couldn't know if Stepanov had decided to place cameras of his own in case Ivanov had been right about her. She dried herself and dressed. Stepanov's snores vibrated through the room. She quietly closed the door to the bedroom and walked down the hall. She paused at the study. Light from a heavy brass lamp spilled over the desk. Stepanov's uniform jacket and holstered pistol hung on the back of the chair. His computer was on, ribbons of color making random patterns on the screen. She looked back down the hall at the closed door to the bedroom, then went into the study. She tapped the space bar and the screen cleared. A level 7 security password was requested. Anya had been granted level 7 clearance when she was assigned the planning for Operation Eagle. But if she used her password, it would be saved on the remote server in the ministry. There would be a digital trail showing she had accessed Stepanov's computer, where she had no right to be. But there was no reason for anyone to look. She took a deep breath and entered her password. The screen cleared and showed several file folders on the desktop. She recognized all but one ongoing operations like Eagle. The exception was a file marked Medusa. She began reading. The first thing she saw was a list of submarine units, the same secret units she had discovered when she had looked at the document in Stepanov's briefcase. She scrolled to the next page. With growing alarm, she realized she was looking at a plan to launch a nuclear strike against America. What are you doing, Anya? Stepanov's voice startled her. She turned away from the screen and looked at him. He wore a white robe of thick Turkish cotton. Her mind froze. She couldn't think of what to say. Never mind, Stepanov said. You are a great disappointment to me, my dear. I did not want to believe Colonel Ivanov's accusations. Now I see they are true. Tell me, who are you working for? Is it the Americans? Yuri, I'm not working for anyone. Then why are you looking at my computer? I was curious, that's all. I'm sorry. I was leaving and I saw the screensaver was on. I wondered what you did when you were home and not on duty. I thought perhaps I'd see pictures of friends, family. I wanted to know more about you, who you are when you're not being the deputy minister of defense. You're not a very good liar, Anya. Stepanov's face turned dark. He stepped forward and grabbed her arm, hard. Yuri, you're hurting me. This is not hurting you, this is nothing. Soon you will understand that. Let go. You are a traitor. I would have raised you high, but you have betrayed me and the motherland. He released her arm and slapped her hard. Anya stumbled backward into the chair and grabbed it as she went down, knocking over the lamp on the desk. She fell onto her back. The lamp landed on the floor next to her. Stepanov towered over her. Bitch, he said. He turned his back and picked up the phone on his desk. Anya got to her knees. She had to stop him from making that call. She grasped the lamp in both hands, swung it in a high arc and brought the heavy base down on Stepanov's head. It made a dull, thick sound. The shock of the blow vibrated up her arms. He grunted and dropped the phone. She swung the lamp again. This time the sharp edge of the base sunk into his skull. 
she heard the hard crunch of bone breaking. Stepanov went down, falling sideways to the floor. His sphincter let go, filling the room with a foul stink. He lay on his side, eyes open. Blood spread out around him, a red flower blooming against the white robe. Oh my God, oh my God. She looked down at the body, the blood. Suddenly her stomach heaved. She bent over and vomited, retching until nothing came up but drool. For a moment she was unable to think. Then her mind switched into gear. Did anyone hear? No one else lived on this floor except Stepanov. He'd said the apartment below was empty. Besides, these expensive apartments were built to shield their important occupants from unwelcome noise. The walls were thick, the insulation designed to keep out winter's arctic cold. She listened for signs someone had heard. There was only silence, no voices, no shouts of alarm, no sirens in the distance. Stepanov's blood spread out over the floor. She'd never seen so much blood. Think. It was almost midnight. Stepanov usually got to the ministry around 7.30 in the morning. It was a half-hour drive from here. That meant she still had time until someone began to wonder where he was. It wouldn't take long for them to start looking for her when the body was discovered. The security guard in the lobby and Stepanov's driver both knew she was here. She'd be arrested. Michael, he will know what to do. She looked at the computer. She had to get the information to him. She remembered there was a box of USB drives in one of the desk drawers. She stepped around Stepanov's body and opened the drawer. She took out a drive, inserted it into the computer, and entered the command to copy the file. Then she took out her phone and dialed Michael's number. Chapter 67. Thorne looked at the display. Anya. He made the connection. I'm in big trouble. You have to help me. Her words came out in a rush. Wait, slow down. What happened? You have to help me. He's dead. Who's dead? Stepanov. I killed him. He could hear the fear in her voice. Okay, you're all right. Try to stay calm. Where are you now? In his apartment. I don't know what to do. Where's the apartment? On Ostojenka Street. Where? She gave him the address. All right, listen. Stay where you are. I'll get there as soon as I can. Are there guards? There's a guard in the lobby. Okay, stay in the apartment. Don't go anywhere. I'll call when I'm outside. All right. He hung up and entered the address in the GPS on his phone. He was still dressed except for his shoes. It was nearing midnight on Friday, and Moscow was known for its nightlife. Things were just starting to get warmed up in the city. No one would think it odd if he went out looking for distraction. A blown operation produced its own mindset. He began thinking about actions to take, possible scenarios. It didn't matter why Anya had killed Stepanov. There'd be time later to find out why. What mattered was that he had to get her out. First from Stepanov's apartment, then out of the country. His mind ticked over possibilities. He needed transportation. He couldn't take a cab to the apartment, pick her up, head to an airport. The cabs were all tracked by the FSB. Besides, a flight out of the country wasn't happening. There were few flights at this time of night. And even if there were, she might not have a passport. If she did, she probably didn't have it with her. Besides, a plane could be called back or met at its destination. He had to get her out of Moscow. He remembered his conversation with Jenna earlier in the day. Now speculation had turned into reality. As soon as Stepanov's body was discovered, the Russians would shut down all the obvious routes of escape. Like the cabs, rental vehicles were tracked by the FSB. A foreigner renting would be flagged immediately. He needed a car, but a rental was out. He'd have to steal one. He left everything in his room except his passports and money. It would take them a while to realize he was missing. He waited for the elevator. When it came, he took it to the lobby and left the hotel. Parking for guests at the Metropole was in a small, guarded lot. He wasn't going to find something there. He walked away from the broad intersection where the Metropole and Bolshoi faced each other. He kept walking until he found a street where people were allowed to park. He was in operational mode, paranoid, his adrenaline pumping. It made him feel alive. It was a part of the job he loved and hated at the same time, the feeling of walking the edge of the razor. The street felt clean. No one had followed him from the hotel. He turned a corner onto a residential block looking for the right kind of car. He saw a white Lada parked in a shadowed area between streetlights, a car that wouldn't stand out. There were a lot of white Ladas in Russia. He took a pick from inside his wallet and worked the door lock. Thirty seconds later, he was inside the car. Thirty seconds after that, the engine started. I'm getting good at this. 
He headed for Stepanov's building. As he drove, he took out his phone and called Jenna. Moscow was seven hours ahead of the East Coast. It was late Friday afternoon in Washington. She'd still be in her office. Mike, I was just thinking of you. We have a problem. Opera killed Stepanov. What? Tell me you're not serious. I wish. She's blown. I'm on my way to get her. Then I'm going to get her out of the country. What happened? I don't know yet. When I do, I'll call. Carlson is going to have a cow, Jenna said. Yeah, well, that's how it goes. He can deal with it. What's your plan? I'm making it up on the fly. Remember what we talked about earlier? Estonia and Finland look like the best bet. The ferry from Tallinn. I don't like it, but I don't see any better options. By the time you reach the Estonian border, they'll be looking for her. Do you have a better idea? Not at the moment. What do you need? Do we have a safe house in Tallinn? We used to. I don't know if it's still there. I'll find out. I'll need a passport for her. Clothes, Idaho. Something to disguise her looks. You know the drill. Find me a safe house or at least a way to get everything to me. How are you traveling? I hotwired a car. It will do for now. Jesus, Mike. Just another day at the office. I'd better get on this, Jenna said. I'll keep you posted. Mike, don't get yourself killed. Not a chance. He was nearing Stepanov's block. Gotta go. He hung up. He turned onto Ostojenka Street. A lot of was common as dirt in Russia, popular and cheap, but you didn't see them waiting in front of Stepanov's building. Thorne saw the security guard sitting behind a desk in the lobby as he drove by. He was reading a newspaper. There would be cameras in the lobby as well. He continued past the building, turned a corner and found a place to pull over. No way he was getting into that building. She had to come out. He called her. It's me, he said. I'm parked outside. I'm frightened. I know Anya. Yes, it's important to act naturally. Does the guard know you? Do you say goodnight to him when you leave? Yes, his name is Boris. Do what you always do. Say goodnight, smile. When you come out of the building, go to your left, then left again at the next street. I'm in a white lotta, about a third of the way down the block on the right. White lotta. He had to keep her focused. Anya. Yes. I'm here, Thorne said. Go. He hung up. After ten long minutes, he saw her coming down the street. He leaned over and opened the passenger door. Anya was dressed in dark slacks, low-heeled shoes, a summer jacket, a blue blouse. She looked beautiful, even with the stress showing on her face. Anya got in the car and shut the door. She gripped his hand. He felt her vibrating. He looked at her face and touched her cheek where Stepanov had struck her. Your face is red here. Are you all right? It is nothing. He hit me. Thorne touched two ignition wires together. The engine started. He pulled away from the curb. Where are we going? She asked, her voice tight. Away from here, Finland. Thorne remembered her saying she wouldn't leave Russia without her mother. He waited for her objection. She surprised him. Whatever you say. You don't have a problem leaving Russia. You told me before you wouldn't go without your mother. Anya looked out the window. My mother is dead. I'm sorry, I didn't know. She had a heart attack. I'm sorry, Thorne said again. She turned back to him. So you see, there is nothing to keep me here now. What happened? Thorne said. Why did you kill Stepanov? His computer was on. He caught me looking at it. He called me a traitor. Then he knocked me down. That's when I killed him. How? I hit him with a lamp. He had picked up his phone. I would have been arrested. She rummaged in her purse and brought out a gun. I have this, she said. You carry a pistol? No, it was his. It was hanging on a chair and fell on the floor next to me. I thought you might need it. She handed it to him. It was a Grok 9x62mm, standard military issue. The safety is on, she said. Thorne put the pistol in his jacket pocket. Most of us do not carry a weapon every day. Yuri liked to wear it to demonstrate his rank and power. Yuri? Stepanov. He made me call him that. The pig, I'm glad he's dead. Are you sure he's dead? He is very dead. Do you have your phone? Yes. Take off the back then take out the card and break it. She got the back off the phone and broke the card. Tossed the pieces out the window, then the rest of the phone. She did as he asked. The pieces bounced off the pavement. Thorne came to Prechestanka Boulevard and turned left. In a few minutes he reached the ring road that circled Moscow and turned north. It would connect with one of the two highways leading towards St. Petersburg and Estonia. How long do we have before someone finds him? He asked. Not long. Six or seven hours, I don't think more. 
When he doesn't come down, his driver will go up to see why he is late. It could be worse. What was on the computer? A file. I only had time to read the first page. They are going to launch a first strike against your country. His adrenaline spiked. He took a deep breath and looked over at her. You're sure of that? Yes. Too bad you couldn't read the whole thing. She reached into the purse. It was not necessary. She held up a thumb drive. I copied the file before I left. Chapter 68 Most traffic going from Moscow to St. Petersburg used the M11 Expressway, a fast road with a gauntlet of toll booths and cameras. Thorne took the turnoff for the M10 North instead. The M10 was the old route, with only two lanes. It would take longer, but there were no toll booths. When he was on the highway and out of Moscow, Thorne called Jenna again. I'm out of Moscow. Mike, Kramer is disavowing you. Davidson's telling everyone I told you so. Carlson is pissed because you weren't authorized to extract her. He thinks you're probably sleeping with her. You're not sleeping with her, are you? No, Jenna, I'm not sleeping with her. You told them what Opera did? Yes, it didn't make any difference. Davidson doesn't believe her story. He thinks it was some kind of lover's quarrel. I don't believe this. They don't want to help you. They're afraid of creating an international incident. Not to mention that you don't officially exist. Jenna, they're making a mistake playing these political games. They don't have the full story. It's not only about getting us out. The Russians are going to launch a first strike. Opera has proof. Stepanov caught her looking at the plan. That's why she had to kill him. Tell them that. That ought to get them off their asses. Are you serious, a first strike? That's right. When? Thorne turned to Anya. When is this operation supposed to happen? He asked. I don't know. Soon. Requisitions for supplies have been heavy. She doesn't know. She says soon. She says they've been building up supplies. Shit. Exactly. All right, I'll tell them. Someone will find Stepanov in a few hours. I need backup. Call when you have something for me. Thorne broke the connection. You are angry, Anya said. It's nothing. Lights from a Lukoil gas station showed up ahead. He looked at the fuel gauge. We need gas. I need a bathroom, she said. See if they have something to eat while you're inside. Anything will do. We won't stop again until we're close to St. Petersburg. He used a fake credit card to pay for the gas. She came out of the station with a bulging green plastic bag in her hand. He watched her walking toward the car and wanted her. Christ, Thorne, keep your mind on staying alive. She got back in the car, took a snack from the bag, and opened it. What did you get? Thorne asked. They did not have any sandwiches. Try these. Sweet corn sticks. They are very good. He ate one. It was crunchy and vaguely sweet. She opened one of the snacks for herself. Not bad. Did you get something to drink? She pulled out a can of Coca-Cola and opened it for him. He tasted the soda and looked at the can. This is different from what we get at home. Too sweet. He pulled out of the gas station onto the empty highway. Where is your home? She said. I have a house in Virginia about a half hour drive from where I work. It's in the country. You'd like it. You are CIA, no? It was the first time she'd asked who he worked for. That's right. I was taught that CIA is a very bad organization, Anya said. For us, it is your intelligence agencies that are bad. Do you think there is any real difference between ours and yours? I used to think so. Now I'm not so sure. Why did you begin to work for them? They recruited me. That is not an answer. I asked you why. I did two tours in Afghanistan. Civilian life looked pretty tame after that. I figured working for them wouldn't be boring, and I would be helping keep my country safe. Anya nodded. I understand. It is why I joined the military. Thorne watched the pavement unfold in his headlights. It can't have been easy for you, he said. A woman in your army. I do not think it would be easy for a woman in any army. He watched the highway. Anya was silent. He looked over at her. She was staring at the night. Anya, where did you go? His voice startled her. She'd been immersed in a memory. Sorry. I was thinking about when I reported to officer training after the university. The first months were designed to weed out unsuitable candidates. They did not want officers who could not handle the stress. They made my life hell, but you got through it. I do not like to admit it, but they were right to do it that way. I hated it at the time, at least part of it, the part that stripped away my privacy. But I liked the physical part. The challenge, you know. To find out I could do these things I never would have dreamed I could do. I know what you mean. Our training is similar. It shows you what you're made of. He reached over and took her hand. 
When I first saw you, I felt I had known you forever, she said. I never felt like that before. It was a strange feeling. It was the same for me, he said. Do you believe in fate? I don't know, maybe. We Russians believe in fate. We have many words for it. The one I like means destiny. I think you and I have a destiny together. I think we were always meant to meet. I wish we'd met under different circumstances, Thorne said. I do also, but fate isn't like that, is it? No, we will not be able to cross the border, she said. I do not have my passport. Even if I did, traveling with a foreigner will cause great suspicion. We will be stopped. Don't think like that, I'm working on it. I do not think your CIA is happy with you. Why do you say that? The way you were speaking on the phone, they are angry with you. They'll get over it. They have to help us. The information you have is too valuable for them to let you get caught. She looked out the window at the Russian knight rushing past. I had to kill him. I do not like what I have done. The car hit a pothole, the shock jarring and harsh. You didn't have a choice, he said. If you hadn't stopped him, you'd be sitting in a cell right now instead of this comfortable luxury vehicle. Anya laughed. He liked the sound. I am not sorry he's dead. I didn't plan it. I was frightened. I didn't think about it. I hit him with a lamp. It was a very heavy lamp. I hit him on the head as hard as I could. Then I hit him again. It bothers me. If it didn't bother you, I'd be worried about you. He would have had you tortured to find out what you knew. Like your friend Sokolov. Poor Vlas, it is my fault he's dead. No, Anya, it's not. It's their fault, not yours. He knew what he was doing when he helped you. You are so sure of yourself. How do you stay so calm? Don't believe everything you see. I've learned to put things in compartments when I need to. What do you mean? Right now my job is to get us somewhere safe. That's the compartment I'm in doing that. Worrying about getting caught is in a different compartment. You're not afraid. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid. That's in another compartment, the fear. I know what you are saying, Anya said. This is something else we have in common. How so? When I was a child, my father would get drunk. He was an angry, unhappy man. He would yell. He used to hit my mother. My brothers were both younger than I was. I thought I had to protect them from him, and I was very afraid. If I had let my fear control me, I could not have done that. So I pushed it away into another part of me until it was over. That's it, exactly. That's what we have to do now. Plenty of time to think about being afraid after we're safe. His phone buzzed. Carlson. Lewis. Jenna says Opera has the Russian plan for a first strike. Is that true? Yes, it was on Stepanov's computer. She copied it to a USB drive. Thorn. If this turns out to be some bullshit story you made up to cover for her, you'll think Guantanamo is a beach resort compared to where I'm going to send you. You disappoint me, Lewis. Are you the done with the theatrics? Unless you're going to help get the hell off the phone. All I'm saying, this better be the real deal. Lewis, I'm sitting next to someone who has the end of the world in her purse. Don't you think we should figure out how to get it out of her purse and onto the president's desk? There's a safe house outside of Novgorod. It hasn't been used in years. Get there and we'll think of something. He gave Thorne the coordinates. That's a start, Thorne said. Carlson hung up. He doesn't believe me, Anya said. Don't take it personally. It's hard for him to trust anyone. It's not in his nature. He is your boss. You are in trouble. Thorne laughed. That's nothing new with him. This place we are going, we will be safe there. Yes, at least for a while. They came around a long curve in the highway. Militia cars and flashing lights blocked the highway ahead. Thorne felt the hard shape of the gun in his pocket. If they're looking for us, we're screwed. It is probably a random check, Anya said. They happen all the time. Let me do the talking. There was no way to avoid the checkpoint. They'd already been seen. If he turned around and went the other way, they'd be after him in a second. Besides, there was nowhere to go except back to Moscow. Thorne drove up and stopped behind an idling truck, while a man in militia uniform checked the driver's papers. An assault rifle was slung over his shoulder. He handed the papers back and waved the truck on, then signaled Thorne to pull forward and stop. Thorne rolled down his window. The cop came over. Your papers, please. Thorne handed over a Russian passport. The cop looked at it, then at Thorne. Off to the side, two other militiamen watched. Anya took her ID from her purse, waiting. You, he said to Anya, let me see your papers. She held up her ministry ID with her picture on it. I am Colonel Anya Volkova, she said. Perhaps you recognize me? The cop looked at the ID picture, then at her. He straightened. 
Yes, Colonel, I recognize you. Why has this checkpoint been established? We are looking for a suspected terrorist. I am pleased to see your vigilance, Anya said. It is unpleasant but necessary work. Excuse me, Colonel, but where are you going? To Bull Island, you know it? That is where the boarding school facility for female students is located. That is correct. Our future leaders are taught patriotism, social values, and the foundations of motherhood there. Forgive me, Colonel, but why are you traveling so late at night? We are going to conduct a surprise inspection of the facility. I want to arrive early to ensure they have no time to prepare. Sergeant, can I trust your discretion? Of course, Colonel. There have been reports of illicit activities at the school, sexual activities. The guard looked shocked. No, we intend to root out the perpetrators. They will regret betraying their trust. Anya looked at her watch, then at the name tag on his uniform. May we proceed, Sergeant Novotsky? I wish to get there before classes begin. By now, one of the other men had come over and was standing next to the sergeant. Thorne kept quiet. His hand rested on the pistol. May I ask a favor, Colonel? The sergeant said. Could I have your autograph? You are an inspiration for my daughter. Anna smiled at him. Of course, it is my pleasure. She opened her purse and took out a small notebook. Please make it out to Natasha, the sergeant said. Anya wrote a short note and signed it, then handed it over. Novotsky handed Thorne's passport back to him. He stepped away from the car and saluted. You are free to go. Thank you, Colonel, he said. No, thank you, Sergeant. Your vigilance keeps us safe. Thorne put the car in gear and drove away. He watched the rearview mirror until the flashing lights were gone. That was a great performance, he said. He blushed when you hit him with that smile. You do not achieve much in Russia if you don't know how to play a role, she said. Do you want to go to America? Thorne asked. I had not thought about it. Why? Because if you go to Washington, you'll fit right in. Chapter 69 Stepanov's driver was beginning to worry. Usually the general came down promptly at 7, where Genity would be waiting in front of the building. From there they would go to the ministry. It was now ten minutes past the hour, and Stepanov had not yet appeared. The general was never late, perhaps he was ill. Genetti turned off the engine and entered the lobby. He went over to the security guard. You didn't see General Stepanov go out, did you? No, he hasn't left the building, I'm sure of that. He's not down yet, it's not like him. I'm going up to see if he's all right. No problem, I'll keep an eye on the car. Thanks. Genity took the elevator to Stepanov's floor and walked down the hall to his door. He knocked. There was no response. He knocked again harder. General, are you there, sir? Would Stepanov be angry if he tried the door? Genity turned the handle and was surprised when the door opened. General, he called again. God, the stink was terrible in here. Maybe he was in the bathroom. That could explain it. He started down the hall. That was when he saw the body through the open study door. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Two hours later, Colonel Ivanov stood at attention before the desk of his superior, wondering what new indignity was about to be heaped upon him. General Peshkov looked at him with disapproval. You will be pleased to hear that I am canceling your transfer to Novosibirsk. Sir, thank you, sir. Don't thank me yet, Colonel. Do you know why you are so fortunate? No, General. It appears your suspicions regarding Colonel Volkova were correct. Last night she murdered General Stepanov. I was right. Murdered, sir. She killed him, Ivanov. There's no doubt she did it. She's gone, of course. You and Petrov are familiar with her and her background. You are ordered to find her and bring her in. You will have all the resources you need. General Stepanov's apartment has been sealed until you have a chance to examine the crime scene. May I make a suggestion, sir? We should alert the border militia. She may try to leave the country. Do I look like an idiot? That has already been done, Colonel. Any other suggestions? Ivanov knew the answer to that. No, General. Good dismissed. Ivanov turned to leave. Ivanov, do not fail to apprehend her or Novosibirsk will be the least of your worries. Yes, sir. Outside Peshkov's office, Ivanov took a deep breath. Now Volkova would get what she deserved. He would make sure of that. He would bring her in. And if the goods were a little damaged when he delivered them, well, he didn't think anyone would mind. He took out his phone and called Major Petrov. You can stop packing, Major. We have a new assignment. Yes, sir, what has happened? Colonel Volkova killed General Stepanov. It seems our model of patriotic dedication is a traitor after all. She killed Stepanov. You're not hard of hearing, are you, Major? Peshkov has given me whatever I need to catch her. That includes you. 
Where are you now? In my office. I was clearing out my desk. Good. I'll meet you there in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Five minutes later, Ivanov walked into Petrov's office. He felt reborn. Half an hour before, he'd been about to leave for a dead-end job in the Arctic. Now he had a chance to turn everything around. He didn't doubt he'd catch Volkova. Success would bring the resurrection of his career, perhaps even promotion. All in all, it was turning into a good day. Petrov stood as Ivanov came into the room. At ease, Major, sit. Let's think about what our traitor might be doing. Yes, sir. Petrov sat. Ivanov remained on his feet, pacing back and forth. I don't think she will stay in Moscow, sir. No, she can't hide here, not for long. Thanks to the public campaign, everyone knows what she looks like. She'll run. The question is where. She'll have a dacha out in the country. We can check that easily enough. It will be in the registry. It could be under her father's name. Make that your first priority. Petrov made a note on a piece of paper. She'll try to leave the country, escape to the west. Peshkov has already alerted border security. It's the only way she can be safe. That won't be easy, sir. How would she travel? Check departures from the airports, train stations, and bus stations. It's still early in the day. If we're lucky, this can be over quickly. What if she has a car? Something else for you to check. Petrov made another note. Let's assume she's trying to get out of the country, Ivanov said. Where would she go? The obvious choice is Finland. As you said, the obvious choice. Where else? Belarus. She wouldn't need a passport there. That's possible. However, she could easily be captured there. The same applies to Ukraine. We control the border and a good portion of the area beyond. Security is tight. She cannot escape that way. That leaves Finland by way of St. Petersburg or Estonia, Petrov said. Or she could make for Lithuania and get to Poland from there. Or she could try to have somebody take her across the gulf to Finland. All very difficult, Ivanov said. My guess is she'll take the easiest route and try to get through St. Petersburg to Finland. Something occurs to me, sir. We've been talking as if she's traveling alone. What if someone is helping her? Another traitor. If someone is helping her, it will make our job more difficult. We don't know why she killed General Stepanov. Go on. Stepanov had a habit of taking classified material home with him. You'll recall that I reported it. It's against regulations, but no one wanted to challenge the first deputy minister. If she is a spy and he caught her looking at classified material that would explain why she killed him. It seems logical to me, sir. Maybe it was an argument that got out of hand. Watching the videos, it was obvious she didn't enjoy Stepanov's sexual attentions. Maybe he wanted her to do something she didn't like. She was conspiring with the dissident Sokolov, Petrov said. I'm convinced she's a spy. Sir, shouldn't we inspect the crime scene? We might find something to confirm it. Peshkov had the apartment sealed. We'll go take a look. Before we do that, issue the orders to cover what we talked about a few moments ago. Yes, sir. From GRU headquarters to Stepanov's apartment took 40 minutes. Ivanov and Petrov got off the elevator on Stepanov's floor. The militiaman guarding the crime scene took one look at their uniforms and came to attention. Has anyone entered the apartment? Ivanov said. No, Colonel. Has the general's body been moved? No, sir. Everything has been left as it was. Good. Continue to keep everyone out. Sir. They entered the apartment. Petrov held his finger under his nose. What a stink. They walked down the hall to the study. Ivanov took in the scene. Stepanov on the floor, the top of his skull caved in. The blood-stained desk lamp lying next to him. The chair lying on the floor, with Stepanov's uniform jacket crumpled underneath. The gun belt and empty holster. The crusted blood spread out around the body. Why was he in this room? Petrov said. He's wearing a bathrobe. Something got him out of bed and brought him in here. Ivanov stepped around the mess on the floor. He stooped and picked up the polished belt with Stepanov's empty holster. He looked around the room. I don't see his pistol. She must have taken it with her. What was she doing in here? His computer is on. Perhaps she was looking at it. Petrov touched the space bar. The screen lit requesting a password. Do you have level 7 clearance, sir? Working for our organization has certain advantages, Petrov. Ivanov entered a string of characters on the keyboard and the screen cleared. Lots of files, Ivanov said. Let's see. He opened a folder marked Ural. It was an feasibility study for improving the missile defense system for Western Russia. There was nothing particularly secret about it. Ivanov had seen an article in Red Star about it not long ago. What's that one, sir? The one marked Medusa. Ivanov opened the folder. The two men began reading. 
Shit, Petrov said. This might be a good time to visit my mother in the country. Major Petrov, you did not see this, you understand? Yes, sir. Seen what, sir? Unplug the computer. We'll take it with us. Do you think this is why she killed him? Yes, if General Stepanov caught her looking at this, he would have had her arrested. She's a traitor, Petrov said. She should be shot. Don't worry, Ivanov said. She will be, after we question her. Chapter 70 There were no more roadblocks. Red streaks in the sky hinted at the coming dawn as the sky began to lighten with the coming day. They were a little more than 20 kilometers south of Novogorod, the last city before St. Petersburg. Following the GPS, Thorne turned off the main highway and drove into the countryside. It's not far now, Thorne said. They drove through flat farmland, low crops showing green in the fields. Thorne came to a narrow dirt track and turned, following it through the fields until they came to a bleak-looking farmhouse. The land here was untended, choked with weeds. A sagging wooden barn and an outhouse stood behind the house. A rusty well pump with a long handle stuck up out of the ground. Thorne drove to the barn and stopped, got out, pushed the barn door open and got back in the car. He drove into the barn and shut down the car. The floor was dirt, the back piled up with rotting bales of hay next to an old van that looked like it had been there for years. A pile of firewood dusted with ancient cobwebs lay off to one side. They got out. Thorne stretched, felt his joints aching. His old scars ached. Our home away from home. We'll be okay here for a while. They will stop at nothing to find us, Anya said. They're not going to find us. They walked from the barn to the back of the house. The back door was locked, but he'd been told where to find the key. They entered through the kitchen. A thin film of dust covered every surface. Cobwebs decorated the corners of a low-beamed ceiling. The floor was covered with ancient linoleum and scattered with mouse droppings. A battered tea kettle sat on top of a wood-burning stove, next to a square sink of gray concrete. There was a bucket in the sink, but no running water. Thorne remembered the pump in the yard outside. A neat pile of kindling and wood was placed next to the stove. A box of matches and several candles sat on a shelf above. The rest of the house consisted of a front room and a small bedroom. The front door was barred with a plank. The bedroom contained a wooden platform covered with a thin mattress. The front room featured a stone fireplace, a table, and four wooden chairs. A candle stub sat in a puddle of melted wax on the table. A dusty couch with curved legs and faded upholstery had been placed against one wall. Light coming into the room filtered through small windows covered with grime. This is what your CIA calls a safe house, Anya said. At least we're out of sight. It hasn't been used for a while, that's obvious. How long will we stay here? Long enough to figure out how to get across the border. Anya went into the kitchen and began opening cabinets. She found a box of stale tea along with two chipped mugs. There is tea but no food. We still have some snacks in the car. I'm going to call in. He entered Carlson's number. His phone showed a 60% charge. Carlson picked up. About time. What's your situation? We're at the safe house. We were stopped on the M10 but Opera talked us through it. She had to show her ID. They knew who she was because of all the publicity she's gotten. The cop even asked her for her autograph. It helped get us through, but now they know we went this way. The cops will report us. I had to use my Russian ID. You're in the middle of a real shitstorm, Thorn. The Russians have gone ballistic. Security at every border point has been stepped up. The consensus here is that you head for Estonia. Once you get there, we'll pull you out. We're on our own until then. An hour ago, the Federation sealed the border tighter than a Swiss banker's asshole. You know what our situation is over there. They neutralized most of our assets years ago. There's no help to send and no way to get you out. You're going to have to improvise. Christ, Lewis. You need to get that information to us. Right now, I'm looking out a window at an empty beet field. What do you suggest, a carrier pigeon? You can't quit being a smartass, can you? If you'd handled opera differently, we wouldn't be in this mess. You've got a bad habit of blaming the messenger, Lewis. It's not me who's planning to nuke America. Find an internet connection. Send us the info. Carlson broke the connection. Thorne looked at his phone and considered throwing it across the room. Nobody's coming, are they? Anya said. They are not going to help us. They want us to go to Estonia. Once we're there, they'll extract us. He began to pace back and forth past the table where Anya sat on one of the chairs. 
They want me to find an internet connection and send them whatever you've got on that drive. Do you think this attack is imminent? Like tomorrow or the next day? I do not know. There are still critical supplies in transit. I do not think they will launch the attack without them. I don't like to admit it, but Lewis is right. We need to get your information to him. The closest internet connection will be in Novgorod. You cannot use your phone to send this information. No, I don't have an interface for the drive. Novgorod is too big a risk, Anya said. They know we are on the road going north. They will be watching everywhere. Even if you find a connection, the internet is controlled. There is an international firewall. They will suspect I have classified information. By now they have shut down all traffic out of the country. If you try, you will be arrested. You should believe me about this. You're a real optimist, aren't you? She shrugged. I am Russian. Are you familiar with Estonia? I have not been there. Estonia is considered a problem since they joined NATO. Travel there is not encouraged for people like me. So you know nothing about the border? No. Great. He took out his phone. What are you doing? I'm looking for a map. I want to see roads to the border. He didn't like what the map showed him. There was only one road leading to Estonia, beginning on the other side of Novgorod and leading to the city of Pskov. Past Pskov, it continued on to the border. The GPS showed a few gray lines that might be passable dirt roads. All but one of those petered out in the middle of nowhere. That one crossed through farmland, more or less parallel to the highway to Pskov, heading west toward Estonia. It stopped somewhere near the border. Thorne considered what he'd do if he were the Russians. He'd place militia at every major intersection that could lead to the west. The turnoff to Pskov and Estonia was a natural place to set up a roadblock. They couldn't risk going that way. Hell, they couldn't risk staying on the highway. Stepanov's body hadn't been found when they'd passed the checkpoint on the M10, but the next time they weren't going to talk their way through. Breaking through a roadblock guarded by soldiers armed with automatic weapons was not an option. I will make tea, Anya said. She handed him the tea kettle. Bring me some water, please. Fill the bucket. He went outside to the well pump and tried the handle. It was rusted in place. He pushed hard and broke it free. The pump creaked and scraped as he worked the handle up and down. After a while, he was rewarded with a gush of brown water. He kept pumping until the water ran clear, then filled the kettle and the bucket. Thorn looked at the sky, where dark clouds were piling up in the north. Lightning flickered in the distance, followed seconds later by a distant rumble. The air felt leaden and smelled of rain. The effort of pumping the water had darkened his shirt with sweat. Back in the kitchen, Anya had started a fire in the wood stove. She took the kettle and set it on top of the stove. Looks like weather moving in, he said. There can be storms this time of year, sometimes a lot of rain. That might help. Makes it harder to look for us. Tell me the truth, she said. Do you really think we can get to Estonia? He looked at her. Her green eyes were fierce, intent. Tell me the truth, she said again. I don't know. It could be as easy as driving to the border on a back road and walking across. Best thing is to think we'll make it. We'll adapt to the situation as it changes. I'm good at improvising. It could be worse. She nodded. A few minutes later, they sat at the table drinking the tea. It was bitter, but it was hot. After the first sip, Thorn realized how tired he was. He looked over at Anya. There were deep shadows under her eyes. What is the plan? She said. We need sleep. We'll leave tonight after it gets dark. It's better if we move at night. What if there is a roadblock? They'll concentrate on the highways and the border, but they can't be everywhere. My phone shows a track a few kilometers north of here before Novgorod. It will get us close to the border. And then? Then we walk. We'll deal with it when we get there. He set his cup down on the table. You were an officer in your country's military? She asked. Yes, a captain. She smiled at him. It made him happy to see her smile. I outrank you. That means you must answer my questions. He laughed. You said before that you became a CIA spy because you wanted to help keep your country safe. That's right. I love my country. I hate what they are doing to it. I want you to understand that this is why I have betrayed my oath. I don't think you betrayed your oath, Anya. If it's anything like the one I took, you swore to defend your country and its leaders. Yes, that is so. That oath goes two ways. Your leaders are supposed to do what's best for the country, not push it into a war that guarantees its destruction. No matter what they think, they cannot prevent defeat if they attack. They're the ones who have broken the oath, not you. 
Keeping the oath means doing what is right for the country, not what you are told to do. You're doing the right thing. You are very good with words. She yawned, covering her mouth. We have to rest, Thorne said. You take the bed, I'll sleep on the couch. The couch is too small, she said. The bed is big enough for both of us, I think. Are you sure? You are afraid to share a bed with me, American? Michael, my name is Michael. You are afraid to share a bed with me, Michael. No, it's just... Don't worry, she said. I'm not going to seduce you. Besides, you are very tired. It would be a waste of time. Now wait a minute, he said. She laughed. You should see your face. Anya got up and went into the bedroom. Thorn followed her in. She lay down on the mattress. It is not too bad. She patted the mattress next to her. A puff of dust rose into the air. Come. He lay down next to her. There was enough room for the two of them, not enough for space between. He could feel her heat against him. She turned and put her arm across his chest. I am frightened, she said. I don't want to die. Her breath smelled of tea. I know. My father was senior officer in SVR. Sometimes he would be home drinking with his friends. They were cruel men like him. They talked about people they arrested, what they had done to make them confess. They laughed about things I do not wish to remember, terrible things. I know what they do to traitors. I know what will happen to me if I'm caught. You're not a traitor, Anya. In their eyes, I am. We're not going to get caught. Yes, but if we are, you must promise me something. Promise you will not let them take me alive. Anya, you have the gun. Promise. He looked at her. Promise. All right, I promise. You must mean it, Michael. I promise. If it comes down to it, I won't let them take you. Do you have a woman back in America? Not exactly. Not exactly. What does that mean? There's a woman I work with. I like her a lot. She's a friend. Sometimes we're together. Mostly we're not. You are not married? I was once. It didn't last. No, I'm not married. While they were talking, it had grown dark. A sudden glare of lightning lit the room, followed by a clap of thunder that shook the house. Rain began drumming on the roof. She reached over and touched his face. Remember, you promised not to let them take me. I won't let them take you, he said. She was quiet for a minute. Michael. What? I want you to make love to me. He started to say something. She put her finger on his lips. Tomorrow we may be dead. Do not talk. She kissed him. Anya. Shh. Then there was no point in talking. Chapter 71 DDCIA Davidson was feeling good. He'd been proven right about Thorne, hadn't he? The Russia operation had turned into a major disaster. Thorne had gone against orders. He was in the wind with opera, playing knight in shining armor to her damsel in distress. Davidson didn't believe for one moment that opera had stolen the secret war plan of the Russian high command. He didn't believe Moscow was planning a first strike. Tarasov wasn't that crazy. Sure, the blockade must be annoying the hell out of him, but everyone knew you got around these things through negotiation and backdoor diplomacy. No one in their right mind would start an all-out nuclear war. The Russian generals were professionals. They weren't going to risk turning their beloved motherland into something that glowed in the dark. Thorn was probably sleeping with opera and following his hormones. It was late. Davidson put the files he'd been working on into the wall safe, closed the door and spun the combination. He closed the door to the inner office, walked past his assistant's desk, stepped into the deserted hallway and headed for the express elevator that would take him to the underground garage reserved for Langley's chiefs. He was halfway to his car before he realized he'd left the keys in his desk. He turned and got back on the elevator. Back on the seventh floor, he entered the combination for the hall door and went in. The door to the inner office was open, the one he'd left closed. Davidson's shoes made no sound as he crossed the soft carpet. Ed Bradford was bent over Davidson's desk, his back turned toward the door. He hadn't heard Davidson come in. The wall safe stood open. A file lay open on the desk. Bradford was taking pictures of it with his phone. Shit, he's the fucking mole. Davidson backed quietly away. He stepped out into the hall and closed the door. Then he called security. This is Deputy Director Davidson, he said. COO Bradford is currently in my office. Get up here now and arrest him. Secure his phone. Sir, did I hear you correctly? You want us to arrest him? You got it. Put him on ice. No contact. He's to have no visitors, no calls, no communication with the outside world. Understood? Yes, sir. Davidson disconnected. He had to call Kramer. She wasn't going to like what he had to say. Kramer picked up. 
She sounded annoyed. What is it, Scott? I'm about to go out. The mole is Bradford. He's in my office right now, photographing a classified file. I've alerted security. The elevator opened and two armed guards stepped out. Security is here. He's not going anywhere. Call Olmsted and Carlson, meeting in my office one hour. Kramer disconnected. Thinking about it, Davidson realized there had been signs something was off with Bradford. He'd caught him once before in the inner office when he shouldn't have been there. Bradford had asked about an operation that really wasn't his concern. In hindsight, Davidson knew he should have reported it. But at the time, it had seemed innocent enough. How did Bradford get the combination to the safe? With a sinking feeling, Davidson remembered opening it when Bradford was in the room. He could have been close enough to see the sequence of numbers. It was a security lapse that might come back and bite him. Well, there was no proof he'd been lax. If Bradford tried to implicate him, he'd deny it. It would be Bradford's word against his. Who were they going to believe? A traitor? Davidson didn't think so. In fact, he ought to come out of this looking pretty good. After all, he'd caught the mole. Feeling things were under control, he made the calls to Carlson and Olmsted. Chapter 72 It was late in the afternoon of the same day Stepanov's body had been found. Colonel Ivanov caught an unpleasant hint of his own sour sweat as he paced back and forth in his office. Outside, the light was almost gone from the sky. Volkova had not been found. He didn't want to contemplate what would happen to him if she managed to escape. The last sighting of her had been at a checkpoint on the M10 in the early morning. She'd been riding in a white Lada. A white Lada had been reported stolen in the vicinity of the Metropole Hotel. The license number matched the car that had passed through the checkpoint with Volkova. There'd been a man with her. He'd shown a Russian passport in the name of Alexei Barishnikov. The passport was counterfeit and had been flagged. Whoever he was, if he tried to use it again, he'd be arrested. They weren't going to get far. The border was sealed. Roadblocks had gone up everywhere. A description of the car and occupants had been relayed to the militia. Ivanov reminded himself that she couldn't escape. So where the hell was she? Volkova had gone north, ruling out Belarus and the Ukraine as her destination. As Ivanov had suspected, she was making for Finland or one of the Baltic states. There hadn't been enough time for her to get out of the country. It bothered him that she hadn't been caught yet. She and her companion must have stopped somewhere. She was hiding, but where? Ivanov considered the options. The checkpoint she'd passed had been north of Tver. The next town of any size between there and St. Petersburg was Novgorod. Roadblocks had been set up before she could have reached Novgorod. That meant she was somewhere south of there. What would he do in her situation? The smart thing would be to lay low during the day and try to escape at night. It would be dark in less than half an hour. By morning she could be gone, and his career would be down the toilet. Major Petrov came into the room. He was excited. Sir, we have a hit on the car. A satellite picked it up on the other side of Tver. It turned off the M10. At last. Excellent. Where did it go? East on a secondary road south of Novgorod. Then it turned onto a dirt track. There's nothing at the end of the track except an old farmhouse. I checked the registry. It's been unoccupied for years, but the taxes are current. Is the car visible there? No, sir, but there is a barn. They probably put it inside. Alert the militia in Novgorod. Tell them to send a team. Remember to tell them I want her alive. Yes, sir. Ivanov had anticipated needing to move after his quarry. General Peshkov had given him everything he'd asked for. A helicopter was standing by. We're going north, Major. You can call the militia on the way. Yes, Colonel. I'm coming, Volkova. You will learn what happens to traitors. A car was waiting for them outside headquarters. The two men left for the helicopter. With a little luck, this would be over soon. Chapter 73 Thorne was in the barn, looking at the van parked in the back. He had to assume that the militia would be looking for the stolen car. If he could get the vehicle running, they could abandon the Lada. The van was a UAZ-452, a vehicle found all over Russia. It was painted army green. The windows were covered with dust and grime. The designers hadn't bothered much with styling. It looked like a loaf of bread stuck on top of four wheels. He walked around the truck inspecting it. The tires still held air and had tread. He opened the door to the cab and climbed in. The engine was mounted between the front seats. The keys were in the ignition. It was supposed to be a safe house. Maybe the truck was more than a prop. 
Anya stood nearby. Do you think it will run? I don't know. They'll be looking for the car. If I can get this started, we'll take it instead. He turned the key. Nothing happened. The battery's dead, that figures. He looked around the unfamiliar cab, searching for a hood release. He found it, pulled, and was rewarded with a metallic clunk. Thorn got out and propped the hood open. The battery was mounted near the right fender. He went around to the back and opened the door, hoping for tools or cables. There was nothing, not even a spare or a jack. The interior of the truck was empty. Anya went to the Lada and opened the trunk. She came back with a set of jumper cables in her hand. Will these help? Anya said. They were in the trunk of the car. Good. Yes, they'll help. He pried off the covers on the van's battery. The cells are dry. I'll need water. Can you fill up the tea kettle? I'll get it. A few moments later, she returned with the water. He filled the cells and replaced the covers. It might work. It might not. Bring the car up close, he said. Leave the engine running and open the hood. While Anya started the car, he hooked up the cables to the dead battery. She drove the car up close, got out, and propped open the hood. Thorne connected the cables to the Lada, then got back into the cab of the truck. This time when he turned the key, the instruments came alive. The fuel gauge showed half full. He turned the key off and got out. Now we wait to see if the battery will take a charge. If it doesn't, I'll pull the one from the car. It's smaller, but it should work. Is there fuel? The gauge read half a tank. Let's hope it's still good. It is time to give you this, Anya said. She took out the drive with the file she'd downloaded from Stepanov's computer. It's safe with you. Keep it. No, Michael, you must take it. It is better. He took it from her outstretched hand and looked down at it. Such a small thing, he said. Small? To hold the key to peace or war. What will your government do with it? I think they'll tell Tarasov they know what he's doing and warn him to back off. Without the element of surprise, he can't win. He'll call off the attack. What if he doesn't? It would mean war. Then nobody wins. But I don't think he's that stupid. Tarasov is not stupid, but it is a mistake to assume he will call it off. Why do you say that? Tarasov believes. What do you mean, believes in what? He's still a dedicated communist, a true believer. Before everything fell apart, Tarasov was an important man on the Central Control Commission. In time, he would probably have become a member of the Politburo. He has never gotten over the loss of our prestige. He hates America. He sees your country as the obstacle that keeps Russia from claiming her rightful place in the world. This is his chance to destroy you, and it will only come once. He can't really believe he'd get away with it. Anya shrugged. He's a gambler. All gamblers are sure they are going to win. It's their nature. War isn't a game of cards or a horse race. No, it is more like chess. Tarasov understands how the game is played in the real world. Syria is a good example of what I'm talking about. He gambled that your president would do nothing to stop him. He was right. Yes, but now he has to deal with the blockade. That is a counter move by his opponent. If this is like chess, your president has put Tarasov in check. Tarasov has only two options. He must attack or concede. If he concedes, he loses. It is not in his nature. I hope you're wrong. I want to be wrong. She reached up and touched his cheek. I want time to be with you. I want that too. He felt something surface within. Unexpected. Unbidden. It seemed to come from every cell in his body, a feeling impossible to resist. The words were on his lips before he had time to think about them. I love you, he said. He looked into her eyes and knew it was true. I love you too, Anya said. They wrapped their arms around each other. He could feel her heart beating against his. For a moment, the outer world didn't matter. Then he thought about where they were. We have to get going. I know. Let's see if the truck will start. Thorn climbed into the cab and turned the key. The starter made a grinding sound. He pumped the gas pedal and tried again. The engine turned and coughed, backfired and caught. A cloud of black smoke erupted from the tailpipe. He left the motor running, got out, detached the jumper cables. He closed the hood. Anya pushed the barn door open. It was now full dark. The rain had stopped. Thick clouds hid the moon and stars. He drove the van out of the barn. The night air smelled of rain and wet earth. As soon as she got in, he let out the clutch and drove away. The track was wet and muddy from the storm. He came to the paved secondary road and turned toward the M10. The van ran well enough, except for an occasional stutter from the engine. They reached the main highway and turned right toward Novgorod. 
They'd only been driving for a few minutes when a convoy of militia cars roared by in the other direction. You think they are looking for us? Who else? He watched the taillights disappear in his mirror. When will we turn? She asked. The phone with the GPS lay next to him. He glanced at it. In about two clicks. Clicks. Kilometers. The lights on the van were dim. The dirt road he wanted was little more than an overgrown track, and he almost missed the turn. He turned off the pavement and shifted down to a lower gear. How far are we from the border? Something over a hundred kilometers. It's going to take a while. Too bad we don't have a radio. We can sing to pass the time, she said. He looked at her, surprised. Every cop in Russia is looking for us and you want to sing? Why not? He laughed. You don't want to hear me sing. Besides, I don't know any songs. Then I will sing a song. It is a very popular song here, very old. What's it about? It is about a girl who is in love, but her father forbids her from seeing him. Sounds familiar. It is sad, but very beautiful. She began to sing. Her voice was clear. Thorn listened and thought about her. She knew what was waiting if they were caught. She would be tortured. When her captors were convinced she had nothing left to tell them, she would find herself kneeling on the stones of some hidden courtyard, waiting for a bullet to the back of her head. Yet here she was, singing. Their lovemaking had been beyond intense, more than physical. They had connected. It was as if they had always been lovers. It wasn't about the sex. The sex was only part of it. He had never felt like that with anyone. Not Ashley, not Jenna, not anyone. It was an unfamiliar feeling and he wanted to hold on to it. Thinking of Jenna brought a stab of guilt. He cared for Jenna, a lot. He had no obligation toward her. They hadn't made any commitments to each other. Even so, it felt like a betrayal. He pushed the feeling of guilt aside. He'd had a lot of practice with pushing aside things he didn't want to feel. They had been driving for several hours over the rutted track. The headlights were getting dim. The needle on the gas gauge was close to empty. It is getting hard to see the road, Anya said. The battery is failing. We're losing the lights. Not long after that, the lights faded out. He stopped and let the engine idle. It would keep running unless he turned it off. It was impossible to see what lay ahead in the black of the night. This isn't good. I will walk in front of the truck, Anya said. You can follow me. You think you can see where you're going? I don't know. Let me try. She got out and went to the front. He could just make out her shape. I can make out the road, she called. Can you see me okay? Yes, but don't get too far ahead. I will begin walking now. She took a hesitant step, then another. He peered through the darkness at her shape and put his foot on the clutch. The gears ground together and the truck started creeping along the track. Within minutes, his eyes were watering from the strain of trying to see in the dark. He squinted and gripped the wheel, one foot touching the brake, the other ready to go for the clutch. A burning ache started across his shoulders. Anya gave a sudden cry and disappeared. He slammed on the brakes, shifted into neutral, pulled on the emergency brake and jumped out of the cab. Anya, where are you? Here. Her voice came from somewhere in front of him. Be careful, she called. The road is washed away. Help me get out. He found her, grabbed her hands and pulled her out. She steadied herself with a hand on his shoulder. Close up. The washout was a deep, dark slash across the road. Are you all right? I twisted my ankle a little. The truck engine sputtered, coughed, and died. Can you walk? Anya put weight on her ankle. She winced, took a few steps. I will be okay. The truck is dead, Thorne said. It wouldn't get past this anyway. It's too deep. So we walk? We walk. How far is it to the border? Not too far, ten or fifteen clicks. He looked at the sky. The clouds were breaking up. A few stars were visible. It will be dawn in a couple of hours. Then we had better start, she said. She held onto his arm and they began walking toward Estonia and safety. Chapter 74 Nobody was smiling in Kramer's office. Bradford had been in custody for over a day. He'd refused to say anything. He's not talking, Carlson said. The only thing he said is that he wants a lawyer. Have you explained to him that he's being charged under the Patriot Act? Kramer asked. He must know he's forfeited his right to an attorney. Yes. I told him he was asking for a one-way ticket to Guantanamo or Romania. It didn't make any difference. He sat there and smirked. That little shit, I can't believe he's got that much guts, Davidson said. I don't think he understands, Director, Jenna said. He may think rendition is an idle threat. He's about to find out that it isn't, Kramer said. 
Lewis, arrange for him to be taken to the facility run by our Romanian friends. Are you sure? We have to find out how much damage he's done. Give him one more chance to come clean. If he refuses, get him on a plane today. Keep me posted on the interrogation. How far can they go? Carlson asked. As far as is necessary. They're authorized to use extreme measures. Make sure Bradford knows what's in store for him if he refuses to cooperate. It might shake him loose. Jenna started to object, then realized it would do no good. By questioning Kramer's decision, she'd accomplish nothing. This wasn't a battle she could win. I'll take care of it as soon as we're done with this meeting, Carlson said. If the media gets wind of this, it will create a real problem, Davidson said. Then we'd better make sure they don't find out. It took years for the agency to recover after the last time we had a mole. We need to keep a lid on this. How did this happen? Jenna said. Why didn't we see something was wrong? We missed all the signs. Not all of them, Davidson said. We figured out there was a mole, didn't we? When we started looking, we never looked at Bradford. If you hadn't forgotten your keys and gone back to your office, we still wouldn't know who it was. We didn't have any reason to suspect him, Carlson said. He's never given any indications he was disloyal. Hell, his clearance is as high as mine. Jenna, I want you digging into his life, Kramer said. See if you can find something that tells us why he turned. See if there's anything we can use to put pressure on him. I'll start with his finances. If he was being paid, there's a record somewhere. Look for a woman, Carlson said. Maybe he's got some little honey on the side. Of course you would think of that, Jenna said. He's right, Jenna, Kramer said. The opposition might have used a woman to get to him. Honey traps are as old as espionage. You can find them in the Bible. Don't worry, this man will have no secrets by the time I'm done looking at him. We can assume the recent string of failed operations is due to Bradford, Kramer said. The question is, who was running him? Based on the ops that went wrong, I'm leaning toward the Russians, Carlson said. I agree, Jenna said. It's also possible he's responsible for what happened with Opera, Davidson snorted. You may not like Thorne, Jenna said, but maybe you should wait until we've managed to extract them before you dismiss her story out of hand. I'll believe it when I see it, Davidson said. Where is Thorne now? Kramer asked. The last time I talked to him, he was at an old safe house of ours near Novgorod. I told him to get to Estonia for extraction, Carlson said. I haven't heard from him since. Do we have real-time satellite coverage of the location? It depends on the time, Jenna said. She looked at her watch. Yes, we should have a satellite over the area now. Bring it up on the monitor. I'll do it, Jenna said. She got up and went to a big screen monitor mounted on the wall of Kramer's office. A panel beneath controlled the display. From this room, whoever sat in the director's chair at Langley could access any one of dozens of satellites in orbit around the globe. Jenna called up the menu and selected a satellite over Western Russia. She entered the coordinates for the safe house. The image came up on the screen. In Russia, it was early morning. The sun had cracked the horizon. Who the hell are those guys? Carlson said. Vehicles were parked in front of the house where Thorne was supposed to be hiding with opera. A helicopter sat in a dirt field nearby. Armed men in uniform moved in and out of the building. Jenna zoomed in on a man smoking outside the building. She focused on his insignia. A colonel, GRU. If Thorne and Opera were there, they've been arrested. The man looked up almost as if he could sense the satellite watching from far above. Jenna focused on his face. That's not the look of someone who's pleased with himself. Thorne probably left before they got there, Carlson said. He's got a sixth sense for these things. It's spooky. If those troops are looking for opera, she must have something they want. Like the Russian war plan, Jenna said. Davidson rolled his eyes. She killed her boss, remember? They're looking for a murderer. Jenna, can you track Thorne's phone? Kramer said. He turned the tracking feature off. It makes sense. If I were him, I'd be worried about the mole blowing my cover. We had no certain proof there was a mole before he left, Davidson said. Well, Scott, Lewis said. He did try to tell us, didn't he? As I recall, you didn't want to hear it. That's not how I remember it, Carlson. The way your memory works, you'd make a good politician. Who the hell do you think you are talking to me like that? That's enough, Kramer said. Lewis, get Bradford on the way to Romania. Jenna, contact Thorne. Find out where he is and what he's doing. Tell them we've caught the mole. Tell him to turn on his damn tracker. Scott, go through everything Bradford could have seen in your safe. See if you can get a handle on operations he's compromised. She paused. Any questions, then get on it. 
Chapter 75 Colonel Ivanov stood in the yard in front of the house, smoking. He'd spent an uncomfortable night waiting for word Volkova had been arrested. There had been no word. He dropped his cigarette and crushed it under his heel. They'd found the stolen car inside the barn. Tire tracks from another vehicle led away from the farmhouse. The militia had been alerted to look for a truck or a van instead of the white Lada. It didn't matter what Volkova and her companion were driving. There was nowhere they could go without running into a checkpoint. The sun had broken the horizon. The storm from the previous day had moved on. The sky was clear except for a few lingering clouds. Ivanov took off his cap and rubbed his forehead. He looked up at the sky, trying to push away the headache building at the back of his skull. Where were they? By now they should have been stopped. They must have left the highway. But where would they go? They'd never make it to Finland. They had to be headed for Estonia. The border was a little over a hundred kilometers from where he stood. There was only one paved road to Estonia, and Ivanov knew they hadn't gone that way. If they had, they would now be in custody. That meant they had left the highway and gone overland, through the fields. They'd have to drive slowly. There might still be time to catch them before they reached the border. If he didn't catch them, he'd be spending whatever was left of his career in the Arctic. Petrov came out of the house. We found nothing inside, sir. Only dirty cups. It looks like they made tea. I don't give a shit about their tea. Where do you think they are? Ivanov looked out over the dark earth stretching away into the distance. This was beet country. There weren't many houses and there weren't any roads. Only rough tracks for farm equipment and animals. Ivanov gestured in the direction of Estonia. Somewhere out there in those fields. Now that it's light, we'll take the helicopter, get the pilot. Fifteen minutes later, they were in the air. All three men wore headsets that blocked out some of the engine noise and allowed them to talk with each other. Follow the highway north, Ivanov said to the pilot. Keep low. We're looking for where they could have turned off into the fields. Yes, Colonel. A few minutes later, Petrov pointed down at the road passing below. There, Colonel, see that? The helicopter was already past the spot. Turn back, Ivanov said. The chopper banked and headed back. Down there, Petrov said. A muddy track below was wide enough for a truck. It showed fresh tire tracks. Follow it, Ivanov said. They started along the track, flying a hundred feet above the ground. Thirty minutes later, they saw a green van, stopped where a jagged scar cut across the track. That has to be them. They couldn't get across the washout, Petrov said. They're on foot. We'll get them now, Ivanov said. He tapped the pilot on his shoulder. Faster. They sped toward Estonia. Chapter 76 Anya's ankle was swollen from the fall. She held onto Thorne's shoulder as they walked. He had his arm around her waist, supporting her. The injury had slowed them down. The sun was up. For the last ten minutes, they'd been crossing rough ground. Ahead, a forest of birch trees shimmered in the morning light. See those trees? Thorne said. That's the border. We're almost there. I hear a helicopter, she said. They looked back the way they'd come. In the distance, a helicopter was coming in fast, headed straight for them. Inside the aircraft, Petrov pointed. There they are. Buzz them, Ivanov said. The pilot brought the helicopter low and flew over the fleeing figures on the ground. Then he hovered over them. The wind from the rotors beat them down, throwing up bits of dirt and rock. Thorn and Anya went flat to the ground. Set us down, Ivanov said. We'll get out. They'll make for the trees. As soon as we're out, go up again and block them. Yes, sir the pilot said. When the helicopter banked away, Thorn and Anya got up and moved as fast as they could toward the trees, Anya hobbling while Thorn half carried her. Ahead was a white stone marker. The border. They are landing, Anya said. That's a mistake. Thorn took out Stepanov's pistol. He'd checked the magazine. It was full with 17 rounds. He clicked off the safety. Anya looked back. Two men got out of the helicopter. It's Ivanov. Petrov too, bastards. The helicopter lifted off. Ivanov shouted something at them. They couldn't hear him against the sound of the rotors. Keep going, Thorne said. The helicopter flew past and turned back toward them. Thorne raised the pistol and aimed at the air intake under the whirling blades. He fired as the aircraft dove toward them. Three rounds glanced off the side of the engine housing in a shower of sparks. Two disappeared into the open maw of the engine. The results were immediate and spectacular. The turbine came apart in a tortured screech of metal. The housing shattered. The rotor shaft snapped, sending the blades whirling through the air. 
The helicopter dropped straight down, slammed into the ground, and exploded in a fireball. The shockwave knocked them down. One of the blades scythed into the earth in front of Anya's face and ricocheted away. Thorn hauled Anya to her feet. Ivanov and Petrov began shooting. Thorn felt the breeze as a bullet passed close by. He turned and fired several shots. Petrov pitched face down onto the hard earth. Bright flashes came from Ivanov's pistol. Anya cried out and stumbled to the ground. Thorn fired again. The unfamiliar pistol hardened his hand as the slide racked back and forth. He kept firing until the pistol was empty. Ivanov dropped his gun. He clutched his stomach and toppled face forward. He didn't get up. Thorn turned to Anya. She lay on her back breathing fast. Bright blood streamed from a wound under her right breast. Black smoke from the burning helicopter rolled over them, setting him coughing. His eyes stung. He knelt by her. She struggled for breath. Michael, it hurts. I know, don't move. Stop the bleeding. He pulled off his shirt, folded it, pressed it against the wound. He took her hands and placed them on the makeshift bandage. It was turning red. You have to hold this tight, press hard, can you do that? Yes. Her voice was weak. She looked pale. Her eyes fluttered. Anya. Yes. Stay awake, you've got to stay awake. I'm going to pick you up and carry you across the border. It will hurt. She didn't answer. He picked her up. She cried out in pain. Press with your hands, don't let go. He was pumped with adrenaline. She didn't seem heavy. He ran toward the trees past the border marker into Estonia. He set her down in a grassy clearing among the birches. Anya. She didn't answer. Her eyes were closed. The bandage was soaked red with her blood. Anya. He pinched her cheek. Stay with me, open your eyes. Her eyes came open. She was looking up through a circle of branches at blue sky. Her skin was pale, the color drained away. He pulled out his phone and called Jenna. Come on, answer. Mike, where are you? Estonia, right over the border. I need medevac now. Opera is with me. She's been shot. Turn on your GPS. Thorn fumbled with the phone and activated the GPS. Okay, I've got you, Jenna said. Hurry. He dropped the phone and turned to Anya. My guardian angel, she said. Help is coming, he said. They'll be here soon. I love my country, she said. Her voice was weak. He had to bend down to hear her. Promise me, you will tell them. You'll tell them yourself. Promise. I promise. She coughed. Blood trickled from her mouth. I'm tired. Hard to breathe. Don't try to talk. Stay with me. Fight it. She coughed more blood. Easy, he said. His hand trembled as he gently wiped blood from her lips. He placed his hand over hers where they pressed down on the bloody bandage. Her skin felt ice cold. Fear bloomed in his chest. You have to hold on, he said. A helicopter is coming. I'll get you to a hospital. I'm frightened. I know it's all right. You'll be all right. Michael, I can't see you. She was looking right at him. A fist closed around his heart. I'm right here, Anya. I'm here. I love you. You, we might have. She let out a long sigh. Her chest stopped moving. Her eyes were open, but the light was gone. Nothing was going to bring her back. He reached out and closed her eyes. His face was wet with tears as he picked up his phone. Chapter 77. Thorne sent the files Anya had copied to Langley over a secure link from the CIA station in Tallinn. There was no sleep for him on the long journey back to Washington. By the time the plane landed, he was exhausted. Jenna met him at the gate. Hey, she said. Jenna. Oh, Mike, you look like something out of a zombie movie. I'm going to take a hot shower and sleep for about a week. I know, but you can't. Not yet. Kramer wants to debrief you. We're going to Langley now. What a crock of shit. Sorry. Don't be. It's not your fault. The files you sent? What about them? It's what Opera said it was. A plan for a first strike scenario. I told you she was the real deal. What happened at the border? They came after us. They shot her. I killed them. Thorne closed his eyes. There was no more talk until they reached Langley. They rode up to the seventh floor and went into Kramer's office. Carlson was there and Davidson. Kramer was behind her desk. They looked at him as he came into the room. Thorne, she said, take a seat. Michael, Carlson said. Lewis, Thorne sat. We received the files, Kramer said. Tell us what happened. Start from the time you picked up opera in Moscow. This is bullshit, Thorne said. You know what happened. We don't need to do this now. Watch your mouth, Thorne, Davidson said. You're talking to the director. Fuck you, Davidson. I know who I'm talking to. 
Let me guess why I'm here. The Russians are making a stink and you're looking for a way to cover your ass. Mike, Jenna said. No one's blaming you for anything. We know you're tired, but a lot of things are happening right now. Most of them are not good. The sooner you brief us, the sooner you can go home. Come on, Thorne, Davidson said. Tell us what happened. Scott, enough, Kramer said. Thorne, how did it start? Mike, Jenna said. He sighed. All right, we were supposed to meet the next day. Who, Kramer said, you and Opera? Yes, I was already in Moscow at the hotel. She called me and told me she needed help. She said she'd killed Stepanov and that she was in his apartment. She didn't know what to do. I told her to stay where she was and I'd come get her. It was the only option. Did she tell you she'd accessed files on his computer? Davidson said. Not until later. You screwed up, Thorne, Davidson said. You were specifically told not to extract her if there was trouble. Thorne looked at him. Davidson flinched. Am I missing something here? She had the Russian plan for a sneak attack. If I hadn't acted as I did, we wouldn't have that information. You didn't know she had it. It hasn't been verified. You disobeyed orders. She gave her life to get it to us. What makes you think it isn't true? It could be disinformation meant to confuse us. Why are you such an asshole, Davidson? Were you born that way or did you have to work at it? Davidson flushed, a deep red. You can't. Kramer held up her hand. Scott, save it. Thorne, tell us what happened after she called you. I needed transportation. I knew the FSB would track vehicle rentals, so I boosted a car. Then I picked her up. You stole a car. That's right. Then what? Then we headed north and I called Lewis. Thorne told them about reaching the safe house. He took them through everything that had happened, up to the point where the helicopter came after them. We saw the wreckage of the helicopter on the satellite, Kramer said. How did you bring it down? I used Stepanov's pistol. Anya brought it with her. You shot down a helicopter with a pistol. I shot at the engine. I got lucky. How did Opera die? We were making for the border. There was this GRU colonel and a major who had been hounding her. They got out of the helicopter and started shooting at us. That's when she got hit. The Russians are making a lot of trouble over this, Kramer said. They put two and two together and figured out who you were. They say you helped a murderer escape justice and killed three of their officers. They're demanding we turn you over for prosecution in the Federation. Of course they're going to say that. Do you think they're going to admit that the woman they'd turned into the face of their military stole their plan to attack us? She was a traitor, Thorne, Davidson said. No, she wasn't. She was a patriot. She loved her country. I don't expect someone like you to understand that concept. Thorne, until we can verify the information on that drive, you are not to go anywhere, Kramer said. Stay close to home. Don't leave the country. Is that clear? Thorne shook his head in disgust. I don't believe you people. He stood and headed for the door. Where do you think you're going? Davidson said. We're not finished. Thorne turned and looked at Davidson. Jenna saw the look on his face. She held up her hand and half rose from her chair. Mike, don't do it. Thorne's face was dark with anger. He took a deep breath, turned, and left the room. The door closed behind him. Jenna caught up to him in the hall as he waited for the elevator. Where are you going? Home. How are you going to get there? I'll call a cab. I'll drive you. The elevator came and they got on. Jenna pressed the button for the garage. Jenna, you should get away from me. I'm toxic. They'll use it against you. Don't worry about me. Worry about yourself. You didn't do yourself any favors walking out of there. If I'd had to listen to any more of Davidson's crap, I would have hit him. I saw that. He's a jerk. We both know it. I was going to hurt him, he said. A few minutes later, they were on the road to his house. Mike. What? You want to tell me about her? I can see it bothers you. No. Is it that obvious? This is me, remember? They don't know who you are, but I do. I'm not sure what to say. When you're sure, will you tell me? Yeah, I will. Chapter 78 President Campbell was meeting with the Joint Chiefs and his advisors in the Situation Room in the basement of the West Wing. Before the meeting, he'd gone into the bathroom to throw up. The decisions he made today might bring peace, or they might bring the end of civilization. It's not easy for someone who desires peace to meet an existential threat with the resolve required. The last thing Campbell had ever wanted was the power to bring life or death to millions of people. A long, polished table ran the length of the room. Campbell sat at the head of the table. Behind him, the presidential seal was displayed on the wall. 
At the other end of the room, a dozen large screen monitors displayed live satellite feeds from Russia and around the world. Off to the side was another room walled off with a glass partition. Behind the glass was a bank of computer consoles manned by military personnel. Rebecca Kramer had finished summarizing the Russian plan of attack. You are absolutely certain this intelligence is accurate? Yes, Mr. President. Admiral Stone. It's accurate, Mr. President. We've confirmed that the entire Russian submarine fleet is at sea. All of it? Yes, sir, all of it. All of their boomers and all their serviceable attack submarines. Boomers. Their ballistic missile submarines, sir. They've been sneaking them out over the last three months. Director Kramer, can you tell me why the hell you didn't notice what the Russians were doing? With all due respect, sir, submarines are... Campbell was angry. He cut her off. Don't bullshit me, Director. I don't want to hear your excuses. Kramer's hatchet face turned pink. He turned to General Kroger sitting opposite Kramer at the table. Admiral Stone sat on Kroger's right. The stars on their uniforms glittered under the overhead lights. Secretary of Defense Dixon sat next to Admiral Stone. Walter Covington sat next to Kramer. As always, he was impeccably dressed. Kaplan sat next to him. He looked as though he'd slept in his suit. General, these torpedoes are missiles or whatever they are. Will they work? Can we stop them? We believe they will work, Mr. President. We've been keeping an eye on the development of these weapons for some time. They use a radical propulsion system that drives them at high speed. They are armed with a high-yield nuclear warhead. How high, General? Fifty megatons, Mr. President. The equivalent of a hydrogen bomb. Jesus, Dixon said. It gets worse, Kroger said. The Russians have developed advanced stealth technology for their subs. They can bring them in close to their targets before launch. They're fast and virtually invisible. They will be difficult to intercept. Are you saying we can't stop them? No, sir. I'm saying it will be difficult. The best way to stop them would be to prevent those weapons from being launched in the first place. What are you suggesting, General? Kroger took a breath. Knowing what he was about to say would not be easy to hear. Sir, we need to consider a preemptive strike. If those torpedoes make landfall, our ability to respond will be seriously compromised. Their subs may already be in position. If they are already in position, a preemptive strike will not stop them from launching. I will not be the person to initiate Armageddon, General. Unless we are under attack, our missiles will stay in their silos. Yes, sir. Admiral Stone, what do you think? Sir, the Russian technology is good, but it's not perfect. We've detected a number of their subs lurking off our coasts in the past week. It's not unusual for the Russians to sneak up as close as they can get. They're careful to stay in international waters, so there's not much we can do except watch them. We shadow them with our attack subs. They know we're there, and they know that we know what they're doing. It's a game of hide-and-seek. What's unusual in this instance is the number of submarines we have detected. It tends to confirm the intelligence Director Kramer has presented. Damn it, Admiral, are they in position to attack or not? Yes, sir, they are, if that's their intention. Sir, this plan of theirs is designed to significantly degrade our ability to respond, Covington said. It's not only the torpedoes. It's a coordinated attack. They intend to destroy our fleet in the Mediterranean and follow up with ICBMs and missiles from their subs. Mr. President, they are planning total war. Dixon spoke up. I don't understand why Tarasov thinks he can get away with this. A sneak nuclear attack would devastate us, but total war is a lousy strategy. Our submarines alone have enough missiles to wipe Moscow and most of Russia off the face of the earth. Doesn't he realize that? His generals have probably told him they can knock out most of our subs, Admiral Stone said. Can they? No, not enough, Stone said. He can get some of them, but the others will launch. Even if they manage to take out most of our land-based sites and some of our subs, Russia will be destroyed. It's a certainty. Then why initiate this insane plan? Tarasov hates us, Kramer said. He blames us for everything. His father was killed in Afghanistan by an American missile. Then his country ceased to exist when we won the Cold War. He's not acting rationally and it makes him dangerous. He's surrounded by hawks who see us as the enemy. The blockade backed him into a corner and now he has to do something. It's personal for him, General Kroger. Sir, what is our current defense status? We are at DEFCON 3, Mr. President. We have been since our aircraft was shot down in Syria. DEFCON 3 meant that the armed forces were on a heightened state of alert. Some bombers were in the air. The rest could be deployed within 15 minutes. 
Launch preparations for the ICBMs had not yet been initiated. DEFCON 3 was the midpoint between peace and war. We don't have a choice. Go to DEFCON 2, Campbell said. Worldwide? Kroger asked. DEFCON 2 was one step short of nuclear war. The bombers would be sent to their fail-safe points. All of America's enormous military might would be ready to deploy and fight within hours. The missiles would be readied for immediate launch. DEFCON 2 had only been reached once in the past during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. It had never been activated on a worldwide basis. Yes, General, worldwide. Yes, Mr. President. Kroger got up and went into the glassed-off area. They watched him pick up a phone. Sir, this is a high-risk strategy, Dixon said. The Russians will think we're getting ready to attack. It could provoke them to launch. Tarasov has created this situation, Richard. There's no time to pussyfoot around. I'm going to call him in the next few minutes and tell him we know what he's up to. He's not going to get away with this. I want him to know we're going to stop him. Sir, I'd like to be excused, Admiral Stone said. I should be at the command center. Of course, Admiral. Harold, find the interpreter and get her in here. Yes, sir, Kaplan said. He followed Admiral Stone out of the room. Dixon said, Sir, we should activate COGCON and get you to Air Force One. COGCON was a multi-tier plan to preserve the government of the United States in the event of war. Part of that plan was to move the president onto Air Force One, where he could command from the air. Theoretically, it was safer than remaining on the ground in the event of war. The nuclear codes would go with him. I appreciate the thought, Richard, but I'm not going anywhere. Let's see what Tarasov says before we trigger COGCON. At least go down to the emergency command center. After I talk to Tarasov, Campbell turned to Kramer. Well, Director, this is a fine mess. Yes, Mr. President, it is. You didn't vote for me, did you? No, sir. Why not? Be honest, I want to know. Frankly, sir, I didn't believe you would stand up to people like Tarasov. It's no secret I have sought to encourage peace rather than war. To the shame of the human race, there are always people like Tarasov and his generals. He's left me no choice. I refuse to start this war, but if he goes ahead with his reckless plan, I will finish it. Yes, sir. You know him better than I do, Director. Do you have any suggestions before I call? Above all else, Tarasov is a survivor. Mr. President, if you can convince him you are serious about using our nukes against him, he may call off the attack. Their plan depends on complete surprise. It's the critical element. That is now impossible. We know it's coming. He can't stop us from sending Russia back into the Stone Age. His generals will resist backing down. You might suggest he find a way to, um, neutralize their advice. A purge. Perhaps if these radical elements among his advisors were no longer in a position to influence him, better relations between our two nations could be established. I'm beginning to see why you achieved your current position. There was a knock on the door. Kaplan entered with the translator. In the days of Kennedy and the Cold War, there had been a separate phone on the president's desk with a dedicated line to the Kremlin. That was ancient history. Once the translator was ready, all Campbell had to do was press a button and he would be connected through a satellite link to Tarasov's office in the Kremlin. Ready, sir, the translator said. Campbell pressed the button. Chapter 79 Tarasov was shocked. He had just been told that American bombers were holding at fail-safe points near the edge of Federation airspace. Their stealth bombers had taken off and were in the air. Satellite images showed increased activity at land-based missile silos. The ether was filled with encrypted radio communications. The U.S. was preparing for war. His personal aide knocked and entered the Kremlin office. Mr. President, the President of the United States is calling. He demands to speak with you immediately. He demands. Yes, Mr. President, he sounds angry. Why had the American president sent his bombers to threaten the motherland? Such a display of force was more than a mere exercise. Could he possibly know about Medusa? You said he sounds angry. Yes, sir. Very well, I'll talk to him. Tell him to wait while we get the translator. Yes, sir. Five minutes later, the translator was ready. Mr. President, Tarasov said. Why are your bombers threatening us? My generals believe you are getting ready to attack. You are playing a dangerous game. President Tarasov, I will come directly to the point. We know about your plan to attack our country. I am calling in the hope we can avoid the certain destruction that will follow if you continue this rash course of action. How did he find out? That is an outrageous accusation, Tarasov said. Campbell's voice was hard. 
Don't waste my time, President Tarasov. Don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about. You will hurt us if you launch your torpedoes, but we're ready for you. All our forces are ready to deploy. Preliminary launch sequences on our nuclear missiles have been initiated. Our naval forces have been alerted. If you do not call back your submarines immediately, we will launch. You will be destroyed. We know all about your so-called safe retreats in the Urals and outside of Moscow. We've developed a special nuclear-tipped weapon with only one purpose. That purpose is to penetrate and destroy the underground facilities you assumed would protect you. I can assure you, they will not. Tarasov was speechless. Campbell continued. Mr. President, I believe you have been misled by your military advisors. You have made a mistake, but you can still prevent this from happening. Stop this reckless plan before it's too late. Let us use this as an opportunity to begin a new era between our two great nations. Rebecca Kramer listened to the conversation, surprised at the harsh tone of Campbell's voice. He looked over at her and winked. She almost fell off her chair. Holy shit. He's giving Tarasov an ultimatum and he winked at me. I don't believe he did that. I've misjudged him. In Moscow, Tarasov thought quickly. Mr. President, Tarasov said. It is difficult to conceive of a new era of relations when your navy is preventing essential goods from reaching us. In the Oval Office, Campbell was careful not to attack Tarasov personally. He needed to give the Russian president a way to save face, and out. The blockade is a direct result of the ambitions of your generals, Campbell said. They must have told you we would not respond in any significant way to their military adventures in Syria. As you can see, they were wrong. The blockade will be lifted when your troops retreat back across the Euphrates to their former positions. That is not a negotiable point. My generals are true patriots, Tarasov said. Their patriotism will cause the total destruction of your country if you do not stop them, Campbell said. I want you to listen very carefully, President Tarasov. You must believe what I say. If even one of those torpedoes is launched, I will retaliate with the full power of our nuclear arsenal. You must stand down. You cannot threaten me. I am only stating the truth, Mr. President. Truth is not a threat. My intention is to make sure you understand the consequences of the events that have been set in motion. Is it possible you did not know of this plan? Rebecca Kramer smiled. If Tarasov admitted to knowing about the attack, he was guilty of planning to start a world war. If he said he didn't know about it, he would look like a man who had been manipulated by his generals. In Moscow, Tarasov tapped his fingers on his desk, thinking. The translator waited, shocked at what he was hearing. Medusa could only succeed under two conditions. Complete surprise and destruction of the enemy's ability to respond. Neither was now possible. If war began with America's offensive capability intact, Russian defenses could never intercept enough of their missiles to prevent defeat and annihilation. Tarasov had flown over the site of the Chernobyl disaster. What had once been a thriving city was now a forbidden zone of lingering death. The wild animals which had somehow survived were radioactive. A hundred thousand square kilometers of rich farmland had been abandoned, poisoned by fallout from the explosion. Chernobyl was nothing compared to what would happen if the Americans launched their missiles. Tarasov imagined mushroom-shaped clouds rising everywhere over the Federation. America would suffer, but Moscow and every other major Russian city would cease to exist. The country would be blanketed with radioactivity. Everything would die. Instinct told him Campbell wasn't bluffing. The American president had put him in an impossible situation. If he went ahead with the attack, the motherland would be destroyed. If he backed down, the generals would try to seize power. Unless they're in no position to do so, he would have to move quickly to stop them. Kerensky, Fedorov and Stepanov, Admiral Mikhailov, all of them. They said the Americans would not know until it was too late. They lied to me. They initiated Medusa before I gave the order. They have used me. Tarasov put aside his anger for the moment. He made his decision. President Campbell, I can assure you I knew nothing of this plan. It's difficult for leaders like us, Mr. President. We are busy men. We make important decisions every day. Sometimes we're offered bad advice by people we trust. People with hidden agendas. People who wish to steer us in dangerous directions. It appears that some of your generals have tried to bypass your authority. It will require firm action to rein them in. I'm sure you understand. You must stand down, Mr. President. Can I have your word that this operation, this attack, will be canceled?
Tarasov knew the order to launch had not been given. It was not too late. Medusa could still be stopped, but he'd have to move quickly. You have my word, Mr. President. In the situation room, there was a collective sigh of relief. Excellent, Campbell said. You understand we will maintain our present state of readiness until we are sure the operation has been called off. Please do not think this is anything but a necessary defensive decision. I understand. We will maintain a defensive posture as well until we can mutually de-escalate. That is acceptable. I suggest you recall your submarines immediately. An incident could undo our agreement. It will be done, Tarasov said. I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk, Campbell said. I look forward to our next conversation and the improvement of relations between our countries. Goodbye, Mr. President. Campbell ended the call. Well done, Mr. President, Kramer said. Now we wait and see, Campbell said. Chapter 80 General Boris Kerensky had gotten to sleep sometime around one in the morning, helped by several glasses of vodka. It took a lot of vodka to make Kerensky tired. His huge bulk could absorb enough alcohol to put lesser men into a coma. Besides, he was angry. That peasant Tarasov had ruined everything. If he hadn't intervened, the Americans would now be history. He was still thinking about Tarasov when he fell asleep. Kerensky was dreaming. He stood on a tall cliff looking out over a dark ocean under a menacing sky. A storm was coming in. Towering waves as tall as buildings rolled in and pounded against the cliff with a rhythmic sound. Boom, boom, boom. He stirred and came awake. The pounding continued. Someone was hammering on his door. He looked at his clock. It was three in the morning. Boom, boom, boom. Something must have happened. Something important. If it wasn't important, there would be hell to pay. Kerensky got out of bed, shrugged on a robe, and went to the door. He looked through the spy hole and saw a militia officer standing there, raising his fist to hit the door again. What is it? Police open the door. Kerensky undid the locks and opened the door. There were three other policemen with the officer, all armed. General Boris Kerensky. Yes, what do you want? You are under arrest. You would be wise to offer no resistance. Are you out of your mind? You can't arrest me. By whose order? By order of the president. The officer gestured. Two of the policemen stepped forward, grabbed Kerensky's arms, pulled them behind his back and handcuffed him. Kerensky couldn't know it. But similar scenes were taking place at the homes of Defense Minister Fedorov and Admiral Mikhailov. Within an hour, all three had been transported to the Lubyanka. If Stepanov had been alive, he would have joined them. Many things had changed over the years in Russia, but not the Lubyanka. For decades, the yellow building on Derjinsky Square had served as headquarters and prison for the KGB. It was no longer used as the main prison by the security services. That honor now belonged to Lefortovo. But the Lubyanka was a convenient place to confine those who were too important to be lodged with common criminals. The cells on the lower levels of the Lubyanka had been occupied by some of the most famous names in Russian history, along with countless others whose names would never be known or remembered. No one knew how much blood had been spilled in those cells. Kerensky and the others were only the latest additions to the long list of those who had displeased Russia's rulers. Kerensky wasn't sure how much time had passed when the door to his cell finally opened. Tarasov stood in the hall holding a folder in his left hand, flanked by two FSB agents. Why am I here? Kerensky said. I demand an explanation. You are in no position to demand anything, Tarasov said. That should be perfectly clear to you. You betrayed us, Tarasov. We were about to destroy our enemy. You threw away the opportunity. Why? Why did you do this? You have betrayed the motherland. It wasn't me who betrayed the motherland, General, Tarasov said. It was you. You hatched this plan. You told me there was no chance the Americans could respond before they were destroyed. If you hadn't interfered, we would have succeeded. You are a fool, Kerensky. The American president knew everything. He knew what you were doing. If I had not stopped it, the Americans would have destroyed us with their nuclear missiles. You activated the plan before you consulted me. I never doubted you would go along with it. It was your plan to begin with. Oh, that's not quite how I remember it, Tarasov said. As I recall, I only learned of your plan after it had been initiated. You bastard. What were you going to do if I had refused? Kerensky said nothing. That's what I thought, Tarasov said. Perhaps I would have met with an accident. Or did you plan something else? A heart attack, perhaps? 
I'm sure you would have been grief-stricken at the loss of my inspired leadership. Go fuck your mother, Kerensky said. Insulting me is a serious mistake, Tarasov said. You have one chance to live. Tarasov took a sheet of paper from the folder. There is going to be a public trial. You will read this statement confessing to your crimes. It names you, Fedorov, Stepanov, and Mikhailov as co-conspirators. It states that you plan to initiate war against the Americans without my knowledge or authorization. You make it clear that you regret your actions and the harm it has caused. You apologize to the Russian people. And if I don't sign, it's of little consequence to me if you don't, Tarasov said. I'm sure one of the others will when they see pictures of your body. The pictures will not be pleasant. Kerensky's shoulders slumped. He knew he was beaten. Very well, you win. I thought you would see reason. Tarasov handed him the folder and a pen. Kerensky didn't even bother to read the paper as he scrawled his signature. He didn't look up as the cell door clanged shut. Tarasov and the FSB men started the long climb from the basement. What do you want us to do with him, Mr. President? One of the men said. After the trial, make him disappear. Yes, Mr. President. Chapter 81 Thorne and Jenna were in Thorne's kitchen. He took a chilled bottle of vodka from the refrigerator and poured two double shots, then set the bottle on the counter. He took the stool next to her and raised his glass. It's been quite a week, Jenna said. I have to hand it to Campbell, Thorne said. Whatever he did, it worked. Lewis told me what happened. Campbell called Tarasov and told him we'd launch our nukes if he went through with his plan to attack. He must have been convincing. If he hadn't been, we wouldn't be sitting here. It's not over yet, we're still at DEFCON 3. The Russians are matching us. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. But the bombers have been recalled and the launch preparations have stopped. So that's good. Lewis thinks Campbell is waiting to see if Tarasov pulls his troops back across the Euphrates before he drops to DEFCON 4. What's happening in Moscow? It's hard to know for sure, Jenna said. There are rumors Tarasov has relieved several senior officers of command. And Dropov has replaced Kerensky as chief of staff. Fedorov, Kerensky, and Mikhailov haven't been seen in days. A purge. I think so. We should know more soon. What happens if Tarasov pulls back in Syria? The Syrian army will take over the fields. The Kurds are in disarray and no longer a military threat. But Al-Khali is weak. There are still a lot of people who want to overthrow his regime. He can occupy the fields, but keeping them might be a different story. Iran would like that oil. And the Turks. It's what my old CO would call a fluid situation. Carlson wants to know when you're coming back, she said. I'm not sure. What have you been doing? Not much. Working out, going for rides, it clears my head. That bike is beautiful, but it scares me. I've never taken you for a ride, have I? No. I'll have to get you a helmet. Jenna sipped her wine. You did it, Mike. You stopped a war. I didn't do it. Anya did. What was she like? Someone I fell in love with. That's what she was like. The thought brought a sudden feeling of unbearable loss. He looked away from Jenna so she wouldn't see the truth in his eyes. Too late. It went through her like a knife. She toyed with her glass, making condensation rings on the counter. Damn you, Mike. She was... Russian, he said. It's hard to explain. Russians are different from us. They're more intense, emotional. It's as if their history of war and suffering is stamped on their soul. As if they come in with it. It makes them passionate about life. That sounds very romantic. I suppose it is. Like I said, it's hard to explain. They draw strength from their country the way they think about it. The Rodina, the motherland. They're connected to it. It gives them strength. You don't think we draw strength from our country? Not in the same way. For them, it's visceral. How many Americans do you know who think of the country as their mother? When we were in Kramer's office, Davidson called her a traitor. You said she was a patriot. She was. She loved her country. She saw what Tarasov and the others were doing, and she knew she had to stop it. She did it the only way she could. The Russians will call her a traitor, but she did it out of love for Russia. She made me promise to tell people that. Jenna finished her drink and stood. I think I'd better leave now, she said. Jenna, don't, Mike, just don't. Thorn watched the door close behind her. Chapter 82 The early morning roads were empty of traffic. The sky streaked with bands of color announcing the coming day. The sharp rumble of the bike's exhaust changed note as Thorn geared down. 
He turned onto a narrow road leading to a deserted quarry. It had been a while since he'd been here. It was where he went when the demons came out and started dancing in his head. It hadn't taken long for them to show up. He'd come wide awake in the middle of the night thinking about Anya. He pulled up near the edge of the quarry and killed the engine, put the kickstand down and got off the bike. He took off his helmet and hung it on the handlebar. The world was quiet, except for the ticking of the engine as it cooled. Somewhere, a bird began to sing. The quarry had been abandoned around the time of the Civil War. It wasn't that big. A few acres deep, filled halfway with still dark water. He walked over to a flat rock and sat down. He gazed out at the black surface of the water. It felt watchful, as if it were waiting for him to do something. Thorn didn't know how to handle what he was feeling. Anya's death had torn something inside him, left him suspended between grief and anger. He felt as if part of him had died with her. Davidson's smug face came to mind, his easy dismissal of Anya as a traitor. If he had gotten his way, they would never have learned of the attack. Davidson and everyone else would now be dead. Why were idiots like him in charge of things? Working at Langley was like living inside a story by Lewis Carroll. Sometimes he felt like he'd slipped through a dark mirror into an alternate universe, where everything was suspicious and nothing was as it seemed. After a while, it became difficult to remember that sometimes things were exactly what they appeared to be. If Anya had lived, they might have made a life together. Now he'd never know what would have happened. Never know if the feeling between them would have lasted. All he had was the memory of it. The memory of that first electric touch of her hand. The way her eyes had widened in surprise. A feeling of connection that was right. He thought about Jenna. How different she was from Anya. Last night he'd watched her walk out and felt unable to speak. Unable to stop her. He hadn't known what to say to her. Before he'd met Anya he'd thought he was in love with Jenna. He did love her, but it wasn't the same. He'd never felt about Jenna the way he did about Anya. Anya had awakened something more. It didn't make sense, but that didn't change the feeling. Thorne was under no illusions about who he was. The rules of his personal world were more important to him than the rules imposed by people like Davidson. When Davidson had insisted on calling Anya a traitor, he'd wanted to hit him. If Jenna hadn't stopped him, he would have done it. All because Davidson had questioned Anya's motives. He'd overreacted, but Davidson had dishonored her. He'd negated her sacrifice. It was important to stand up for her. Thorne couldn't get her out of his mind. He couldn't remember much about the dream that had startled him awake, but he knew Anya had been in it. He remembered the way she'd looked at him as he set her down in that grassy clearing in Estonia. He remembered what she'd said as she was dying. I love you, you. We might have. Something splashed in the water below. When he looked, all he could see were ripples vanishing on the surface. The End We hope you've enjoyed this production of The Russian Woman by Alex Lukeman. If you have, would you mind sharing this story with a friend? Life is so much better when we share. Oh, and the whizzle bopple dangers of the algorithm like it too. So go ahead, click that share button and make someone's day.